The Bride by Abigail Barnett Narrated by C.J. Bloom Chapter One There's no good way to break it to your mother that her 25-year-old daughter is dating a 49-year-old billionaire, so I'd never really gotten around to it. By the time we flew to my hometown of Calumet, Michigan, I knew I was in trouble. On the car ride from the Marquette Airport, where Neil's private plane had landed, I mentally rehearsed how I would explain to my mother that I was dating Neil Elwood, publishing magnate and tenth richest man in Great Britain. Oh, she was going to be so pissed at me. Sophie, you're awfully quiet, Neil said, his eyes never leaving the snow-covered road for a second. He'd rented a car from the airport, a Malibu that, according to him, drives like a broken shopping trolley. He hadn't been in a great mood since we'd landed. I'm letting you concentrate on winter driving. It was a pretty good excuse. Mom said the Keweenaw had already gotten a hundred inches of snow in December alone. Highway 41 was a hard-packed avenue of white, with a sheen of ice on top, Tall plow banks narrowed the road on either side, and deceptively cheerful flurries fell in the gray early morning light. Neil raised an eyebrow at the road ahead of us. Darling, I learned to drive in Iceland. I'm sure I can handle this. We get a higher average snowfall than Iceland, I pointed out. But it wasn't like I could hide the truth forever, and I really had to stop my whole head-in-the-sand routine. Okay, confession. On the way to meet your family for the first time? Lovely, he inhaled, audibly frustrated. Do they at least know I'm coming? They know you're coming. My mom just doesn't know some stuff. Better to do it like a Band-Aid. Maybe I haven't been entirely honest with her about your money? Or your age? Sophie, he barked tearing his eyes from the dingy snow on the road to frown at me. I didn't lie. And I hadn't. I just haven't corrected my mom when she said, This kid you're dating. This is bloody fantastic, he cursed, a muscle in his jaw ticking as he locked his gaze on the road again, as if I weren't already nervous. At least I told you before we got there. Not that I was making it any better by asking for credit for that, we were already in the car. I could have easily just let this whole thing blow up in our faces upon arrival, and Neil probably suspected I had planned to do just that. Sophie, we have been dating for a year. Christ, we're buying a house together. You didn't think that eventually your mother would find out? I tilted my head and studied his profile. Since the chemotherapy he'd had the year before, his hair had come back in grayer. He'd started growing a beard, a precisely clipped shadow of silver that I absolutely detested, but tolerated because it seemed to make him happy not to have to shave as often. Even before the chemo, our age difference would have been obvious, but now that he was rocking the hot dad look, it was going to come as a bigger shock to my mother. She was only forty-two. You know... You're very handsome when you're annoyed with me, I observed. His mood didn't lighten. I'm always handsome, Sophie. Stop changing the subject. Why didn't you tell your mother the truth about me? I shifted a little in the passenger seat. I meant to, I really did. But then I let way too much time pass, and it got harder and harder to work it into a conversation. It never seemed like the right time and a house full of your extended relatives is the perfect venue for initiating that conversation, is it? He fumed. What is this? Are you embarrassed of me? That made me laugh, despite the fact he was roaring angry. No, seriously, that's not it. That's stupid. But my mom is to me as you are to Emma. How would you feel if she moved to a different country with an older man she'd met only two months before? It depends on if that man is horrible Michael or not, he grumbled. He hated his daughter's fiancé for no reason I could see, 
beyond the fact that he was going to marry Emma. In Neil's opinion, no one deserved Emma. He would have to cop to understanding my mother's point of view, or concede that Michael wasn't all bad. The latter was never going to happen, so he said, It's completely understandable that you didn't know how to explain our relationship to your family. I must admit to having a bit of an advantage here. As a wealthy middle-aged man, I'm expected to have affairs with beautiful women half my age. It says nothing negative about my character. Those beautiful young women bear the brunt of the scorn for being vapid, shallow gold diggers. Now that I know you understand where I'm coming from, I feel even worse for not telling you. I laid my hand on his knee. I'm really sorry. Does it help at all that I never lied? Your mother is expecting a twenty-four-year-old to walk through that door, he reminded me grimly. My mother wasn't going to like you no matter what. At least this way she has a reason that isn't openly pathetic. I don't think it's openly pathetic to dislike Michael's loud chewing or his overly American accent, Neil muttered. Somebody's projecting, I sing-songed. I never once said that you were openly pathetic. You adopted that title on your own. The corner of Neil's mouth twitched, but he squashed his smile before it could fully form. I lifted the hand he rested on the gear shift and kissed his fingertips through his leather gloves. He pulled his hand back with a resigned sigh. It's only that I thought you were getting better at confronting difficult situations. We've been talking about the great progress you're making. Yes, progress. I'm not 100% perfect. I heard the defensiveness in my own voice and mentally started counting to ten. I'm sorry, I just... Could you not bring up therapy? I'd rather argue. Sorry. That was below the belt, wasn't it? He looked over, then back to the road. I'm working on it. I had to. It had been a rocky year for both of us, with Neil's cancer treatment and my sudden plunge into the world of medical caregiver. He'd spent a scary time in the ICU nearly dying from a kidney infection that had struck while his immune system was down for the count. I'd been in full-time survival mode, both for him and myself. Then, for the months that followed... I'd never quite shaken that mindset. If anything annoyed me, I'd think, but at least Neil is okay, and feel incredibly guilty for being upset, especially if he'd been the cause of the annoyance. It had made for a very contentious few months of me pretending everything was fine until I exploded. Neil had constantly walked on eggshells to keep from upsetting me, until we both decided that seeing a counselor together was in our best interests. Couples therapy should be bottled and sold at every available retail outlet. Look, this... it has nothing to do with you, I assured him. This was completely shitty of me, and I'm sorry. But I promise I'm not doing this anymore. This is just the last one of my avoidance issues coming to a nasty head, and it's not fair to you. He looked over to me, his expression softening. Apology accepted. But really, Sophie, this puts me in a terribly awkward position. I know. Boy, did I know. And he couldn't begin to imagine the half of it. Neil had grown up in an extremely wealthy family, jetting from their homes in England and Iceland to fabulous holiday locales. The Elwood brood had been sophisticated from birth, it seemed. My family had an uncle who painted his beer gut to look like a watermelon when he walked with the rest of his VFW buddies in the Fourth of July parade. Neil was about to get the culture shock of his life, no matter how laid back and easygoing he thought he was. If it makes you feel any better, at least you're getting the biggest, most extended of the extended family gatherings out of the way first. After Christmas, any other interaction with my family will be a piece of cake, I added, trying to put his mind at ease. Besides, I'm sure everyone is going to be totally cool with you. We were overrun the moment we stepped through the door. Becky! Someone, my cousin Steve, I think, shouted into the dining room. 
Your daughter and her fella got in. Merry Christmas, my Aunt Marie shouted, wrapping her arms around me. Her hair was a grain blonde cloud of perfectly sculpted curls that got into my eyes and mouth as she hugged me. Beside me, Neil Elwood, internationally known billionaire, swayed slightly on his feet. I really hoped he wasn't going to pass out because he was carrying two bottles of very expensive champagne in the sleek black shopping bag in his hand. My Aunt Marie stepped back and did a double take as she looked Neil over. Her eyes went wide and she bit her lips to try and disguise her mischievous smile. Oh, your mom is going to shit. The back porch of my grandmother's house was easily the most down-home place in the Midwest, decked out in laminated wood paneling and thick plastic rugs to protect the carpet in the high-traffic areas. Christmas saw the room turned into a glorious buffet, with my aunts and great-aunts scurrying to bring hot dishes to the already laden-down folding table. A truly hideous light-up clock of the Last Supper hung on the wall over the sliding glass entryway into the main part of the house. I took Neil's hand. Come on, let's go see Mom and get this over with. When we stepped into the tiny crowded kitchen, my mom was bent over a steaming sink, having just strained some boiled potatoes. She looked fabulous, as always, in wide-legged black trousers and a fitted leopard print cardigan. Her blonde hair, as fake as her nails and just as difficult to maintain, was perfectly straightened and held back from her face with a clip. I'm home, I declared, as she shook the last drops out of the huge stock pot. She turned to face us, the corners of her eyes crinkling with happiness when she saw me. Then her gaze darted to Neil, and her smile did that telltale split-second cessation of outward mobility caused by an unpleasant shock she didn't want to admit to. I'd gotten so used to it over the years. The I'm freaking out internally freeze. She hugged me, harder than absolutely necessary, and effused, Honey, I'm so glad you made it. I was worried the airport would close down because of the storm yesterday. It didn't. After stating the obvious, there was nowhere to go but introductions. Mom, this is Neil. Neil, this is my mom, Rebecca. She put out her hand. It's nice to meet you, Neil. Sophie has had only good things to say about you. Turning to me with raised eyebrows, she said, Not that she said a lot. Yes, she mentioned that in the car on the way over. He gave her what was possibly the most charming smile I've ever seen on him. Oh, baby, you're wasting your energy. She already hates you. My grandmother was at the stove. She looked over the shoulder of her red, bedazzled Christmas sweater. Well, don't hug me, for heaven's sake. I only haven't seen you for a year. Merry Christmas, Grandma, I said as I went to her with open arms. I heard my mom ask, So, Neil, what do you do? I own two multimedia conglomerates, one in the U.S. and England, and the other based out of Reykjavik. Oh, how nice for you. My mom was going to die of a heart attack on the kitchen floor. Is there a lot of money in that? My grandmother asked him, with all the tact small-town Michigan matriarchs generally displayed. Neil's eyebrows lifted, and he blinked three times, rapidly, before managing to answer, I do all right. It's a wonder anybody's doing all right these days, with those damn Republicans. Ma, my mother hushed her, nobody wants to talk about politics at Christmas. I, uh, I brought a little something to contribute to the festivities, Neil said, reaching into the shopping bag to pull out one of the bottles of 1996 Dom Perignon. He'd brought the Dom Perignon because I'd suggested he not go overboard. My mother was going to eat him alive. She took the bottle and turned it in her hands with a little nod. This was very thoughtful of you. We've got beer too, Neil, in the cooler outside the door. Just don't let all the heat out, my grandmother called, 
her head in the oven as she peeled the tinfoil off the ham. I'll chill this, Mom said, taking the other bottle from Neil. Grandma deposited a heavy bowl into my hands and I gasped, juggling it quickly so as not to slosh gravy onto my coat. Take that out to the table. I cast an apologetic glance at Neil as I moved past him, into the crowded dining room and out to the porch. As I went, I heard my grandma shoo him out of the kitchen. It wasn't a long journey with the bull, but by the time I got back to Neil, he'd been cornered by my great-uncle Doug, who had an open beer in his hand despite the fact it was 11 a.m. on Christmas morning. You heard a damn gingerbread Oreos? he asked Neil, taking a swig from his bottle. Neil blinked and stammered, N no That sounds horrible. No, they're a real tang, Doug insisted, gesturing with his beer. They were on the Channel 6 news. I'm sorry, did you say news? Neil spotted me and his relief was visible. I should have warned him about the thick Youper accent that ran in my family. Hey, Sophie. Uncle Doug put out his arm for a half hug. He was my grandmother's youngest brother, 65, and he'd recently retired from his job as a DNR officer. Did ya hear about them gingerbread Oreos? That sounds gross. I stood beside Neil and reached up to put a hand on his shoulder. It was as hard as a blacksmith's anvil with tension. I hoped he'd brought his headache pills with him. They got him down in Marquette? Doug went on. They don't got him at the Pats here, but I told Debbie's sister, you better save me some of them gingerbread Oreos. My Aunt Debbie yelled from the living room that there was something wrong with their cell phone, and Doug excused himself. As he walked away, Neil muttered to me, I feel like I'm listening to an alien language. Oh, you just wait until I've been up here a couple of days, no matter how hard I've tried to shake it. The accent always comes back. Neil's eyes widened as he considered the implications of that statement. I think I do need one of those beers after all. My grandmother emerged from the kitchen, wiping her hands on her apron. Everybody shut up. We're gonna pray. Since my cousin Jimmy was going into the seminary, he did the honors. As everyone crossed themselves, including me, solely on reflex, Neil bowed his head respectfully. That's one of the things I really love about Neil. He's mindful of small stuff, and that lets him fit in anywhere, even when he doesn't fit in at all. We'd been sticking to a mostly vegan diet since Neil had picked it up during the big, fun year of cancer. But there was absolutely nothing that could be classified as vegan at my family's cheese-smothered Christmas dinner. So we took the opportunity to gorge ourselves shamefully on fatty baked ham and thick, gooey casseroles. I had a feeling this meal would be the dietary point of no return for both of us. There has never been a dinner table invented that could hold an entire extended family of Catholics. There were just too damn many scafes. So most of us ate standing up, or sitting on couches or folding chairs, since there were only six seats around the dining room table. Neil and I stood in the little corner next to the back bedroom, our plates balanced on our hands, our bottles of Leinenkugel perched on the windowsill between ancient styrofoam snowmen. I need you to still love me. I managed, around a mouthful of scorching hot mashed potatoes, when you are witness to the gastrointestinal nightmare that will be this food's legacy. We shall never speak of this night. What happens in Michigan stays in Michigan. Hopefully including your accent. He lifted another bite of ham to his mouth. And we must never tell Emma about the orgy of animal products we're ingesting. Who's Emma? My mom called from the dining room table. The woman had the hearing of a buck in November. Neil chewed and swallowed, then reached for his beer. My daughter... She's a vegan. Oh, you have a daughter, my mom brightened, and my grandma and Aunt Marie both perked up. I knew mom had visions of adorable kindergartners in her mind. It's a funny story, I said, even though I knew it wouldn't strike them as remotely funny. She's 25, 
she's my exact age. She's a month younger, he clarified, as though that made things better. Oh, a whole month. Anger tightened my mom's fake smile. I thought it might crack and fall off. Well, that would be a good story, wouldn't it, Becky? Aunt Marie laughed to diffuse the tension. My daughter and my grandbaby are the same age. You could go on Maury. Um, no, Emma is not... I shook my head. Emma is not my baby. Well, you better have some soon, Marie said, as though it weren't the most mortifying thing in the world for her to order Neil and me to procreate. Your mom's been hungry for a grandbaby. How soon my mom's expectations had swung from don't get pregnant to get immediately pregnant, the moment a man was in the picture for me. I bet she felt differently now that she'd met Neil. I'd gotten pregnant the year before, but we hadn't kept the baby. I didn't regret that choice, but I was glad my mom didn't know. She'd told me time and again how disappointed she was that I wouldn't have children. I wasn't about to change my mind, but I wished for her sake that she didn't feel that way. I'd already warned Neil about my mother's obsession with being a grandmother, and he'd agreed to take the fall for me. He cleared his throat and said quite seriously, Well, after I had chemotherapy and the transplant this year, it's not likely that children are in our future. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I had no doubt that my mom meant that. She would probably feel irrationally guilty over Marie's remarks later. The good news is he's still alive, I reminded them with a wise-ass smirk. Neil grinned over the top of his beer bottle. Somehow you'll just have to cope with your disappointment, Mrs. Scaife. My mom laughed, and I saw a glimmer of hope that she might slightly warm to Neil after all. A little after lunch, Neil excused himself to call Emma and wish her a happy Christmas. I'll go outside, he said, gesturing toward the door with his phone. It's a bit loud in here, and I don't want to be rude, of course. Don't put your tongue on anything out there, or it will get stuck, I teased. The moment he was gone, my mother and my Aunt Marie herded me into the back bedroom. I backed into the end of the narrow bed and had no choice but to sit on all the coats as the two women loomed over me. Explain yourself, Sophie Ann, Mom hissed in a low voice. Explain what? I held out my open and utterly innocent palms. I told you I was bringing my boyfriend to Christmas. I brought my boyfriend to Christmas. You didn't go to law school. You are not going to lawyer your way out of this. Mom pressed her garish holiday manicure to her forehead. How old is he? Forty-nine. I lifted my chin defiantly. Or was that childishly? Why could I never act like an adult when my mother was involved? Forty- I'm not even forty-nine, Sophie. What the hell are you thinking? I'm thinking he's super hot and great in bed? Mom crossed herself. Jesus Christ! Okay, so, what does he do? Aunt Marie asked, her voice insistently calm, like we were in an emergency that needed immediate handling. Then, in a split second of panic, she added, For a living. I meant, for a living. What does he do? He owns two media companies. He's the tenth richest man in Great Britain. My mom sat down heavily beside me. Oh, sweetie. You're not doing this for the money, are you? Mother, no! God, I didn't even know he was rich when I met him. I shook my head. Why can't I just meet a guy and fall in love with him and not have any ulterior motive? You are being extremely weird about this. Your mom is just concerned for you, Sophie, Marie said gently. And pissed off that you didn't tell me any of this before, Mom added. I took a sharp breath my exasperation audible. It's not like I lied to you. You didn't lie to me, but you didn't tell the truth. What does it even matter? I demanded. It's not like I'm doing anything wrong. So he's a little older. So what? Marie said, putting her hands on her hips. Sophie, do you love him? Absolutely. And does he treat you good and love you back?
I nodded decisively at my aunt. She turned to my mom. Then why are you having a shit fit over this, Becky? You should just be happy that she found a guy who isn't covered in tattoos with a bunch of junk in his face. Marie was talking about my first boyfriend, a 19-year-old I'd started dating when I was 17. He'd had the most awful amateur tattoos, and he'd played bass in a garage band. He'd seemed so dangerous and like such a bad boy. I'd since learned that the truly bad boys looked perfectly normal and respectable until you got them into a Parisian sex club. Mom huffed. She knew she'd lost the argument. Are you guys still staying out at the trailer? I don't know. Are we still invited? I snapped. Mom's expression softened. Of course you are. Just stop dropping these bombs on me, Sophie. I never know what's going on with you anymore. You don't have to be so secretive. Well, apparently she does, if you're going to freak out like this whenever she tells you something, Marie observed. Can I go now and enjoy my lovely Christmas with my family, who I have not seen in a year? I asked with a roll of my eyes. Mom huffed and I pushed through the door and out into the dining room. Neil was still outside, thank God. I went to the kitchen and leaned over the sink to peer out the window. He paced between cars in the driveway, phone to his ear, his other arm wrapped around his chest. Occasionally, he stopped and bounced for warmth. He had a huge grin on his face as he talked to his daughter. I knew it was difficult for him to be away from her at Christmas. The only other time it had happened, Emma had told me, had been when he'd gone to visit his ex-wife Elizabeth and her family the year before they'd gotten married. Emma took this trip to be a very good sign for her father and me. Still, I felt a little bad that Neil wasn't spending the holiday with his daughter. I knew he missed her terribly. It assuaged my guilt slightly that she was celebrating with her fiancé and his family this year. The rest of the visit was surprisingly stress-free. Neil was asked at least seven times what part of Ireland he was from, but he was very gracious about correcting people. As the day went on, he relaxed considerably, and I marveled again at how adaptable he was to such an unfamiliar situation. Neil had grown up with wealth and proper manners, but he didn't look down on my loud, sometimes earthy family the way other people with his upbringing might have. It was around four o'clock when Neil and I left. Our arms weighted down with plates of leftovers, cookies, and my grandmother's fudge. I must have hugged all of my relatives a thousand times apiece. Are you heading back to the trailer right now? My mom called from the table as we walked past. No, I wanted to take Neil to see the lake while it's still light out. I gestured to the door. We'll meet you back there. Is the key still in the same place? Just don't get lost or run out of gas, Marie snarked, complete with finger quotes. The woman would not shut up about that first bad boyfriend. My mother shot her a look. Yes, the key is in the same place. I'll be heading that way shortly. Okay, bring more leftovers, we'll have dinner. I was going to be as relentlessly cheerful as possible about this whole thing. When we stepped outside, Neil gave me a reassuring smile. I think that went quite well. Aw, oh, the poor guy. I think you're being way too optimistic. You have no idea what's going to happen to you tonight. Chapter 2 The wind off the frozen surface of Lake Superior was cutting cold. But since we'd both grown up in extreme low temperatures, Neil and I were brave enough to face it. Someone had plowed the gravel parking lot by the shore and shoveled off the wooden steps of the beach. I thought the Great Lakes had magnificent sandy beaches, Neil mused aloud as we navigated the slick staircase. There's sand. It's just under all this snow. He put a hand out to steady me. Careful. Yeah, I might fall and bruise my ass. Oh, wait, it's already bruised, I snorted. Knowing the limits of our stamina and accommodations over the holiday season, we'd gone a little crazy with the dominance-submission fun times in the week before we'd left New York. It had been entirely warranted. 
I'd been so keyed up and stressed over my audition with Wake Up America that when it had gone perfectly, I'd needed to blow off some steam in a big way. Sometimes it felt like our lives were never going to slow down and let us catch our breath, which was why it was so nice to stand on the shore and smell the clean lake breeze. I've always felt like this lake had a primal energy, you know? Neil raised one eyebrow sardonically. Don't look at me like that, I laughed. I'm not about to get a tattoo of a dream catcher and start reading tarot cards in the park, but look at it. As a force of nature, you have to be impressed. All the sand here? Washed off the bottom of the lake by the water. If you went in right now, my bollocks would crawl all the way up into my neck, I'd imagine. He quipped, laughing a little at his own joke as he looked down at his feet. He seemed strangely nervous, considering it was just the two of us. Then he put his hands in his coat pockets, and I decided it must just be the cold. I sighed at his juvenile humor. As I was saying, the bottom of the lake is sandstone, like an underwater cliff. I've waded out pretty far before, and I've never found the edge. You were too frightened to find it. His hand rummaged in his pocket as he stared out at where the gray of the sky melded into the gray of the open water farther out. I was. I kicked the toe of my boot into the snow, mixing it with the sand. Last year was the year that just kept rubbing up against us and wearing us down, so I think I know how this sand feels. And now, he was still staring off, as if he didn't trust himself to look at me. It was like he'd been overcome by delayed stage fright from meeting my family. Now, I'm just glad that things are going to be more peaceful, I said, reaching over to loop my arm through his. We'll go to Iceland, we'll meet your family, then we'll come back to New York and just settle in. His laugh was strained. You sound like you're ready to feather a nest. I suppose we should get more serious on this house hunt? If you want, I shrugged. I'm happy enough with everything exactly the way it is. Oh, he shrugged. If you wanted to put off buying a house. No, it's not that. Well, it was that, at least some of it. This is going to sound crazy. But if we're going to buy a house, that's settling down. I don't think I want to spend the rest of my life in Manhattan. Oh, he said again. His voice cracked and he cleared his throat. When did you arrive at this conclusion? Right now, actually. I haven't been hiding it or biting my tongue. I breathed in more clean, fresh air. I never realized how much I missed the quiet and the open spaces. Do you think you could see yourself living outside of the city? I had planned to. I'd like to retire at Langhurst Court, I thought we'd agreed upon that. He sounded wary. I'm always happy to discuss. No, that's... That actually makes me feel better. I wouldn't like being that far from my family and friends full time, but my job had definitely changed. When I'd worked at Port Terrace, I'd had to live in New York. Living in the city wasn't cheap, but commuting from out of town would have been prohibitively expensive and needlessly frustrating. Now I was writing, and if I got the job at Wake Up America, I would still only be working on segments once a year. I could go anywhere, provided I could make it back to New York for a week here and there so I could see Holly and Deja. Neil smiled, then faltered, then smiled again, even bigger. I'm very glad to hear that. I'm not ready to fully retire yet, of course. But I have been thinking about scaling back my involvement with the company. Not in any official capacity. I'm still expecting to return to a fairly heavy schedule, but I'd like to delegate more. Take some time off. Travel with you. Not work myself into an early grave. Then it settled. No enormous life changes right now. I beamed at him, but to my surprise his expression fell. His posture stiffened a bit. He slipped his hands from his pockets and rubbed them together, then spoke as though he were purposefully moving on from that part of the conversation. It's quite beautiful out here. Cold, but quite beautiful. 
something was definitely up with him. Does it look like Iceland? I'd never seen Iceland, and I was strangely eager for some connection between our childhoods. Because of our age gap, I found myself reaching for those superficial similarities, despite logically knowing that they didn't matter. He squinted out at the waves tossing in the distance, far beyond the shelf of ice around the shore. The light is different. I've never seen light behave the way it does in Eastland. He added cheerfully, You'll see. I would see. After our Upper Peninsula Christmas, we'd be flying to Reykjavik for New Year's, to spend it with his brothers and their families. Runolf had recently had a baby with his second wife. As if becoming a first-time father weren't terrifying enough, he had to do it at fifty-two. Neil had lamented, and Geyer had five children ranging from their teens to their twenties. It would be a far cry from the chaos of a scafe family Christmas, but I felt just as nervous at the prospect of meeting them as Neil had been of meeting my family. So if he was going to be this weird the entire time, it was going to be terribly inconvenient. If something were wrong, you'd tell me, wouldn't you? I asked, taking his hand in mine and squeezing it. He looked penitent at once. Yes, of course. I'm sorry. My mind was elsewhere. It has nothing to do with you. Let's go back to the car before we freeze. I pulled him along with me, still not sure what had caused his change in mood. I'm worried about Emma, he finally confessed, as I steered the car up the gravel drive to the road. She didn't sound like herself on the phone. She was too chipper to have just spent the day with horrible Michael's mother. I knew the reason behind Emma's forced cheerfulness, but I couldn't tell her father. She'd sworn me to secrecy when she'd confided that she and Michael were trying to conceive. Her concerns about her fertility had led her and Michael to begin trying for a baby shortly after they were engaged, but she didn't want her father to know about any of it. While I knew that the reason for Emma's emotional state was likely the arrival of yet another unwelcome menses, I couldn't tell him that. While gaslighting him was an option, are you sure you're not just projecting your feelings of missing Emma onto her mood? I really wanted to stick to the honesty thing we'd been working on. I know what's wrong with her. You do. But I can't tell you. Why ever not? It would drive him crazy, control freak that he was, to think I knew something about his daughter's life when he didn't. I shook my head and smiled. Because she asked me not to tell you, and she trusted me. So I'm not going to break her trust. She's going to tell you what's up after the wedding, but I promise it's nothing serious, nothing you can fix, and nothing you need to worry about. His mouth set in a grim line as he stared out the windshield, and I knew he wasn't as stoically accepting as he looked. His devious mind would be furiously calculating all the ways he could find out what I knew. And don't try to wheedle it out of me, I warned him. Emma's trust is extremely important to me. He sighed. You're right. I suppose I should be glad that the two of you get along so well now, even if it means you both get an opportunity to make me crazy. As I drove us back to the trailer where I'd grown up, Neil's mood improved greatly, and that was oddly touching. He trusted me enough to put his worries about his daughter, the single most important person in his life, aside at my reassurance. Home sweet home, I announced, as I navigated the rental car down the dirt two-track through the pines at the back of my grandma's property. The road widened into a clearing, and in the center sat the trailer I'd grown up in. I knew it was small, probably smaller than anything Neil had ever set foot in before. I didn't think he would love me any less, but I did wonder if he might view me differently when he saw the reality of how we'd lived. He was too good a person to make it affect his opinion of me negatively. It just wasn't how he operated. But I wondered if he would have some misplaced rich guy pity for me. I wasn't sure how I would feel about it if he did. It's a bit like a fairy tale cottage, isn't it? He mused, 
leaning toward the windshield to gaze up at the tall pines. This must have been an extraordinary place to play as a child. I frowned. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I'd had plenty of happy hours pretending to be Belle, rescuing the beast from wolves, or chasing imaginary white rabbits into imaginary holes. Yeah, it was, actually. I used to love our family vacations to Austria. The forests were spectacular for pretending to be soldiers or hunters, or bears. He smiled at the memory, and I had to admit, the idea was cute. I'd seen photos of him as a child, and he'd been absolutely adorable. He and his sister would have looked like Hansel and Gretel playing in the woods. Mom wasn't back yet, so I retrieved the house key from the mouth of the frog fountain in the unused birdbath and let us in. I flicked on the light. It's amazing how home always smells like home, no matter how long you've been away. Mom had made everything as neat as a pin. A stack of blankets, sheets, and pillows were on the sleeper sofa, waiting for us to make up our bed. Well, waiting for Sophie and the young twenty-something Neil Mom had pictured, I had no illusions about how the night would go when she got back. This is pretty much it, I said as Neil stepped in behind me, carrying our bag. I took it from him and put it down in the space between the end of the couch and the entertainment center. Then I shrugged off my coat and gestured around. Through there is the kitchen, beyond that is the dining room, over that way is the bathroom and my old bedroom, but that's my mom's now. You and your mother shared a bedroom when you were growing up. He sounded shocked at the idea. Nope, I shrugged. Mom slept on the couch out here, and I got the bedroom. She's probably still got my posters up if you want to see how embarrassing my life truly was. He took off his coat and laid it over the arm of my mom's lazy boy. I don't think it looks embarrassing at all. You were clearly raised by a very loving, if loud, protective family. You had a comfortable home, a caring parent, and you grew up to be a woman I love very much. Aw. I stepped into his arms and hugged him hard. His chest was so firm and warm under my wind-burned cheek, I tilted my head up to kiss him. But first, I said, my family is loud. I could barely understand anything they were saying, with all the background noise. He made a disgusted sound, but not at my family. I'd heard that huffy exhalation before. I feel ancient. You're not ancient. Chemotherapy can damage your hearing, you know that, I said, reaching up to touch his face. I cupped his jaw with my hand and he leaned his cheek against my palm. Besides, I kind of like being able to mutter under my breath without you hearing. What was that? he asked, widening his eyes and leaning slightly forward so that I would take the bait. And because I'm too nice and trustworthy a person... I began repeating what I'd said before. He grinned. I realized the joke, and I smacked his chest. How do you manage to fall for that every single time? He laughed. I was trying to console you. I rose on my tiptoes, and he bent his head to kiss me. I'd meant to give him a brief peck, but what I ended up getting was a thorough tongue-fucking that made me lose my balance and lean against him. His hand slipped down my back over my ass, and he lifted his head and cursed softly. I opened my eyes to see the illumination of approaching headlights skating over the faux wood paneling. Mom's home, I said with a resigned sigh. The point of coming here was for you to see your mother, and now you're trying to avoid her. He stepped back and ran a hand through his hair. Do I look like I was just ravishing you? No, you're fine, except wipe my lipstick off your mouth. I brushed my thumb over the smudge of Mac pre raphaelite that stained his lower lip. The door opened and Mom stepped in, faked normal at the sight of our close proximity, and held out a huge Tupperware bowl. Neil stepped over quickly to take it from her. Potato salad, she said, as she handed it to him. I think that's the wrong color on you, Neil. His blush was kind of cute. Do you need us to bring anything in from the car? I asked, 
as she slipped off her coat and hung it on the pegged shelf beside the door. Nothing that can't keep until morning, Mom pushed her sleeves back. I want to get some quality time in with my daughter, if that's okay. This time when she hugged me, it wasn't a stiff-armed, suspicious hug. She was also faintly alcohol-scented, so I was so glad she'd been driving. When she stepped back, she called to Neil, who was trying in vain to find room for the giant Tupperware bowl in the tiny galley kitchen to ask, Are you hungry, Neil? Do you need something to eat? No, thank you, no. Still quite stuffed from this afternoon. Mom smirked at me and mouthed, Quite. I mouthed back, Stop. I wasn't sure what I wanted her to stop doing, but I had this horrible feeling that what I'd meant was, Stop finding my boyfriend cute. How about drinks, then? Mom suggested. Neil, put that down. I'll find a place for it in the fridge. What are you having? Oh, um, he stepped into the living room and let Mom pass. The kitchen of a single wide trailer was really a one-person show. What do you have in the way of scotch? I don't know about scotch, but I have a fifth of wild turkey, Mom offered. The bottles in the refrigerator door tinkled, and I heard stuff moving on the shelves. And I've got some Jack. Neil looked like my mother had just asked him if he wanted to drink gasoline, but he managed to choke out, I, I think Jack Daniels would be fine. Rocks? He nodded, then remembering she couldn't see him said, Yes, if it isn't too much trouble. Have a seat before you fall down, I murmured, steering him toward the couch. His sudden case of nerves was a combination, I thought, of his claustrophobia in the small trailer and the realization that we were all alone with my mother. It was only five o'clock and she had plenty of time to ask us whatever she wanted. When I'd first met Neil's daughter, Emma, it had not been under the best of circumstances. She'd come home unexpectedly and overheard her father and I having headboard slamming, obscenity shouting sex. I'd felt so super awkward around her for the longest time after that, so I couldn't help but feel that Neil's discomfort around my mother was a little bit of life balancing the scales. Thank you for letting me stay in your home, he said, trying again to break the ice. It's no trouble at all, Mom replied, coming into the room with a glass of Jack over ice for Neil. You let my daughter stay with you for what? Has it been a year already? It's less stain with and more I live there now, I corrected her. Do you want anything, Soph? She asked, smoothly ignoring me. I have Snow Creek Berry. Ooh, I haven't had that in so long. I even clapped my hands a little at the thought of some good old-fashioned cheap-as-hell Boone's Farm. It's going to give me a wicked headache. When Mom came back, she had two plastic tumblers of the gas station wine and handed one to me. Okay, so, Neil, you're dating my daughter, and I know practically nothing about you. Yes, Sophie informed me on the drive here from Marquette that you had no idea the boyfriend you were going to meet was twenty-four years older than you were expecting. I wasn't quite thrilled at that surprise myself. He looked to me with a lifted eyebrow, and I pointedly canted my eyes away as I sipped my drink. Well, tell me about yourself. I know you're British, and I know you have family in Iceland, and you have a daughter I just found out about today, so you're... I take it you're divorced? Mom sipped from her cup. Yes, but not from Emma's mother. Emma was a happy accident with my girlfriend from university. We never married. He grimaced at the taste of the whiskey and was totally unsuccessful at hiding it. I had just gotten divorced when Sophie and I reconnected. Oh, fuck you, Neil. He knew that casual reconnected was going to open a can of worms I wasn't interested in digging into. You two have known each other for a while, then. Mom looked to me and so did Neil. Okay, I get it. This is my punishment for secret keeping. I took a gulp of my Snow Creek berry. I met Neil seven years ago at the Los Angeles International Airport. 
Mom blinked. Seven years ago you were here, and then you were in New York when you left for college. She made a slight detour. Neil said quietly. I was heading to Japan. When Mom still didn't look like she was getting it, I added, I was running away. You were going to run away to Japan? And you never told me? Mom shrieked, leaning forward so fast the lazy boy creaked. I didn't make it to Tokyo. My flight was delayed. We spent the night together and Neil stole my boarding pass. I had no other choice but to go to New York. I shrugged off Mom's look of horror at my open admission of teenage sex having. She told me she was twenty-five, he said uncomfortably. And I didn't strand her when I took her boarding pass. I left her four thousand dollars. Ah, so you had sex with my eighteen-year-old daughter and left her four thousand dollars on the nightstand? The question hung in the air like the worst balloon since the Hindenburg, and I held my breath. Neil didn't apologize, not for sleeping with me, not for stealing my ticket, not for any of it. It was the only way I could think of to prevent her from going to Tokyo and throwing away her chance at college, or her chance at an advanced degree, since she told me she was going for her master's. There was no ammo there for my mom to strike back with. If he hadn't intercepted me at LAX, I would have run away to Tokyo. She was backed into a corner. She chose to go for the aerial attack, dive-bombing him with, So, this was while you were married? I lunged into the fray again. Neil wasn't married when we first met. After our one-night stand, he went on and met someone else. Then six years later he got divorced and I was her boss. He wasn't going to let me tiptoe around that, either. I took over for Gabriella Winters, briefly when my company bought Port Terrace, and the magazine needed restructuring. But Sophie was fired from Port Terrace. I saw the pieces click together in Mom's mind, in the completely wrong way. Did you fire Sophie so you could date her? No, we were a bit unprofessional, I'm afraid. We had something of a secret office romance for a few months, and then a situation arose in which I had no choice but to terminate her, he said, taking another sip from his glass. He really did have to do it, I assured her. I was in the wrong, and it would have been impossible for me to continue working at Port Terrace after what I did. Do I even want— Mom stopped herself. No, never mind. I don't need to know. It all worked out, I reminded her. Hello? Soon-to-be-published author at twenty-five? That reminds me. How did the interview go? Mom's mode shifted from interrogation to genuine caring and curiosity. I know a part of her excitement about my audition for Wake Up America was the fun she would have going back to work and telling everyone about her daughter on TV. It went really well. I was pretty sure it had. Everyone in the room had seemed enthusiastic about my ideas for possible segments, and my on-camera audition had been amazing. I guess I look great on TV, so if it doesn't work out, I could always be an anchor or something. You do have a degree in journalism, Mom said in her always look on the bright side voice. So, Rebecca, Neil began, reaching over to take my hand and squeeze it. He knew how nervous I still was about the audition, and the brief touch was welcome, as was his proposed change of subject. Tell me about yourself. Sophie told me you work at the hospital. I'm a monitor tech. I've been there since Sophie was knee-high to a grasshopper, she said with a fond smile at me. Sophie is the first person in our family to go to college. I must congratulate you on raising such a wonderful woman. Neil sipped his whiskey. And thank you as well. It must not have been easy doing it on your own. Neil's a single parent, too. I was pleased to land on a subject where they had something in common. A single father who had nannies in only part-time custody, he reminded me. I know Sophie's father wasn't in the picture. It must have been very difficult. It was, but it was worth it, Mom said. 
I kind of like this kid. Calling me a kid in front of Neil was going to bring up all sorts of pseudo-incest, creep-out issues he still wasn't quite over. But he didn't voice those now. Sophie has told me about her father and that he left. Has he ever tried to contact you or— No, no, he saw her a few times, but I think the last time was her first birthday. He was a kid named Joey Tangen, off the res down in Bearaga. We met at a party and fooled around. That's about all there is to that story. Mom shrugged and took another sip of her Boone's farm. Have you seen him since? Neil asked me. I told him only the very basic facts about my missing dad. That he'd been sixteen when I was born. Like my mom. That I had three photographs of him. And that my lifelong issues with abandonment probably stemmed back to Joey Tangen, absentee father. I shrugged. No, I don't care to either. Wherever he is, he's ancient history, Mom agreed. I hated talking about my bio dad in front of Neil. There would always be some small sad part of me that was truly embarrassed that my father had been able to walk away from me. So when the subject switched again, Mom asked Neil about his job. I was relieved. We sat around drinking and talking, I never really got a sense of what Mom thought of Neil. I knew she wasn't happy that I was dating him. If her little freak out at the house hadn't clued me in, her super polite and interested faces during our conversation would have. But she didn't seem like she was ready to poison him. So I guess I could thank God for small miracles. I filled Mom in on what was happening in my best friend Holly's life. Holly was currently dating Deja assistant to Rudy Ainsworth, managing editor of Porteris, and Neil's best friend. She actually worked for Neil, I said, deferring to him. Oh? Mom loved Holly, and already I could see all the ways she was deciding that Deja wasn't good enough for her. What do you think of her? Is she a good girl? Is she going to treat Holly nice? Uh, I believe so. After three rocks glasses of Jack Daniels, his cute little drunk frown was starting to show up more often. She was a good assistant, and very discreet, when she found out what was happening between Sophie and myself, which I appreciated very much. She is just like a grown-up version of Holly. You're going to love her, I assured Mom. Holly is twenty-five years old, Neil said with a chuckle. I think Holly is the grown-up version of Holly at this point. Well, ladies and gents, I think it's time for me to mosey off to bed. Mom pulled the handle on the recliner to lower the footrest and got up, weaving just slightly. She stopped and pointed at both of us. This is a trailer. The walls are thin. No hanky-panky. Yes, well, I'll try to restrain myself amid the romance of sleeping on a sofa bed in the living room of my girlfriend's mother's home. Neil said dryly. Mom just drunkenly pointed again and staggered off to her room. I'll show you where the bathroom is. You can take your contacts out while I make up the bed, I said with a laugh, and I grabbed Neil's hands to pull him off the couch. I just unfolded the bed and was tucking in the final corner of the fitted sheet when he came back in a t-shirt and plaid cotton sleep pants. He picked up a pillow and tossed it to the head of the bed. You know... It occurs to me that I have never once in my life slept on a sofa bed. What? That just seemed absurd. In college, I slept on a lot of sofas, but no sofa beds. This is a new experience for me. He looked pleased at that, so I had to laugh. Well, you did take me to London and Paris, and you flew me around in your fancy jet, and bought me ridiculous amounts of jewelry, so... I thought it was time to return the favor, I said with a mock sigh. Nothing but the best for my boyfriend. Well, if we're opening up to new experiences, I'll get into bed and you can turn off the lights for a change, he laughed. We were lying in the dark for all of two minutes before the shine of the new experience wore off. There was a very sharp bar digging into my back, Neil groaned. I lifted my head. Why don't you move then? Well, I can't bloody well move, can I? 
One creak from this rusty death trap, and your mother will think I'm out here mounting you. But he flopped over onto his stomach anyway, while I muffled my giggles into my pillow. This feels so weird, I whispered, nudging his elbow. I feel like I'm doing something bad, having a boyfriend over. I only ever did that once, when my mom was working a night shift. I was terrified she would come home and find me and the guy together, but that made it kind of hot. If you're feeling nostalgic, I can clumsily finger you while talking about my band. He mumbled into his pillow. Who told you about AJ? I squeaked in amused outrage. Your Aunt Marie was more than willing to humiliate you behind your back while you were in the bathroom. He hooked his ankle over mine. Happy Christmas, Sophie. I leaned over for a kiss. Merry Christmas, sir. Chapter Three After the weirdness of our first night in town, our visit was surprisingly stress-free. I showed Neil around what small amount of town there was, and we borrowed Mom's snowmobile so I could take him out on the trails. It felt good to be home, and somewhat back to normal after my long year in London. On our last day at Mom's, we woke to the sound of aggressive scrambled egg-making. I lifted my head from Neil's back and squinted through the split wall of the kitchen. Mom? What are you doing? I'm making breakfast! Though the hands on my old Hello Kitty wall clock said it was only 7.30, Mom already wore a full face of makeup. She never let strangers see her sans eyeliner, and she'd even made me sneak lipstick into the recovery room after her gallbladder surgery. I rubbed my eye, definitely not perfectly lined and beautifully mascaraed, and sat up. Neil stirred beside me, blinking, and said, For a moment, I forgot where I was. You're at the North Pole, judging by the weather report. Mom said. Sorry to wake you up so early, but I thought you might want to get on the road before the snow comes. Snow? Neil reached for his glasses on the end table and slipped them on. I hope we can still fly out this evening. We're supposed to get a foot of snow between three and ten tonight, Mom said, turning to flip bacon in the pan. Perhaps I should call and ask for a revised flight plan? Neil asked apologetically. I don't wish to tear you away from your family, but we don't want to get snowed in either, I finished for him. I totally understand. Here. Mom tossed Neil the cordless handset, and he fumbled to catch it. Our cell phone reception was spotty up here. You can use my bedroom. Thank you. He got up and moved cautiously through the furniture that had been rearranged to accommodate the sofa bed, when he was out of the room, Mom said in a low voice, He doesn't want to get snowed in here with your mother. Well, would you find the arrangement very comfortable? You guys would have alcohol poisoning in no time. I swung my legs over the side of the bed and began stripping the linens. So, we needed something to loosen us up in the evenings. You put us both in a hell of a situation, Sophie. Mom pulled bacon out of the pan and dabbed at it with a paper towel. This is the microwave all over again. Once when I was a kid, I'd accidentally set my grandmother's microwave on fire when I used an old plastic cup to make hot chocolate. I had very calmly gone into the living room, sat down, and waited a full minute and a ruined microwave before I'd gotten the courage to casually tell her, The kitchen's on fire. Mom was right. This was exactly like that situation, only on a much weirder scale. The truth was, I'd always had a problem telling people things I should have let them know. I'd done it before with Neil when I'd found out someone was sabotaging poor Terrace. I knew I had to stop doing it. Does it help if I tell you I'm in therapy right now to get over that very issue? She gave me her I-don't-have-time-for-your-bullshit look. Seriously. Neil and I almost broke up over this kind of thing. I'm working on myself. This is the last time it's going to happen. I scrolled through my mental inventory in a panic. Was there anything else I hadn't told her? Neil came back, and Mom exchanged the phone for a mug of coffee, which he accepted gratefully. He took a sip. Brent is going to call me back with an answer within the hour. 
So you're all going to Norway? Mom asked over the screeching of the sofa bed frame as I folded it away. Iceland, Neil corrected her. Reykjavik, or about forty minutes outside. My brother Runolf has a compound on a small private lake. I haven't seen my brothers in, oh, five years now. Mom laughed and clicked off the stove burners. Sounds like you and Sophie have a lot in common. I haven't seen her in a year. I ignored her comment as I folded down the dinette table from the wall and retrieved the folding chairs that went with it. I do apologize for that. We'll have to have you in New York sometime, Neil said over the rim of his coffee mug. Sophie and I are looking for a house at the moment. I cringed inwardly. How had I forgotten to mention that? Mom looked from him to me, exhaling the vapor from her e-cigarette. Sounds serious. Neil took a swallow of coffee. I consider it so. I reached across the pass-through for the plate of bacon Mom held out. So do I. We just went through a lot together this last year. You two seem very happy. Mom brought the scrambled eggs to the table and sat down. I'm not going to say I'm thrilled with this, because I'm not. But we're all adults here, and it's not my place to tell the two of you what to do. So I'm just going to be grateful that my daughter found someone who loves her and makes her happy. I'm glad. Neil smiled, and it was the first genuine smile I'd seen out of him since my confession in the car on the drive up. Because Sophie is one of the best parts of my life. Mom sighed and unnecessarily stubbed her e-cigarette on the tabletop out of habit. Just see that you get her out here to see us more than once a year? Our changed flight plan meant we had to leave my mom's house by nine, so in a flurry of hugs and promising to visit again, as well as an awkward handshake for Neil, we were tearing our way down Highway 41 to Marquette. It was the first time I'd truly appreciated how good he was at driving. I don't know why it would surprise me since he owned a car magazine. I'd been absolutely astonished when he'd taken me to his garage at a private track an hour outside of London and shown me the fleet of exotic cars he'd amassed over the years. We arrived at the tiny airport just as the pilot was finishing up his pre-flight checks. As we walked up the stairway to the jet, Neil's hand fell to my butt, and he gave me a quick squeeze. Oh, so it was like that. It occurs to me he murmured against my ear, that you've never officially entered the Mile High Club. You're right, I said with mock surprise. I was well aware of the opportunities we'd missed. Emma had traveled to New York with us on the flight from London. New York to Marquette had been riddled with turbulence, and the pilot had advised us to stay seated the entire time. Not that creative things hadn't been done under a blanket— We'd fooled around the first time I'd flown on his jet, but we'd never gotten a chance to go all the way. Are we going to be rectifying that on this flight? I asked, as I stepped inside. Neil ducked through the door behind me. Well, let me think. New York to Reykjavik is about six hours. Add on five from Marquette, and with the weather conditions. He paused thoughtfully. Do you think it will give us enough time? Oh, shut up, I said with a laugh. Our flight attendant, Mickey, was a very polished professional man who appeared to be in his early forties. He took our coats and informed us that we'd made a good call on switching our travel plans. They are supposed to be getting slammed with snow today. So we heard, Neil told him, dropping into one of the seats to unlace his boots. Please tell me that the catering company came through— I'd hate to spend ten hours in the air without anything to eat or drink. Everything is on board. Do you have a particular time you'd like the food prepared, or— No, no, Neil shook his head. We'll let you know. For the most part, we prefer to fly undisturbed. I understand you perfectly, Mickey agreed, and disappeared into the forward galley. I raised an eyebrow at Neil. He understands you perfectly? which means he's used to people getting nasty in midair. That is exactly what that meant. 
Neil kicked his boots off and slumped down in his seat. The jet was set up with three rows of two across seats, like a regular plane. Two flat-screen monitors were installed so we could watch movies or check our flight's progress by GPS. And to the rear of the compartment was a small hospitality station. A pocket door led to a compartment with more seats and a dining area that converted to a bed for overnight flights. The jet was beautiful and comfortable, but practical. Neil didn't even keep a full-time flight crew but hired them when necessary. I took the seat next to him and buckled up, while the flight attendant closed the door. Well, I think our visit could have gone worse. Yes, if you had waited until we were at the door to let me know what I was walking into, it would have gone much worse, he said wryly. He took my hand and kissed it to let me know he wasn't as mad at me as he had been. You know, your mother's house is terribly small. I know. It helped me adjust to dorm life in New York apartments. I snickered at my own joke. I'd been weirdly proud of my trailer-bound childhood when I'd first moved to the city. You think this is bad? I'd say when Holly complained about our dinky NYU dorm. You should have seen my room back home. Would she... He hesitated, and I knew what was coming. Would she be terribly offended if we gave her money to build a house? Neil, we have a lot going on right now. We're buying a house. You're paying for Emma's wedding, at, like, the least cheap venue I can think of. Emma had decided to get married at the Museum of Natural History in New York City, and as the wedding planning had gone forward, the totals had shocked me. Emma's mother, Valerie, had offered to go halvesies, but she was navigating a messy financial split from her longtime partner, and Neil had insisted on covering three-quarters of the total to reduce her cost. No, the least cheap venue was Lake Bloody Bracciano, he muttered. His ex-wife had insisted on marrying in Italy. I wondered if his bad marriage to Elizabeth had soured him on tying the knot forever. If that were the case was fine by me. I could live happily without ever getting married. Okay, maybe I was sour grapesin a little. I had just said no major life changes, but we hadn't even discussed marriage since the last time he'd brought it up during his chemotherapy. He wanted to buy a house with me, so I knew he considered us long-term, if not permanent. But with all the talk of Emma's wedding, I'd begun to wonder why my traditional, sometimes infuriatingly so, boyfriend— hadn't mentioned the possibility of one for us. Don't buy Mom a house, at least not right now, I told him, getting back to the original discussion. She has a lot of pride and she doesn't like you very much. Fair enough. It wouldn't be the last time the subject came up, I knew. Neil hated running into problems he couldn't throw money at. We fastened our belts for takeoff, and once we were safely in the air and had the all clear, we unbuckled and headed to the rear compartment. No bed? I asked, trailing my fingers over the tabletop between the two rows of inward-facing seats. I don't think we need one yet, Neil said, unbuttoning the sleeves of his chambray shirt to roll them back. It struck me that he was dressed pretty much the way he had been the day we'd met, except that beneath the open outer shirt— his T-shirt sported the red, white, and blue Target logo of The Who. That day at the airport seven years ago, he'd had on a David Bowie tour shirt. I wondered if he always equated classic rock acts of the 70s with air travel. I have a game in mind, he continued, sliding the pocket door closed. There was a little latch on it, and he flicked it down. Are you interested? Always. Then get naked and get your ass on that table. Yes, sir. As I readily complied with his order, he took something out of a seat pocket, a deck of cards. So it really was a game. Is something funny? He asked, a delicious hint of warning in his tone, as he slid smoothly into his role as my dom. I shook my head. No, sir, just anticipation. If you enjoy anticipation... Then you'll very much enjoy this game. He slid the cards from their box and shuffled them between his big hands. He waited until I was completely naked and sitting primly on the edge of the table. Then he said, 
Slide back, bring your knees up, and spread them. If you'd put your heels on the corners of the table, that would be ideal. But then I'll be wide open, sir, I teased, slowly pushing back and lifting my feet up to rest where he'd indicated. There was such a naughty thrill at being completely naked in a situation where people normally weren't naked. I mean, I'd never seen anyone so exposed on an intercontinental flight before. Maybe I'd been on the wrong planes. While I explain the rules, I'd like you to stroke your clitoris. One finger only, no penetration, he added sternly. I slipped my middle finger into my mouth and held his gaze as I sucked it down to the knuckle. When I pulled it out, it shined with my saliva, and I reached between my legs to do as he'd instructed. He pulled a card from the deck and held it up. It was a seven of clubs. Clubs. Denial. I took a shaky breath. We'd played games with my orgasms before. It was the best and worst activity. He plucked another card from the center of the deck, glanced at it, put it back, and pulled another. Ace of spades. Spades. Ruined. Ruined orgasms were the worst, but they made every one that came after them so much more intense, because it took longer to get there. Sir? I asked. Do the number values on the cards have any bearing, or are we just going by the suits? He considered a moment. Which would you prefer? I thought about how frustrating a ten of spades would be and decided, let's just go with the suits. Numbers for another time, perhaps? He suggested with a lascivious smirk. He pulled another card. Diamonds. Mean I can come? The hot flush of arousal that pulsed between my legs intensified at the word. Mean I get to decide the action. He stepped between my legs and traced the edge of the card from my ankle to my knee. I'll give you a command, and you'll obey. That sounds like just another day at the office, I challenged him. He moved the edge of the card down the slope of my thigh, over my hip, and stomach, between my breasts up to my throat. He dropped the card and gripped my jaw, the rough touch sending darts of desire through me. Do you want a spanking? I lifted my leg and rubbed my toes across the front of his jeans. Always. He grinned down at me and leaned in for a languid kiss. I savored his mouth on mine, darted my tongue along his lower lip. His beard pricked my chin, and I rubbed my cheek against his. He released my face and sank his fingers into the hair at my nape. I rolled my clit in slow circles while he kissed me. The shocks of desire there echoed by the delicious tingling in my lips and tongue. My leg caught between us as he pressed me down. When he pulled back, I flexed my foot, feeling the thickness of his erection through his jeans. With a maddening half-smile, he picked the cards up again and shuffled them, then withdrew one. Hearts mean you're allowed to orgasm. Do you understand the rules of the game? I nodded my breathing increasing in tempo to match my rising desire. I understand, sir. He put the cards down on the table between my legs and drew one from the top, a heart. I thought he would be disappointed that his game had so quickly rewarded me. If he was, I saw no sign of it as he brushed my hand away from my mound and spread my labia to expose my engorged, throbbing clit. He pinched it between his thumb and forefinger and dropped to his knees to give me a slow lick. I groaned and leaned on my elbows, letting my head fall back. My hair hung loose, brushing my shoulders, and I sighed happily as Neil's lips closed over me. He alternated rolling my clit between his fingers and lapping and sucking at it with his tongue. I squirmed against his mouth. After a year together, he knew everywhere I needed to be touched. He could get me off almost as fast as I could get myself off, which made sense, since he'd studied me doing it enough. I whimpered at the intensity that built without faltering, and mindful that we weren't alone on the plane, I breathed deeply through my nose to keep from moaning.
His facial hair chafed my thighs and labia in the best possible way. He slipped a finger into me and I clutched on him, rocking my hips against his face. He found my G-spot like he'd grown up in the neighborhood, and my hands curled on the polished wood tabletop. My calves cramped and my knees hugged his head. I managed to subdue myself to a low groan as I climaxed. He withdrew his finger, but kept the other hand busy on my overstimulated clit as I panted and tried to wriggle away. He took another card and held it up, and my brain registered that it was a spade, even as I climbed toward a second orgasm, one I would be cruelly denied at the last possible second. Neil had ruining an orgasm down to a science. My pussy clenched, the sharp edge of pleasure twisting tighter and tighter, and just when I thought I would come, just when I desperately wanted it, he pulled his hand away. No, don't, I begged, but I didn't say red, the word I used when I really wanted to stop, so he didn't give in. He laughed low and said, Oh, Sophie, begging for mercy, have we met? I ground my teeth together as he reached between my legs and rubbed me with the tips of his fingers. It was like I'd already had an orgasm, though I hadn't felt it. When are you going to draw another fucking card? That earned me a quick, sharp slap to my vulva, and I hissed at the pain. Talk to me like that again, and you'll get worse, he warned, and my body throbbed in response. It was almost worth it to sass him again, just to see what worse meant. He drew another card, and this time it was a diamond. He got to pick the next action, though I had an idea what it would be. Lie on your back, and your head over the table. I smiled to myself and did as he ordered, reversing my position and leaning back so that the base of my skull tipped over the edge of the tabletop. I spread my legs wide and planted my feet on the seats on either side. Unbuckling his belt, he stepped up close. I suppressed a giggle as he pulled his erection free and tapped the massive head of it against my lips. I'd been right. I had known what he wanted. I opened up and took him in, undulating my tongue against the top of his shaft and relaxing my throat as the head of him passed my gag reflex. He growled appreciatively, his hands bracketing my stretched neck. Touch yourself while I'm fucking your throat. Well, when my sir commands. I'd never tried any drug, any drink, any experience that made me feel the way sexual submission to Neil made me feel. Every sight, scent, taste, texture was like gasoline on my already burning body. The hard, cool tabletop against my back was a caress, the familiar smell of his skin a potent aphrodisiac. I wanted to please him above all else, and I knew that in pleasing him I would have pleasure myself. So even though the flesh between my legs ached and touching my clit was like brushing against an electrical current, I did as he ordered. Slowly he withdrew, and a flood of my saliva sputtered out around his cock. He groaned and pushed back in, and I half gagged, half moaned as I got closer and closer to the edge of another orgasm. I needed this one. I was miserably turned on and still disappointed from having my release spoiled before. When I could breathe, I whimpered high-pitched mules around his cock. The building shock of my anticipation locked my legs rigidly against the table. Oh no, Sophie, you won't like this one. My heart dropped to my stomach. I sped my fingers, but he grabbed my wrists. It was his dumb luck that he got my hands away from my body just as I reached the peak, and though I humped frantically at the air, there was nothing, no extra little nudge, that could bring me over the edge. My muscles ached from straining up, straining against his hold, and a tear leaked from the corner of my eye. I tried to beg him, but my words didn't make it past the thick column of his cock, and I sputtered and gagged. He pulled out gently, and brushed a tear from my cheek. Where are we, Sophie? I sniffled and tried to ignore my aching clit. 
What he was doing to me was torture, and I loved every demented moment of it. There was no way in hell I was stopping. We're still green, sir. He tucked himself away and drew another card. He looked at it, frowned, and flipped it over between his fingers to show me the image on the reverse. What does the Joker do? I asked, mesmerized by the ends of my hair brushing the tops of his bare feet. We never set a value on the Joker, he said with a note of dismay. I suppose I'll have to think of something. He gave me a hand to pull me up and held me for a moment while I regained my equilibrium. Then he scooped his arms beneath me and lifted me from the table, setting me on my feet in the aisle. Bend at the waist, he ordered, and I did, gasping when his hand closed on my upper arm, just above my elbow, bent far over with no way of balancing myself. I had to trust him not to let me fall face forward onto the floor. The parting of his zipper's metal teeth seemed incongruously loud in the low hum of recirculating air. It was always like this when I submitted to him. My senses heightened in strange, intoxicating ways. The tip of him brushed over my opening and I moaned. For the first two years of our relationship, we had used condoms all but once, and the odds had not been in our favor. After I'd had the abortion, We'd been diligent about condoms, but since the high-dose chemotherapy Neil had undergone had most likely killed any chance of us ever conceiving again, we'd decided it would probably be safe just to rely on my newly installed IUD. Though we'd been going bareback for about a month, after my gyno had assured me that the IUD was way more idiot-proof than the pills I'd messed up, I was still reveling the newness of it. Before Neil... I'd never had condomless sex, and it was incredible to me how different it felt. Not necessarily better, just different. He pushed into me, all hot and hard and rough, and I gasped. He's a big guy and not gentle with me when we played like this. Though I was incredibly wet and my whole body trembled with need, my cunt opened reluctantly around him on that first deep thrust, he gripped my other arm as he withdrew, and the slow glide of his foreskin as it rolled with his motion made my eyes flutter closed. Then, without mercy, he rammed into me again, holding me captive at the point of the greatest pain, and my tortured nerve ending sang out in pure joy. A sob of mingled agony and pleasure tore from my throat. There was nowhere to move— no option but to let him fuck me as he held me immobile. He released one of my arms, but when I reached back to touch him, he slapped my hand. If you want to touch anyone, touch yourself. His fingers sank into my hair, and he jerked my head back, adding a growled, Slut, to the end of his sentence. That forbidden word did something to me every time he used it, my pussy contracted along his length as he pounded me, every hard thrust bringing a louder and louder exclamation from me, until he had to let go of my hair to clamp his hand over my mouth. Do you like this cock, Sophie? he asked, and I mumbled my affirmative against his palm as he stilled inside me. Then I suggest you keep it down, or I'll take it away. Do you understand? I nodded my eyes squeezing shut. The last thing I wanted was to be punished in that way. Once he was inside me, I lost all sense of reason. I used to really push it with him. I'd thought that when he threatened to stop fucking me, he would eventually have to give in, until he'd stopped during one of our play sessions to teach me a lesson about being a bratty sub. And despite the superb emotional and physical aftercare he'd given me, he hadn't fucked me again that night, so I knew he was talking serious business. After our first year together, Neil had gotten more confident of my ability to know my own limits. He took me at my word, or lack of safe word, that I was okay, and I was discovering that he had a little bit of a sadist in him. While he'd always been slightly amused by the way I got off on pain, nowadays he seemed to get off more on causing it, 
like there had been some part of him he'd held back from me until he knew I not only could take it, but that I truly wanted it. Oh, man, I wanted it. He slammed too deep, and I bit my lips to hold back my cry of pain. He did it again and again, and I broke, wailing, unable to control my response as the pressure inside me burst. My pussy clenched and gushed, wetness pouring down my thighs. Neil's hand still clamped over my mouth. His fingers dug into my arm so hard, I was sure they would leave a mark. But I couldn't hold myself up at the moment anyway, and I needed him to keep me upright. He buried himself in me with a feral growl, his cock jerking in my sopping cunt. Fuck! I panted when he released my mouth. He slipped from me, and I staggered forward, wobbling on my feet. Okay, I just had a thought. What? He slumped into one of the seats, his eyes squeezed shut as he struggled to catch his breath. We can't exactly go roll into your brother's house for family Christmas, smelling like sex, can we? He looked up at me, then down at his jeans, which were liberally smeared with my gushing orgasm. Then he laughed reached up, and pulled me into his lap. Chapter 4 We cleaned ourselves up as well as one can in an airplane bathroom and settled in for the rest of the long flight. After we ate a quick dinner, Neil surprised me with a vegan version of the ubiquitous Upper Peninsula pasties. The flight attendant assembled the berths so I could nap. Neil stayed up, claiming he intended to read, but I knew he would be working. Even going through chemotherapy, the man hadn't been able to keep himself away from his job, and now that he was planning to go back to work, he seemed determined to sneak in the odd five hours here and there working from home. The most adorable part of this delusion that his companies couldn't run without him was the fact that he thought he was hiding it from me. I slept longer than I'd expected, something I found myself doing more and more after intense sex. Though Neil always took care of me after we played hard, I felt less of an obligation to be on the way I had earlier in our relationship. My need to sack out post-sex worked for Neil, as he found he needed some alone time to decompress afterwards, too. He woke me for our landing, and I buckled in and snuggled up beside him in the forward compartment. Reykjavik was absolutely nothing like I'd expected. I'd been picturing something like Paris, with old stone buildings standing majestically side by side with newer architecture. Instead, the plain windows had revealed a milk carton town from a second grader school project. The bright colors of the houses stood in contrast to the blank white canvas of snow. The place reminded me more of my small UP town than a major city. No matter their disparate sizes, I fell immediately in love. After we landed, a customs official boarded the jet to ask us questions and stamp our passports. We deplaned, and I got my first breath of the cold air. Everything smells like the sea, I said, still all dreamy and swoony from our mid-air activities. What time is it? Neil checked his watch and did a quick mental calculation. With businesses that spanned continents, he had to be sharp about time zones. But that was a magic that completely eluded me. 3.16 in the morning. And what time were we supposed to get here? Two o'clock in the afternoon. He brightened up. You'll get to see the house fast. Neil's home in Reykjavik was a hip-looking three-story building of gray concrete and glass. The roof slanted like the top of a parallelogram, and plate windows of uniform size and shape dotted the exterior in a seemingly random pattern. The house had already been opened, a phrase I was getting used to. Before we arrived at any of his residences, Neil's people would give the house a good cleaning and airing out, run the taps, and stock the kitchen and other supplies. When we stepped through the front door, a gleaming black vase crowded with bright orange poppies greeted us on the glass and steel table in the entryway. That was another thing I'd noticed about Neil in the past year. Everywhere we went, there were fresh flowers. At first, I'd assumed it was a holdover from Elizabeth, but I was starting to suspect otherwise, especially when he said, 
ooh, poppies, in the same way some people would say, ooh, birthday cake. This place is spectacular, I said, in a reverent hush, as I looked up and up, all the way to the ceiling of the third story. In front of us, to my right, stood a freestanding staircase with a glass panel half wall topped with a brushed steel railing. Open-backed concrete steps rose in a precise line to the second story. Another set reached from the left of the second floor to the third, and both of the upper floors were open lofts with glass partitions. From the foyer I could see a small grouping of a rust-colored couch and two matching armchairs on the second level. Thank you. I quite like it, he agreed with me. Let me take your bag upstairs. By yourself? I scoffed. Hell no, I need to see what this place looks like. Don't become too attached, he warned as we made our way up the truly freaky and vertigo-inducing staircase. I don't spend much time here. I've almost sold it a dozen times. Don't you dare. My eyes boggled as the living room at the top of the stairs was revealed. A huge, sinfully plush white rug covered the dark, polished concrete. The rust-colored sofa and chairs surrounded a low-glass coffee table. The flat-screen television on the wall was easily over seventy inches, but I couldn't imagine anyone actually watching it when a wall of two-story plate glass displayed a truly dazzling view of the bay and the snow-capped mountains beyond. A sliver of the city stretched off the right, and a blanket of white turned every street lamp, tail light, and illuminated sign into a hazy sort of fairy glow. He was right. The light was different here. A short hall led off past the second staircase. The walls painted a lovely deep reddish orange. Down there are a bathroom and some guest bedrooms. I hardly ever use them, now that Emma doesn't stay with me as often, Neil said, as we started up the next flight. I've thought of turning them into a fitness room. Running outdoors here can be quite brisk in the winter. And you're probably ten times more likely to bust your ass here, too. Though I didn't notice a huge difference in temperature between Calumet and Reykjavik, the cold was different— seemed predatory and hostile, because it affected the pavement and sidewalks differently than I was used to. I'd nearly slipped a dozen times just walking from the car to the front door. Why not turn it into a kinky sex room? I suggested, and he laughed. Do we need a kinky sex room? I thought we made the most of our environs just a few hours ago. He reached for a switch and flipped it on, and the upper floor flooded with light. The bedroom was on a wide bridge of the same polished concrete as the floors below. The glass partition railings gave an unobstructed view of the water and mountains on one side, and on the other tall windows at the top of the open foyer displayed more dazzling city lights. The enormous bed had no head or footboards, and was made up with crisp white sheets and a black duvet. Two sleek black nightstands stood beside it. A supermodern freestanding concrete fireplace and chimney rose in a tall rectangle to intersect with the sloped ceiling, and skylights on either side of the loft would light the entire house during the day. It was absolutely beautiful. Oh, baby, I am begging you to never sell this place, I said, wheeling my suitcase to rest against the wall. I unzipped my blue parka and shrugged out of it, then walked around the loft pulling down my sweater and straightening my hair. The place wasn't homey by any stretch of the imagination. I couldn't imagine living here full time. It would feel like living in an art museum. It was like a little oasis. We were away from our jobs, away from friends and family. Not that we didn't love our friends and family. And truly alone together, out of our usual element. I wished we had more time to spend together in it. Neil was visibly taken aback. I usually never expressed an opinion on what he should do with his money or properties, at least if it didn't concern me. He wanted to retire at his country estate in England, for example, and while I thought it reminded me a little too much of a horror movie version of Downton Abbey, I wasn't about to ask him to revise his plans. I just asked that he close the house to tourists when that time came, 
and warned that if ever an antique doll turned its head to look at me, I would burn the entire place to the ground. But I didn't usually weigh in on this stuff. As much as I wanted to protest, that I wanted to stand on my own two feet and be independent and a full partner in our relationship, where money was concerned, I was kind of along for the ride, because my income didn't match our lifestyle. I still had a twinge of guilt every time I used his money to go shopping, or when he bought me an occasional present. I wasn't going to say, hey, I know you pay for most of my clothes, my food, the roof over my head, and you take me on trips all over the world, but let me tell you how to make major financial decisions. This time, though, I totally was, and it had come as a shock to him, not an entirely unwelcome one, I saw from his hesitant smile. You really like it that much? I do. This place could be our little escape. We could fly out here on weekends or something. The thought of getting away from New York, or wherever we ended up living, for the sole purpose of being alone together, made my heart flutter. You're always saying that your money makes our lives more flexible. I'm strangely touched by the fact that you're asking me to keep a very expensive home, just because you think it's pretty, he teased. Don't pull that misogynist sugar daddy shit on me, I warned him with a laugh. Just admit it. You're thrilled that I'm telling you what to do for a change. It was late. Neil started the gas fireplace, and I headed to the ultra-modern master bath to take a quick shower. Three tiers of natural wood decking surrounded the sinfully deep, two-person rectangular jacuzzi tub. A plant with tall green shoots grew happily from a silver oval urn on the floor. I lifted an eyebrow at the square toilet and bidet. Seriously, they were square. I would deal with that mindfuck at a later time, I decided, plopping my beauty bag down on the counter beside the square vessel sink. I fished out my shampoo and soap and put them in the shower. A polished concrete and glass room with iridescent black tiles and fiddled with the taps. Then I went back to the sink to brush my teeth. When I rinsed, I smiled at myself, flashing my braces straight whites. I was going to look so good on television. If you have the job, I reminded myself, puncturing my vanity bubble. I was trying not to get my hopes up, but I really, really wanted the gig with Wake Up America. I knew it was an extreme long shot. I'd only gotten the interview because of strings that India Vaughn had pulled with her beauty journalism clout. A producer on Wake Up America had once worked as an intern under India and would do anything for her, including granting an audition for a job I would have normally had no chance in hell of getting. But still, I wanted to hope. Believing something would happen was supposed to make it happen, right? At least... That's what the secret had said. I tilted my head back and forth, imagining how poised I would be on camera. Then I snapped myself out of it and got into the shower. After a few hours in bed, I had to force myself to sleep after my epic pass out on the plane. Neil and I got up and had a light breakfast. We'd made out a grocery list to cover our three-day stay in the country, and the people who'd opened the house had stocked the fridge and cupboards. If we don't use something in here, what happens? I asked, pouring a bowl of cereal from a box I knew I wouldn't finish before we left. Neil leaned against the counter and considered as he chewed a bite of his tempeh scramble. How he managed to eat that stuff first thing in the morning, I had no idea. I assume the housekeepers take it home with them. Could you make sure? Maybe it was my recent return to my roots that had reminded me of all the times we'd had just enough food to get by. I hated to admit it, but I'd become one of those people who forgot what needing money was like the second I didn't need it anymore. I just don't want it to go to waste. He nodded. Certainly. You could leave a note if you'd like. Will they understand it? I mean, since I can't write in Icelandic? I could write it for you if you're concerned— but as far as I'm aware, my staff here speaks and reads English. As far as you're aware? I frowned. You don't speak English with them? 
He looked like I just asked him why he didn't have a tail. No. Sophie, I lived here from age seven until I went to university. When I'm here, I speak Islenska. Oh. I had meant to get Rosetta Stone or something to try and learn Neil's second language, but the year had been kind of busy. Now I felt a mild stab of panic. Your brothers speak English, though, right? Yes, of course. They spent more of their childhoods in London than I did. Anyway, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone here who doesn't speak English. He pointed his fork at me and narrowed his eyes in a playfully stern scowl. But it wouldn't hurt to try. With a family, that is. Not the general public. I remember Merry Christmas, I said with a laugh. That's going to have to do. Do you now? He took a sip of his coffee. And how do you say it? Gle- Um, Glekilekio? My face got hot as I tried to contain my embarrassment at murdering the greeting. He sputtered and set his coffee mug down, laughing as he reached for a napkin to wipe his face. That might be the worst I've ever heard. Well, excuse me, I huffed, only partially offended. You know, at least you didn't have to learn a foreign language to meet my family. Oh, didn't I? He chuckled ruefully. He set his plate on the counter and reached for me, snagging one arm around my waist as I moved to put the soy milk back in the fridge. He pulled me up against him, and I put the carton on the counter with a weary sigh. But I couldn't be too mad, because he leaned his head and kissed me. Even with his coffee breath, I couldn't resist him. He raised his head, arms still wrapped around me. It's Glegilegyol. And Happy New Year is Hamingusakmur Nit Ur. I hesitated a moment and giggled. No, I'm not even going to try that one. Neil's life in Reykjavik was completely different from his life in New York or in London. At the Belgravia house, we had a staff of five people. On his country estate, well, I had no idea. There were too many to count. And in Manhattan, he just had a housekeeper and a driver. Here, things seemed so... normal. Nobody waited on us apart from stocking the kitchen and cleaning before we arrived. Nobody cooked our meals. And if I put down a dirty cup and walked away, it would still be where I left it when I returned. It was like real life, and I could have found myself getting used to it. After we cleaned up our breakfast, Neil showered while I put on my makeup. It was almost 11.30 before the sun rose, and I watched the sky lighten over the bay as I dressed. Can you zip me? I asked Neil as he emerged from the bathroom, a towel riding low on his hips. I held my hair up so he could pull the zipper on my red lace Dolce & Gabbana A-line dress. At my throat, I wore the diamond necklace Neil had given me for Christmas, the year before. This isn't too much, is it? I don't know how fancy your family is. It might be too much, but don't let that stop you, he said, leaning to kiss the back of my neck before I let my hair down. This is the first time they're meeting you. Let me show you off a bit. Neil drove us to his brother's house, about an hour outside of the city. Neil looked amazing, in a dark berry-colored sweater and brown corduroy trousers. Our parkas were tossed in the back seat of the Range Rover, and I relaxed into the ride, eager to see some of the sights. What I could see from the car, anyway. One minute we were in the city suburbs, the next, scattered industrial buildings. We took the highway past a huge lake, and then we were off on some alien planet. The countryside outside of Reykjavik was a snowy white wonderland, dotted with brown grasses, black rock, and rolling gray hills. I've never seen anything like this, I marveled, gazing out at the dim white horizon. It's beautiful. You're right. It looks nothing like where I grew up. It looks totally bizarre. Fewer trees, he said, and it made such perfect sense. I wondered how I'd miss that detail in the first place. But there really weren't as many trees as I was used to seeing from the highway in the U.S., where they kind of blocked the view. I felt like I could see forever from the car windows. 
Though we arrived just a few minutes late, the sky had already started to dim when we pulled up the long two-track drive to the house. It's getting dark, I said with a frown, gazing at the sky above the pines. There were more trees here, practically a forest, probably because of the small private lake Neil had told me all about. His brother Runolf owned seventy acres in a sprawling plot. His only neighbors are some archaeologists working on a Viking settlement on the other side of the lake, Neil had told me. Runolf is very private. Since he lived out in the middle of nowhere on way too much land, I'd expected Runolf's house would be a log cabin or a sod house. But we parked on a circular drive paved with cobblestones, in front of a house with an A-frame center and two long half-sunken wings. The exterior was sided with cedar, set at angles toward the apex of the roof, and large windows revealed a warmly lit interior. This is the place, Neil said as he turned off the ignition. But he didn't get out of the car. He sat for a moment with the keys in his lap, totally zoned out. Are you okay? I had a weird, queasy feeling suddenly. Was he embarrassed of me? Did he not want to introduce me to the rest of his family? He looked over to me with a benign smile. Yes, absolutely. Perhaps a touch jet-lagged. That didn't set my mind at ease. I knew him too well. We grabbed our parkas and pulled them on, then went to the back of the vehicle and unloaded the duffel bag full of presents we'd brought. He had gifts for Emma and Michael and for his new niece, but he and his brothers didn't exchange presents. Neil and I had made the same agreement this year as well, but I'd totally cheated. I just hadn't given him his gift yet. He'd probably cheated too. He knocked on the door, and a man about as tall as Neil, with the dirty blonde hair color Neil had before the chemo, answered the door. Same green eyes, same elegant facial features. The only real difference between Neil and his brother was that Runolf was a bit pudgier around the middle and in the face. A difference Neil must have pointed out a time or two, because Runolf grabbed Neil's midsection and said something in Icelandic that I couldn't understand, but it carried the universal tone of big brother fat shaming. Neil swatted his brother's hands away and pulled me forward. Peta er unustamin am korastan, Sophie. Runolf's eyes went wide as he looked from Neil to me. Neil looked like he was swallowing a really big pill. What had he just said about me? Then Runolf said, Sophie, it's nice to meet you. Hi. I reached out and shook his hand. I'm sorry I don't speak. Not at all, not at all. Runolf's posh English accent strongly matched Neil's. Come on inside. Emma's already here. We took off our coats and hung them in the small coat room off the wide, open, octagonal foyer. To the left and right, hallways led off in opposite directions, and a staircase swooped in a graceful arc down to the lower level, where a Christmas tree that had to be eighteen feet tall stood in front of an all-glass wall that faced the lake. The house was built into a hillside, I realized. Dad! Emma called as she thundered up the stairs. She threw her arms around Neil's neck before he could get a word in. I missed you. Christmas wasn't the same without you. I missed you too. He kissed her forehead and set her on her feet. And I suppose Michael had to come along? Daddy. A one-word admonishment was all she needed to give him. He held up his hands defensively. Fine, fine. That was the last one. I promise. Sophie, Emma said, putting her arms out. Christmas hug? Of course. I'm the huggy type, but Neil's daughter is not. For a while, I thought it was because of our strange situation. It couldn't be easy having your dad date someone who was your exact age. But as I'd gotten to know her better, I'd realized that she was quite sparing with her physical affection. I guess that just made it mean more. Downstairs, Neil introduced me to the eldest Elwood sibling, Geir, and his wife Helen, who was a Canadian from Winnipeg. 
They'd met when she'd been plying her trade as a lawyer in the contracts department of North Star Media, the company the Elwood brood had inherited from their late father. Geyer and Helen's children weren't with them for Christmas. They were all grown and busy with their own families in Canada and England. Geyer looked more like Neil's mother. He was shorter than his brothers and plump, and he didn't smile as easily, though he didn't come off as a grumpy sort of person. Helen was slender and youthful, despite the gray streak in her effortless brown bob. She talked with her hands and showed tall white teeth when she smiled. No one seemed to bat an eye at the fact that Neil had such a young girlfriend, but when I met Runoff's wife, Christine, I got an inkling of why. Though Runoff was fifty-two, his wife was in her early thirties. She was a former Olympic swimmer who was six-one, had long, sexy blonde hair I was pretty sure she stole from a 1990s glamazon, and her arms were more jacked than Michelle Obama's. I had this crazy feeling no one was going to crack a trophy wife joke about me in Runoff and Christine's house. Sophie, so nice to meet you. Christine gave me a welcoming hug. Neil has told us so much about you. He has? I knew Neil talked to his brothers often, even if he only saw them every couple of years, but I had no idea he'd talk to them about me. Gaird chuckled. The last time we saw him, he couldn't shut up about you. When was that? The last time we got together for Christmas? No, it was when your mother was in the hospital, Helen corrected him. It's nice to finally put a face with the name. When his mom had been in the hospital, that had been... We hadn't even been dating at that point, just casually fucking, and he'd been talking me up to his family. I shot Neil a look and he coughed, cleared his throat, and turned to Michael, who stood gazing out the windows at the lake, probably trying to remain totally still, because protective father vision is based on movement. Michael? Neil said stiffly. To Michael's credit, he didn't look as terrified of Neil as he used to. He nodded and raised the glass in his hand, responding, Happy New Year, sir, and a belated Merry Christmas. Michael was everything Neil had probably feared from the moment Emma had been born. Blindingly handsome, well-mannered, tall, dark, and charming. He was Emma's fairy tale prince come to life and met every one of the high expectations she had of men. Though Neil hated Michael, there were similarities between them that I would never, ever point out to him, because I was sure it would earn me a very withering look. Yes, well, same to you, Neil said, then turned to Runoff and spoke something in Icelandic before they both headed off to the bar. From somewhere in the room, a baby monitor crackled with the sound of a distressed infant, Oh, good. She's up. Finally. Helen jumped to her feet with the glee of a mother about to hold a child she could give back to its owners, and she excused herself to go with Christine. Emma sighed. Less than ten minutes. I owe Michael twenty dollars. I cocked my head in query. Less than ten minutes before my father got bilingual to complain about Michael, in front of Michael. She shook her head with a resigned sigh. He said, I'm going to need a drink to handle this. Come on. Emma led me up the stairs, through the foyer, and to the surprisingly industrial-looking kitchen. Maybe he meant he needed a drink to handle bringing me. I normally wouldn't have so blatantly hinted for reassurance, but I was starting to get a little paranoid. He's been acting really strange ever since Christmas. There's a time when my father doesn't act strange? She grabbed a glass-bottled soda from the ice bucket on the table. Want one? Sure. I took something that looked grape. You don't think he's weird about me being here? Sophie, you know him. Emma was as pragmatic as ever, and it was very welcome. If he didn't want you to be here, you wouldn't be here. But the man misses you when you go off to the toilet. I don't think he would want to spend a whole holiday without you. She had a point that I mentally conceded as I popped the top off my soda. Then, with a halt, Emma had a visible realization. You don't suppose... Sophie, 
Do you think he's nervous because he's planning to propose to you? I frowned as I let that roll around in my head for a second. Neil didn't buy new socks without serious consideration. I couldn't imagine him proposing to me without first having in-depth conversations about our future. I don't think so. Why not? You've been together for a year. Yeah, a year. Singular. One year, I said wryly. I'm not angling for a proposal just yet. A hell of a year, though. Emma pursed her lips as she thought. Have the two of you even discussed it? No, well, once, I think. Only in the most abstract way. Neil had confided that he'd planned to propose to me on his last birthday, but he'd changed his mind because he hadn't wanted it to seem like one of those deathbed-slash-wedding-bed scenarios. We haven't had any serious discussion, and that's okay. We're happy where we are. I suppose. Emma didn't sound too happy about having to accept that fact, and I was surprisingly touched. Her father's last marriage hadn't ended well, with hurtful accusations that I hoped were all a huge miscommunication between two truly well-meaning people. If they hadn't been, then Neil's ex-wife had been a gold digger out to trap him with the child support clauses in their prenup. Neil and Emma felt the latter was the case, so the fact that she could trust me enough to be disappointed that her father wasn't marrying me was a big deal. We rejoined the rest of the group in the living room, where Helen was just handing a slightly fussy baby off to Runoff. I'll get her bottle, Christine said, less relaxed than when we'd first come in. Do you need help? I offered, though I wasn't sure what needed to be done, and I prayed hold the baby wasn't going to be her suggestion. I'll help her. Neil, could you take Annie just for a moment? Runoff asked, passing the baby off to his brother without waiting for an answer. I would love to. Neil set his glass aside and reached up for the infant, whose tiny limbs wobbled excitedly in the air as she was handed off. Careful, you've got her now, Runoff asked, and Neil gave him an annoyed tut. I have actually done this before, you know. Neil was seated in an armchair, so I plopped down in the corner of the sofa nearest him. He held little Annie under the arms, her pigeon-toed feet awkwardly stamping on his thighs. She babbled excitedly, and a thin stream of drool leaked from her lip and onto Neil's $600 sweater. He didn't look like he minded a bit. I leaned my head on my folded arms atop the end of the sofa and smiled over at him. I'd seen the same wonder and joy in his expression in photos of a younger Neil with Emma. Men with babies. Even if I didn't want a baby, I couldn't really deny there was something sexy about a man confidently holding an infant and, yes, even making stupid faces at her. How old is she? I asked no one in particular, as her parents were out of the room. Almost seven months old now, Helen said. She was born on the first, wasn't she, Emma? The human mind is a really cruel thing. I couldn't calculate what time I had to go to bed to get eight hours of sleep when I had to wake up early, but I instantly snapped back seven months to the first week of July. Our baby would have been due in July. In the past year, I'd found myself thinking on a couple of occasions about the abortion I'd had. Occasionally, I had compared myself to a pregnant woman on the street and wondered if I would have looked like her. I'd never been weirded out in a way that made me regret our choice, though. The first week of July had been a bizarre time for me, because Neil had still been in intensive care. I would have been ready to go into labor at any time at that point, if we'd kept the baby. I'd been too emotionally stressed by the fact that my boyfriend had been in a touch-and-go health crisis. The thought would jar me out of my head for a second, and I would imagine how devastating it would have been to deliver our baby without Neil by my side, because he was dying in the cancer ward. It was horrible to imagine. I was glad we'd made the right choice. Neil looked over at me, as if he could sense my thoughts. He probably could. We spent enough time together, and he read my every mood and facial expression like a cherished book. Would you like to hold her? 
They're so much more fun when they aren't yours. Oh, thanks, Dad, Emma said with a snort. No, I don't want to steal your time with your new niece. I declined smoothly, and he was more than happy to go back to kissing Annie's squishy fat cheeks and making grumbly noises. Dinner was amazing, though not vegan-friendly. Emma seemed to have anticipated this, and she'd brought her own food, which she chowed down without complaint. Neil and I had given up any hope of a vegan holiday. We'd picked up the diet when Neil was ill after being convinced of the health benefits by Emma. But Christmas was never healthy, anyway, so we felt free to indulge in hangikyut, made of smoked lamb, though Neil informed me that he preferred the horse variety. There was also fried ptarmigan, a bird I'd never heard of, but was stuffed with bacon, so I was sold. There were caramelized potatoes and red cabbage, and steaming warm homemade bread. You did all this? I boggled after I'd inhaled my second helping of rice pudding. Christine grinned. Yes, it was quite difficult. I had to call the caterer weeks in advance, and then pop the trays in the oven this morning. Everyone laughed, even Neil, who seemed to have loosened up a bit. Though it was only five o'clock, it was pitch black outside by the time we'd exchanged presents and let the massive dinner settle. I was sitting in the crook of Neil's elbow, leaned against him, when he suddenly spoke up. You know, it only just now occurs to me that Michael has never been for a proper sauna. He said this apropos of nothing, immediately rousing my suspicion and Emma's, too, judging from the way she sat up with wide eyes. Michael looked up from where his hand was laced with Emma's on his knee. Uh, what now? A sauna, Gaier said, gruff and terrifying. You sit in the steam for a while, get a good sweat worked up, then you run outside and jump in the lake. Nice try, Michael shook his head with a dazzling smile. Fool me once, Mr. Elwood. Fool you once? I asked, and Neil gave me an I'm totally innocent look that I was not buying. At Michael's first Christmas with the family, Dad told Michael that it was Icelandic custom to strip naked and roll in the snow on Christmas morning, Emma said, with a peeved edge to her tone. He told Michael to meet him in the garden at Longhurst Court before breakfast, then never came down. I sat outside in my underwear for seventeen minutes before I decided he was messing with me, Michael admitted sheepishly. This is all legitimate, I assure you, Runolf said, chuckling at his brother's horrible prank. I've even got the hole cut out there. It really is something they do, Helen reassured Michael. Although Geir shouldn't, because of his heart. Um, and maybe somebody who just had cancer shouldn't do it either. All the blood drained from my face. You're really going to do it, aren't you? Absolutely. It's the perfect male bonding experience. I haven't seen my brothers in a while. And anyway, I wouldn't want Michael to miss out, Neil said, nodding to him. Daddy, don't be stupid. Of course Michael isn't going to jump in a frozen lake. He's not an idiot, Emma laughed. Oh, no offense to be taken from that statement, is there? Geir grumbled and stood. I don't know about all the rest of you, but I'm going down to start the damn fire. Are you coming? I am, definitely, Michael said, and I saw in the firm set of his jaw the resolution of a man who saw plunging his overheated body into an icy death lake as a last-ditch attempt to win the respect of his mortal enemy. It was hard not to laugh. Neil tightened his arm around me and said low beside my ear, You'll be all right without me. I nodded and gave him a reassuring smile. Christine and Helen seemed nice enough, and Emma and I got along great. It wasn't like he was leaving me alone with Valerie or something. When the guys were gone, Christine dropped on the couch beside me with a giant glass of wine. She stretched her legs. Do you know how long it has been since I've had a drink? But it's all worth it, Helen laughed. Still, I wouldn't trade with you. I like my eight hours. 
Christine took a huge gulp of wine before responding. We're very lucky. We have an overnight nurse, usually, but not at Christmas. That seemed too self-indulgent. So, Sophie, how did Christmas with your family go? Emma asked. Then to Christine and Helen, she explained. It was Dad's first time meeting them. I shrugged. If Emma wanted details, I would fill her in another time. It went really well. My mom didn't like him, but I didn't think she would. Christine made a sympathetic noise. My father hates Runolf. All he sees when he looks at him is some perverted old man. Doesn't help that Runolf is only seven years younger than him. I breathed a sigh of relief. I'm so glad I'm not the only one in this situation. Neil is actually older than my mom, and she's super freaked out. I would be, Helen said with a shocked blink. If my child brought home a partner who was older than me? Granted, my kids are in their twenties and I'm fifty-nine. You married a guy your own age, though, Christine pointed out. So you don't see the drawer. Trust me, there are things an older man can do that a young guy— Emma looked at me, horrified, and interrupted loudly. New topic of conversation. Okay, new topic, Christine agreed. Helen, how are your classes going? Helen had retired from her law practice, and now she taught courses on contract law at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. As it turned out, Christine had just gone back to school to get her master's degree in modern art. It had never occurred to me before that conversation, but I could go back to school. I was living with Neil. I wasn't making a ton of money. My advance from my first book had been generous for a debut memoirist, mostly because of its famous subject matter, but it wasn't a career I could really imagine myself growing to love. Neil was always saying I could do whatever I wanted to do, and he'd support me. I wondered if that extended to an advanced degree. What was I thinking? The man had bought me jewelry that cost more than a master's degree. He would be fine with it. Still, I wasn't actually sure it was something I wanted to do. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I'd hoped I would have figured it out before I was a quarter of a century old. About an hour and a half after the men had gone off on their own, we heard whoops and laughter from outside. There they go, Emma said, with a weary sigh. Her arms crossed as she looked out the glass wall at the wintry lawn. I saw four bodies, ghostly pale in the full moonlight, racing barefoot and naked across the snow, headed straight for the icy lake. Only one of them hesitated at the square hole cut into the ice. I assumed it was Michael. Owing to the yelp of pain surprise we heard through the glass as the other men barreled past and carried him right over the edge. Poor Michael, I said, shaking my head. He's the one who's desperate for my father's approval, Emma sniffed, not at all sympathetic. Michael was the first up the ladder and onto the dock, and I turned away quickly. Whoops, not looking. I am, Emma said with a mischievous smile. Then her eyebrows scrunched up, and she grimaced as she turned her back to the window. But not if Uncle Guide is getting out. We heard the men come in, the rolling babble of three strangely identical voices. I hadn't noticed that before. But Neil and his brothers all sounded remarkably alike, speaking in Icelandic. After they dressed and came back to the living room, it was like every trace of weird, distant Neil had been wiped away. He came to me with his wet hair slicked back from his face and wrapped me up in his arms, burying his cold nose in my neck until I squealed. Michael, you idiot! Your lips are blue! Emma slapped Michael's shoulder and guided him toward the couch, where he huddled in his clothes, shivering uncontrollably. Christine jumped up. I'll get him a blanket. And I'll get him some whiskey, Gaird grumbled, clearly unimpressed by Michael's lack of fortitude. Oh, the boy is perfectly fine, Neil said, with what could have easily been mistaken as a friendly laugh. It totally wasn't. Aren't you, Michael? He gave Neil a weak thumbs up. Well, I hope he proved himself, I said, 
resting my hands against Neil's chest. He was willing to jump into testicle-shriveling ice water to impress you, Runolf pointed out. Well, Neil said, resigned as he looked over at Michael. I suppose it's a start. Chapter 5 I think that went well, Neil declared as we let ourselves into the house. He hit the master switch by the door and lit up all three levels. Oh, sure it went well. It went so well, you almost gave Michael hypothermia, I said with a roll of my eyes. Neil chuckled. That's what I said. It went well. If Michael had actually gotten hypothermia, I'd have said it went spectacularly. I would save my lecture about his attitude toward Emma's fiancé for another time. Did you enjoy yourself? he asked, for the eleventh time since we'd left Runolf's house. Well, the first ten times you asked me, I thought I did, but now... Don't be smart. He reached out and tucked a strand of my hair behind my ear. You have no idea how nervous I was. I think I had kind of an idea, I frowned. Or maybe not. See, if my family hadn't liked you, it wouldn't have changed anything between us. But I get this crazy feeling that it would have changed us if your family hadn't liked me. I could have slapped him and he would have looked less stunned. Not that I would ever slap Neil, though there were times he had sorely tempted me. You seem tense, I explained patiently. Maybe he hadn't noticed his own mood. You seemed like... I don't know, like something was riding on today. You haven't been yourself since we left New York. He took both my hands in his and looked down at them as he held them between us. Squeezing my fingers, he promised, If you perceived any amount of tension, or you felt that I was removed in some way, absolutely none of that had to do with you. Okay, I trust you. It was easy to say it, because I felt it to my bones. He had never lied to me before. Well, except for during our one-night stand seven years before, but neither of us had been truthful that night. We hung up our coats and went upstairs to the bedroom. In the master bath, I brushed my teeth and removed my makeup while Neil took out his contacts. He was unusually quiet until he said, I wasn't sure until the moment Runoff met us at the door, that I wanted to see my brothers today. What? It was all he'd been talking about for weeks. I thought you were looking forward to seeing them. I was. He screwed on one lid of his lens case, and he didn't look up at me. Until I wasn't. I didn't know what to say to that, so I waited until he was ready to go on. He took a breath. The truth is... I was quite hurt that neither Runoff nor Geir came to visit while I was ill. A knife of sudden understanding pierced my lungs, and my inhale was painful. Oh, baby. It's all right now, he assured me. For the past few days I've been thinking about it, thinking about how terrible it was that Runoff hadn't come to visit me. We were quite close growing up. Geir was seven when I was born. Fiona was six. I realized that families grow and change and drift apart, but it hurt that they were willing to risk never seeing me again, that they were both. I reached over and put my hand on his, on the countertop. He looked up with a hesitant smile. I understand now, seeing baby Annie. Death, just the idea of it. It feels contagious. When Emma was a baby, I obsessed over her safety. If I heard a story on the news about a child dying, I turned it off. I was so happy. It seemed like if I invited even the notion of death in, I would make it happen. Geir is getting older. His mortality is becoming more real to him. I can understand why he wouldn't want to see his little brother suffering through cancer. And Runoff has a beautiful wife who had just given birth to that sweet baby when my condition deteriorated so badly. Of course he would want to protect them, even if the danger was imaginary. I shook my head. I still think it's awfully shitty, not coming to see you, when it seemed pretty certain you weren't going to make it. 
I hated talking about that time. It made my throat close up. Sophie, believe me, it's fine now. I made my peace over it. He leaned down and kissed my forehead. Hurry up. You don't want to miss the fireworks. We have a spectacular view. When I came out of the bathroom wrapped in my fluffy bathrobe, Neil was sitting on the bed, already down to his black silk boxers. In his hands he had a gift wrapped in elegant green paper. I know we agreed to forego presents this year, but damn it, couldn't help myself. So I bought you something. As it so happens, I began heading to my suitcase, I knew you wouldn't be able to resist, so I got you something too. It's hard to shop for a billionaire. If he wanted something, he usually just bought it, so I'd had to get creative. I handed him my present and sat beside him to open mine. He tore the paper off the box and lifted the lid. Inside, in an elegant silver frame, was an enlarged version of the photo we'd taken in bed together in Paris the year before, on New Year's Eve. Neil's hands trembled as he lifted the heavy frame from the box. In a voice choked with emotion, he managed, Oh, Sophie. You said you wanted to always remember that trip, I reminded him, smiling down at the photo of the two of us, damp from a post-sex shower, and snuggled up in bed together. That night he'd tortured me with a personal massager and poured champagne into my mouth full of his cum. It had been one of our most intense encounters, made more so by the knowledge that he'd start chemotherapy when the trip was over. We hadn't known then what the future would hold. A year later we had come through so much, and we were finally, finally, becoming that couple in the picture again. When he looked up his eyes were a little misty. Come here, you brilliant woman. Still clutching the frame, he wrapped his arms around me and hugged me tight. I'd expected him to like the present, but I hadn't expected it to move him so much. I'm glad you like it, I said with a surprised laugh that was cut off by my lack of breath as Neil squeezed the hell out of me. With a soft chuckle of his own, he released me. Like it? Sophie, I love it. That night was the perfect way to start my year and this is the perfect way to end it. The middle was a bit dodgy, I'm afraid, but the bookends are lovely. With one finger against the glass in the frame, he traced the line of my jaw. I shivered as though he'd touched me. Okay, I said brightly, or else I was going to start blubbering. I get to open mine now. It's nowhere near as thoughtful, he said ruefully. I'm embarrassed now. Tearing the paper off a Christmas present just thrills my materialistic little heart. I grinned to myself at the half-circle of birds and flowers stamped on the plain box. It was Karina Gilson's logo. Her lingerie was to die for. I couldn't wait to see what Neil had gotten for me. I parted the tissue paper inside, and my fingers brushed a pool of the softest azure silk I had ever felt. Breathless, I lifted the nightgown by its slender straps and a reverent, oh, crossed my lips as the ankle-length gown unfurled, revealing the designer's signature lace embellishments. There's a robe in there as well, Neil said. Do you like it? Do I? My mouth dropped open. I rubbed the silk on my face. It was as soft as I imagined Lily Cole's skin to be. Put it on, he urged. This is almost as much a present for me as it is for you. How thoughtful, I said wryly, as I stood and let my bathrobe slip from my shoulders. Neil's gaze raked appreciatively over my naked form as I lifted the nightgown over my head. The silk was absolute heaven, like the softest, sweetest oil slick. It floated to my ankles, skimmed my every curve, hugged my body perfectly. Neil's big hands closed over my hips, and he pulled me forward to nuzzle his face against my belly. Hey, I jumped back out of his grasp. Your stupid beard is going to snag my fancy new nighty. Stupid, he gasped, rubbing his hand over his jaw. I thought you'd grown to like it. I tried to avoid his reach when he started to grab me, but he's a tall guy and mostly arms and legs. There was no eluding him.
and he tackled me to the bed, both of us laughing breathlessly. He rubbed his rough chin into my neck, making me squeal and squirm as he pinned me beneath him. And just as quickly as the moment had turned playful, it became tender. He lifted his head, smiled his crooked half-smile down at me, and stroked my hair back from my face. This is weird, I whispered, gazing up at him, searching his eyes for something I wasn't really sure was missing. This house, this country, the language. It's a whole separate part of your life. It's like I didn't really know you. You knew me, he said, sleepy, confident. You just didn't know me in this context. I flipped to my belly, relishing the slide of the silk between the duvet and my body. He slowly walked his fingers up my spine as I spoke. No, seriously, I'm fascinated by this change. A smile curved his mouth, then he rolled to his back and pulled me against his side, cradling my head on his shoulder. He combed through my hair with his fingers and sighed contentedly. I suppose it's because I'm home. Spent a large part of my childhood here. The happiest part, really. When I was in the ICU, I thought I would die. And I thought, I can't die without seeing my brothers again. And I can't die before I take Sophie to meet them. A lump rose in my throat. In addition to our couple's therapy, Neil had been seeing someone about the PTSD caused by spending weeks in isolation in the ICU sedated and on a ventilator. He had a difficult time talking about those days, and I was worried for him now. We don't have to talk about that if you don't want to. Actually, I'm not that bothered. It's getting easier, and this isn't denial. I feel relieved to be telling you all this. I want you to share every part of my life with me, and I want to share every part of your life with you. We do share, I began and his hand gently covered my mouth. Sophie, he said softly, do shut up. I'm trying to propose. Propose? My head went light and my chest got heavy. My eyes flared hot and watery, and my skin tingled. It was the single best anxiety attack I'd ever had. He eased his arm from beneath me as he reached with his other hand for something in the nightstand drawer. I sat up, certain my face was bright red from the blood pounding into it. He leaned back on the pillows, turning a small clamshell jewelry box like a Rubik's Cube in his nervous hands. Sophie, I love you. I've tried to think of a thousand different ways to say this poetically, but I really feel that the unadorned truth is utterly necessary right now. And if you don't want to marry me, if you think it's too old-fashioned an institution, or against your principles, then that's fine. Nothing has changed. I just needed to tell you. I love you so much that I regret having memories that don't include you. I look back on my life before I met you, and I see where you should have been. Some of my greatest achievements, the things I am most proud of— Seem empty because you weren't there beside me. You are the other half of me, and I would be so incredibly grateful if you would marry me. I lunged forward, grasped his head between my hands, and kissed him, hard. And by hard, I mean our teeth scraped together unpleasantly. But I didn't care. I gasped when our mouths parted. I love you so much. He smiled against my lips his arms wrapping around my back. Do you want to see the ring? I nodded. He rolled me smoothly beneath him, settling between my thighs as my nightgown rode up. Braced on his elbows, he opened the box and handed it to me. Inside a huge cushion-cut yellow diamond flared brilliantly, surrounded by a border of smaller white diamonds, set in flawless platinum. It was absolutely gorgeous, and absolutely me. I held out my hand, and Neil slipped the ring from the box onto my fingertip, sliding it down easily over my knuckle. It was a bit loose, and I giggled. At least it's not too small, he said with an embarrassed laugh. I'll get it sized, I kissed him again, letting him pull my hand to his chest and cover it with his own palm. I looked down at our entwined fingers. 
You've had this with you the whole time? He nodded, smiling ruefully. It was in my pocket when we went to the lake. I thought I would propose to you there, but I chickened out. This is so beautiful, really. I love it, and so romantic. I'm not as good with words as you, says the woman whose first book is being published in three months, he teased. Okay, that was a little dumb of me, but I feel the same way. I can't imagine not waking up with you every morning. This last year with you was the best and the worst year of my life. And I want that. I want all the good parts and all the bad parts. As long as we're together while we're going through them. I have never felt so safe with anyone, or as sure about anything as I am with you. So, this is a yes, he asked with an arched brow and I realized I hadn't given him a definitive answer. I want to make sure, in case I need to take this back to the jeweler. I laughed and raised my head up to kiss him. Yes, absolutely. He laced his fingers with mine as he pushed my hands back on the pillows. I like the sound of that. Yes, I wonder how many times I can make you say that word tonight. With a lift of my hips, I rubbed myself shamelessly against him. Do you mean yes, sir, or just yes? I'll take either. His grip tightened on my hands, and he sank his teeth into my neck. My squeal of laughter drew out into a long moan as he nibbled and sucked at the hypersensitive spot behind my ear. I think I'm going to spend a very long time with my head between your legs tonight he murmured against my jaw. Oh, fuck yes, I gasped. We'd been together a year and he could still drive me crazy with just a few well-spoken dirty words. That's two. He slid down my body, his big hands bracketing my ribs and working my silky nightgown up. He kneaded my breasts through the slippery fabric. Before I'd gotten together with Neil, I'd been convinced that I just wasn't made for long-term relationships. I'd dated guys casually and gotten bored of them within months. Now I was in the longest relationship of my life, and I couldn't get enough of my boyfriend. Fiancé. Holy fuck, was that amazing. Just thinking about it gave me a heartgasm. His chin scraped over my belly. Okay, there was like one good thing about the beard, and he circled my navel with his tongue. Look at you, writhing like you're in heat. I bet you're already wet, aren't you? I moaned as his fingers skimmed up my inner thigh. A minute ago it was, I can't live without you, and now I'm in heat? He slipped his fingers beneath my panties and skimmed between my labia. He was right, of course. I was hot and wet, and ready for him. You're suggesting that it's a bad thing, he murmured against my hip. You know I love the way you want me. I grinned at him as he pulled my panties slowly down my thighs. Ego, thy name is Neil. He growled and jerked my panties down the rest of the way, then his mouth descended on me. I gasped and curled up when I remembered what our plans had been only moments before. Wait, what about the fireworks? With a last sucking kiss, he lifted his head. You're right. You don't want to miss those. He got up and gave me his hand to lead me down the stairs to the living room. With a flick of a switch, he cut the lights, leaving the house in total darkness, but for the gentle illumination of the city lights curving around the bay. He led me carefully around the furniture, to the tall windows that stretched from the second floor to the third. It's almost midnight. Neil said, stepping up behind me. One hand closed around a chunk of my hair, the other gripped my upper arm as he nuzzled behind my ear. Would you like to do something a bit frightening? My breath caught in my throat as he walked me forward, one slow step at a time, until my toes touched the edge of the very short window sill. My knees bumped the window pane, and I gave a startled eep as he pushed my body flush against the glass. It wasn't a terribly far drop below, but that wasn't what I was worried about. I was worried about the lighted path that ran along the waterfront past Neil's house. Someone might see, I whimpered, but I knew I wasn't going to hold out for long. The hand at my arm fell to my hip, kneading through the silk. 
That's half the fun, darling. His hand worked between my breast and the glass. His thumb stroked over my hard nipple through the lace applique. Slowly he slid his hands down and followed them, kneeling on the floor behind me. Pushing up the silk, he bared my backside to the cool room. With a palm splayed across my mound, he canted my hips back. To keep my balance, I braced my chest and forearms against the window, and I gasped. He kissed over the curve of one buttock, his fingers slipping into the cleft between and sliding down. One fingertip caught the top of my opening and gently stilled there. Now, where were we? The naughty thrill of doing something truly wicked overrode the part of my brain telling me that being eaten out in front of a giant window in the capital city of a small European country on a night when everyone else was going to be looking out their windows was a dumb, dumb idea. But they would all be looking at the fireworks, right? His nose bumped against me, and his tongue snaked between my folds to circle my clit, and I dropped my head back with a moan. His rough jaw scraped my inner thighs and my legs shook. Steady, he murmured against me, his big hands grasping my hips to hold me in place. I rose up on my toes as his tongue swirled over me again. How was it that he needed only put his hands on me, and I became willing and compliant? One touch, and all I wanted was to please him. Probably because while I was striving to please him, he was striving to please me. We got off on each other's pleasure, and it just happened to work out that we fulfilled each other's needs. His tongue burrowed into my cunt, and I clenched around him involuntarily, a high-pitched ooh of pleasure tearing past my lips. He held me still against his mouth, rasping with his chin, fucking me with his tongue until it was just too much. I pushed back on him as the tension in me wound tighter and tighter, and with a cry I let go, my thighs quivering around his face. I panted to get my breath, both palms splayed on the glass. Neil got to his feet behind me, still holding my nightgown at my waist with one hand. His fingers skimmed over my buttocks, then dipped down to the wet, puffy flesh he'd just so expertly tended. He traced his fingertips around the outside of my thigh and settled his big, warm hand between my legs. The position pulled my nightie up in front, exposing my bare vulva to the window and anyone who might happen to see in. "'Is this mine?' he asked hooking his two center fingers inside me until I writhed under the pressure and could only gasp a desperate, Yes. And would you like to come again? He pumped slowly, putting exquisite pressure on my G-spot. The bottoms of my feet tickled and I moaned. I wanted to come again, wanted it desperately, and I rocked my hips against his hand. I want you to fuck me, I panted. Across the city the first burst of a shimmering green firework filled the night sky, then another, and another. More illuminations than I'd ever seen before, even on July 4th back home. Flashes of pink, purple, and gold all clashed beautifully in their garishness, the cold, clean air making them more brilliant as they exploded. I reached for the hem of my nightgown and whipped the fabric over my head before I could think too much about it. But in for a penny, in for a pound, as Neil would say. Or as I would say it, go hard or go home. If we were going to have possibly public, possibly exhibitionist sex, I wasn't going to hide my light under a damn bushel. He laughed, not the dark chuckle of my dominating sir but the surprised bark that always told me when I'd caught him off guard. Sophie, you're absolutely filthy. I wriggled on his hand, his two fingers still buried in me. You love it. That I do. His thick length pressed against my backside, and he mumbled into my hair. I will even brave stand-up sex for you. He slipped off his boxers and bent his knees to align us. He rubbed the head of his cock up and down my slit, then found his mark. Our height difference made the position a bit awkward, but when Neil was finally inside me I didn't care at all. 
He stroked my clit, and my eyelids fluttered closed, but I forced them open again so I could see the glittering explosions across the bay. I couldn't believe my good luck. I was with a man who cherished and appreciated me as a friend and a lover, a man who had loved me from the first time we'd met and who'd proposed to me because he wanted to spend the rest of our lives together, a man who created splendid new memories for me every day, and this day would be no exception. I rocked with him, watching the celebrations beyond the glass through a sheen of overjoyed tears. The slap of our flesh as Neil slowly withdrew, then ram deep again, set a cadence in time with our panting breaths. Under his fingers, my clit throbbed and tingled, and I was close, so goddamn close, that I pushed his hand out of the way to race that last mile on my own. He chuckled into my hair and fastened his mouth to the back of my neck, sinking his teeth in. I shouted and slapped my palm against the glass as I clutched around him. I'd barely come down when he pulled out and wrapped my hair around his fist, gently tugging me away from the window and over to the sofa. The sofa I hadn't even sat on yet, but he was sure going to fuck me on it. I snickered at the thought and he pulled me down to straddle his lap as he sat. What's so funny? He growled beside my ear. The tip of him brushed against my wet, wanting opening, and I rolled my hips, inviting just a little inside. The fact that this is the first interaction between this couch and myself, I feel like I should have at least watched some reality television on it before going all the way. I slid down, and a strangled moan caught in my throat, he still took me by surprise sometimes. I rose up a little and bounced on my knees, testing the cushions. He slapped my ass hard. His fingers dug into my backside as he moved me on him. Well, better make it memorable, shall we? I leaned down to kiss him, with just the head of him stretching my opening. Believe me, baby, I am never going to forget tonight. He pushed my hips down, and I exhaled shakily as I took him in. He was so hard and so thick, the pressure against my pelvic bone was actually painful. I squirmed as he held me, and he grabbed my wrists and pinned them against the small of my back with one hand. I don't need my hands to make you come, I murmured against his cheek. I squeezed on him in rapid flutters, then long, delicious tugs, and he dropped his head back. May I make you come? I wheedled softly, gently rolling my hips. Please, sir? Oh, fuck yes. I wish you would. He groaned, his grip tightening on my wrists. With my shoulders back, my posture was forced up straight, my breasts thrust into his face. He sucked one tight, hard nipple into his mouth, teasing with the edges of his teeth as I worked my body in an undulating wave against his. The depth and stretch inside me brought goose flesh to my exposed skin, and his hot, wet mouth reminded me too keenly of where it had been only minutes before. My clit was swollen and hypersensitive, and with every forward sway of my hips, it raked over his pubic hair and the wide base of his shaft. I strove toward the same peak, was almost there when he released my wrists to grip my hips and surge upward. I gasped, I'm coming, and he growled. Don't you dare stop until you do. And then he broke, shouting and digging his fingers into my ass hard as I frantically pumped against him. The hot throb of his twitching cock inside me brought me over, and I ground on him, riding every last wave of pleasure as he muffled, pained groans. Finally, he stopped me, panting comically and holding my hips in place, and begging through clenched teeth. Don't move. Don't. I shouldn't get off of you? I asked, rising up a little, and his sharp inhalation strangled on the way in, the point of my tongue slid from one canine tooth to the other as I regarded him maliciously and dropped suddenly back down. Turnabout is fair play. You do this to me all the time. 
torturing my poor, sensitive body right after I've orgasmed. You deserve to know what it feels like. Neil grimaced and held his breath until it appeared there would be no further torture. Careful, you might inspire me to empathy, and then I'd have to stop doing that to you all the time. I leaned my head on his shoulder and breathed in the smell of his sweat and his skin. I nuzzled against him and sighed contentedly. I didn't think you'd ever top Paris. Well, in the absence of sex toys, I find a marriage proposal often does the trick. He chuckled sleepily. I never felt so protected and sure of my place in the world as when I was in his arms. My eyes slid closed, and I almost fell asleep right there in his lap, but something stirred in my brain. I sat up and he slipped from my body with a little sigh of relief. I took his face in my hands. I have an idea. I fear I am finished for the night, darling, he said wryly. I am still recovering from a very traumatic transplant. I snorted. No, you pervert. I think we should stay here a few more days. We were supposed to leave the evening of the second, and I knew Neil was already panicking about the thought of missing that first day he could go back to work. I saw the sharp spike of fear in his eyes, like I'd just told him I was considering canceling his birthday. Think about it, I went on quickly. We can leave Sunday night. You can be back on Monday. Do you really want your first day back in the office to be on a Friday? You'd be so frustrated. That's true, he said cautiously. But I feel like the longer I delay. Your company will still be around when you get back. Porteras and Auto Watch will still be around. Let's just spend a few extra days together. I chewed my bottom lip as I watched him consider. We just got engaged. Let's enjoy the moment before we have to go back to reality. Please? For me? He sighed, and I knew from the sound of it that I had won. I can't say no to a damned thing you truly want. Do you know that? I do. I leaned my cheek against his neck, and you know it's the same for me. Come on, he said, patting my bottom. Let's go up to bed. Snuggled beneath the thick blankets, I toyed with the ring around my finger. I lifted my hand, and I could still see the stones glittering, even in the dark. It was an ice ring, but it paled in comparison to the other gift he'd given me tonight. Neil was worth a thousand times more than any diamond, no matter the cost. His lips brushed my shoulder, and his arm tightened over my waist. I can never sell this place now, you know. It's the place where I proposed. There's too much sentimental value. I smirked to myself and wriggled down closer to him. So, I got three things I wanted for Christmas. He growled and buried his face in my neck. Neil and I decided not to announce our engagement right away. He wanted to wait for the perfect time to tell Emma, in person, when we were all together. My mother would be the first person to hear, but I could hold off calling her until we got back to New York. Our additional three days in Reykjavik were relaxed, happy, and totally boring. We ignored our phones, slept in, snacked a little too much, and prepared for our upcoming return to reality. I'd worried that it would be strange going back to life in New York after spending so much time in England. Having a life at all again after cancer had isolated us from the world for the past year. We'd slowly been coming back to normal since Neil had gotten out of the hospital in August, but returning to our Manhattan apartment after the holidays felt like an official stamp. The hellish past year was over, and now we could get on with our lives. I called my mom on our first night back, while Neil was on a video conference with Valerie and a man from a German publishing company, I paced the huge living room, trailing my fingers along the back of the leather couch as I got the courage to place my call. How was Iceland? she asked right away. Was everybody nice to you? She'd asked me the same thing after my first day of kindergarten. I had to smile. Everyone was great, 
Neil's family is really nice. I'm actually calling because I have some news. Oh? The sudden high, tight pinch to my mom's voice clued me in that she might know what was coming. Neil asked me to marry him. This felt more awkward than I'd expected it to feel. And I said yes. There was a split second of silence. Then she said, Honey, that's great. Is it? Suddenly I wanted her approval about this more than anything. No! You're way too young. What were you thinking? She shrieked. I was thinking that my boyfriend, whom I love very much, proposed to me because he loves me so much that he wants to make that love legally binding in public. My back teeth gritted so hard, I swore I could hear the enamel shearing. I guess I was thinking, wow, we're perfect for each other and I'm incredibly happy. Let me guess. He made some grand romantic gesture on a boat or something? Some textbook move like putting the ring in a glass of champagne? She made an impatient noise. Sophie, you are twenty-five years old. That stuff might work on you now, but ten years down the road. He proposed to me on New Year's Eve, a little bit before midnight. We had just come from Christmas with his family. We were in our PJs and exchanging gifts with each other, alone. I interrupted. Like hell, I'd let my own mother paint me as some stereotypical, vapid child woman who'd say yes to anything, so long as there was a yacht involved. There was no grand gesture. He didn't even get down on one knee, and the ring didn't fit. I know you desperately want this not to be a thing, but it's a thing. You can either deal with it or go fuck yourself, my brain finished for me, but I decided to end with a stuttered not. How can I deal with this? You've never introduced me to a boyfriend before, and suddenly it's, here's this middle-aged man I'm dating, and by the way, we're getting married? You can't just keep dropping this shit in my lap. This shit? This is my life, mother. I realized how loud I was and lowered my voice. And if you want to continue to be a part of it, then I don't care how you deal, but you have to. I know. Mom sighed. Do you think I don't know that? I've been with you through all your twists and turns. Oh, Mom. I had to admit, I occasionally felt bad for her. When she'd had me, she'd had no idea what she was getting into. I'd always been headstrong, even as a child, and my wants had hardly ever lined up with hers. But this wasn't an argument over an Easter dress or my curfew. I couldn't compromise to keep her happy. Then don't give up on me on this one. I had her, and I knew it. She was silent for a long time before she said, You know I'm not entirely comfortable with your situation. But if you're happy, I'm gonna try to be happy for you. You just have to give me a little bit to warm up. I am happy. I took a huge gulp of air in relief. Neil and I are really good together, Mom. You just have to get to know him better. I don't suppose I have a choice now. There was a pause. So, no grandkids, then? Sorry. Even if I had wanted kids, it was pretty much a non-issue, now that Neil had gone through so much chemotherapy. Well, Marie's kids will have babies, and they'll probably need a sitter some of the time. There was Mom's always-look-on-the-bright-side attitude. I really will be happy for you. Even if I'm not the world's biggest Neil fan, I think I have that covered. I know he loves you. Because every day when you two are out, I cut another spring in that sofa bed frame, and he never once complained. Mom said that with no small amount of pride at her own craftiness. I wasn't entirely sure why she believed that proved anything, other than the fact that she was a total nut job. That's horrible, I scolded. What is this, a white trash community theater version of Once Upon a Mattress? It's a mother looking out for her daughter, Mom insisted, and I had to bite my cheek 
to keep from pointing out that if anyone needed looking after, it was a crazy woman who went sick house on her own sofa bed with a pair of wire cutters to prove some demented point. But I had to love that she was willing to go to furniture wrecking lengths over my happiness. Chapter 6 The next day, Neil went back to Elwood and Stern. Officially, that is. He'd been logging major hours from home on both Porteris and Auto Watch since November despite his doctor's instructions to take it easy and give himself time. He was itching to get back to work. His alarm woke me at 6.30, but I stayed stubbornly cuddled under the duvet until I heard him emerge from the bathroom after a shower. The master bath in the New York apartment was so cool. It was accessible only through a dressing room, a bigger, more organized version of a walk-in closet with floor-level heaters. Seriously. How did I ever live without special vents to heat my feet in the mornings? I scooped up the shirt I'd sort of, okay, totally, ripped off Neil the night before, and slipped my arms into it. It was going to need a lot of new buttons, so I closed it by wrapping my arms around myself. I went to the dressing room, leaned against the door jamb, and looked in. Neil was buttoning the cuffs of his blinding white button-down shirt. His gray hair was mussed and sparkled damply in the overhead can lighting. He caught sight of me. I'm sorry. Did I wake you? I can always go back to bed. Squinting through my just-woke-up haze, I noticed there was something different about him. It took me a groggy minute to realize what it was. You shaved the beard off. With great concentration, he picked out a navy blue tie with white pin dots, it made me look middle-aged. The fact that you're about to be fifty in March makes you look middle-aged. I flipped my bed hair to one side of my head and yawned. He looked up with his half-smile. He really did appear younger without the facial hair. Shut that smart mouth and come help me with my tie. I've an assignment for you today. My tummy fluttered. An assignment? Is this some naughty student hot professor role play? Because I have to say, I'm kind of down with that. He placed me in front of the big built in trifold mirror. Hands to your sides, please. You're obstructing my view. He lifted my hair to lay the tie over the back of my neck. Stand up straight. I put my shoulders back, and the shirt parted, revealing a long swath of my nude body beneath. He stood just a little too close behind me, the silky fabric of his navy trousers brushing the backs of my thighs. When he reached around me, I fought the urge to rub my face against his sleeve. I hadn't taken my makeup off before tumbling into bed the night before, and I didn't want to mark his shirt. What are your plans for today? He asked, his hands moving smoothly beneath my chin, looping the tie around itself. He didn't need my help at all. He just wanted physical proximity. I met his eyes in the mirror as he cinched the knot loosely around my neck. I'm going to have lunch with Holly today, and Deja, so make sure Rudy gives her a lunch break at noon, okay? Darling, I am returning to my company after a year away. I may be unable to devote time to micromanaging lunch breaks at Port Terrace. He leaned down and sniffed the hair behind my ear. I love the way you smell in the morning, like sweat and sex and hot skin. Mmm, I said, wriggling away. And morning breath, so don't get too close. Come on, tell me what my assignment is. What's this all about? He went to the wing chair beside his ridiculously overblown, and this is coming from someone who worked in the fashion industry, shoe collection. He took a pair of gleaming mahogany-colored crocodile loafers down, as well as a pair of Berluti leather ankle boots. Whoa, whoa, I said, holding out two fingers in the shape of a cross. You can't wear those. You made one of your magazines go cruelty-free, remember? Valerie made the magazine go cruelty-free. I was just along for the ride. Do you want your assignment or not? He asked, slipping his foot into a navy sock. Fine. I leaned against the wall and yawned. 
since you'll be going out for lunch, I'll have to revise my plan. I was going to ask you to edge fifteen times, then come by my office and give me your sopping wet panties and let me get you off, but I don't want to intrude on your lunch with Holly. So why don't you come back from lunch, edge fifteen times, and then call me so I can give you permission to come? He might have phrased it as a question, but he spoke in my sir's tone of voice. It was a command, and it thrilled me to my toes. Yes, sir. I bounced on the balls of my feet, coming fully awake. There was no chance I'd get back to sleep now. How do you want me to do it? He considered as he pulled on his boots. Just your fingers, I think. Penetration? That was an important distinction. Sometimes I wasn't allowed. I don't see what the harm would be. I'll probably be working late, so give yourself a good scene, too. He stood and came to me, and slowly stroked the backs of his fingers down my cheek, across my jaw to my throat. My breath hitched, and my nipples hardened beneath the shirt. I'll just need my tie. He smirked, and slipped it over my head before stepping back, leaving me wanting. He put on his tie and his sleek suit jacket, and checked himself over in the mirror. Not bad. Sleeves are a bit tight, perhaps. You look fine, I reassured him. He seemed to find his slight post-chemo weight gain distressingly conspicuous. Everyone is going to be so glad that you're back. That remains to be seen. He chuckled and gave his jacket one last tug to straighten it. He picked up his loafers, for changing at the office. And as he walked past me, he dropped a kiss on my forehead. When you call, do make sure you're wet. I want to hear it over the phone. Even though I'd just seen Holly in New York before I'd flown home for Christmas, I was beyond excited to meet up and tell her my amazing news. She was going to freak when she found out I was getting married. The truth was, between the two of us, I'd always imagined Holly would be the one to get hitched, and I'd expected it would be to someone who got rich from something to do with the internet, or Pixar. We'd had so many conversations where I'd resolutely declared that I would never get married. She was going to be shocked. When I arrived at the restaurant, a trendy bistro near the High Line, Holly was already there, seated at a table for four in the center of the floor. Holly is a fashion model, and her recent career explosion meant that now, when she went places, she got recognized. She loved it, hence the middle-of-the-room table. Everyone could see her that way. And people really were noticing her. I saw a busboy step from the alcove near the kitchen to surreptitiously snap a photo with his iPhone. Holy shit, my best friend really is famous. Sophie! Holly hopped up from her seat, all arms and legs in her tight jeans and fitted black blazer. A thin chain suspended thick silver teardrops around her neck, and her hair, still growing in from the pixie cut she'd sported a year ago, was curled behind her ears. I missed you. I know. A year and then ten days? Definitely too long. I hugged her, a little tighter than usual. Where's Deja? She's on her way. Her a-hole boss kept her over, she said with a roll of her eyes. Then quickly she clarified, Rudy, not, you know, your a-hole. We took our seats, and I scanned the menu. But I didn't want to decide on food. I wanted to tell her my awesome news. Since I couldn't, I asked her how her visit home had been. Her stepbrother had recently eloped with his girlfriend, whom the family did not approve of and they'd chosen Christmas Day to announce that they were expecting. So it was a great year to introduce Daisha to everybody. Holly wasn't being sarcastic. She beamed brightly. My mom was so busy finding backhanded ways to call Patricia a slut, she never even bothered to bust out her racial microaggressions at Deja. What about you? Christmas went fine, I said, tilting my head. Mom hates Neil. You knew she would. Holly sipped her water. I did, and, um, I wanted to wait for Deja to get here, but I feel like I'm being dishonest if I keep going without telling you the biggest news. I dangled my bare left hand in front of me and wriggled my ring finger. It's been sized, but 
I'm getting married. Oh my God, Sophie. Holly leapt up and grabbed me over the table, her long arms hugging me tight. I'm so happy for you. What are we so happy about? I looked up at the same time Holly did to find Deja shrugging off her coat beside the table. Holly released me and moved to hug her girlfriend. I thought Rudy was going to keep you from us all afternoon. Well, he didn't need me there. He was headed over to the big man's office for celebratory whiskey. I'm guessing you guys are celebrating the same thing? Deja's smile flashed her impossibly straight teeth. She had some supernatural ability to wear the orangey-red lipstick she had on without smearing it all over her blinding pearly whites. She stepped over to hug me. Congratulations, Sophie. I beamed at her. So, funny you should bring up weddings, Holly said, clearing her throat. Because we have some news. I looked between the two of them, blinking in disbelief. No way. You guys aren't. They both held out their left hands. I had been so distracted with my own news that I hadn't even noticed the sparkling princess-cut diamonds on their fingers. Oh my gosh! I knew we were all talking way too loudly, but I couldn't help it. I was so excited. Never in a thousand years had I imagined that I would be engaged to be married at the same time my very best friend was. We both got engaged at the same time? This is like a movie! Father of the Bride Part Two? Holly gasped. Deja shook her head with a smile. No, baby. Bride Wars. Let's not have this situation go down that way. I don't think we'll have that problem, I assured them as I took my seat. The last time Neil got married, it was this big giant thing in Italy, and I have a feeling you're not going to do the traditional plaza ballroom wedding. We want to get married at the castle in Central Park, Holly effused, and dress like princesses, flowers in the hair, whole nine yards, and we want to have our pictures taken on the Brooklyn Bridge. Deja added, then she frowned. You know, we got engaged on Christmas Day and we have the wedding basically planned. I guess it helps when it's two girly girls getting hitched. Have you guys already set a date? I had this weird little twinge in the pit of my stomach, the one I always got when I stupidly compared myself to someone else and found myself wanting. It didn't make sense, but I had this little voice in my head suggesting that since Neil and I hadn't talked endlessly about wedding plans, our engagement was somehow less valid. I pushed that aside. That kind of shitty thinking led to envy, and I never wanted to envy my best friend. That wasn't how we worked. Deja was practically glowing. Not a date date, but we were considering an August wedding. Wow, that soon? Did that sound judgy? I didn't want to sound judgy. I mean, don't you need time to plan? With Miss Efficient here? Holly nudged Deja with her elbow. No way. We could get married on skates. Center ice at Rockefeller Center next weekend if she put her mind to it. Please don't, I laughed. I just got back from Iceland and northern Michigan. I don't need any more cold. And you're going to be my maid of honor, right? Holly asked, biting her lower lip. I mean... I know in the past you've said you'd hate being in someone's wedding. Oh my God, shut up. I will totally be your maid of honor. I mean, I had kind of expected she would ask me since I was her best friend and all, but that didn't make the invitation any less exciting. Our chatter turned to the possibility of destination weddings in tropical climates. As independent 21st century young women, maybe we should have spent our lunch talking about more important topics, but we'd all just gotten engaged. I gave us a pass for one stereotypical lunch. When we were ready for the check, I picked it up. Seriously, it's on me. You guys have no idea how much I needed this today. Still waiting to hear on the job, huh? Deja asked, her perfect eyebrows nodding together in sympathy. Unfortunately, but that's not the problem. I slipped my card into the black leather case and left it on the side of the table. I've just really missed New York. London is an amazing city, and Emma was a lot of fun when she was there, but the past year sucked. It's good to be back to normal. 
The version of normal where you live in a palace on Fifth Avenue and I'm engaged to a human being instead of an architectural structure? Holly laughed. I'm so glad you're home. Never, ever move away again. I'll try not to. There was no point in telling her that in fifteen years, Neil planned to entomb us both at some crusty old estate. She didn't need fifteen years to worry about it. In the cab home from the restaurant, I thought about Holly and how different our lives had become in just a year and some odd months. Before Neil had strolled into Port Terrace and hired Deja, neither Holly nor I had ever expected there might be an end to our single days. I mean, we'd hypothesized about it in a dreamy, far-off sort of way. We might think about doing that when we're in our thirties. We'd better decide on the children issue before we hit our forties and it becomes difficult to conceive. It was always in the abstract far-off future. Maybe it was because we'd viewed married or engaged versions of ourselves as being boring and restricted. I know that's how I'd envisioned myself, and I'd always had this idealistic view about not getting married. The wedding, the dress, the honeymoon, all of that had been beneath me in the picture of independent, successful Sophie that I had begun painstakingly constructing in college. Had I taken a sledgehammer to that construction? Getting married to Neil, hell, just moving in with him, had definitely taken down some walls, but they hadn't been structural supports. I was still Sophie, just like Holly was still Holly. Being with our respective partners didn't make us any more or any less. So if getting married was a total non-issue, why was I so up in my head about it? probably because it was new and exciting and, truth be told, a little scary. But I usually dug exciting and a little scary where Neil was concerned. I'd always assumed that when you loved someone and you wanted to marry them, that was that. If it was this complicated, was I really ready to do it? My phone rang as I stepped out of the elevator. I juggled my purse to answer it as I entered the security code and slipped my key into the lock. Holly was on the other end. Okay, so are you freaking out? She asked in lieu of a hello. Because I'm freaking out. What are we supposed to be freaking out about here? Because I might be freaking out. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. In the foyer, I dropped my purse and coat on the floor and headed directly to the library. The whole getting married thing, Sophie? I have no clue what I'm doing. Her voice trembled. Is this... If I feel like this, then it's probably not the right decision, huh? I don't think that's true. I went to the antique secretary where I kept my laptop, and I opened the lid as I dropped into my chair. This is a major life change. I think it would be stupid of us not to have some serious considerations. I typed wedding, cold feet, into the search bar. Are you Googling this, Sophie? Holly asked with an annoyed ch. I don't think this is a googleable thing. Aha! Cold feet or something more. It's an article, and we are going to read it right now. I leaned forward and squinted at the screen. Okay, apparently it's totally normal to have cold feet, blah, blah. Okay, right here. Many couples experience symptoms of anxiety, including increased bickering and diminished sex drive. Is that going on with you two? No. Things are better than ever. It's like those damn rings of sex powers or something. Holly paused so I could continue. While it's normal to interpret every spat over household chores as an omen, remember that you're both moving into an exciting new chapter of your lives together. Talk to your guy. He might be feeling the same way. Your guy? Are you giving us relationship counseling out of Cosmo? Because so help me... It's not Cosmo. It's some wedding bells blog. I think it's for Southern brides, but a lot of this still applies. I scanned the text. Oh, that's not good. What's not good? Holly shrieked. Well, there's a list of reasons why you should call off an engagement. Do you want to hear them? I wasn't sure I wanted to hear them. I don't know. Holly sounded as panicked as I felt. W what if there's stuff on there that applies to us? What happens then? I don't know. I guess we don't get married? The thought of it crushed my heart. 
like it was being sucked out of a tiny breach in an airlock in a space movie. Or not. I mean, it's a blog, right? It's not like if we read it, we're doomed to unhappiness forever. Nobody gives a shit about blogs. Not even a little, she agreed. But what if we don't read them? After all, neither of us plan to get married. We're probably just freaking out because we changed our minds, or whatever. But it might be nice to know. No, it won't, Holly stated firmly. Look, do you think there is going to be anything on that list that's going to make you love Neil less? Because I'm pretty sure there won't be anything on that list that's going to make me fall out of love with Deja. Okay, you have a point, I conceded. We're just being crazy. This is terrifying, though. I mean, I just moved in with her in September, and things are going great, but... She broke off with a sigh. You know, it's just so grown up and official. I'm only 25. The rest of my life is a long time. It might not be, I reminded her. It almost wasn't for me and Neil, and I feel like kind of an asshole. This time last year, I would have given anything for some kind of future with Neil. Now he wants to spend the rest of his life with me, and I'm doubting something that I desperately wanted before? I imagined Holly nodding sagely as she said, You know, we're totally fucked up. We are, I agreed. I'm so glad we talked each other off the ledge. After we hung up, I sat with my finger hovering over the trackpad. Holly was right. There was nothing on that list that would make me not want to marry Neil, so there was no sense in even looking. But I bookmarked it, just in case. Neil texted me at one, saying I should call him at around five for our phone sex rendezvous, because he'd be between meetings. Then he texted again at three to tell me his schedule for the day had gone off the rails, and he wouldn't be home until after ten. I whimpered as I read the text, then scolded myself. I'd gotten so spoiled by having Neil to myself all the time, and I'd known that it would be hard to go back to the way our lives were when we'd just started dating— Compared to our old routine of Skype sex during the week and the occasional weekend together, things weren't so bad for us now. Still, I dialed his phone, because I needed to hear his voice. Sophie? He sounded concerned, but a bit distracted. You're really not going to be home until ten? I whined. I'm sorry, darling, but I did warn you that going back to work would mean taking care of stuff that piled up while you were gone. I know. You're making up for a year off. I resigned myself to falling asleep to reality television. Look, darling, I have to go, but do call me later. Around seven. I should have time, then, to remember what you have to do this evening, he asked, his voice pleasantly neutral. The naughty man was talking to me about this in a room full of people. I was sure of it. Of course I do, sir, I purred. After we hung up, I told Sue she should knock off an hour early and leave dinner to me, since Neil wouldn't be coming back and he'd probably eat at the office. Then I worked on a video for my YouTube channel. After India had started linking my videos to her massively popular Tumblr, I'd had to invest a lot more energy into them. I couldn't just point a flip phone at the mirror and do my eyeshadow. Now I had a studio light, a small collapsible background, a state-of-the-art HD camera, and professional microphones. The videos used to be a hobby, dashed off in a couple hours' time. Now I worked for weeks on just one. And Neil had taken to calling the library the studio. They just weren't as much fun as they'd been before. Today I decided I would record a tutorial on a smoky eye look— if Neil did get home early, I might be able to pull off the sultry vixen routine and consider whether continuing with the makeup Maven shtick was worth it. At around six, I put away my stuff, washed my brushes, said goodnight to Sue, and headed into the bedroom. Neil wasn't always going to be around for sex, but it wasn't like working late was the worst thing that had ever happened in our sex life. When he'd been ill, we'd gone for months without making love. I knew how to make this work. Part of making it work was committing fully to great sex with myself. 
I ran a hot bath with lots of bubbles and scrolled through Neil's iPod since he'd left it plugged into the sound system in the bathroom. I found Morchiba and decided I could definitely get down to their slow, sultry beats. I lit the candles around the garden tub, hit the lights, and sank into the water. I leaned back, careful not to let my messily pinned-up hair get wet. That would be uncomfortable later, when I moved to the bed. I had an awesome bath pillow, and I rested my head and neck on it as the tub's jets blasted away the soreness in my calves and thighs. Closing my eyes, I imagined Neil coming home and catching me like this. I could clearly see him, standing beside the tub in his button-down and expensive trousers. His sleeves rolled up to the thickest part of his forearms— he would watch me wordlessly for a while as I stroked myself beneath the water. I slipped my fingers down my body, lifting my hips as my hand strayed closer and closer to its goal. If Neil really were here watching me, I would take more time, teasing my nipples and making long, fluttering sweeps down my stomach. Since he wasn't, and since he'd given me the time-consuming task of fifteen edges— I parted myself with my fingertips and made slow, gentle circles around my clit. The hot water moving around the unprotected bundle of nerves made me sigh, and a naughty smile bent my lips. I briefly considered getting out to retrieve the video camera, but the water was so nice and warm and touching myself felt so good. I didn't want to stop. I thought about what Neil would say if he were standing over me something to get my attention like, no one should be so filthy in a bath, or some similar cliché, yet insanely hot quip, and I would gasp and open my eyes and see him there, feel the sudden piercing weight of his stare as he took in my form, and I would be utterly helpless. My fingers sped up, rolling over and over my flesh, fifteen edges, Fifteen orgasms denied at the last possible moment. Fifteen clenched fists, cramped toes, countless sobs of frustration and joy. I had to do them all, and then I had to call him so he could give me permission to finally let go and tumble over. Oh, fuck, I whispered, my other hand gripping the tub beside my head. I pumped my hips in time with my fingers and rose higher and higher. I thought of Neil's big hand dipping beneath the water, his fingers brushing mine as I pleasured myself, and I was so close I had to jerk my hand away, laughing a little at how intense I'd gotten so quickly. I handled the first five edges in the tub before I forced myself to get out. My knees shook, but as I moved about the bathroom blowing out the candles and drying myself, my arousal dimmed. I was in control enough to get to my sixth edge by tapping my clit with the soft terry cloth towel, though I had to grip the bar for support as I struggled not to come. Making a little game of it, I considered how to get close to each next edge. I seated myself on the padded bench beside the shower and used a makeup brush to tease myself, whisking the smooth, ticklish hairs over my clit. He'd said no toys but I didn't think a blush brush counted as a sex toy. I went out to the dressing room and sat, legs splayed in front of the mirror to watch my fingers spread my glistening wetness over me. The sense of being exposed and doing something really naughty harkened back to the days of my inventive teenage masturbation. There was a dirty thrill in taking so much time, moving from the bathroom to the closet to the bedroom, making a full event out of exploring my sexuality. It had been a long time since I'd really gotten to know myself in this way. After a summer of stresses that had pushed sex as far from my mind as possible, it was so good to catch up. By the time I reached number 15, I was a sweating, panting mess lying in the center of the bed. When I was close, so close I felt a step from the summit— I pulled away my fingers and held painfully still. Any movement, even breathing too hard, 
could have triggered my long-delayed orgasm. My vulva throbbed, all of my delicate tissues painfully swollen. I dripped onto the duvet beneath me. I should have put a towel down. When the danger had passed, I reached for the phone on the nightstand. My hands shook, as much from physical tension as from excitement. As Neil's cell rang, I held my breath, afraid that I might just come from hearing his voice. Hello, Sophie, he answered cheerfully. Is there something you need? A gasped laugh tore from my throat, hoarse from my moans and hisses at the denial. Please, sir, can I come? I don't see why not. I'm all alone here. The cocky half-smile that matched his tone would be on his face. I was sure of it. But first, let's make sure you followed my instructions. Are you wet? Are you kidding? I snapped. He clucked his tongue. I could always just deny you, you know. I could always just come anyway. I was mindless with desire, and though I knew my sir didn't like bratty subs, I couldn't imagine any punishment he could come up with that would be worse than withholding release now. His voice lowered to that dark, silkily stern tone that set every inch of my skin tickling. If you did, I would tie you down and make sure you got your fill, and then some. You wouldn't want to come again for a year. He would, too. He loved torturing me with orgasms, making me come over and over until I begged him to stop. If he did something like that tonight... After all the torment I'd already been through today, I wasn't sure I would be able to last five minutes without safe wording. I'm sorry, sir. That's better. Something thumped in the background, maybe a file cabinet door closing. It was a bit off-putting to know that my climax was being multitasked. Put the phone near your cunt and touch yourself so I can hear it. A hot flush burned in my face and across my chest, and I giggled in embarrassment. You want to talk to my cunt, sir? No, I want to talk to my cunt. Who does it belong to? His demand left my knees quivering. You, sir. It's yours. Good. Now do as you've been told. I've missed that gorgeous pussy. We haven't spoken in a while, he said with a low chuckle. I reached the phone down, and I couldn't help my laugh. It was so ridiculous, yet oddly arousing. I slipped my two middle fingers inside my vagina and pumped them, exaggerating the squishy wet sound. Then I lifted the phone to my ear again. Okay, now can I come? I've been waiting for an hour. You may, but do it slowly. In the background, something dinged. Darling, I'm heading through the lobby right now. I'm about to get on the elevator. I'm just returning from a dinner meeting with Rudy. If I lose you in the lift, wait for me to call you back. Is that understood? Understood, unfortunately. So go slowly and don't finish if we get disconnected. Good girl. Okay, I'm going to speaker. I hit the button closed my eyes, and tipped my head back on the pillow. You have no idea how much I need this. I think I might have some idea, he said, and the line was a bit crackly. Luckily, he didn't lose service, and I heard a set of elevator doors sliding open before the signal cleared. But you're being awfully quiet. If he wanted me to make some noise, I could make some noise. My tortured clit practically recoiled beneath its hood as I stroked myself. My own lubrication was enough to keep things good and slippery, and I was swollen, so swollen that I hurt. The tightening in my pelvis was almost a cramp, and my clitoris felt like it was being pricked with needles. I didn't need to be told to moan and thrash as I got closer and closer— my hand fisted in the pillow beside my head, just as the bedroom door opened, and Neil stepped inside. The bastard. He'd been in our elevator. I opened my mouth to say something witty, and I burst out weeping.
He slipped his coat and jacket off, smiling slightly to himself. I can leave again if you'd like. Don't you dare! I climbed up on my knees and grabbed at him, pulling him against me with two fistfuls of his shirt. I was practically hiccuping with my sobs of desperation, and a hot tear ran down my face as I begged him, Fuck me, please. He caught my chin in a firm grip. How do you ask? Fuck me, please, sir. Please. I tried to pull him down with me, and he gently pushed me back. It took him no time at all to work the buttons on his shirt, at least the top four. He pulled the shirt and his soft cotton undershirt over his head, and then he was on top of me, fumbling between us to undo his belt. His hand bumped my mound, then his belt brushed me. I dug my fingers into his shoulders, panting please, over and over in a ragged whisper. He unzipped, then the head of his cock touched me, and finally, finally, he was inside of me. Christ, you're wet. He groaned against my ear. I squeezed him with my internal muscles and delighted in his sharp intake of breath. He kissed my ear and murmured, I'd better make you come now because I have a feeling this isn't going to last long. I don't know if he expected me to argue with him, but I was already a trembling, sobbing, emotional wreck. I worried that if I didn't come soon, I might have some kind of actual breakdown. I considered safe wording just to relieve the tension, but with his cock grinding against my clit and the incredible pressure on my G-spot, it only took two strokes to bring me right back up to that cruel edge. My body, so long denied, teetered uncertainly at the breaking point, and my shouts escalated in pitch and volume as I clenched around him. The desperation and anticipation he'd already subjected me to burst, a wave crashing around an immovable boulder. I shook with the violence of my orgasm. Every muscle in my body clenching and unclenching spasmodically, until all I could do was hang on to the duvet and writhe, my long moan turning into a shriek of tortured ecstasy. As the tremors of my climax continued to rock my body, he slammed forward and withdrew, slammed forward and withdrew, until I couldn't catch my breath. I grasped at him, my hands crawling up his chest to his shoulders to pull him down, and I buried my face in his neck, whimpering, I love you, I love you, like a mantra. I wound my legs around him, and he arched up, face crumpled in a grimace as he pounded his last few thrusts. He growled and grabbed my thigh, pulling me tighter to him, his cock jerking as he came. I clenched around him, reveling in the hot, wet gush and the throbbing pulse of him buried deep inside me. I'm so glad I came home, he murmured against my ear and I squeezed him with my arms and legs. He pulled out and tucked himself into his boxers and sat on the edge of the bed to get his breath. I slipped off the bed, kneeling beside his feet. I reached for the laces of his boot and untied it. He lifted his foot so I could slip the boot off and set it carefully aside. I had seen Neil take off the jacket from a $30,000 suit and drop it on the floor without a thought, but he was damned serious about his shoes. He wriggled his toes when I took off his socks and reached down to cut my jaw as I gazed up at him. A slow smile spread across my face. I'm glad you came home too, sir. He kicked his trousers aside and swung his legs beneath the blankets. Come on, tell me about your day. I got into bed on my side and rolled to the middle to rest against Neil's body beneath the covers. He hit the lights via the remote, bringing them up so we wouldn't fall asleep without dinner. Well, I heard some big news today. I lay on my back and smoothed the blanket across my chest. I folded my hands primly atop the blankets. Holly and Deja are engaged. Are they? Neil's eyebrows shot up. Rudy didn't say a word about it to me. From what I hear, you and Rudy had quite the celebration. I wouldn't say that. 
We toasted to my good fortune, is all. And then we had a bit of a boozy lunch. He fell serious. But I did warn him not to keep it private, so I wish he wouldn't have mentioned it to Deja. I want to tell Emma the news in person, and I'm afraid that she'll hear it from Valerie, who heard it from the office. I nodded, my hair rasping against the pillowcase. I got it. Deja would never spread gossip she got from an employer. She's a better assistant than I ever was. Oh, good. I was hesitant even to mention it, but you know. I did know. One of the biggest issues Neil was working on in counseling was learning to tell me things like this the moment he thought them. Neil had a terrible habit of thinking relatively minor things were potentially hurtful, so he just didn't tell me about them. He'd done it when he'd decided to give me an enormous share of his estate and consulted with Valerie about it instead of coming to me, and when he'd planned his funeral and shared the details with Valerie but not with Emma and me. He was doing way better on confronting his avoidance issues than I was. I scooted into the crook of his arm and laid my head against his chest. Holly and Deja have already set the date, I said, gently wheedling. Neil's sleepy chuckle rumbled under my ear. Oh, have they? And they were all, when are you getting married? But they're doing it in, like, August? Eight months to plan a whole wedding, that's insanity. You need at least... I'm beginning to feel that you're hinting at something. He stopped his slow stroking of my hair against my back and sighed. Believe me when I say that my reluctance to jump with both feet into wedding planning has nothing to do with you. I know you're busy with Emma's big day, and that's fine. It really was. I didn't want to get into hardcore planning myself, especially now that I was going to be Holly's maid of honor in less than seven months. I just want a date. Well, the date will largely depend on the availability of the venue, won't it? Neil gently eased me off him and sat up. I guess I hadn't thought of that. He had a point. Where do you want to get married? Besides, not Italy. He thought for a moment. Well, let's narrow down the continent. We could get married at Langhurst Court. It's a popular wedding venue. I've seen some of the photos in the brochure. Though, obviously, our wedding wouldn't have to follow the tourist package at all. You let strangers get married in your house? I shrieked. Neil, that is incredibly weird. It pays for upkeep, he protested. All right. You have a large extended family. Perhaps we should do the wedding here, in New York. The travel would be less complicated for them. Good plan. Get married in New York. A lot of your business friends are here, too. A New York wedding. Since I'd never seriously planned to get married, I'd never fantasized about such a thing. Besides, I doubted I could ever imagine anything on the scale that Emma had dreamed up. I knew I should be the stereotypical New York bride and demand the plaza, but it seemed cliched. Do you have anywhere particular in mind? The plaza is quite nice, Neil said almost too quickly. At my raised eyebrow, he said defensively. Look, it isn't that I've never thought of marrying you— I'd like to see you walking down the aisle in the terrace room in your beautiful white gown. Whoa there, partner. That much white would wash me out, and it buys into that whole purity culture bullshit? Nuh uh. I shook my head firmly. But we can put the plaza on the list. What about St. Patrick's? That would please your mother, Neil suggested. We could do the reception at the rooftop gardens at Rockefeller Center. There is no priest in his right mind who'll let us get married in the church. I'm your second marriage, you're not Catholic, and I haven't been to Mass in seven years. Oh, and we had that abortion, which, you know, Catholic Church, not huge abortion fans. Hmm, and the no sex until after the wedding clause is probably non-negotiable? He frowned. There's the Mandarin. They have a lovely ballroom. It's very modern if that's what you're going for. I suppose we'll have to really look at our options, huh? My excitement deflated at the thought of going through what Emma was going through. Then I brightened. Well, more of a reason to set the date, then. He winced. Okay, that wasn't cool. Um, 
Is there something you want to tell me? No, it's not, he sighed heavily. It isn't that I don't want to get married. I do. I wouldn't have proposed to you if I didn't. I'm just not looking forward to the wedding. I'm looking forward very much to being married to you. But the last time I did this, the wedding marked the beginning of the end. Now that I've actually proposed, it's all much more real to me. After they'd returned from their honeymoon, Neil's ex-wife had revealed that she'd stopped using any form of birth control, despite their agreement that they wouldn't have children. That had fractured the trust between them to an extent they'd been unable to repair, though they'd spent two years trying before calling it quits. In my excitement over my impending marriage, I'd forgotten about the painful details of Neil's disastrous one. It was only natural, if completely illogical, for him to be nervous. I'm not comparing you to Elizabeth, or expecting you to do what she did. Contrary to what I might express in frustration at counseling, I do feel that I can trust you to come to me with important things. Most of the time. And you know I'm not going to sabotage my IUD or something, I assured him, and I'm not going to turn into a bridezilla. He raised an eyebrow. Okay, fine. There will probably be some bridezilla antics, but I promise they'll be low level. I shook my head. Ugh, we should not be talking about this. I'm going to subdrop like a bastard. Neil grimaced. You're right. I'm so sorry. We'll save it for therapy. Come here. I scooted up against him and laid my head on his shoulder, and he threaded his fingers in my hair to rub my scalp as he spoke. Let's talk about the honeymoon. That's what I'm looking forward to. We're taking a honeymoon? I gasped in mock surprise. I didn't think you'd ever take a day off work again. To go somewhere preferably tropical, where you'll wear tiny bikinis and I'll get to slather sunscreen all over you. You're out of your mind if you think I'm going to miss a chance at that. I heard Belize is nice, I suggested, imagining hot sand on my toes and crystal blue water stretching toward the horizon. Neil made an approving noise. Or Fiji? I have a friend who owns an island in the area. I'm sure he'd let us rent it. Or the Marquesas. I could really get into this whole tropical vacation thing. I've always wanted to go and I've never done. He paused. Did we... Did we just plan a part of our wedding? The Marquis says it is. I picked up his hand and shook it firmly. What do we decide on next? Dinner. He patted my hip with the arm wrapped around my back. Shall I cook something, or do we order takeout? Neither. You just worked all day. I'll cook. I leaned up and kissed him, then rolled away. You know... I could get used to coming home from a hard day at the office to find my wife has made me dinner, he said, watching me as I headed off to the bathroom. I paused by the dressing room door to give him my most good-natured, knock-it-the-fuck-off-right-now look. I assume that in this scenario, we're talking about your third wife. Chapter 7 India Vaughn was the kind of woman who looked way meaner than she was. This was due in part to her ice-blue eyes and the stern set of her mouth. She used to be a heavy smoker, before New York became a socialist state, in her words. So whenever she was sitting with nothing to do, she looked miserable and resentful, probably longing for the days of giving the public the gift of COPD. She was tough and mildly abrasive like a sandpaper that would wear down the soft wood of pine boards, but Oak probably had nothing to fear from her. I like to think that if I wasn't Oak, I was at least Walnut. She might scratch me up a bit, but only just the glossy finish. I walked into the restaurant she had picked, a lovely, unpretentious bar with gourmet pizzas. I loved lunch meetings with India because she always knew the best places. Sophie, good to see you. How was Christmas? I lifted my left hand, the weight of my newly-sized ring reminding me of its presence once more. I held my fingers lax at the knuckles and slowly swayed my wrist. She grabbed my hand and practically jerked me across the table as I sat down. Good Lord! 
I suppose it was a very good Christmas. Is this meant to be your bonus? I laughed, even though I felt a little bad for finding that quip funny. It's an engagement ring. I gathered that, she said dryly. She was almost more British than Neil. But quite seriously, congratulations. This is a bit like a prize at the end of the cereal box, isn't it? If the cereal was full of leukemia. Absolutely. I picked up the menu and scanned for the vegan symbol. Lots of offerings, because India was a goddess like that. I ended up ordering a six-inch soy cheese, spinach, and pine nut pizza. And when the waiter had gone, I shrugged and smiled at India. So, what did you want to see me about? Well, I have very good news on the initial print run, based on early orders. They're very good for a debut. Oh, great. I'd been hoping this meeting would be about the Wake Up America audition, but I didn't want to sound desperate. And the publicist from M&R called. She says they've expanded the launch. It's going to be more like a cocktail party with a brief Q&A for the press. I haven't had a chance to check the attachment she sent me yet, India admitted. Things at work have been hectic. India wasn't only my agent or manager or whatever it was she was doing for a cut of my sales. She still worked at Porteris, Neil's magazine, and walked a very fine line trying to pull off managing my career as a debut author. Neil hadn't been thrilled, in light of how I'd left his company, that India was working with me. He'd set some very strict parameters regarding the work she did at the magazine and didn't want to see evidence of the beauty department slipping due to her attention being focused elsewhere. I completely understand. I couldn't really complain. For a first-time author, I was getting a pretty amazing rollout. Granted, most of that was because the book was about a high-profile one-percenter. Because he worked in media, enough people knew of him to make his incredibly personal details a desirable thing to read about. Though the book was my memoir, they would be reading it for Neil Elwood. There was another reason I wanted to see you in person today, India said, and the hopes about audition news that I'd just set aside returned and immediately plummeted. India nodded as though she saw my disappointment as a physical symptom. Wake up, America, past. Oh, I had the strangest feeling that I'd been punched in the chest and the wind had been knocked out of me. I'd never been great at dealing with rejection, but I'd never been given a thumbs down like this before. Did they say why? They just wanted to go with someone who had a bit more broadcast experience. She shrugged. We knew you were a long shot, but we gave it our best. Though I appreciated the plural possessive, India hadn't missed out on a job. I'd only been turned down from an interview once in my whole life. I hadn't liked it then, and I didn't like it now, especially when it was too easy to pin the blame on things like my looks or my height or my weight. Good Lord, this was what Holly's entire job was. How did she survive? I think this will be good for you in the long run. India went on cheerfully. You can concentrate on writing. Em and I will want to follow up once they know you're engaged. Any chance you'd want to write about planning your multi-million dollar wedding? Yikes. Is it going to be that expensive? I tried to laugh, but it sounded slightly hysterical. I was working so hard to keep myself together, and even though I thought I was doing a good job of it, I wanted to die from embarrassment. Maybe India had sensed how vainly excited I'd been over the audition. That would have been terrible. In the face of rejection, I wanted to be cool, like it didn't matter to me. I really hated the fact that it was affecting me this much. I'd always had a little bit of disdain for people who wanted to be on television. When Holly would go stand outside the Today Show windows, trying to get discovered when we were in college— I would roll my eyes and silently congratulate myself on how above it all I was. If I saw a movie being filmed on the street, I didn't go out of my way to try and insinuate myself into the background, the way some people, mostly tourists, did. I was happy being mostly anonymous. But all of that would change soon. People were going to read my book. 
They were going to know things about me. I'd been all right with that for a while, as it got closer to becoming a reality, though. Are you all right? India looked alarmed. You're absolutely colorless. I'm sorry, I just had a thought about what's going to happen when I marry Neil. That's going to be kind of public news, isn't it? It will run in all of the social columns, yes. Her forehead creased. Sophie, you didn't think of this at all? No. Where I come from when you get married, you put an announcement in the local paper, maybe get a congratulations Sophie and Neil billboard put up. If you've got money and want to show off. Maybe he goes out with his friends and spray paints your name on a rock by the highway. I thought I might hyperventilate. Seriously, people are going to care? A smile tugged at the corner of India's mouth. There are a lot of very wealthy women in New York who are going to be fuming mad over your engagement. Prepare to be ated. He hasn't told his ex-girlfriend yet. I think she'll be the lead pitchfork holder. I groaned and slumped down a little in my chair. Do you really think I'm going to be enemy number one? No, honey. Far from number one. But you just wrote a book about the well-known and influential bachelor you landed. You already put yourself out there. I would have much rather put myself out there as a four times a year beauty segment host on a morning show. Well, it fell through. Be disappointed about it. Drink and cry and listen to sad music and pretend no one understands you. But in the morning, get your arse out of bed and start coming up with an idea for a follow-up book. People are going to ask about that when you do press. India's practical response was strangely soothing. She gestured to the waiter and said, Look, I think we're going to need some drinks here. Scotch. Doubles. Neat. Oh, I don't think... India gave me a look that would have stopped a charging elephant. She leaned forward and fixed me with a hawkish gaze. We're going to stop brainstorming. Right. Now. And I was way too frightened to say no. India's method of making me feel better by steering me toward the future was well-meaning, but ultimately I left our lunch feeling worse than I had over the rejection. I was beginning to feel like it was a mistake, leading off with the cancer in my very first book. It was difficult to top. Was every job I had going to be a one-hit wonder? Would I just flit from industry to industry until I was completely unemployable? My pity party continued on the cab ride home. To add insult to injury, when I arrived at the apartment, Emma's mother, Valerie, was there. Over the past year, Valerie and I had our rocky moments. She believed I'd tried to sabotage poor Terrace, and I believed she was trying to sabotage my relationship with Neil. After I had put my foot down about the strangely close relationship she'd still had with Neil, we were on more even footing. Still, we didn't like each other and I wasn't thrilled that I was coming home from bad news to have to put my nice face on. Neil, Valerie, and Emma were in the dining room, the massive 14-person table covered with more paperwork than it takes to buy a damned house. What's all this? I asked, with a forced smile to announce my presence. Neil looked up from the glossy pamphlet he'd been frowning at. He wore the thick-rimmed reading glasses that looked so impossibly good on him, and the sleeves of his gray button-down were rolled back to his elbows. He smiled, looking utterly relieved to have an excuse for escape. How did it go? Did she hear anything about the audition? I didn't want to discuss it there in front of Valerie, and not in front of Emma. She was trying to plan her wedding, not hear all of my problems. Luckily, she jumped in and rescued me with a perfect mocking imitation of her father. Darling, glad you're home. In answer to the question I so rudely ignored, we're having a small crisis with the menu, and I've invited my intelligent and beautiful daughter, Emma, and her mother, Valerie, to stay for dinner. Valerie laughed, and I managed to maintain my smile, which was suddenly trembling under the onslaught of forced interaction with people. I was disappointed, angry with myself for being disappointed, and it was just... Too much to be on and friendly tonight. Can we speak in the kitchen? I asked, 
trying hard to sound peppy and upbeat, hoping no one would ask me what was wrong while simultaneously knowing it was unavoidable. Neil's frown returned, and he pushed back from the table. Certainly. Excuse us, Valerie. Emma? Of course. Valerie waved her hand and turned her attention back to the catering brochures. In the kitchen, Sue the housekeeper was seated at the island, vigorously polishing the stainless steel cutlery. She looked up as I entered and smiled warmly. Hello, Sophie. Hi, Sue, I winced. I hate to ask because you're so busy. I will find something else to be busy on, she said easily and slid off her stool. As soon as she'd departed through the service entrance, I turned to Neil. I took a deep breath and noticed the split second of hope and anticipation in his eyes. That made it even harder to get the words out without crying. I didn't get it. He wrapped his arms around me. Oh, darling, I am so sorry. Only a few tears leaked out. I'd felt devastated a moment before, but leaning on Neil with his hand on the back of my neck, his chin resting on my head, that made up for a lot. I savored the feeling for a moment, then I stepped back with a sigh of weary resignation. It's okay. I'm more bothered by my reaction than anything else. Why is that? Neil went to the cooler under the counter on the island and pulled out a bottled water. I shook my head and he came back up with a bottle of chilled 1998 Veuve Clicquot, and I nodded gratefully. He set about opening it while I tried to explain. I feel like an asshole for being disappointed about not getting a job on TV. I shrugged. Everybody wants to be famous. I kind of thought I was above that. And it hurts to know you're not. I could always count on Neil to understand me. I'm just exhausted right now. Why does bad news make me so sleepy? I mused. Neil smirked. It's another of your avoidance techniques. Would you like me to cancel dinner with Valerie and Emma? I'm sure they would understand. I shook my head. No, I'm not going to chase Emma out of here. Good, because I was thinking that I would tell her tonight. He muffled the pop of the cork with the kitchen towel. About us. Neil had been waiting for an appropriate time to tell Emma two big pieces of news, that we were getting married and that we were looking for a house together. Tonight was as good a night as any, and horrible person that I am, I wanted to be present when Valerie heard the news so I could see her first reaction. I hated that whenever I was around Valerie, I felt this intensely stereotypical jealousy, especially after she had apologized months ago, and she'd done absolutely nothing deserving of my scorn since then. While I would have preferred to be totally cool and unthreatened by the fact that she had reproduced with my fiancé and had maintained a creepily close friendship with him since, some petty mean part of me wouldn't let it go. I brightened and nodded. Then, remembering my ring was on my finger and Emma was super observant, I twisted it around to hide the diamond in my palm. Oops, can't have that. Thank you for letting me take my time in telling her. Neil took down four flutes and a tray. Oh, that wasn't just for me? I asked, leaning against the counter across the island from him. He looked up, a sympathetic smile bending his lips. It's for you. I know you, Sophie. You need to decompress. If we go out there and announce our engagement right away, you can drink to something happy instead of your rejection. You're basically the best boyfriend ever, you know that? Fiancé, he corrected me. I am terribly sorry. I know you wanted that job. It's fine, I reassured him. But it wasn't, really, and he knew it, just like he knew he couldn't fix it for me right now. So he did what he could do and came around the island to pull me into his arms for a scorching kiss. His mouth on mine, the slow sweep of his tongue along my bottom lip and his hand in my hair made me forget myself for an instant. He could overwhelm me when I least expected it, in the best possible way. When we stepped apart, I took a moment to steady myself and return to the real world. I think they're going to suspect something is up when you come in with those. A giddy bubble rose up in my chest, at odds with my lingering disappointment. Maybe telling Emma about the engagement 
really would chase away some of my pouty mood. Every time we told someone, it made it more real to me that Neil and I were officially forever. Emma and Valerie had moved to the living room, probably to give us some privacy. The apartment was gorgeous, but its soundproofing left much to be desired. We were definitely keeping that in mind while looking for a new house. We didn't need another embarrassing incident like the first time I'd met Emma. The moment we entered the living room, both Emma and Valerie's gazes landed on the tray of glasses in Neil's hands. What's all this for? Emma narrowed her eyes. I could have just blurted out our happy news, but what would be the fun in that? I didn't get the job. Emma looked almost as disappointed over it as I felt. She got up from the couch, and I accepted her hug gratefully. I'm so sorry. They're clearly idiots because you're fantastic. Yes, terrible look, Valerie added, and to her credit, she did sound sympathetic. She was seated on the same sofa Emma had been on, her bare feet pulled up beneath her, her arm resting on the back of the couch, like she was completely at home in my living room. No, Sophie, that's your hurt feelings over the rejection talking. Don't make this into something it isn't, I scolded myself. Thanks. I stepped back from Emma's hug and looked to Neil. But it's nothing, really, because I've got plenty of other stuff to be happy for. Right, baby? Valerie looked from me to Neil with a slowly growing smile, her impeccably straightened slashes of auburn hair subtly swaying as she turned her head. I'm sensing some kind of announcement. Emma's jaw dropped. Neil tried to keep a poker face, but a big boyish grin broke through. I wanted to tell you in person, Emma. I've asked Sophie to marry me, and she accepted. What? Oh, my God! Emma held a hand to her chest. Then she grabbed me and nearly jerked my arm out of its socket, pulling me into a hug that was part joyous celebration, part python squeezing its prey. She squealed her happiness directly in my ear, and I couldn't help but laugh and return her hug. She stepped back holding my upper arms like I was a sweater in a shop. Oh, my God! Finally! Congratulations, Valerie told Neil, with one of those smiles people have when they know they have to seem enthusiastic about something, but in reality they just don't care. I didn't blame her. She was trying to plan her daughter's wedding in the middle of her own relationship breaking up. If she didn't have the mental energy to expend being happy for her ex and his fiance. I wouldn't hold it against her. When's the date? Emma demanded, her hands on her hips. Because I can't start helping you plan the wedding if I'm busy with my own. I'm sure Sophie has friends who want to help her, Valerie reminded her daughter. I would never turn down the advice of a woman who manages to organize paint bucket wielding career activists into one cohesive fur coat battling army. Yes, well, we have Emma's wedding to worry about at the moment, Neil reminded them. Let's get all of that settled first. Maybe it was the champagne on top of the scotch India had plied me with, but I managed to sit through a dinner with Valerie without too much unpleasantness. Neil was touchingly exuberant when Emma pressed us for questions about the wedding. It was good to see him so happy. Sue served us an amazing lentil walnut loaf with a side of spinach and soy paneer and an aromatic basmati rice dish. This is absolutely delicious, Valerie said after a few bites. Emma nodded but frowned. Watch out for cloves in the rice. I just bit into one and it was not agreeable. So, Sophie, Valerie began with an attempt at a friendly smile. What's happening with your book? Well, the initial print order is high. India had assured me that this was good news. And I'm going to have a launch and everything. It's getting a lot of interest because people know Neil's name and they're all snoopy. And what is it called again? Emma swirled the water in her stemmed glass. I'm just the girlfriend. Neil rolled his eyes. I loathe that title. Emma made a face. Why? It minimizes her role in my care, and frankly, our relationship. 
She was my girlfriend, yes, but not just my girlfriend. I think it's catchy, Emma defended me. And the point of the title wasn't to show the reality of the situation, but my perception, I reminded him for the millionth time. Valerie nodded. And once everyone reads the book, they'll have the whole picture. A sudden pang of indigestion hit me as I realized for the first time that people who knew Neil and me were going to read this book. Emma was going to read this book. Probably. Sophie, are you all right? Did you get one of those cloves? Valerie's concerned gaze slid from my face to my plate and back. No, I just... I agonized over the decision as to whether or not I wanted strangers reading this intensely personal story. I never thought about Emma, for example, reading it. Maybe I would gift everyone I knew with a copy of the book, whole sections blacked out with a marker. Dad, have you read it? Emma asked, digging back into her food. I've read parts, passages that Sophie felt were sensitive. He took a swallow of water and didn't meet her gaze. Emma looked questioningly at me. Sex stuff. It wouldn't help to tap dance around it. Nothing pornographic, Neil said to soothe her horrified expression. But there is frank discussion about sexuality during cancer treatment. I hoped she heeded those words as a warning. At India's urging and with Neil's full support, I'd written about the toll chemotherapy had taken on our sex life. Of course, I hadn't included the fact that we'd had a threesome or had gone on a Parisian sex holiday, but I didn't think that would matter. Reading about my honest feelings regarding sex with her father would probably not be high on Emma's list of must-do activities. Well, Sophie, I wish you all the best, but that's a side of the two of you I'd rather not have illustrated. Valerie held up her glass as if in toast and took a long swallow. That was fine with me. I'd also written, without naming names, about an ex-partner of Neil's who'd made me feel profoundly unwelcome when I'd first arrived in England. Valerie had meddled with Emma and her father's relationship, implying that she wouldn't be wanted at the house while her father underwent treatment because of me. I'd never figured out what end Valerie had been trying to achieve by widening the divide between Emma and me. But I was bitter that it had come at the cost of Neil spending time with his daughter while he'd been ill. Still, we were at peace for once. When dinner was over, Emma headed for Michael's, but warned us she'd be back later as Michael had an early meeting and she didn't want to disturb his rest. He's a full-size bed, and it's just way too hot and uncomfortable to be squeezed in so close all night, she said, looping her scarf around her neck. We stood in the foyer to see both Emma and Valerie off. Just the mention of a bed and Michael in the same sentence was enough to elicit a scoff of displeasure from Neil. Emma rolled her eyes. Don't wait up, or you'll be quite put out. Oh, Neil, I'd almost forgotten, Valerie said, pulling on one red leather driving glove. I need to reschedule our meeting with research and development, but I didn't know when you would be free this week. Do you have your diary with you? I'm going now, Emma said, leaning up to kiss her father on the cheek. She gave her mother a hug and wished her goodbye and went out to the elevator, leaving just me and Neil and Valerie, standing alone without Emma as our buffer. Well, Neil cleared his throat. My laptop is just in the other room. I'll run off and get it, shall I? Thanks, Valerie nodded briskly, and I realized there had been some unspoken communication between the two. Valerie wanted to get me alone, and Neil didn't want that to happen, but he had no way to parry Valerie's let's talk about work strike. I was left there with his ex, the mother of his child, the woman who hated me probably more than anyone I'd ever met. So, Sophie, congratulations again on your engagement. Her smile wasn't what I would describe as frozen, but it was certainly stiff. 
I guess that makes you Emma's stepmother. Um, technically? I couldn't puzzle out what she was getting at. She couldn't actually be worried that I was going to become Emma's favorite mom or something, right? Well, maybe you could do Emma a motherly favor. See if you can't get Neil to stop being so vocally opposed to Michael. Oh, she was being nice to me because she wanted something. Well, now it all made sense. I don't know that there is a force on earth capable of changing his opinion on Michael. No, you're spot on there, she agreed. But perhaps you could convince him not to voice that opinion, so often and so forcefully. With all the stress leading up to the wedding. What's this about the wedding? Neil entered the room holding his laptop and looking from Valerie to me and back again. Concern caused a vertical crease between his brows. He got that often when Valerie and I were in the same room together. I think he worried that he would have to rush to my defense or something. I smiled to show him everything was cool. Emma's just got some nerves, and Valerie was suggesting I take her out for lunch, you know, so she can blow off steam about things to a non-parental type figure. Oh, he smiled, relieved and surprised all at once. He held up his laptop to show Valerie. Neil's schedule, a fearsome spreadsheet of numerous multicolored boxes, was displayed on the screen. Do you see that window of about fifteen minutes, on the seventeenth? Valerie waved her hand. You know what? It's not important. Let's just leave it where it is. I'm overthinking things, as always. We said goodnight and she stepped into the vestibule to wait for the elevator. I turned and headed for the bedroom, grateful to have an empty house finally. That was rather obvious, Neil said as he followed behind me. What did she really say to you? His wary tone was, I knew, due to some need to defend and protect me from Valerie. During his illness... We'd had a major blow-up about her involvement in his life and her constant critique of our relationship. I was relieved that, for once, his concern was misplaced. She wanted me to intervene on Emma's behalf. You're being a dick about Michael. A dick? His eyebrows rose. That's a bit strong. Is it, though? I put my hands on my hips, we stood close enough that I had to tilt my head to look up at him. How long have they been together now? Three years? Good Lord, don't remind me, he grumbled. He took a step as though he would move past me, and I stopped him with a gentle hand against his chest. This isn't a joke, baby. Your daughter is so happy with Michael, and he treats her good. You should love him for loving her. I sighed through my nose. Or, you know, if you can't bring yourself to love him, at least pretend to not hate him, because Michael isn't the one you're hurting with this bullshit. Neil reached up and covered my hand with his own, pressing my palm over his heart. I know, and I do realize that there are scores of other men out there I'd hate much more. It's just... He trailed off in frustration. It's hard for you to let go because you want to protect her. I get it. It's because you're a good father. Every now and then, I had an odd pang of envy over Neil's good relationship with Emma. It wasn't that I wanted Neil to be my father, but I did feel a what-if sort of longing toward the man who should have filled that role. What if Joey Tangen had stepped up to the plate? What if I had tried to make some kind of contact with him? But deep down I knew that if a man were willing to miss out on the first twenty-five years of his child's life, he didn't really have anything to offer in the second twenty-five. Still, being present in Emma's life didn't make up for Neil's tired, overprotective father commentary. If I start being nice to him, Emma will think I've had a stroke, Neil argued half-heartedly. You don't have to be nice to him. You can keep on barely tolerating him. 
but stop saying mean things about him in front of Emma. He frowned. All right. Though it will be difficult to stop calling him horrible Michael. You can still call him that in front of me, if you want. I consoled him. Neil wrapped his arms around me and gave me a squeeze. Thank you for loving my daughter as much as I do and telling me when I'm being an utter prat. That's what I'm here for. I didn't need to tell him that no one on earth would ever love Emma as much as he did. He already knew. I was thinking, he said, dipping his head to rub noses with me. You've had a rough day. Why don't you invite Holly round for one of your veg-outs? Really? I'd never invited Holly over before. When we hung out, it was always at her place. She'd stayed with me in London when Neil had been going through the high-dose chemo, but at that point I'd been living there for months, and it had felt like my home. The apartment in New York still felt like Neil's place, and I guess it had never occurred to me to have people over. Neil frowned. Certainly. I have work to do tonight, and I'll feel much better knowing that you aren't brooding in rejection all alone, and there's some very expensive grass in my nightstand. I'm sure the two of you could think of some way to entertain yourselves. You know us so well. I leaned my face up for a kiss. I'll give her a call. I went into the bedroom, grabbed my phone, and dialed up Holly's number. What do you want, bitch? she answered. You sound bored. Totally bored. Deja is at some bullshit thing with Rudy. How soon can you get here? It was awful and hypocritical of me because I hated when Neil was away, but I loved it when Deja had to work and I got Holly all to myself. Well, it depends on where here is, she said with a snort. I mean, I've never gotten the invitation to Fifth Avenue. I ignored the hoity-toity accent she sometimes affected when talking about my new lifestyle. For a while, it had seemed funny, and I'd rolled with it out of a healthy sense of self-deprecation. But now I was beginning to wonder if she really did dislike the way I lived with Neil. I gave Holly the address and asked, So how long, do you think? I don't know. Give me an hour. She perked up at the prospect. Should I bring anything? I thought of the lovely light dinner we'd just had. I wanted to be conscious of what I was putting into my body, and the impact it would have on my health later in life. I really did. A pizza. Bring a pizza. After I hung up with her, I went looking for Neil. I found him in the library, his laptop open in front of him. Whatever he was working on, there were a lot of numbers involved, and I looked away from the screen out of pure math phobia. He'd changed into a T-shirt and sleep pants. There's something about the way a T-shirt stretches across a man's upper back that makes me just ache to touch. Or maybe it was just because it was Neil's back. He looked up, distracted. Is Holly coming? Mm-hmm. I trailed my fingers across the back of his neck. But she won't be here for, like, an hour. A smile touched the corners of his mouth, but his eyes never moved from the screen. Unfortunately, I am quite busy. I dropped to my knees beside his chair and rested my chin on my forearms on the armrest. I batted my eyes up at him. Too busy to get your dick sucked, sir? He turned in his chair, but when my hands went to the button fly of his pajama pants, he brushed them away gently. I can't. I sat back on my heels. He hardly ever turned me down. Not because of anything you've done. He hurried to console me. Then he uttered a resigned, damn, under his breath and said, It takes around thirty minutes for a pill to kick in, and that's on an empty stomach. I frowned and tilted my head. Remember when we first started having sex again, after the chemotherapy? The, uh, difficulties I had? Neil rarely blushed, but his face was furious, ashamed red now. They didn't magically clear up. His meaning became fully clear. Oh, you're... Are you taking boner pills? And of course you pick the most charming possible way to phrase it. He covered his face with his hands and pulled the skin out of shape. 
I am a walking cliché. No, baby. I put my own feelings aside for later examination. Right now, Neil was hemorrhaging dignity. It's not a big deal. I just can't believe you didn't tell me. I don't even want to take the damn things. He shook his head. Of course I didn't want to tell you. You're twenty-five. Men your age are not marrying me, I reminded him. I know. Defeat clung to those words. It's a matter of vanity. I leaned my elbows on his knees. I know it makes about zero difference to you, but if it helps, I don't think it makes you any less sexy. His closed mouth smile told me my words had helped a little. They must not interfere with my appeal too badly. And it's not vanity. You were a healthy, in-shape guy before. As healthy as someone can be with secret leukemia for four years, he reminded me. True, but you couldn't see the leukemia. I paused, considering. Maybe that's your problem. This is the first time you're carrying around real physical reminders of your illness. He frowned down at his stomach. Too true. Stop. I slapped his hand where it rested on his knee. Look, you might never get back into the shape you were in before the chemotherapy and the transplant, and that's fine. I would much rather have a living, slightly doughy Neil with erectile dysfunction than a dead Neil I can remember as having a tight tummy. It's all a matter of perspective. I should have been recording this conversation. For the next time you gain three pounds, he said with a smirk. I got up, shaking my head at him. Where are you going? He called after me. I turned and put my hands on my hips, physically exaggerating my outrage, so he would know I was joking. After that remark, I am not remotely interested in your penis. Good night, sir. Chapter 8 Wow, Holly said, flicking a few more buttons on the remote. There really is a lot of porn on here. Told ya, I squeaked out, around a lung full of smoke. I choked and coughed and passed the joint to Holly. Holy shit, this stuff is... Yeah, I got that. Her eyes were already red. You should always be engaged to a rich dude. We lounged in the media room, a home theater set up of the kind I'd fantasized about as a child. Crushed burgundy velour seats, like out of a grand old movie house, surrounded a big bed with a matching duvet. I'd thought it was pretty cool when I'd first seen it, but since moving back to New York, I realized I couldn't get through an entire movie in the room without falling asleep on the comfy bed. The thing the theater was really good for was fooling around while watching dirty movies. And BFF sleepovers, of course. I still don't get it, Holly said with a shake of her head. You're cute. That one nail thing you did went viral. It had like six million hits the other day. Are you just not good enough for the lofty standards of Wake Up America? I swear the hosts of their fourth hour are drunk as hell every morning. I shrugged. Somehow talking about it so many times today had worn out some of the sad, or just plain wore me out. It was hard to feel rejected anymore. I just felt tired. India thinks this is a blessing in disguise. Without this job, I'll be free to stop doing the beauty tip stuff and just write. But you love the beauty tip stuff, Holly whined, her mouth dropping open in shock. I do, and I would definitely miss it, but I like writing, too. At least I hoped I would. The first book had been more like a form of therapy than a career prospect, but I'd be able to write something less challenging the second time. India wants me to write about what it was like working for Gabriella at Porteris. Holly made a face. I think there's already a book like that. We fell silent a moment. Holly was right. Someone had already written a book about Gabriella Winters. It was apparently the fate of any member of the wealthy New York media elite to have a tell-all written about them. When I'd been working on my own book, Neil had told me there were no less than three unauthorized biographies about him, which seemed excessive for a man whose idea of a hobby was doing more work. 
So what could I write about? My life hadn't gotten interesting until I'd graduated college, and the only thing people would want to hear about in my Gabriella story would be the part where she'd been ousted. Since I'd stayed at Port Terrace, all the juicy details were restricted by a company-standard non-disclosure agreement, not to mention my fiancé's ire. So, Holly said after my thoughtful pause, porn? We found a cheesy French one filmed as a medieval epic, and we were having a lot of fun supplying our own lines for the evil wizard and fair maiden on screen when Holly said, I know what you should write about. Bangdolf's withered staff? I snickered. No, seriously, I have an idea. She frowned in concentration. How many women end up getting married at the same time as their best friend and their stepdaughter-to-be? You think I should write about the wedding? I thought about it for two seconds, then dismissed it out of hand. My first book was about cancer. I don't think a frantic couple of years of wedding preparations are quite up to that level. Who says your second book has to be a downer? Holly reached for the rolling tray a silver platter thing from Tiffany's that neither Neil nor Elizabeth had wanted custody of after the divorce, and scooped up the roach clip. She had a point. Who did say I had to be as serious as cancer all the time? I could compare my experience marrying someone my mother doesn't like with Emma's experience marrying someone her father doesn't like. People are going to ask questions about, how does this all work for ages? They're going to make the same old jokes and you're going to be expected to laugh at them. Why not make some money off that? Hey, yeah. Not that you need the money, she added. That soured the air. I wanted to ask her why she kept referring to me not needing money. Okay, so I didn't need it. I believe Valerie snidely referred to it as landing on my feet once before, but that didn't mean I wanted to just give up and do nothing forever. That would be so boring. And I wanted to ask her if she and Deja were okay, financially, because it wasn't like Holly to be so focused on money. My annoyance came second to my worry. But how did you ask your best friend if she was broke? I didn't want to come off as the lofty savior who could sweep in and fix everything for the poor, impoverished waif. Holly hated it when her parents did that. I just stared at her, like a deer gazing frozen into the headlights of an oncoming car, unable to do anything but let the moment hit me. And that was when Emma arrived. I heard her footsteps, her disgusted, likely exaggerated cough, and realized that the blue haze surrounding Holly and I had spilled into the hallway. You have got to be joking! She shrieked, and I scrambled for the remote, aware too late of the loud grunts and moans issuing from the speakers. It's me, I called out to her, just me and Holly, watching porn. Emma stepped in warily, as if her brain believed me, but her eyes were still scared. And smoking all the marijuana in New York City, apparently. Join us? I patted the bed. Room for one more. Her gaze flicked to the screen. Perhaps another time. She pointed to the tray. Does Dad know about that? Uh, was all I could say. And I nodded, unsure how to proceed. Holly piped up. Who do you think gave it to us? No, of course he did. That's bloody perfect. Emma pressed a hand to her temple. Just keep it down, okay? I have to work in the morning. Quiet as church mice, I swore, holding up three fingers in a Girl Scout salute. When she'd left and we'd heard her door close down the hall, Holly lit up, inhaled deeply, and said on an exhale, Tell me you can't get material out of that. I unmuted the television and lowered my voice. I really, really like Emma. But I'm going to be so glad once she's married and living with Michael. Neil and I are never alone anymore. Hey, you're the one who hooked up with a single dad, Holly reminded me. I know I did. 
I just thought that since she was in her mid-twenties... I was glad the grunts of the dude on the screen would cover up our conversation. I'd never want to make Emma feel like I was pushing her away from her father. Neil lived for the time he spent with her, and I found myself missing her when she was gone for a few days. But we did have difficulties, living as a couple with another adult in the house. Why isn't she staying with Michael? Holly passed the joint to me. I shook my head to decline it. I'm good, thanks. It gets too hot when it's little like that. But yeah, Michael has a roommate situation. There are like four of them living in this loft. It would be a little too new girl for her. Whereas we were more don't trust the bee? Holly supplied in a pinched voice. Exactly. And it's not like Michael could live here. The strangest feeling of dread crept over me. Oh, God. You know, they don't have a house yet. I was expecting her to move out when they got married. But where are they going to go? Holly lifted her eyebrows and tilted her head, as if to say, Glad I'm not you. They didn't have a place to live. Were they even looking? What if they didn't find anything? You don't think they'd actually want to come live here with us? She shrugged and stubbed out the roach. There's more book material for you. We'd been meeting our therapist, Dr. Ashley Kenner, at 7 p.m. on Thursdays, since November. It was a preemptive move we'd made when we'd realized that coming back to real life was going to be more difficult than anticipated. Her office was on West 59th Street, near Columbus Circle. Our first appointment after the holiday was also our first appointment after Neil had returned to work, so I wasn't surprised when it seemed he would show up late. I was waiting in one of the stylish lime-green leather armchairs when he arrived. The waiting room was done up with stark white walls and spotlighted stills of ripe Bartlett pears. The floor was gray marble tile with a huge white area rug. A receptionist sat at a very mod white metal desk at one side of the room. It was her, Good evening, Mr. Alwood. That made me look up from my magazine. Just from the office, Neil looked tired, harried, and in a hurry, as he should have been, since he'd made it with just three minutes to spare. Still seeing him was the best part of my day, and today was no exception. I'm so sorry, darling. I've done it again. He hated being on time anywhere. He considered five minutes early late. He hung his long black coat on the gleaming steel coat rack by the door, then came to where I sat. He wore a slate blue suit of raw silk with a one-button jacket closed over a classic white shirt with an open collar. I could have sworn he'd left the house with a tie. Bad day, then? I asked, tugging on his collar when he bent down to kiss me. Not a wonderful day. Valerie let five poor terrorist staffers go after emails to one of Gabriella Winter's assistants were found on the company server. He unbuttoned his jacket as he took the chair beside mine. What was it this time? Or can't you tell me? I was still very cautious where Porteris was concerned. I never wanted to sound like I was pressing for information. But I couldn't believe that Gabriella would care about Porteris after a year, and since she'd started her monumentally successful new digital magazine. As far as I can tell, these were all friendly correspondences. But Rudy issued multiple warnings against fraternization and confidentiality over the past year, and our position on this sort of thing is very clear. To be honest, I'll be glad when I'm short of the whole place, after Valerie scoops it up this weekend. Since Neil had been working out of the New York offices of Elwood and Stern at the time they'd acquired Porteris, he'd stepped in as interim editorial director a title he'd passed on to Rudy, and which would now be given to Valerie. Well, Valerie wouldn't be interim. It had been her idea to buy the magazine, because she'd wanted to run it herself. After she got entirely moved to New York, and only three blocks from us, sarcastic hooray, Neil would be able to turn his focus back to Auto Watch and the general operations of his company. Wait a minute. Weekend? 
disappointment curled up behind my ribs, and I sighed, accepting and dispelling it at once. He grimaced. I have to fly to London. We're selling print and distribution rights to Port Terrace in six more countries. But I'll be back on Monday. Do you want to come with me? No. As much as I would miss him, I wasn't getting on another plane again for a while. I still wasn't fully recovered from our holiday. I'm trying to get over my homesickness now that we're back in New York for good. It would be like running into an ex. My fiancé used to date London, he said with a tired laugh. That's a bit disappointing. Amir was going to be in town. He wanted to see us, but I'm sure he'll understand. Before I had to argue with my body to stop throbbing at the mention of hot three-way sex, the frosted glass door to Ashley's office opened, and she stepped out. Hey, you guys. Come on in. Ashley, she preferred for us to use her first name, was young, in her early thirties, with shoulder-length blonde hair and blue eyes that reminded me of a Disney princess's. When we'd first met with her, Neil had deemed her too young to be a capable counselor. I think he'd been looking for another gruff, middle-aged man like his therapist in London. But I'd asked him to reconsider, and though we'd only had a few sessions, he'd grown to like the no-nonsense approach that made Ashley such a sought-after doctor in Manhattan. Ashley's office had the same white walls and gray floor and the same huge plate glass with a gorgeous view of the park. Black shelves held a few books and her credentials, and a small desk was tucked against one wall. A comfortable stuffed black sofa sat in the middle of the room, across from her own black armchair and small glass-topped table. She motioned to us to have a seat and picked up her iPad as she sat down and smoothly crossed her flawless legs. She tapped something on the screen and looked up with a pleasant smile. Well? Don't keep me in suspense. How did the holidays go? Wonderfully, Neil said, looking to me with a smile he couldn't contain, no matter how many times we'd told people the news. We're getting married. It didn't look like it came as a shock to her. She smiled and nodded. I'm happy to hear it. So, they had talked about this in his one-on-one -on -one time. Very sneaky. And congratulations, Ashley went on. Have you set a date? Neil looked to me, hesitating before he spoke. W well not exactly. We're very distracted right now with my daughter's wedding, so planning anything is... We probably won't even want to go to our own wedding once this one is done. I was trying to laugh it off, but I saw a telltale twitch at the corner of Ashley's eye. But she didn't say anything, yet. How did meeting the families go? I know there was some concern there. My mom hates him, I said with a shrug. It is what it is, I guess. She's not going to cut me off, so... Neil reached for my hand and squeezed it. I knew he perceived himself the cause of a wedge between my mother and me, but I didn't. Mom had done the wedging, and I'd helped. A lot of her dislike was totally avoidable, I admitted. Perhaps... I did not adequately prepare Mom for meeting Neil. The age difference was an issue. Sophie's mother was expecting a 25-year-old. Neil sounded as uncomfortable as he had when it had been happening. Okay? Ashley's eyes went wide. We'll be talking about that today. Maybe Sophie should go first? I think that's a wonderful idea, Neil said standing. I'll show myself out. Our sessions were ninety minutes long, with thirty spent in individual counseling and thirty spent together at the end. Dr. Ashley never divulged what one partner talked about to the other partner, which was as much a relief as it was maddening. It was very easy to imagine that Neil went into his sessions and complained ceaselessly about me, even though logically I knew that was absurd. He'd already admitted that he talked more about himself in his sessions then about me, and I found the same to be true on my side. As the door closed behind him, I sighed and faced Ashley. Okay, I didn't do what we talked about. And you were so ready to, 
she said with a little laugh to disguise her frustration. What went wrong? I chickened out, but I went to plan B. Good, she encouraged me. Plan B had been to confess to Neil and prepare him for my mother's expectations before he met her. But I was supposed to have done that before we left New York, so he'd have a chance to decline the visit. But not until we were already in Michigan. Okay, let's just take the good out of all that bad and focus on that. You did tell him. That's a big improvement from where you were when you first came in. Ashley had a way of framing things to seem way more positive than they were. I wondered if that was a normal therapy technique, or just something she used with her most deeply fucked up patients. Thanks, I said, not feeling particularly worthy of the praise. I'm assuming you learned something from the experience? I had. I'd been dreading admitting it. Obviously, I learned that it's far easier to tell the truth immediately, rather than hide it. But I also learned... Ugh. Ashley didn't say anything, but waited with an interested expression. Maybe I'm not as comfortable with our age difference as I thought I was, and I'm not saying I'm uncomfortable with Neil's age. I'm just uncomfortable with everyone's reactions. We're adults and we love each other, but I feel like we have to keep having the same conversation every time we meet someone new. I sighed. I feel like I have to constantly prove that I love him. Because of his age or because of his money? She asked gently. Both, I admitted. You just got engaged. I assume that means you love him? Ashley said with a tilt of her head. Why? Why? Why do I love him? Was she supposed to ask me something like that? Was I supposed to answer it? It didn't seem to matter because when I opened my mouth, all I could manage was, well, um, I, before my stomach dropped into my toes, and I felt lightheaded with panic. Of course I loved Neil. We'd just been to hell and back together. I was never happier in my life than when I was with him. But why did I love him? Why couldn't I think of an answer? You can't tell me why you love him. Ashley began, a slow smile forming on her mouth. Because you're in love with him. Love isn't rational, and you are. That's why you're having such a difficult time. If you were sitting here and saying that his age was a problem for you because you wished he was younger, I might advise you to reconsider your engagement. But it's only a problem because other people are making it an issue. Should other people's opinion of your happiness be detracting from your happiness? I was about to argue that my relationship with my mother was very important, and that it did affect my happiness, but it sounded so stupid in my head already that I probably didn't need to say it out loud. You're right. It shouldn't. Seriously, I should have been doing therapy years ago. After my thirty was up, it was Neil's turn. I sat in the waiting room sucking up the free Wi-Fi to look at wedding dresses on my phone and tried to think about what I would say to him when we met at the end. The time passed quickly as it usually did when my mind was roiling through everything I'd just talked about. When Ashley invited me into the office, I sprang up and hurried in. Neil looked up almost guiltily when I came back. I'd only just sat down when he reached for my hand and covered it with his own against the sofa cushion. I am so sorry. Way to jump the gun, Neil, Ashley said wryly. Wait, what are you apologizing for? I looked uncertainly from Neil to Ashley. Was I supposed to be thinking of something to apologize for? No, it's me. It is entirely me. He squeezed my hand. I have been letting my feelings about my previous marriage interfere with my feelings toward you. That isn't fair. Oh, I frowned. This was one of the parts of couples therapy that I didn't like, hearing stuff you sort of expected, but had convinced yourself you were being paranoid over, confirmed in front of another person. Don't act surprised. You've noticed. That's what all the talk about setting a date was. 
wasn't it? I wished he hadn't noticed. Look, I don't want you to do the weird thing you do, where you ignore your emotional needs in order to protect what you perceive to be my feelings. Remember when you did that and you had no idea what my feelings were and we broke up? Neil isn't going to do that this time, Ashley said with her characteristic no-bullshit tone. The two of you are coming into this marriage with your own past baggage and some reasonable fears. You've just been through an incredibly turbulent year, and you're both emotionally raw. But the very last thing you can do in this situation is assume that your feelings and your partner's feelings are the same, or that you know what's going on inside their head without asking. It's kind of good that you mentioned that, because I am dying to know what Neil thinks of something. I'd been working up the nerve to broach the subject with him, and it was a relief to know how to start the conversation. How do you feel about Emma living with us? Neil sat up straighter, adjusting his shoulders against the back of the couch. I, um, well, it feels normal to me, I suppose. Though Valerie and I tried to keep our custody arrangement as equal as possible, I always somehow ended up with Emma more than I was without her and she doesn't have anywhere else to live right now. Where does her fiancé live? Ashley asked, her fingers poised above her iPad to type a note. He has roommates, so it's not an ideal situation for a couple starting out. Neil said this as though it was an apology to me, but he couldn't have worded it more perfectly. Yeah, I said with an arched brow. I know. He hung his head in good-natured shame. Ah! I put a hand on his knee and gave it a little squeeze. It isn't that I don't love Emma. I do. But it's a little weird having to worry in my own house that I'm going to do or say something in front of her that makes her uncomfortable, like the other morning when we were in the kitchen. It had been a blissfully lazy Sunday, and I'd thought the coast was clear because Emma had stayed the night with Michael. Neil and I just had fantastic morning sex, and we'd gone to the kitchen to put on some coffee. So, of course, Emma would come home exactly when I was standing in the kitchen in one of her father's T-shirts and nothing else, punching buttons on the needlessly complicated coffee maker. The fact that Neil had been standing behind me, his arms around my waist, clad in just his boxers and a smile, was the icing on the uncomfortable cake. It wasn't an abnormal interaction for a couple to have, but Emma had walked into the kitchen and right back out again, and disappeared for most of the day. I feel so guilty about touching you or kissing you in front of her, because I feel like it gives her the massive creep-outs. I finished, my frustration obvious in my tone. I'm making her totally uncomfortable just by being your girlfriend, whether she admits that or not. Ashley nodded, her lips pursed. Weren't you two looking for a new place to live? We were. I don't know if we put that on hold, Neil said, looking uncertainly to me. What happens if you do find a place to live? Ashley went on. Is the expectation that Emma will move in with you there? Or her and Michael both? That's not something I would be comfortable with, I stated firmly, but I know my expression was totally apologetic, as I shrugged. That's just how I feel. I'm sorry. No, I would never have expected you to agree to that. The fact that he even had to say that meant he'd thought about it. Yikes. When we were looking for a new place, I'd assumed Emma would stay in the apartment after we moved, at least until she and Michael found a place of their own. That way we would have some privacy, and so would they. But after our discussion at the lake— What discussion was this? Ashley prodded. We said no big life changes. It sounded silly that we were sticking to that, considering he'd proposed to me just a few days later. I guess that went out the window. Marriage to each other will be a huge life change for both of you. Getting married is very high on the list of major life stressors. So is moving houses. Unfortunately, if you want to do the former and do it successfully— you might have to do the latter. Ashley set her iPad aside, a signal that it was time to wrap up. 
Before our next session, I'd like the two of you to brainstorm alternate living arrangements that everyone will be comfortable with. And Neil, talk to Emma about this privately. She may have concerns she feels she can't share in front of Sophie. After our session, Neil dropped a check on the receptionist's desk, and we exited to the elevators. The doors had no sooner closed than he said cautiously, I haven't been looking. I should make that clear. But when I called the agent to tell him we were no longer looking, he mentioned a listing in Sagaponak, and I said I would talk to you about it. Wow, that far? I knew we'd talked about not staying in the city permanently, but this came as a shock. I'd prefer something in Connecticut, but it does sound like an ideal home for us. We could fly out and look at it on Monday. He straightened the cuffs of his jacket, eyes fixed on the numbers above the door. He hated elevators. If we don't care for it, nothing has to come of it, and you can pretend you're on that wretched television program you so enjoy. Using house hunters against me? The man knew my every weakness. I do like looking at the insides of other people's houses. I paused. Don't you think flying is overkill? We can charter a helicopter. It won't be any trouble. You live in a world where chartering a helicopter isn't any trouble, and you're taking that helicopter out to the house you're looking at, in the Hamptons. Okay. The realization had numbed me enough to agree. Let's go look at a house, then. I don't know if talking through our issues and confronting them in a productive way gets us turned way the fuck on, or if we're just so relieved that therapy is over for another week, but we were as giddy as two teenagers as we left the building. Some nights we'd head straight back to the apartment to go at it like animals, very quiet animals if Emma was home, but this time we decided to make it a date night. We went out to dinner at our new favorite restaurant an experimental vegan place that was partially our favorite due to its proximity to our apartment. The atmosphere was upscale casual, booths, but no decimals on the menu prices. You know, I was thinking, I said, during a lull in the conversation as we waited for our meals to arrive. I wouldn't mind if you saw Amir while you were in London. Neil's half-smile flirted with his mouth, and he raised his water glass to disguise it. Wouldn't mind if I saw him or... Or... I laughed and had to break eye contact. Oh, please. It's not like it's any different than what we did before. And you like him. Not in the romantic sense. He was suddenly very serious. I worry that an arrangement like this might lead to some... jealousy. I shook my head. First of all, if I thought something more was going on... I wouldn't have suggested it. And I wouldn't have gotten engaged to you if I thought you were going to cheat on me. That answer seemed to satisfy him. I know all this, of course. I don't know why I'm worried. Maybe the gurgling in my stomach was hunger, but at the moment it felt like dread. You were comparing me to Elizabeth again, weren't you? It's not an easy mechanism to turn off, I'm afraid. He sat back in his chair. That's the problem, I think. I am afraid, but only because I want this to be a successful marriage, Sophie. I don't ever want to lose you. I'm not going anywhere, I reminded him happily. See Amir in London, if he's up for it. Honestly, I think it's pretty awesome that we have a friend with benefits together. Neil raised his glass. To our unconventional relationship. I picked up mine and added, may it continue to surprise us. Under the table, I slipped my pump off and ran my bare foot up the inside of his ankle, hooking under his pant leg. The darkly mischievous gleam in his eyes made my nipples harden, and my flimsy lace bra was not going to disguise anything. The corners of his eyes crinkled as he slowly half-smiled, half-smirked. Darling, if you want to be surprised, I'll shock the hell out of you tonight. Chapter 9 After dinner we headed back to the apartment. 
When we came in, we heard Emma and Michael laughing in the media room. So we snuck through the foyer and headed straight for the bedroom. It's like bringing a boy home and trying not to get caught, I whispered, sputtering my laughter. Let's go into the bathroom. They won't be able to hear us in there. He pushed me along with a hand at the small of my back, which dropped to the zipper of my skirt. He deftly popped the hook and I pulled the zipper, and I stepped out as we crossed the bedroom. I'd opened two buttons on my top before Neil could get a chance to accidentally rip them off. It was a teal silk cap sleeve scoop neck blouse that I adored, and I didn't want to risk not being able to find a replacement. I whipped it over my head as we stepped into the dressing room, and Neil stopped me with a hand on my shoulder. Wait right here, he said, his voice low and husky. Did you lock the door? Not that I thought Emma would ever dare come into the bedroom while we were in it, even if the door were wide open. Of course I did. Neil pulled the wing-backed armchair from near the shoe rack to sit in front of the mirror. He hadn't taken anything off, not even his jacket, and I was standing there in my black lace thong and matching bra, so it was no surprise when he went to the small jewelry safe and punched in the passcode to retrieve my collar. The collar I wore when engaging in a big D little S scene with Neil wasn't the kind you could attach a leash to or use for anything rough. A perfect circle of platinum about as wide as my thumb, ringed all around by huge, flawless white diamonds, the collar had cost Neil an asthma attack inducing seven figures sum. He'd given it to me on our trip to Paris the year before, which made it all the more precious to me. But the most important part of the collar was the mindset it put me in, the moment the latch closed around my throat. On your knees. The side of me collared had a powerful effect on Neil as well. The change in him was instant. One moment he'd been horny and laughing with me, the next he was stern and commanding. I dropped to my knees before him and caught myself subconsciously wetting my lips. He opened the clasp and fitted the cold metal band around my throat, then gently fastened it again. While I loved wearing the collar, I always had a moment of fear when it first went on. I didn't care for anything around my neck. Well, except for Neil's hand, on occasion. And my psyche didn't seem to notice if whatever was around my neck was a noose or a turtleneck or a BDSM collar. Neil knew this. And just as the latch clicked into place, he reached down and cupped my cheek. The reassuring touch of my sir was all I needed to regain my equilibrium. His hand went to his fly, and my mouth dropped open, my lips wet and obediently waiting. He laughed and walked to the armchair. He unbuttoned his jacket and tossed it aside, then sat down, rolling up the sleeves of his white button-down. Come here. Sit on my lap. I started to climb to my feet, and he made an admonishing noise. I didn't tell you to get up. Prowling toward him in a crawl, I pressed my thighs together on every pass. My vulva ached, begging for pressure, and I took it where I could. Slowly, he ordered. Let me enjoy the view. I bowed my head and fixed my gaze on the carpet as I approached. I didn't look sir in the eye without permission. On my lap, Sophie. I got to my feet, still not daring to lift my eyes. He pulled me down so that my bottom was snuggled tight to his groin and my legs splayed outside of his. He spread his big hand on my stomach and stroked up and down between my breasts, over my belly button, the top of my panties, and back again. Not with a gentle feather light touch, but a firm, needing urgency. On one of his passes, he gripped the front of my bra and tugged at it. Enough of this silly thing, he growled, jerking it upward. The lace-covered underwire rasped over my nipples, and I gasped. 
Even an unpleasant sensation could set my nerve endings on fire when we were together like this. He pulled the bra up over my head like a shirt rather than unfastening it. When I tried to slip my hands free, he stopped me with a firm grip on both my wrists. Lowering my arms and tucking them behind my back, he wrapped the bra around and around my forearms, binding them together. It wouldn't be difficult to get out of on my own, but that wasn't the point. It was meant to remind me to keep my hands still, not to forcibly restrict movement. He'd parked the chair we sat in across from the full-length trifold mirror set into the opposite wall. I took in my reflection. My long legs draped over his longer ones, spread wide, the crotch of my black lace thong pulled up between my labia. His big hands cupped my breasts, kneading them as his mouth lowered to my neck. He nibbled and sucked and squeezed with his hands until I was writhing in his lap as much as I dared without scooting right off. One hand moved to stroke my hair behind my ear before he brushed his lips over the spot just beneath it the spot that made me shiver and tickle all over. Neil loved to tease me this way, combining rough touches with delicate ones, so I never knew what to expect. He dropped his hand to my shoulder, gliding down my arm, veering off where my elbow was pinned between our bodies. He followed the line of my hip instead, over my stomach to the top of my panties. He clenched the lace in his fingers, drawing the material up painfully tight in my cleft. The edge of the fabric cut across my clit, and I squeaked in discomfort. He eased off and slipped his hand beneath the lace. I watched the mirror, fascinated, as his big hand stroked me beneath the thong, his fingers curled possessively over my mound as he rubbed in soothing, maddening circles. Oh, did that hurt? He was definitely not as remorseful as he was pretending to be. Yes, sir. My lips pursed, and I was keenly aware of the slow, steady breaths I took through them. One finger slipped between my labia over my clit, and I closed my eyes. My shoulder slumped, and I leaned forward on the hand that was still at my breast. The finger in my panties drew a lazy swirl, and I shuddered. He dipped lower, wetting his fingertip and slicking my fluid up and over my hard, straining clit. I mentally tried to step my arousal back because I knew there was no way I'd be coming this soon in the evening. I concentrated on the side of his hand in my panties, my body undulating in his lap. It wasn't the most efficient way to keep myself from getting hornier. I should have thought it through better. I closed my eyes and leaned my head on his shoulder, and the hand at my breast came up to grasp my chin, forcing me to face the mirror once more. Open your eyes and look, he commanded me. Look at what I'm doing to you. It was almost too much stimulation. I wanted to clamp my thighs shut around his hand to stop him from moving, but he continued his slow circles that tugged at the hood of my clitoris and set off more throbbing pulses deep in my groin. His calm, steady breathing in my ear highlighted my own breathlessness. The brush of his clothing on my skin reminded me of my naked, vulnerable state. What can I do to you, Sophie? My answer was automatic. Anything, sir. And you don't ever fucking... Forget it. He softly bit my shoulder and withdrew his hand from my panties to give my mound a slap that made me yelp. Quiet, he warned, and it was the voice of Neil, my fiancé, not Neil, my dom. Then darker, lower, he said, get on your knees. I sank to the carpet in front of him, and the bra around my wrists slipped a bit, he pulled it free the rest of the way when he bent down to take off his shoes. Would Sir like me to take those off for him? There was something I found incredibly sexy about taking his shoes off. That probably made me a bigger pervert than I already was. 
but acts of lowly subservience really turned my crank. Sir looked like he was considering it for a moment. Then he nodded once and lifted his foot. I sat back on my heels and slipped the shoe off, then slid my hands along his foot to his ankle, reaching under the leg of his trousers to roll down his thin wool sock. When I'd finished with his other foot, I felt him watching me, with a kind of darkly amused intent that always gave me a pause. What had he come up with in his devious imagination? What would he do to me this time? Raising his foot, he pressed my shoulder down, and I lowered myself to my hands and knees, then to the floor when he didn't let up. He rose and stared down, hands in his pockets, at me lying prostrate before him. Then he held my head down with one big foot, gently on the back of my neck. What do you say? Thank you, sir. I mumbled into the carpet. Thank you for letting me please you. Who said you'd pleased me? He lifted his foot off me and walked around my body in a slow circle. I heard him pause before the drawer we were using as a stand-in for the toy cabinet, but I didn't dare look up to see what he was getting. I didn't know he had the paddle until he dragged the wide leather surface down my back. Have you been a good girl? he asked, crouching to trail the top edge of the paddle up and down my spine. I don't know, sir. Have I been? It's not my place to make that kind of judgment. The paddle swept up and over the curve of my buttocks before Neil brought it down on his palm with a loud crack. Right answer. His footsteps left the room, and I heard the television click on in the bedroom. The noise would provide cover for us, but the first time he'd ever done that during sex, I'd been furious until he'd explained it. I'd just thought he was stopping to watch TV. It had been one of our funnier arguments. He came back and rummaged through the toys again before ordering, Sit up. The moment I lifted my head, a length of dark silk covered my eyes. As he knotted the fabric behind me, I slowed my accelerated breathing and found my center through sheer determination. I was trying to learn to pace myself, to not become overstimulated or overwhelmed too early in the game. It was a losing battle. With every new order he gave me, my desire intensified. Soon my need would be unbearable. Up! He helped me to my feet. I swayed a little disoriented by the loss of a sense, but I could tell he was taking me into the bathroom. As we passed through the door, he guided me to the counter where his and her vessel sinks stood on brown Italian marble. He positioned me between them and bent me over the counter, making sure every inch of skin possible touched the cold surface. I whimpered. I couldn't help it. A bit cold? he asked, one palm gliding over my ass. Then perhaps this will warm you up a bit. Put your hands on the counter where I can see them. I'd no sooner done it than the paddle hit me, a resounding crack echoing off the stone and glass in the room. I squealed. He usually worked up to the hard ones. I wondered how much worse they'd get, and my pussy clenched in anticipation. The telly only covers so much noise, darling. Don't make me gag you. I pressed my lips tightly together. But who was I trying to kid? I was going to end up gagged one way or another tonight. Another smack of the paddle just as ferocious was followed by a gentler one, and a soothing kiss on the wide swath of burning skin left behind. Poor dear. He pressed the paddle against my backside. The leather cooled me, but there was a sadistic undercurrent to comforting me with the instrument of pain. Marks tonight. Or no marks. Marks, please, sir. I hadn't had a truly brutal spanking in a while, and I loved the way my ass looked with big red welts and purple speckled bruises. If Neil was going away for the weekend, I wanted something to remember him by. The paddle raised, then fell again with cruel force, 
and he kept it pressed tight against my flesh to drive the blow deeper into my muscles. I cried out. I couldn't help it. His hand fisted in the back of my thong, and he jerked it down, the lace scratching like razor blades along my aching skin. He slapped one of my thighs, and I stepped obediently out of the leg holes. I knew where those panties were going. Open, he ordered, pushing the scrap of fabric against my mouth. I dropped my jaw, and he forced the panties inside, pushing his fingers to the back of my throat until I choked. The taste of my arousal on the lace brought a renewed pulse to my groin, and my pussy clenched in delicious longing. Good girl. He squeezed my face and I mumbled a muffled curse through the panties just to goad him on. That earned me a slapped cheek before he pushed my head back down, and I grinned around the gag and tried to say, Thank you, sir. This time when the paddle landed, I was glad to have my cries muffled. There was no way I would have kept quiet enough, though I doubted Emma and Michael would really hear all the way down the hall over the noise of two different televisions. I would have been mortified if they had. I'd asked for marks, and Neil gave them to me, blow after blow. He'd learned my body and my limits to perfection, and the moment I thought about asking him to stop, he did so of his own volition. This, Neil said in a low growl as his fingers slicked down between my folds, looks very inviting. I moaned against the makeshift gag as his fingertips slid into my cunt, just far enough to rub in and out of my sensitive opening. In the darkness behind the blindfold, I imagined what I must have looked like, bent naked over the counter, still wearing my red patent leather pumps. My ass probably matched them. I ground my teeth against the bruised ache, my vulva bare and still a bit swollen from my wax the previous afternoon, tingled as the backs of his knuckles bumped my labia. He pushed his finger deeper, twisting it as he pumped and withdrew. I sobbed at the loss of penetration, my hands opening and closing on the lip of the counter. Oh, a very warm welcome indeed. I heard a rustle of fabric, then felt hot skin and the coarse touch of his chest hair against the backs of my thighs. He leaned down and kissed the curve of my bruised ass, kneading the flesh with both hands as I moaned in exquisite pain. More kisses pressed along the seam beneath a cheek, and I wriggled in his grasp, my toes curling in my shoes. When his tongue touched my clit, it startled me. Blinded by the silk over my eyes, I had been using his slow progress down my backside as a map to predict his destination. He'd skipped over a lot of road to take me by surprise. He flicked the hard, straining nub with the very tip of his tongue, then licked over it with flat, wide strokes. I pushed back on him and rolled my forehead against the counter. I'd watched him go down on me a hundred times at least, either looking down my body or seeing his reflection in a mirror. Almost always he would hold my gaze as he sucked and stroked me. Now, even without the blindfold, I wouldn't have been able to see him, and it drove me mad. He knew it would, of course, and that was the point. It was no secret that having something taken away from me was a sure-fire way to make me want it even more. I'd become more practiced at delaying my orgasms, but robbing me of a sense had removed one of the distractions I used. If I were watching Neil eat my pussy, it was easier to remove myself from the act, as though I were watching it happen to another person. Now, it was too much. There was no distance. I wasn't sure I'd be able to keep from coming out of sheer willpower. So when Neil murmured, You have my permission to come, Sophie, against my labia, my knees buckled with relief. As many times as you like, he added. I had become so attuned to obedience 
that just having permission to come was nearly enough to get me there. A long, slow swirl of his tongue helped me along, and a finger gliding easily into my vagina took me the rest of the way. He pressed hard on my G-spot, and I let go completely, rocking on his hand, my inner muscles gripping his finger in waves of ecstasy and desperation. It wasn't enough, wouldn't be nearly enough until his cock was inside me. But with Sir, it was never so simple. Though I'd just had an orgasm, he didn't stop, laving my oversensitive flesh with demented purpose while I sobbed through the gag, begging him to stop despite the fact that my words were lost in the sodden mass of lace filling my mouth, or the fact that I didn't really want him to stop. If I did, I could give him our signal, and he would stop immediately. That's what made the futile begging so fun. He kept me there, pinning my hips against the counter, sucking and licking me to another peak, and another. When my knees buckled from exhaustion, and I nearly toppled to the floor, he stopped and helped me to straighten. I leaned on him for support, his hands worked at the back of my head to untie the blindfold. I'm checking in, Sophie. I blinked at the change in light, and Neil pulled the panties from my mouth. Two tear tracks of mascara cascaded down my cheeks. My face was flushed from the slap he'd given me. The marble pressed against my skin and the head rush of too many orgasms. My throat was hoarse. We're still green, sir but I do need some water. He pulled my hair into a ponytail in his fist and wrapped it around his knuckles. I flipped on the tap, and he lowered my head so that I could drink from the long stream that flowed from the tall, arched faucet. The man could make getting a drink of water arousing. When I raised my mouth, he pulled me back to him gently. He still held my hair, and he lifted my crumpled panties, to wipe the trickle of water from the corner of my mouth and the tear tracks from my cheeks. Come along. His grip on my hair tightened, and he tugged me toward the door. He didn't let go of me until we stood beside our neatly made bed. On your back. He tugged at his belt and unzipped his fly. Now. I did as he asked, a thrill of excitement sparking through me. I loved getting fucked this way wrapping my legs around him and raking my nails down his biceps. Well, when he left my hands free. He was awfully fond of holding or tying my wrists together to frustrate me. Not this time, though. No sooner than I'd lain down, he was on top of me, pushing into my swollen, achy cunt. I gripped his shoulders and arched my back, and he pinned my head to the bed with a fistful of my hair. Look at me, Sophie. I opened my eyes to meet his, and I was instantly lost. This was the man I was going to marry. This was the man I was starting a life, building a family with. I mean, sure, it was a weird family with all sorts of strange relationships in it. But we were doing it together. And despite our problems and all the bumps in the road, when I looked into his eyes... I saw the same depth of love that I felt for him, directed back at me. Fuck. I loved therapy night. Neil's slow, steady strokes brought me to another gentler climax. I floated on the pleasure, totally euphoric, clutching his arms and whimpering mindlessly. But I didn't look away from his intense green gaze. He didn't break eye contact with me either panting and groaning as he ground deep and found his own release. For a minute, we just stared at each other in mutual disbelief. We had a lot of fun, awesome sex, but every now and again, we surprised ourselves with how emotionally momentous fucking could be. He kissed me, then rested his forehead against mine. Well, that didn't last as long as I expected. I laughed and wriggled beneath him, and he slipped out, but stayed poised over me on his elbows. I reached up and pushed back his sweaty hair. I liked it. I like you. 
He kissed the tip of my nose, then rolled off me. You're not so bad, I conceded, snuggling happily beside him to rest my head on his shoulder. He turned out the light and hit the remote to turn off the television. The dressing room light was still on, painting dim lines along our shapes in the dark. Can I get you anything? he asked as he drew the covers over us. Water, some ibuprofen or ice. Nah, though I would be incredibly sore in the morning. Just hold me. That's all the aftercare I need right now. What do you get out of it? Neil asked softly, running his knuckles up and down my arm. Submission. I've never quite grasped the draw. Hmm. I pondered very profoundly. After a moment, I followed that brilliance up with, I don't know. I guess it's the feeling of not having to make decisions. I mean, I think all the time. My brain never stops going, and there are times that you get me so deep into subspace that my body won't even make involuntary decisions without your prior approval. To me, that sounds horrible. He actually shivered. I feel a bit guilty, like I'm the one having all the fun. I know that isn't true from a logical standpoint, because I'm certain that if you didn't want to be doing any of this, you wouldn't do it. That's true, I agreed. I don't know. I like being used. Feeling powerless it gives me a rush, and I know I'm safe with you, so I can enjoy that. But I've been powerless for a long time, and I didn't like it. He sounded so unusually helpless that my heart twisted. Neil had known about his cancer for four years before we'd met. He'd managed with drugs that had only postponed the inevitable chemotherapy and transplant. But of course he'd felt powerless. Death was the one thing he couldn't buy, reason, or charm his way out of, and that had blown his entire worldview apart not to mention the horrible experience he'd had when he'd tried to sub before. His dom had been a guy who'd basically used a technicality as an excuse to commit sexual battery. He'd claimed he hadn't realized Neil was truly distressed when he'd forgotten his safe word. Neil had balked when I'd called it what it was, rape, but I stuck by the label. The thought of someone hurting Neil made me so angry— I hoped I would never meet the asshole who'd done it. I suppose if things had gone differently with my, er, uh, introduction, as it were, perhaps I might have tried it again in the future. Neil shrugged. The motion jostled my head. But I don't think I was ever destined to switch. Do you think you'd ever try it again, with someone you trusted? I asked, wondering if I'd overstepped my bounds. He chuckled softly. Are you volunteering? My body throbbed at the idea, but maybe I wasn't the best person for the job. I'd only been Neil's sub for a little over a year, despite all the books, blogs, and tumblers I'd voraciously consumed during that time, and Neil's careful instruction. I didn't have the experience necessary. I don't think I'm the right person for the job, and like a light bulb, I knew who the right person was. You knew? I might try. Neil sounded strangely positive about the idea. A lot of things have changed for me, and it has been a very long time. If I were to have the opportunity in the future... He fell silent, and we didn't talk about it again. We didn't talk about anything again, because a few minutes later, I heard his soft snoring. There was no way I was going to sleep now. My mind was racing. I eased out of Neil's embrace, and he turned on his side to face away from me. I reached for my phone and snuck it guiltily beneath the covers. I still had Amir's number, from when he'd called for updates about Neil's condition during those touch-and-go moments over the summer, though I wasn't sure that what I was doing was right, or even technically helpful. If they were planning to meet in London, it might be the perfect opportunity. I typed in a quick message, hit send, and turned off my ringer. If Amir wasn't the right man for the job, then I didn't know who was. 
I just hoped Neil wouldn't be too mad at me for taking the initiative. Though it sucked that Neil and I would be apart for the weekend, it did give me extra time to see Holly. We'd decided to spend the day in the village, hitting all the trendy shops and feeling very superior about our fashion knowledge. We were standing in 218, a recently opened boutique that was trying way too hard, when Holly checked her phone and groaned. Annika has to stop referring to her kid's age in months. She rolled her eyes. Tell me you will never, ever let me be like that. If I call you up and tell you that my little Jackson just graduated law school at 288 months, pepper spray me in the eyes. I snickered. I thought you weren't having kids. Deja wants them, eventually. She better be the one birthing them because these narrow hips are structurally unsound. Holly shook her head. I know, I'm a terrible person. I used to hate it when people would say, one day you'll change your mind, and here I am changing my mind. You're not terrible. Just because you didn't want kids before, and you do now, doesn't mean you're a traitor. Now if you suddenly start telling me that I am going to change my mind, then you're a traitor. And a dick. I tilted my head as I considered an overpriced white cardigan with red-orange horizontal stripes. The buttons were interesting, but not enough to warrant the $215 price tag. I put it back. Yeah, again, pepper spray. She held up two fingers in a V and pointed to her eyes. Ugh, this store sucks, I said under my breath. You want to go back to your place? I have to stop by Hermes on Madison. There's a scarf I'm dying for, and I just got paid. Holly did a little dance. I almost made a comment about how a Hermes scarf would look splattered with baby puke. But I realized that then I would be a dick. While I was slightly disappointed that Holly was falling out of the No Babies Ever Forever Club, logically I knew it wasn't a judgment of my own choices. I didn't have to be defensive about it. We got a cab, and since she dropped a bomb on me, I figured it would be okay to drop one on her. It would at least make the ride interesting. So, Neil and I are going out on Monday to look at a house in the Hamptons. She blinked at me. Wow. Really? Uh, yeah. You know, we were discussing moving out of the city. This sagaponic thing came up. Why didn't you tell me? Holly shrieked, and the cab driver jumped a little in his seat. In a purposeful hush that I hoped would communicate the need for quiet, I replied, I didn't tell you, because it's not a big deal. We changed our minds. But the property is apparently a steal, so Neil wants to look into it. I paused. You know, maybe he could buy it and Emma and Michael could live there. Holly squinted up her face. What do you wear when you're going to look at a house in the Hamptons? I shrugged. That particular question had been plaguing me for a while now. I'm stumped. Anything conservative I have is going to look like I'm going to the office. And it's not like I can just show up in jeans and a t-shirt. What if I end up really wanting the house? That seems like a great reason to wear jeans and a t-shirt, Holly snorted. Like not shaving your legs before a first date? I mean, it's not like you'd actually want to move all the way out to Sagaponic. When I didn't respond, her expression fell. Sophie, you're not seriously considering this? Maybe not. You know, right now, I might as well have held up a flashing neon yes sign, as convincing as my answer was. I thought Holly would go atomic right there in the cab, demanding to know what I could get in the Hamptons that I couldn't get in Manhattan, and I'd better not expect her to travel that far from movie night. But instead, she just rolled her eyes and gave me an obvious and dramatic sigh. That was almost worse. What? I demanded with a laugh that was entirely forced. You seem to forget that I'm from a town where people give directions by saying, Yeah, you go right down there past the Sodi camp, then take a left by them big gray garbage cans. 
Manhattan was never going to be my forever home. What? Did I get you from a shelter or something? She could never stay mad at me long enough to pass up a quip. We pulled up outside the Hermes Boutique on Madison Avenue, and I slid out, feeling self-conscious in my jeans, white burnt-out tee, and pink tweed jacket. Then I remembered I wasn't there to represent Gabriella Winters, fashion maven, and that I could buy the entire contents of the damn boutique if I wanted to, which is what made the chilly reception I got so fucking galling. Holly, being a newly minted minor it girl of the modeling world, was welcomed with open arms by the sales staff, while I stood by completely ignored. Some of the associates working the floor had been there when I would come in trailing Gabriella, and I could tell from the way those individuals avoided my eyes that a line had been drawn a year ago, and I had crossed it by stepping on her turf. I followed Holly and her salesman, winding around the sleek mahogany display cases and listening to her describe the scarf she was looking for while I tried to upsell her on something else, when someone tapped my shoulder. I turned to see a face that was familiar, but which I couldn't immediately place. I estimated her to be in her late sixties, but it was clear she'd had some cosmetic upkeep. Her hair was a graceful shade of gray, pulled into a severe French twist with side-swept black bangs. She looked like a friendlier version of Cruella de Vil. Still, I had no idea who she was, so it was a relief when the woman said, Excuse me, but I think we live in the same building. You're Neil Elwood's wife, aren't you? At once I felt the piercing, interested gazes of the three salespeople standing within earshot. I ignored them. Fiancé, I corrected the woman with a smile. But yes, I think I saw you in the elevator. You had the... Your key, she supplied, pressing a hand to her chest. Oh, my sweet Anastasia, I live for her every day. Wow, that's uncomfortable. Really great that you love your dog so much. Out of force of habit, I dealt with too many socialites when working for Gabriella. I looked down at her purse to make sure Anastasia the Yorkie wasn't panting happily inside. Holy fuck. The woman was carrying a Birkin bag. It wasn't that I had never seen a Birkin in the wild before, Gabriella had seven with color-coordinating leather gloves for winter. Occasionally, they breezed into the office on the arm of a designer or celebrity. But this person lived in my apartment building, and a lovely coral-toned leather birkin rested its handles casually over her arm. This close, I could see the stitching. I swear I almost had an orgasm right there. You like the bag. It wasn't a question, and her eyes twinkled like we were sharing a secret. It was supposed to have been my daughter's. She killed herself six years ago, and I got her place on the waiting list. Jesus Christ. What the hell was I supposed to say to that? The lady almost sounded happy that her daughter had died, so she could get the damn bag. I had definitely stepped into a different world. Of course, that was back when there was a waiting list. She opined with a little sigh that seemed to ask what was the world coming to. She lifted one hand encased in a glove that was probably made out of orca leather or some other borderline legal luxury animal product and wiggled her fingers at a salesperson. Debra! Debra! Yoo-hoo! Deborah wasn't one of the associates who'd heard the strange lady proclaim me Neil Elwood's fiancé, so when she came over, my neighbor introduced me as such. This is Neil Elwood's fiancé. You know Neil Elwood, I'm sure. He threw that fundraiser for the landmines, what was it, eight years ago? Paul McCartney played. I'm Sophie, I told Deborah extending my hand. 
Deborah was better at dealing with this kind of uncomfortable conversation than I was. Her bewilderment lasted only a few seconds before a distant, professional smile replaced it. How do you do, Sophie? Have you shopped with us before? The future, Mrs. Elwood, was quite keen on my purse, weirdo neighbor lady said. You should show her what you have in stock. I could tell from Deborah's vibe that the last thing she wanted to do was sully the holy Birkin name by showing me the stock. But that just made me angry. Okay, so I'd bought my jeans at Banana Republic. So I couldn't afford a $10,000 handbag on my own. Big freaking deal. I was about to marry a billionaire. I lived in a freaking Manhattan palace. If I wanted to be a New York socialite trophy wife, damn it, this jerk wasn't going to stop me. I lifted my chin and took a breath, as though I were considering. Then I said, You know, I really would like to see what you have in stock. Soph? I heard Holly ask behind me, all gentle, like I was a horse about to bolt into a barn fire. Did you just ask to see a Birkin bag? I did. The wild, dangerous rush I used to feel when I'd occasionally shoplifted in middle school came back to me with a vengeance. Not that I planned on stealing the bag, of course. I would just look at it, pronounce that isn't a color I liked or some other lofty, totally unbelievable excuse, and go. But it felt risky even doing that, despite the fact that the infamous waiting list had been retired. The bags were still ultra-expensive status symbols. We do have one in stock. I'll go and get it, Deborah said, with fake warmth before heading off to the back. Well, this has been quite charming, but I must dash, neighbor lady said with a pleasant smile. Do enjoy your bag. Yeah, bye, I managed. I felt like I'd just been run over by a train. I hadn't even gotten her name. She was like a malicious purse fairy or something. So, you're seriously looking at a Birkin? Holly shook her head. You realize how much those cost, right? Yes. I worked for the top fashion magazine in the country, thank you. I know how much they are. My face was burning. I felt the weirdest urge to prove something to someone. I just didn't know what and to whom. To the neighbor lady that I belonged in the building because we had matching purses? To Deborah, the salesperson I would probably never see again in my entire life, that I was somehow cosmically deserving of an astronomically priced bag? Or maybe I was just trying to prove all of that to myself. But for whatever reason, when Deborah returned with the gorgeous, pale alligator leather bag, I knew I was going to buy it, no matter the price. It was the most beautiful purse I'd ever seen. It was the pale tan of a McDonald's chocolate shake, or maybe just a touch lighter. The fact that it was such a large bag and made out of alligator skin was pretty impressive. Most alligators don't have enough leather for a presentable 35-centimeter bag with pockets, and this wasn't just presentable. It was a marvel, with its gleaming gold hardware and matching alligator leather sleeve for the tiny padlock that would keep the bag from being opened. I lifted the Birkin from the glass-topped counter, like it was a holy relic, and breathed. How much? One hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, Deborah answered without hesitation. I had to buy it, Neil. I barfed on it. That was not a conversation I wanted to have, so I fought back the wave of nausea that gripped me at the dollar figure. Wow. So, kind of out of anyone's price range, huh? Holly laughed. This was the part where I was supposed to politely decline the bag and slink off, I assume. Maybe later I would run into neighbor and Anastasia the Yorkie, who probably had her own Birkin, and they would both look at me in judgment as I stood there, a poor girl from Michigan pretending to be a billionaire's trophy wife. 
A brief barkin' pun bubbled up to the surface of my mind at the thought of a dog with a purse, and I laughed, a little crazily. Sorry, I just remembered something funny. I opened my own purse, a Madison East-West coach bag in purple leather that had cost a measly two hundred and looked like a target clearance buy in comparison to the magnificent ex-alligator before me and pulled out the scariest weapon in my arsenal. I had an Amex Centurion card, the fabled Black card, which Neil had been graciously invited to secure for me after he'd made a few calls. His knighthood ceremony probably had less pomp and procedure than getting the damn Black Amex did. They'd sent the card to me in a friggin' black leather box. When I pulled the card from my wallet, Holly made a sort of strangled, squeaking noise. Deborah didn't even twitch. She took the card, swiped it, and it was done. I'd just bought a purse that cost more than the house I'd grown up in. More than my college education. Deborah packed the Birkin away in a dust sleeve, and then inside a large orange box before slipping that into a carrier bag. Thank you very much, Ms. Scaife, and if you need service in the future, here's my card. I took it from her. I guessed she must work on commission. The moment we left the store, clutching our bags to our chest in the biting New York cold, Holly turned to me with wide eyes. I can't believe you just did that. I can't either. My shivering had nothing to do with the icy temps. My knees wobbled. I thought I might pass out. Should I take it back? Do you think I can? Um, probably not, Holly said with a raised eyebrow. Unless you're willing to never shop at Hermes again. At that moment, that didn't sound too bad. I clearly could not be trusted to make rational decisions in that store. What was Neil going to say? Chapter 10 On Saturday afternoon, I paced in front of the fireplace in the living room, my phone in my hand. You look like you're waiting to get in trouble, Emma snorted, flicking the screen of her iPad without glancing up. Has he found out about your murder bag? From the moment I'd walked into the apartment with the Birkin, Emma had been trying out different names for it. Of all of them, Murder Bag was the one that had stuck. I glared at her, but she was too lost in Candy Crush to care. Though I was concerned about how Neil would take me dropping a hundred thousand on a purse, I was more concerned with how his evening with Amir was going. Of course, I couldn't tell her that. No, I said with forced cheerfulness. I'm just missing him. We haven't been apart since, you know, hospitals. I'm so sorry. I didn't even think, she began, and she looked so concerned, I felt guilty. It wasn't as though I'd lied. It was the first time Neil and I had been apart since he'd come home from the hospital, and I was really nervous about it. But nothing like the anxiety I'd been feeling since I'd spoken to him a few hours ago. Neil had called me when Amir had arrived and told him about the text conversation we'd had. Amir had left it to me to break the concept down, that I thought Neil should try submission again, this time with a better partner. It wasn't that I needed Neil to switch. I would always want him to be my dom, and I couldn't see myself seriously calling the shots in the bedroom, beyond the occasional playful occurrence, but something he'd said on therapy night had shocked me. I've been powerless for a long time, and I didn't like it. Neil hated when I tried to make any link between his sexual need for control and his micromanaging in every other facet of his life, probably because it was too close to the truth for him. I had a suspicion that if he let himself be dominated sexually, he might see the link he denied. I didn't expect it to change those aspects of his personality. I wouldn't want it to. 
but I suspected that one of the reasons he was still so shaken by the cancer and his scary hospital experience was that his need for control was so total. If he felt powerless in one area of his life, then he felt powerless in all of them. I really hated the thought of Neil feeling so bad. You know, if you guys want me to take off for a few days and give you some space when he gets back, I could always stay at Michael's place, she offered. As far as I was aware, Neil hadn't spoken to Emma yet about the living and possibly moving situation. But sometimes when you see an inn, you have to take it. I dropped into the armchair. About that. We had something we wanted to talk to you about. She paled, then squeezed her eyes shut and shook her head with a ch of embarrassment. She was like a carbon copy of her father sometimes. I know, I know. She swung her legs over the side of the sofa and tossed her iPod onto the cushion behind her, as if she were settling in for a long discussion. You want me out of here? What? No, not you as in me, myself. You as in we, both of us. But not actually we. I mean, we don't want you to. Sophie, please. She frowned in annoyance at my fumbling. I'm not upset. I completely understand. Believe me, if I could get all of Michael's roommates to move out, I would jump at the chance. Well, yeah, I kind of assumed that you and me and Neil were in the same boat. Not quite the same boat, she reminded me, with an edge of petty sarcasm I'd come to realize was a sign of her comfort with a person. I suspected Emma only let herself become truly irritated with the people she cared about, because no one else was worth her time. She folded her arms over her chest and leaned back. I realize how immature it is to be grossed out by the thought of one's parent. Having a personal life, I really do. But you must understand, he didn't introduce me to the women in his life when I was young. When I was staying with him, he didn't have overnight guests. Even Elizabeth didn't sleep here when I was home until they got engaged. Wow. That was seriously weird, considering they had dated for two years. Neil sounded way more protective than I'd thought he was, which was a little scary because I thought he'd already been acting bananas over Emma's wedding. It isn't that I don't like you, she continued, or that I don't think you're right for him. You two are lovely together, and I'm thrilled that he's so happy. I just would rather live in a situation in which his happiness didn't thoroughly gross me out. Michael and I have been looking at other options, but we don't want to rely on our parents' money. I'm having a bit of a difficulty. Downsizing. I could sympathize with her there. Though my old apartment could have fit into this one seven or more times, I'd had a hard time adapting to the Fifth Avenue place after life in the London townhouse. It was strange how accustomed I could get to too much house. I was like a goldfish, my space needs growing in accordance to the size of my bowl. You know, your dad and I are actually looking for a place. Really? I had no idea. Either she didn't know how to take the news, or she was just bothered by the fact that we hadn't told her before. Here in the city? No, we're actually going to look at a place out in Sagaponic on Monday. Nothing set in stone or anything, I reassured her. My phone rang. I looked down at it, then guiltily back to Emma. Go and take it, she said wearily. I hit the call button and stood, and Emma grabbed the television remote. Neil? I asked, which was silly, since I knew who it was already. I had no idea why I always did that on the phone. When he spoke, he sounded tired. Yes, darling, it's me. Is everything okay? I walked from the room, covering the receiver with one hand to block out the sound of the television as I headed to the bedroom. How did things go? Wonderfully. It all went wonderfully. I let out a quiet breath of relief. This trip has certainly given me some new perspective, he added.
Was that a good thing or a bad thing he was trying to disguise as a good thing through managerial word trickery? I could never tell. He'd built a media empire on his skills at spoken subterfuge and double meaning. Wow, I'm glad to hear that. I remained neutral. I was picking up some of his tricks. Perspective on what? There was a momentary pause, long enough that I would have worried we'd been disconnected if I hadn't heard the soft sound of his breath in the receiver. Tension drew up tight in me, like a wire ready to snap. I wanted him to be with me. I wanted to touch him, to curl up beside him and listen to all the dirty details of his evening. And, well, I kind of wished I'd been there myself. But then maybe Neil wouldn't have gotten the perspective I hoped he was talking about. Finally, he said, I'll discuss it with you when I come home, I promise. Right now you need to get your sleep and I do too. Since when do I go to bed at six? I chalked that one up to sheer exhaustion. When I get my hands on you, we're going to make up for lost time, he promised. It was embarrassing how loudly I squealed at the prospect. I knew we were insanely lucky, not only that he had survived the summer, but that we had this whole new chance to fall in love with each other again, but seriously, I annoyed myself sometimes with how gooey and romantic I got. I can't wait. I tried for seductive, but I know it came off silly as all get out. There was a change in his tone when he said, I must go, darling. Emir is still here, and I don't want to be rude. I'll see you tomorrow evening. Emir was still there. Oh, he was definitely going to have to spill the naughty details if he was spending the entire night with him. I love you. I love you, Sophie. After we hung up, I went back to the living room. Everything okay? Emma asked, muting the TV. Yep, everything's fine. We're just being ooey-gooey gross together. You wouldn't want to hear about it. She most definitely would not. Though Neil was open with me about his sexuality, his daughter was under the impression that any rumors of her father's bisexuality were just that. Snapping the conversation back to what we had been talking about before, I asked, So you're not upset that we're looking for a house? I was worried you might think I was trying to get rid of you. Not at all. Do you know how much simpler my life will be if my father lives two hours away? She sighed in what I suspected was only slightly exaggerated bliss. Do you want me to try to convince him to move to Philly? I asked with a snort. I hear Auckland is lovely. You might try there. She rolled her eyes. I love my father. I really do. But he's so... Overbearing? At times, yes. She shrugged. I suppose it makes me a terrible daughter, doesn't it? I should just be happy that he's still here. You can be happy that he's still around and severely irritated with him, too. I speak from experience, even though I missed him like crazy at the moment. Well, thanks for telling me about the house, and I think I will take off tomorrow for a few nights with Michael. Emma reached for the remote and clicked the volume on again. Although, I would love to see the look on his face when he finds out about that purse. As it so happened, I did not have to tell Neil about the Birkin right away. I didn't get the chance. When he came home the next evening, he was wiped out, exhausted. He poured himself a drink, wrestled out of his shirt, dropped into his chair by the fireplace in the living room. Turn that on, will you, wife? He asked, smacking my backside as I walked past. I flipped the switch to bring the gas flames up and frowned at him over my shoulder. I draw the line at you ordering me around and calling me wife when you refuse to set a date. How was the flight? Miserable. There was so much turbulence that at one point I thought I might actually be sick. Neil hated flying, but he didn't mind it as much when we were together. His face was pale and dark circles shadowed his eyes. I should have gone with him. I rubbed my hands down the front of my denim-clad thighs as I took a seat on the sofa. That bad? 
He put his glass on the coffee table and patted his knee. I can't have you all the way over there. Not after the day I've had. You know, I'm really more interested in the night you had. I reminded him. I took his hand to steady myself as I sat across his lap. His bare chest was warm and wonderful against my upper arm. He gave me a tired smile and pulled me into his arms to lay my head against his shoulder. Yes, yes, fine. What do you want to know? I want to know everything, I exclaimed. Did you sub for him? I did. Neil kissed the top of my head as though that were a sufficient end to the answer. Did you like it? I demanded. I enjoyed myself, though I can't imagine I'd ever want to do it again. He stroked my hair down my back, his fingers stopping to trace the band of my bra beneath my T-shirt. The submission, that is. It was enough for me to try it, but it's damned hard work. You sound surprised. I skimmed my bare foot up and down his ankle. It felt so good just to cuddle with him again. And you do put me through the ringer. Yes, I must admit, I have a new appreciation for your stamina. So what did he do to you? I squirmed a little, pressing my thighs together, and I knew it wasn't a subtle enough motion to escape his notice. Well, he began with a slow, audible breath. He brushed my hair back from my neck and slowly drew his fingers up and down, from the bend of my collarbone to the top of my breast and back as he spoke. There was a bit of making out. Then he made me wait for a rather long time. On my knees, which hurt a fair bit more than I'd considered it might. I always give thought to how your joints feel when you're bound, or what kind of positions you can hold. But kneeling seemed so benign. I never stopped to think about how it was affecting your knees and back. I leaned into his touch with a happy sigh. I'm fine with it. It's much better than some of the other positions you've put me in. What else happened? I sucked his cock. He rimmed me. There was some arse play. Though it would have been nice to be a totally mature adult, there was something so bizarre to me about hearing Neil very matter-of-factly, almost clinically, even, describing the sex he'd had with someone who wasn't me. I burst out into a storm of giggles. Should I go on? he asked, scolding. I forced myself to settle down and twisted to face him. I smoothed his chest hair under my palms and tried to make eye contact with my most serious face on. It only half worked. I'm sorry, I'm just... I don't know, it's so naughty. Did you, um... Did you go all the way? Yes, we did. His lips quirked in the half-smile I found so damned appealing. I let him fuck me. Wow, really? I tried to imagine it, but nothing my brain came up with was satisfactory. I was going to have to see this with my own two eyes. Hey, you know, that's something we have in common. We've both been fucked by Amir. That we have, he agreed, with a little eye roll and laugh that suggested I didn't know the half of it. Oh, I wanted to know the half of it. He's very good, Neil continued, holding me tight with one arm as he leaned forward for his glass. He took a long sip and grimaced in the way of a truly satisfied scotch drinker. You never told me how good. I wasn't sure I was supposed to. I didn't want to make you feel as though I was comparing the two of you. I leaned in for a kiss, tasting the alcohol on his mouth. Besides, I'm sure it's different having sex with a woman than with a man, right? It is. I find my hands end up in different places, on a woman's body than on a man's, for one, he said, silently offering me his glass. I took it and lifted it for a sip. How so? Well, for example, if I'm fucking a man from behind, I've noticed I'll generally hold on to his shoulder, or put my hands at the small of his back, whereas with a woman... You'll pull her hair or grab her hips? I finished for him with a knowing nod. I took a swallow from the glass and handed it back to him. Exactly. 
and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with body type. Huh, I shrugged. I guess I never thought of little habits like that, if I have any. I gave in to one of the naughty impulses pinging in my brain and pulled my T-shirt over my head. I tossed it aside with a grin, my breath lifting my tits in my cute polka dot bra. He smiled and sighed, leaning back contentedly. Very pretty, darling, but I am exhausted. That's okay, I shrugged. Talking about sex with you is still in my top fifteen favorite things to do. Didn't make the top ten, did it? Bad luck. He reached up and stroked his knuckles over the curve of one padded cup. Don't feel bad. The top seven all involve Chinese food buffets. I lay against him again, loving the feel of his chest hair against my back. I loved the way his voice felt rumbling beneath me, too. It was a very good evening, Sophie. Though I would appreciate it in the future, if you didn't surprise me like that again. Noted. I did feel badly about that part. I shouldn't have done it that way. I should have brought the idea up to you first, and not to Amir. I'd also like to know when you're communicating with him. I've always told you when I've received an email from Amir or when we've spoken. I'm perfectly happy having a friend we sleep with from time to time. But for the sake of my own jealous heart, let's have transparency. His big warm hand stroked down my back, soothing me, telling me he wasn't angry with me. Neil might not have realized it himself, but he was much better at communicating through body language than speaking. He wasn't as conscious in choosing casual gestures as he was in selecting his words. Deal, I agreed. I'm sorry, I didn't think of how that might look from your side. I know it's awfully early, but do you mind if I go to bed? I'm positively knackered, and I'm still fighting off the clonopin. He always took something to fly when he was alone. When we traveled together, he rarely did. I think it was because he felt guilty, feeling better when I wouldn't sedate myself. I sat up and kissed his cheek. I wouldn't mind at all. I'll even come snuggle you to sleep. We went to the bedroom where Neil groaned in ecstasy the moment he settled onto his pillow. This is exactly what I need. I slipped out of my jeans and bra and slid in beside him, and he reached for me pulling me into the circle of his arms. I wriggled back, fitting my hips with his, letting his body envelop me. Well, almost exactly, he whispered against my ear. I hugged his arm tighter over my waist. You said you had a change of perspective? What was that about? I promise. We'll talk about that tomorrow, he yawned, after we look at the house. Damn, that change in perspective was what I'd wanted to hear the most about. The next night, Tony the chauffeur drove me to meet Neil at the New York offices of Elwood and Stern. I'd hoped I'd get a chance to see Neil's office, but the stars never seemed to align on that one, and tonight was no exception. From Elwood and Stern, we drove a few blocks to a building with a helipad, where our chartered helicopter was waiting. In phobic terms, airplanes had nothing on helicopters where Neil was concerned. Oddly, the short flight didn't bother me. The windows were huge, compared to the ones on the jet, so I didn't feel quite so boxed in. But it was a little hard to get excited about the incredible airborne views when Neil was crushing my hand like a vice. I spent most of the flight mentally preparing myself for what was in store. I knew we wouldn't be looking at a four-bedroom Cape Cod. From the few details Neil had fed me, carefully doled out, I believed, to keep me from calling off the entire thing. The place had massive acreage. The terms compound and grounds had been used. Is that it? I asked the pilot over the intercom. Being in an executive helicopter was way different than the tourist helicopter that had taken my mom and me up at the fair. It was more like a car than I'd expected. Yes, ma'am, directly below us, the pilot responded. I leaned my forehead against the window and gazed down, 
conscious of Neil's arm slipping protectively across my waist, as though I'd tumble out to my doom. I spotted a massive, well-lit building, the size of which could only be compared to the visitor center in Jurassic Park, a wide, sweeping crescent of pavement made an illuminated path up to the building, winding away and forking off toward other areas of the compound. Compound. We might as well have built a bunker while we were at it. The pilot set the helicopter down and shut off the engines. Tom, the agent, stood waiting for us in a neatly pressed suit that was almost as nice as Neil's. Hampton property sales must net a pretty good commission. Mr. Elwood, Mrs. Elwood, I am thrilled to show you this property, he exclaimed by way of greeting. He took Neil's hand and shook it, then mine. Ms. Scaife, I corrected him with a smile, but don't worry about it. It was good practice for after we were married. I didn't plan to change my name, and I was sure this wouldn't be the last time I'd be erroneously called Mrs. Elwood. The helipad is awfully far from the house, Neil observed as we stepped into the waiting car. He was right. It was awfully far from the house. I couldn't even see a house. I couldn't see anything but grass and stars. It was a nice change, just like the crisp country air was a nice change, from the smell of asphalt and garbage in the city. But I'd made so much fun of people on House Hunters that I wasn't about to complain about something like the helipad is awfully far from the house. Neil gave me the front passenger seat, and Tom drove us up the long slope. And the other way goes out to the road? I asked, peering out the back window. Oh, Sophie. Look, Neil said, breathless with wonder. I turned and I saw it. The first thing that struck me was that there was so, so much house. It seemed to stretch endlessly across the crest of the hill. The main section was two stories, but the gables at the ends made it seem much taller. At one end, a tower with an open-air cupola had been added, clearly newer construction. Every light in the place was on and the number of windows was overwhelming. I counted eight chimneys cutting tall rectangles out of the starry night sky. The agent took advantage of our awe to launch into technical specifications. The main house is 35,000 square feet, ten bedrooms, nine baths, one Jack and Jill, three half baths. Wait, wait, Neil shushed him urgently. Whatever it is you're saying will not sink in for either of us right now. Sophie, don't get too excited about the property, I mimicked his earlier pronouncement. Good accent, Tom remarked, but his grin faded when Neil cleared his throat. Tom swallowed and continued. As I was saying, the compound sits on 49 acres, has ocean views, a beautiful beachfront. We would live on the ocean? I got dizzy just imagining it. When I'd been younger... I dreamed about one day owning a camp on Lake Superior that I could hang out at on the weekends. That had been some far-off dream that I'd happily abandoned when I'd moved to New York. But the ocean? Only rich people lived by the ocean. That's when it hit me for the very first time. I was a rich person. Even though I'd been living with Neil for a year, even though he'd bought me designer clothes and ridiculously expensive jewelry— I'd never really thought of his money as my own, except for that one time in Hermes. But shopping for a house together? The house we would live in, our family home, that would have both names on it. That really drove the point into my brain. Neil was giving me a life I had never bothered to dream about, and he was doing it just because he loved me. I would probably never again have to stress over bills, I'd never find my career limited by how much money I could spare for the commute. I wouldn't have to eat ramen ever again, unless it was by choice. This was the life Neil wanted to give me, and I'd been stubbornly rejecting it, but still reaping the benefits. I'd been utterly blind to the privilege that had been plunked into my lap. Why? Because I thought it made my love mean less. If I was grateful for his money... What was the price again? Neil asked as the agent pulled into the circular drive and parked beneath the portico. 
83 million, the agent said easily, like it was a number he could rattle off any day. I grabbed Neil's hand and squeezed it. He squeezed back. There are six other exits, Tom explained, like he was the chief flight attendant for the house. The previous owners directed deliveries to the kitchen, through the porte cochere at the other end of the house. That's also where you'll find the eight-car garage. Only eight, Neil asked, and my eyes boggled. What in the name of sweet baby Jesus would require us to own more than two cars? He caught my look and said sheepishly, For my collection. Your collection is in England, I reminded him. He smirked. It can be moved. There is plenty of acreage if you'd like to add a hangar to house them, Tom suggested easily, as though it would be just like putting a ceiling fan in. No big deal, build a hangar on the weekend. Fill it up with a man-sized Hot Wheels collection. People just did this in our world. There is a state-of-the-art security system, as well as an intercom from the panic room, Tom said as we walked the three wide terraced steps to the door. He entered a security code and slid the key into the lock before ushering us inside. I've already been in and had a walk around tonight, but there is a master control for the built-in lighting in the main living areas. The moment the door opened into the foyer, I knew I was in over my head. The room was an octagon open to the second story, with windows that looked even taller than they were, due to the vertical lines of framework that divided each of them neatly in two. The floor was pristine wood that glowed a gorgeous deep red. Tom opened a door to our right to show us the walk-in closet. He pointed out that it could easily double as a coat check during parties. Way over my head. The living areas blew past me in a bit of a whirlwind. The place came furnished from the elegant prairie-style dining and living room sets. Vintage Stickley, Tom informed us as I trailed my arm along the back of the sofa to the sumptuous leather upholstery in the den. There was a second, less formal living room with a native stone fireplace and a loft accessible via an upstairs bridge. That's set up as a very nice office. Tom explained, but there are plenty of rooms on the lower level that could be converted. The lower level? I asked. Isn't this the ground floor? There's a walkout lower level, Tom explained. We'll get to that in a minute. What I really want to show you is the master bedroom. The master bedroom, bathroom, and twin dressing rooms were situated on the ground floor down a long hall. I was pretty sure the entire apartment could fit inside the suite. Enormous windows looked onto the vast side yard, and through two large arched glass doors was a conservatory in a round turret with ocean views. This is insane, I said, pressing my hand to the glass. Then I thought about the handprint it would leave, and then I thought about how much I didn't care because I could leave a handprint on a door in my own damn house. We were going to live here. I opened the door and stepped into the huge space, done up like a parlor. There weren't any plants. I would have to change that. The graceful arch of a polished wood staircase rose in an unbroken swoop up to an open second floor that encircled the entire tower, and I wandered over to it. Can I go up? Certainly, Tom said. There's a door to the deck if you'd like to go out. Would you mind giving us a moment? Neil asked Tom. Not at all. I'll wait in the hall. Once he excused himself, Neil followed me up the stairs. It was too cold to go out on the wide porch that wrapped around the tower, but from here I could make out a few stars. I've gotten so used to not seeing stars. They startled me when we were back in Michigan. I didn't realize how homesick I'd been for them. Neil stood behind me, his hands on my waist. He leaned down and whispered, What do you think? I think it's home. That's what I wanted to say. But sensible Sophie reared her ugly head. I think it's a lot of house. Maybe too much house for two people? We could get a dog, he suggested, a little too eagerly. I wondered how long that had been a part of the domestic scene in his head. 
What size dog are you planning to get that it needs 35,000 square feet? I turned and gazed up into those eyes. That could completely undo me. Baby, I love this house. We've barely seen a quarter of it, and I want to live in it. But how long will we be living here? Do you want to have to commute by helicopter every day? I'm not sure if I'm actually okay with that. I mean, what if you crashed or, like, auto-rotated to your death or something? Auto-rotated? He pinched the bridge of his nose. He winced, then raised his head, eyes directed at the ceiling like he couldn't bear to watch my face. I'm retiring. Right, when you're sixty-five, and you want to go live in Langhurst Court. It was ages from now. You called Longhurst Court, Deadton Abbey. You also described it as being a thousand times creepier than the haunted mansion, and it would take you too far from your family and friends. Besides, Emma is living here now. What happens when she has a baby? I don't want to be an ocean away from my grandchild. I forced my expression to remain neutral. He still didn't know about Emma and Michael's dire outlook on reproducing. One issue at a time, Scaife. Okay, but still we're talking about fifteen years of commuting via aircraft. That's risky, isn't it? Sophie, you're not understanding. I'll be stepping down as CEO of Elwood and Stern. This year. My head went light and I put a hand against the wall to steady myself. What? I thought about it quite a lot while I was in London. Seeing Amir was lovely, but I hated being away from you. Even when I'm just away at work, he frowned. I don't think I've ever enjoyed running the company less. Money I have. Time with you. That I don't have as much of as I'd like. We've both been so busy lately, but I don't need to be. He took my hands. Almost losing my life has made me appreciate it more. I want to slow down now and enjoy it. Oh, Neil. My heart spasmed, but as much as I loved the idea of Neil taking it easier than he was now, I wasn't sure what he was going to expect from me in this new arrangement. The thing is... India has worked really hard to get me this opportunity. I have to come up with a follow-up book, and there's this launch party coming up. I can't slow down right now. Nor would I expect you to. He walked slowly around the perimeter of the tower, brushing his fingers along the window frames every now and then, as though he were inspecting them. He stopped and put his hands in the pockets of his trousers. I'm not imagining a scenario in which we spend every waking moment together. But as it is, we're trying to steal little bits of time together when they happen to line up. If I'm not working, we don't have to do that anymore. Wow. I didn't know what to say to that. It was a total 180 from the Neil I was used to. The Neil who'd tried to surreptitiously run a multimedia corporation from his sickbed. The Neil who'd fired his own girlfriend for fraternizing with the wrong people. Who was this guy? This is not effective immediately. It will take months to finalize everything. He began to clarify, probably because he could see the shock I was feeling. But I do want to settle down. If not in this house, then... wherever you are. I looked down at my fingers braiding themselves together, feeling suddenly very foolish. Neil was trying to clear a path to our future. It was something I'd never expected anyone to do for me with me. I'd sort of expected to look out for myself. Maybe it was because of the example I'd been raised with. My mother never missed an opportunity to point out how much her self-reliance provided independence. I was grateful to her for the lesson, but now, for the first time, I was beginning to see where my thinking needed to change. If I were going to enter into a legally binding domestic partnership. And you know... Neil continued, forcing a laugh. I think I'll make a very good house husband. If he was making a joke because he was nervous, he didn't have to. I think you're the most amazing man I've ever met. When I looked up, he appeared genuinely startled by my praise. I really mean that, I continued. 
You're willing to give up this huge part of your life for me. You're willing to change your plans for the future just to include me. He turned and came back to me, taking my hands in his and gently prying my twisted fingers apart. And you haven't. Okay, he had me there. He went on. You passed on a job you worked hard to earn, just to be with me. After I fired you, no less. For the sake of our relationship, you moved to a different country. You spent a year with me when I was vomiting and crying and feeling sorry for myself. What sacrifices have I made for you? Why shouldn't I make one now? My first instinct was to point out all the things he'd done for me. Romantic trips, designer clothing, houses all over the world. But those things weren't really a sacrifice. He'd already owned the houses, and I could spend a small fortune on material objects every day without making a dent in his considerable wealth. We were standing in an $83 million house, for fuck's sake. As for sacrifices, Neil hadn't made many for us. If he wanted to do this now so that we would have more time together, without it being shaved from my aspirations, then what was I supposed to do? Argue with him? You know? I nodded. You're right. My God! He lifted my hands to his lips, passion and longing in his eyes as he gazed at me. I think that's the first time you've ever said that to me. I slapped his shoulder. Jerk. His arm slipped around my waist, pulling me up tight. What do you think of the house? Well, we haven't seen all of it yet, I reminded him. But I'm impressed. Could you see us living here? He asked. I, I sputtered in disbelief. I could see us communicating by walkie-talkie trying to locate each other. This is a lot of house. All I ask is that you keep an open mind. He kissed my hand for real this time, then released me. Let's get back to Tom before he thinks we're fucking up here. The rest of the house was as unbelievable as what we'd seen already. Tom pointed out every luxurious detail and assured us that the buyer would be very lucky because of this or that item the owner was willing to part with. The more insistent the agent was that we love the house, the more resistant Neil came to showing any sign of approval, until he downshifted into a kind of emotional neutral. I watched the interplay between the two of them in rapt fascination. A sense of wonder and joy I hadn't felt since childhood welled up inside me. This was exactly like House Hunters. I'd heard Tom's tone before, the self-conscious projection of confidence that the potential buyer would find the property amazing, Neil trying to downplay the fact that he was already writing the check in his head, though it was a totally obvious ploy, which meant I got to step into the role of the spouse, who expressed disappointment and dissatisfaction at everything. It was like some dark and terrifying part of my soul had finally been unleashed. I don't like wallpaper, I said, in the fourth bathroom we viewed. In the kitchen I lamented, oh, granite countertops are out now, though. I expressed concerns about light pollution from the patio area and infinity pool. I wondered if it would be too far a walk for me from the garage to the bedroom, or if the bedrooms had enough natural light. I think for a minute I actually turned into the weird neighbor lady from the Hermes disaster. If the helicopter crashed and we died on the way back to the city, I would die with my life's ambition fulfilled. I could not wait to tell Holly. We left Tom with a we'll let you know when he drove us back to the waiting helicopter. As we strapped in, Neil gave me a wry glance and said, I hope that's out of your system now. I beamed at him. When we lifted off, I looked down at the house. The sprawling grounds had a pond and various outbuildings, including an eccentric copy of the Pavilion Francais at Versailles. Tom had shown us photos, so we didn't have to brave the cold again, but I could pick out a few of the buildings now darker spots against the green-black of the grass and trees. There was a guest house Tom had referred to as a mother-in-law residence, which made Neil freeze like he'd just been shot. In no way did I want my mother to come live with us. 
but it was too funny not to let him panic over the idea. What do you think? Neil asked. His fingers laced through and locked with mine as he pointedly avoided looking out the window. I think, I sat back and leaned my head on his shoulder. I think we're going to be very happy here. Chapter 11 Though it was surprisingly difficult to return to real life once we'd put in our offer on the house, there was really nothing left for us to do. After the first two days of jumping every time the phone rang, I had to get out. Luckily, with the wedding locked down under Valerie's obsessive attention to detail, Emma had turned her event planning anxiety to a more pressing date, Neil's 50th birthday party. She met me for lunch at Hangawi, a midtown Korean vegetarian restaurant where you took off your shoes at the door and sat at booths with sunken floors beneath the low tables. I arrived ten minutes late to a very familiar expression. You know, if we're going to pull off a surprise party, you will need to be on time, Emma said with an arched brow. I know, I know. I took a seat on the cushion on the floor and slid my legs under the table. But you know, if I'm supposed to actually get your father to the party on time, I won't technically be late, since the party can't officially start without him. Her pursed lips told me off more effectively than she ever could have with words. So what have you got? I leaned my elbows on the table and folded my hands beneath my chin. I've never planned anyone's gigantic birthday party. Good. Then I can do it all. She rummaged in her Kate Spade bag for her iPad. You sound awfully excited about that prospect, for someone who's getting married in five months. I shrugged out of my coat, and the passing hostess stopped to take it. Emma rolled her eyes as she tapped the screen. Oh, am I getting married? Because you wouldn't know it. Talk to her. She just wants everything to be perfect. It was no use defending Valerie. I knew well enough how contentious the relationship could be between a daughter and her single mother. When my wedding was approaching, my mom would probably be just as bad. I hoped she would be just as bad. It hadn't occurred to me before, but she might not want to have anything to do with my wedding. She was super mad about my relationship with Neil, and I hadn't spoken to her since the phone call where I'd broken the news of our engagement. Suddenly, grilled Toddick didn't sound as appetizing as it had in the car on the way over. Sophie? Are you okay? You've gone quite pale. She squinted at me over the top of her iPad. I waved a hand. It's fine. I was just thinking about your problem. Honestly, the woman acts as though it isn't my job to orchestrate full-scale events for a massive not-for-profit organization. She turned the tablet to face me. This is where I think we should do it. My heart stuck in my throat. One Oak was one of the fabled New York lounges. I'd never been but Holly had, and she'd said the place had been wall-to-wall -wall celebs at the time. Isn't that going to be, um, I don't think nightclubs are really your father's scene. No, for God's sake, we don't want him dancing, Emma said and I had the internal American hearing an English accent squee at the way she pronounced it, dancing. She flicked the screen again and showed me a seating and floor plan. This is what they came up with. I was thinking we should keep it intimate. I frowned at the circles and lines. Intimate? This looks like seating for two hundred. I know. So we will have to be very cautious about who does and does not receive an invitation. She clucked her tongue and turned the iPad around, frowning. Do you think we should go with a larger venue? Emma, the last party I threw was like 20 people in my apartment. This is huge. Sudden panic gripped me. Do you know who we're supposed to invite? When we did the party before his transplant, Neil said Valerie knew who to invite. But I don't have a list or anything, and I really, really don't want to involve your mother in this. There, I'd said it. I didn't want Valerie to be in charge of stuff for the party. This was my boyfriend's 50th birthday party, and I wanted to be the one planning it. I didn't want to make it a joint effort with his ex. Believe me, I don't want her coming in and taking this over, too. 
It's a miracle I got to pick out my own bloody wedding gown, she said with a weary sigh. But in this, we might have to make a concession. We've only got two months to send out invites. I drummed my fingers on the tabletop. You know what? Let me figure something out. Give me, like, two days. You have two days. After that, you have to call my mother. Emma was a great party planner, which was fortunate, since I was used to throwing the kind of shindigs where ice was dumped into the sink to store beverages. She had ideas about traffic flow, table decorations, dance floor space, number of servers. No wonder she and her mother had the entire wedding wrapped up. The only thing I could really contribute was a suggestion about the music. We opted for a DJ rather than a live band, so we could play songs from all five decades of Neil's life as the evening progressed. We were nearly finished making our plans and eating our lunch, when Emma snapped her fingers. I almost forgot. If you guys end up moving before the party, you'll need to make reservations to stay in the city overnight. You won't want to go all the way back to Sagaponic late at night. You're right. The solution came to me in a flash of uncensored inspiration. Oh my gosh, I'll get the wow suite. Ew, that ugly place Dad was staying after the divorce. Why? She wrinkled her nose. It was where we had our first date, or unofficial first date, I guess. I waved off the further explanation she wouldn't want. It's part of our history. A part of our history in which I had waited for him on the sofa fingering myself, so that when he'd arrived he'd found me with my legs spread and my hand in my panties. I could still vividly hear him ordering me to take them off, could see him lifting them to his nose and sniffing deeply. Okay, I would get the wow suite for the night after his birthday, since I was sure we'd be drunk as hell after the party. That's quite sweet, Emma said, surprising me. She usually turned up her nose at anything having to do with her father and romance. She put her iPad back into her bag. Okay, so you'll check on the addresses and come up with a DJ? Yeah, I've got a pretty good idea of what Neil likes, music-wise, I shrugged. And I can always accidentally mix up our phones and check out what he's listening to lately. Wonderful. I'll confirm with the venue, and then all that's left is you getting him to the party. How do you plan to do that? I thought I could tell him we're going out for dinner, and you could text me while we're in the car. Say you're at the club and you've forgotten your wallet, and we'll have to swing by and pay your tab. I raised my eyebrows and nodded to gently urge her in my direction. She remained unimpressed. He's going to see right through that. Tell him Michael forgot his wallet. He'll be so excited at the chance to rescue me from my fiancé's incompetence. He won't question it for a moment. Oh, good idea, I agreed. Then I thought of what Valerie and I had talked about the other night. You know, I think your dad is slowly warming up to Michael. I don't think they'll ever be best friends. Spare me, Sophie, she said with a weighty eye roll. I'm at peace with the fact that my father will never like my husband. At least it will keep family gatherings interesting. She kept talking, but her words were drowned out by the rush of adrenaline-infused blood straight to my brain. A flash of ruby red had caught my eye, a distinctive shade that I hadn't thought of in months. It was Gabriella Winters' hair color, and she had just passed by my table on the way out of the restaurant. Sophie? Emma asked, stopping mid-sentence to look at me in alarm. Are you all right? I turned to follow Gabriella with my eyes. I couldn't help it. It was like seeing the ghost of someone you didn't like all that well. But it was so, so much worse than that, because walking with her, laughing loudly at something Gabriella had said, was deja. No, I managed to say without choking on my own shock. No. I'm definitely not all right. Emma rode with me to the Elwood and Stern offices because I was a nervous wreck. Are you okay? she asked. Do you want me to come up with you? I shook my head. No, your dad is going to freak. I think I just need to tell him this one-on-one. -on -one. Do you want me to wait here with Tony? 
she asked, gesturing to the partition between the front and back seats. I'll get a cab home. I didn't know how I was going to be holding up, and I didn't want Emma to see me fall apart. I couldn't believe Deja would risk her job like this. I couldn't believe I was in this position. If I told Neil, my best friend would be unhappy. If I didn't tell Neil, the truth might come out eventually, and Emma had seen it. I couldn't stand for her to think I was disloyal to her father. Our weird stepmother-stepdaughter relationship was built around me walking on eggshells and her being mildly disapproving. If she knew I was hiding something important from her father, even that would be gone. One thing I knew for certain was that Holly was going to get hurt. She was an innocent bystander, and it wasn't fair. But there was no way to avoid it. I had to be honest with Neil. More importantly, I had to be honest with myself. I wouldn't feel right keeping what I'd seen a secret— I'd come to hate the way I felt when I was lying or covering something up. I was growing away from that person, and I didn't want to invite her back in. Telling Neil was as much for my sake as it was for his. I hadn't really thought through the logistics of what would happen once I was in the building. I didn't know if I needed to be on a list or call ahead or what. There were two uniformed guards at the security desk, as well as a man in suit wearing one of those earpieces with the curly cords. It was kind of intimidating. Hi, I need to go up to Elwood and Stern, I began. I sounded like I wasn't supposed to be there. I wouldn't let me in. The guy with the earpiece looked pretty skeptical as well. Name? Sophie Scaife? I told him uncertainly. I'm probably not on a list or anything, but if you call up, he tapped something into the computer beneath the counter and reached for a laminated pass. Okay, Miss Scaife, you're going to go to the second bank of elevators and Elwood and Stern is on the 11th floor. Okay, that was a little bit cool, to just waltz on in like I own the place, or like my fiancé owned the place. As I rode the elevators up, I tried to sort through the emotions that were currently nauseating me. The ramped-up anxiety, that was a given the fear that I might have to actually confront Deja one-on-one -on -one eventually. I recognized that, too. The anger caught me off guard. I couldn't remember a time I'd been so frighteningly mad at someone. My heart lodged itself at the base of my throat, and though I was outwardly calm, I had no idea how I was going to react if I saw her. The woman behind the desk in the Elwood and Stern lobby saw me coming as soon as I stepped off the elevator. I marched up to her as confidently as I could and said, I'm here to see... You're here to see Mr. Elwood, she finished for me. They already called up. Have you been here before? Do you need me to show you the way? Um, I looked around. The place was not what I'd been expecting. The walls were a dark gray with three thin chrome bands running along them and down the corridors on either side of the reception desk. The carpet was black and the furniture in the waiting area was black with brushed steel accents. It was surprisingly dark. It must be like working in a submarine all day. Maybe you should, yeah. Show me the way. I'm Alice, the woman introduced herself. Her chestnut hair was pulled up in a neat twist at the back of her head, and she was dressed way more conservatively than I was used to seeing in an office setting. But that was because my last job had been Porteris, where high fashion had ruled. Alice's light gray pantsuit and white silk shell seemed almost dowdy in comparison to the stuff Ivanka, the receptionist at the magazine, had worn. Alice bustled me along down the short corridor to the main office. It wasn't as dark here, though the decor was the same. Overhead halogens on exposed tracks took the place of the inset can lighting in the lobby and cubicle walls and slate divided the floor into six large workstations. This is Mr. Elwood's office, Alice gestured to the frosted glass doors on the other side of the aisle we walked. His assistant is at lunch, but you can go right in. Thank you, I said as I opened the doors. Beyond what I assumed was the desk that belonged to his assistant, Brent, another set of double doors, these completely transparent, 
revealed a striking view of the harbor and a striking view of Neil. Dressed in a chocolate-brown silk suit with a very subtle sheen, he stood with one arm against the steel beam intersecting the glass wall. He had his cell to his ear, and he was smiling at whatever the caller was saying. I knocked on the door and he turned, and then gestured me inside. As I slipped in, I heard him say, Thank you, Rudy, before hanging up the call. He dropped his phone onto his desk. I wasn't expecting a surprise today. Well, that's too bad, I said grimly, because I have one, and it isn't nice. Oh? His playful demeanor vanished as he studied my face. What's happened? I was at lunch with Emma, I began. In my moment of slight hesitation, Neil interjected, She's pregnant, isn't she? My jaw dropped and I sputtered a moment. N no, no, this isn't about Emma, it's about... Movement drew my eye to the door. Brent was back, and he gestured to Neil through the door, pointing to his ear. I'm sorry, darling, but I should be on a conference call. I'm supposed to be in Valerie's office right now. It has to wait. I sounded like I was about to cry. I was about to cry. Which I assumed was why Neil glanced out at Brent and hit a button on the multi-line phone on his desk. Terribly sorry. Please tell Miss Stern to go on with the call without me. Please don't mention my visitor. Sure thing, he answered. Brent's relentless cheerfulness was a trait Neil often complained about at home. It would have been funny to see it in action, if not for my current predicament. Neil led me to his chair and parked me in while he half sat on the corner of his desk. All right, what's going on? I saw Deja. She was in the restaurant with us. I don't know how long, but I didn't see her until she was walking out. My throat went so dry it actually stuck closed. I swallowed, grimacing at the pain. She was with Gabriella Winters. What? Neil asked, his forehead wrinkling as his eyebrows drew together. Are you sure? I would recognize Gabriella anywhere. I'm surprised I didn't see her the moment I got to the restaurant, so I guess my radar is busted. My shoulders weighed ten pounds more than they had before I'd stepped into the office. What was all that bullshit about the weight of the world? I'd thought it would lighten some once I'd confessed what I'd seen. Instead, I kind of wanted to throw up on the carpet. I see. Neil nodded, an outwardly calm gesture, but his eyes flicked around the room. I'd seen him like this before, lost in thought so completely that his intensity frightened me. Living with him every day, I sometimes forgot how intelligent he was and how fast his mind worked. He picked up the phone. Brent, I need you to do the following. I glanced to the doors nervously, my heart fluttering like a moth trapped in my throat. While Neil spoke, he tapped something out on his keyboard. I need someone to take Ms. Scaife to conference room B, discreetly. Then I need you to send up someone from HR, preferably Leah and bring Miss Stern here immediately. Tell her it's high priority. She'll need to reschedule. And track down Rudy Ainsworth. He isn't to let Deja Williams out of his sight, and they both need to be on a call with us in no later than fifteen minutes. Please get all of this accomplished as quickly as you can. Why do I have to go to conference room B? HR. He asked for HR and Valerie. He was going to actually fire her. Of course he is, you idiot. What had I expected? He'd fired me, and we'd been in the blissful new relationship stage. Deja was my friend, but it wouldn't be enough to save her job. Neil regarded me with his hands in the pockets of his trousers as he answered my question. Because you look quite upset, and I don't want you leaving alone in the state you're in. He was matter-of-fact, but gentle. And I know that you want to stay but you can't be here for this. Busted. Stay until after the situation is resolved. I'll duck out early and we'll go home together. He tried a small smile of encouragement, but didn't quite manage it. I couldn't bear the thought of you crying in the back of the car all the way home. You're going to be hopelessly keyed up until everything is settled. He was right. 
and I wouldn't argue with him. Alice returned, sent by Brent, and hustled me to the conference room. She brought me coffee and a bagel that I hadn't asked for, and apologized several times for all this. I am the cause of all this. The sunlight that lit the room washed over me as I stared out at the buildings across the street and the narrow sliver of the harbor I could still see from the other side of the office. My phone dinged, and I checked it, my stomach clenching up. Hey, Bish, don't forget dresses at five. Oh, God. Holly. I was supposed to give my input on bridesmaids' dresses. She didn't know what was about to happen. If it happened. A ray of hope, nonsensical though it was, pierced my dread. Maybe it was all a misunderstanding. Maybe she'd been sent on some errand by Valerie. My hope faded like the popularity of Uggs, as much as I relished thinking the worst of her most of the time, it was too big a leap of denial to think she would engage in spying or sabotage. She'd had a low opinion of me before she'd met me, because of the ethically convoluted way I'd exited Porteris. She wouldn't pull something like that. Why had Deja been with Gabriella? Was she interviewing for a job at the new magazine? If so, who had approached whom? Maybe it was something about Holly? She'd appeared in Porteris before. Damn it, why hadn't I thought of that? I doubted Deja was handling her bookings, though. No matter what her reason, she'd broken a company policy that had been implemented specifically because of the mole situation Gabriella had caused. Why did you tell? Scaife, you're such a fuck-up. I berated myself for a little over an hour, ignoring repeated texts from Holly until I could only reply. I'll be there. Though I was bored out of my skull waiting, Neil had been right. I had to know how everything turned out, as much as he could tell me, anyway. Neil wasn't the kind of boss who'd break privacy rules to gossip, but I had to know what I'd done. I was tired of all of this, of running, of fucking up, of lying, or trying to figure out who to trust. Doing the right thing sucked just as much as doing the wrong thing and I was definitely tired of trying to do the right thing and just fucking up more. It seemed like forever before the door opened and Neil stepped inside. He shut the door softly behind him, and the look on his face told me everything I needed to know. You didn't have to fire her, my voice quaked. I know, Deja. She wouldn't have done anything. It wasn't up to me. He stayed at the door his hands behind his back. We listened to her explanation, and I thought it sounded feasible. I can't really go into details, but I promise you, Sophie, if there had been any other way. The only other way was me just not telling you, and that has never gone well in the past. Defeat and disappointment pulled at me like an invisible puppet string, sinking my chest and hunching my shoulders. We should have picked a better restaurant. Neil held out his arm. Come on, let's get you home. I followed him morosely back to his office, keenly aware that the eyes of most of the office were upon me. It wasn't that they knew what had happened. They were merely curious about their boss's fiancé. I wondered if there were any rumors about me. Come in. Have a seat while I get my things, Neil said gently. It seemed like there should be something out of the norm, some sign that a momentous event had occurred, but it was just an office. I sat in his desk chair and leaned my head on my folded arms like a tired kindergartner. I could have gone to sleep right there, I was so emotionally exhausted. What you need is a nice, relaxing night in, Neil said, probably because he thought it was the right thing to say. It seemed like he had no idea how to make things better, so he was resigned to make them worse. He didn't have a clue how bad things really were. I'm supposed to be picking out bridesmaids' dresses with Holly in... forty minutes. Oh, dear. It was the single most English expression he'd ever uttered in front of me, and I would have laughed if things hadn't seemed so bleak. Are you going to go? If it's still happening... I'm sure Deja has called her by now. 
I was doomed to an awkward conversation in the very near future. Although I'm pretty sure I'm off the bridesmaid list now. Sophie, Deja doesn't know it was you. Neil's eye contact never wavered. He was willing me to finish his thought so he wouldn't have to. I told her that she'd been seen with Gabriella Winters at the restaurant, and she didn't deny that they had discussed Deja's job at Porteris. You needn't ever tell Deja or Holly. It was you who reported this. You're saying I could lie to Holly and Deja. I'd come too far to fall back on old bad habits. I couldn't. It would eat me up inside, and then someday it would blow up in my face. That's exactly what would happen. You're right. He grimaced in sympathy and came to my side. His hand fell on my shoulder. The right choice is not always the easiest. I covered his hand with mine. You're very wise sometimes. I assume that comes with your advanced age. Holly's ringtone cut me short, and I abandoned my half-hearted teasing to answer it. Hello? Sophie? Deja's been— Holly was understandably upset. This was the moment I could pretend I didn't know what had happened and start living a lie. Instead, I said, She was fired, I know, and I need to talk to you about that. Can we meet somewhere other than a bridal shop? Um, y yeah. Her voice quavered. What's going on? I would rather talk to you in person. She had to know by now that something was up. Let's meet at Denisio's, okay? Yeah, fine. But it was clear that she wasn't fine. I couldn't stand the thought of her sitting around chewing her nails, ruining her manicure over the suspense created by a situation I caused. I hoped traffic would be light. The car pulled up outside Denisio's, the small Greek restaurant a few blocks away from the apartment Holly and I used to share. I'd thought it was a good idea to meet her here. But when I caught sight of her sitting behind the stenciled plate glass, my heart plummeted to my stomach. Just go on ahead home, I told Neil, but inwardly I was begging him to stay. Stay and give me the dignity of not having to ask. The hell I will. The words were forceful, but not the tone behind them. I'll be right here, Sophie. I hated him for firing Deja. I hated myself for telling him about the whole situation. I hated Deja for being out with Gabriella, though knowing that Neil accepted her explanation for the why of it lessened the sting. The short walk from the curb to the restaurant was bitter cold in a way that seemed much harsher than even the worst Michigan winter I could remember. The bells over the door jingled as I came in, and Holly looked up, her hands cupped around a steaming mug. A few tendrils of hair escaped her messy, growing out updo to frame her worried face. She slid from the booth, our booth, and met me halfway with a huge hug. I'm so glad you're here. Deja is freaking out. Please, please tell me you either have good news or that you read your asshole boyfriend the riot act. I was glad that we were hugging so I had time to compose my face. I should have expected she would be angry with Neil, but I was so focused on how angry she would be with me that I hadn't entertained the notion. Now I felt like an even bigger jerk, because it had never crossed my mind that I could have been more demonstratively angry with Neil. Then again, Neil wasn't the one who'd broken company policy. Neither. I said apologetically. Stepping back, I went to the booth and slid into my seat, knowing without a doubt that this would be the last time we would do this together. Holly didn't question my admission. I can't believe he fired her. And that bitch! I can't believe she weighed in on this. She has never even met Deja. That was true. Valerie hadn't crossed paths with Deja at Neil's pre-transplant party, She'd even expressed disappointment that she hadn't gotten a chance to meet her. And Neil! Sophie, I am sorry, but who the fuck fires his girlfriend's best friend's girlfriend? Holly fumed, all over some silly allegation. 
I shifted in my seat and drew a little swirl on the tabletop with my finger. You know, Deja was having lunch with Gabriella Winters. I'm not saying this isn't shit. How do you know what she got fired for? Holly squinted at me. There was no sense in tiptoeing around it. I know because I'm the person who saw her. What? She smiled, but it was an expression of total nervous incomprehension, not joy. What are you talking about? I saw Deja at the restaurant. I was having lunch with Emma, and Deja and Gabriella Winters walked out, and I couldn't not tell him. How could you do this to us? Holly's perfect forehead creased in a bewildered frown. Sophie, we're about to get married. We have this wedding to pay for. We have a mortgage. You can't still seriously be playing this stupid fashion magazine intrigue bullshit? It's not bullshit. I've been working really hard to change some bad patterns, and I'm not going to go back to... Stop it with your psychology crap. You're crazier now than you were when you started going to that stupid doctor. It's nice to finally know what you think of me. I set my jaw against the sick feeling crawling up my throat. I had to tell him. Look, I know it's a shitty time. Do you? Holly demanded. Do you really know it's a shitty time? Your fiancé has 80 bazillion dollars in the bank, but yeah. You really know why I'm stressing about my girlfriend losing her entire fucking career. I tried, and I tried hard, to keep from letting myself go where I always wanted to go in fights. I liked to pick out the things that had always annoyed me about a person and magnify them by a thousand. Then, when the fight faded away... Those things stuck out in my memory, and I couldn't shake them. So instead of focusing on the fact that Holly could be astoundingly self-centered at times, I decided to take a different approach. Look, I know you're angry, but I'm not the person who created this situation. Deja knew she was putting her job at risk when she started hanging around Gabriella. She didn't do anything wrong. She's ruined, professionally. Do you know what your super great boyfriend said to her? Holly demanded, and inwardly I cringed. Neil was a nice guy who could be ruthless when it came to his business. He told her she was never going to work in New York again. Do you have any idea what this is going to do to us? A mascara-tinted tear rolled down her cheek, and she wiped it away with a curse. Why couldn't you just leave it alone? She wasn't going to like the answer. I didn't like the answer myself but she was going to figure it out either way because it was obvious. I had to make a choice. I could keep it a secret and have it blow up later and hurt Neil, or I could go to him and tell him, as much as I love you, Holly, I love Neil more, and I chose him. Great! I should have expected this. She folded her arms, her wide, hurt eyes narrowing to a bitter scowl. My brain scrolled over all the possible ways I could interpret that statement. None of them were complimentary. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? Oh, come on. Your entire life revolves around Neil and his fucking money. How many zeros are you wearing right now? That blow struck me hard. She saw it, and I thought I saw a flare of regret in her eyes. It vanished, though, when she continued... I knew it was just a matter of time and you'd cash in your life for his. You always talked a good game about how independent you were. But you've never made your own decisions about anything. You always had to have someone holding your hand. She was angry, and she knew how to hurt me. I pushed out of the booth, startling the server who approached with a laminated menu for me. I glared down at Holly, wondering how it was possible to hate someone and miss them so much already. I made my own decision about this, and it's been very illuminating. I was about three feet from the door when she called after me. It wasn't your decision. It's what you're getting paid for. The glacial cold outside helped freeze my sob in my throat until I made it into the car. Chapter 12
I couldn't pull it together to go through our building's lobby, and the last thing I wanted was to become gossip fodder for our apparently weird neighbors. So we rode to the alley with Tony and went up in the service elevator. Neil had said damned little in the car, something I was both grateful for and resentful of. Was he giving me my space? Did he think I was overreacting? What the fuck was going through his mind? You can't distance yourself from this, you know. You're a part of it, I snapped at him as we stepped into the back hall of our apartment. I, I'm, um, I'm aware of that. He looked so confused, and that broke through my misplaced anger. Whatever I was feeling now, I had to remember that he hadn't fired Deja despite me. I'm sorry. I just don't know who to be mad at right now. There's no reason to be mad at anyone. He didn't meet my gaze, choosing instead to stare at his shoes. It's just a genuinely shit situation, in more ways than one. You liked Deja. I hadn't considered how it would affect him. You're probably feeling kind of... Betrayed? He shrugged and gave me a gentle smile. But there is one bright spot to all of this that it's the first time I didn't try to hide something important from you? I tried to laugh, but I just started crying again. Neil took me into his arms and pulled me close. What am I going to do? I bleated into the lapel of his wool trench coat. She's my best friend. She's my only friend. At this point in the conversation, I would have expected anyone else to say something like, I'm your friend, or you're a nice person, you'll make more friends. Words to insulate themselves from my discomfort. Any other romantic partner might have taken my grief as an indication that I would have rather chosen my friend's side. All Neil said was, I know, and that was all I needed. We went into the kitchen, and I kicked off my shoes and dropped my coat on the table. I wasn't usually messy while Sue was still on duty, but... I was exhausted and beaten down. I headed to the bedroom, shedding my clothes on the way to the master bath, where I pulled my hair into a ponytail and scrubbed my face clean of makeup and tear tracks. When I emerged in my baby blue yoga pants and an oversized sweatshirt, I found Neil on the edge of the bed, unbuttoning his sleeves. His jacket was tossed across the duvet. His tie dangled around his neck. He looked up and offered me an encouraging grimace. Why don't you take a bath? That always makes you feel better. No, I don't feel like it. I sat on the end of the bed and listened to the rustle of his shirt as he undressed. It was a calming counterpoint to the turmoil in my brain. There is a small fractured piece of me that is always waiting for me to fuck everything up. The only area of my life I never doubted for one moment was my friendship with Holly. Was that why it had all shattered around me? You know, in times of crisis, I'm awesome at saying the most hurtful things possible to myself. I framed this one as an observation, so I could talk about myself behind my own back. I don't have any other friends. Isn't that pathetic? I wouldn't say you don't have any other friends, Neil said quietly. I know I don't count, because I'm your partner, but I consider you my friend. And you have other friends. Name one. Right now I have alienated literally every other friend I had when I fucked off to London and stopped calling them. My laugh was like acid reflux. That's how great I am about multitasking, caring for people. How can you even stand to be around me? Neil stood and came to kneel on the carpet in front of me, shirtless, still in his suit trousers and shoes. He took my hands. You know and I know that this is self-pity, but I want some part of your grief-addled brain to hear me. Nothing you are saying about yourself is true. I don't know anyone who isn't directly connected to you. I argued, and before that, I didn't have that many friends either. I mean, there's the circle of friends you see at every party you're invited to, 
But no friends I could call up in the middle of the night with a broken heart. Nobody I can make last-minute plans with or rely on to make me feel better when I'm feeling like... Like this. Besides you, I added quickly. You needn't do that. I'm secure enough in our relationship that I don't have to be all things to you at all times. That made me laugh, but only a little. Then the tears started flowing again. What if this is it? What if I don't make any more friends? For the rest of my life, it's just me and you and Emma, and I become that weird lady from our building. Mrs. Smoot Hawley? That's not the point. I dropped my head to my hands. Neil, what if I'm incapable of maintaining a relationship with anybody? It hurt so much when I said it. It felt like a real fear, not something I'd constructed to feel sorry for myself about. What if I really couldn't maintain a relationship with anyone? Holly said, my mouth felt dry, Holly said that I dropped everyone to be with you. When I came to New York, I dropped Jessa. And Jessa's a friend from home, I presume? I nodded miserably. I haven't spoken to her in years. I just went home and I didn't even bother to introduce you to her. She was the most important person in my life for years, and now she's just someone whose updates I roll my eyes at on Facebook. I can't stand the fact that this is how it's going to turn out with Holly, too. Darling, it's far more common to lose touch with your friends from secondary school than it is to keep them, but I can't seem to keep anybody. The giant festering pimple that was my current emotional state had reached an ugly, sore head. I didn't want to be talked out of hating myself. Fresh tears blurred my eyes, and my chest seemed to cave inward under the force of my pain. What if the same thing happens with you? What if, in a couple of years, you realize how fucking awful I am? Or I just... I don't know. I get bored and wander away. He reached up and brushed my hair back from my face. I can't imagine that happening to us. But I couldn't imagine it happening to Elizabeth and me either. You and I are both taking a rather large leap of faith with each other. But there is no reason to believe that you're going to go through your life wantonly abandoning the people you love. I scooted away and stood, going to the nightstand for a tissue. I wiped my eyes, though I wasn't done crying. I probably wouldn't be for a very long time. You know, it shouldn't surprise me. I keep everybody at arm's length. I don't open up. I've heard this a thousand times before. I'm just fucking like him. Like who? The bewildered pain on Neil's face when I looked back hurt me to my core. He didn't want me to feel the way I felt right now, but he was helpless to stop it. I'd spent the last year hiding my fears and problems from him, and now I was finally unable to hold them back. The dam broke and the words shot out of my mouth like a t-shirt cannon, loaded with daddy issues. My father! Neil looked like someone had slapped him. No, he looked like someone had slapped me. You can't really believe that about yourself. Why not? I demanded. He makes up half my DNA. Why wouldn't I be like him? Why would you? Neil was just as adamant. That man walked out of your life. He walked away from his daughter. If that's the type of person he is, then the best thing he could have done for you is walk away. But his choice, his selfish, stupid choice, doesn't reflect on you, Sophie. It doesn't reflect on me? I do the same thing with everyone I know. Before we went home for Christmas, I hadn't seen my family in for fucking ever. And these are the people I'm supposed to love. And when you were in the hospital, when things were really, really bad, I thought... I couldn't say it. It was too horrible to admit to him. His beautiful, sad eyes shone with unshed tears, and I hated myself for even opening that can of worms. You're not going to hurt me, Sophie. Please, finish your thought. I was going to hurt him. I thought about leaving... <laughs> about just walking away from you. 
He didn't say anything. There is something broken in me, Neil. I can't find it to fix it, but it's there. And I know that everyone can see it. They can see the broken thing in me, and they know. I sobbed so hard my chest hurt. My nose and eyes ran, but I didn't wipe my face now. I was paralyzed by the pain of my own admission. They know I can't be loved. Not even by my own fucking parent. He moved fast, wrapping me in his strong arms, crushing me against him tightly, as though he could squeeze the sadness out of me. No, he said, his tone brooking no argument. There is nothing broken in you, Sophie, and certainly nothing that makes you unlovable. I'm a horrible person, I sobbed against his chest. His big hand cradled the back of my head. You are not a horrible person. You did something incredibly difficult, taking on my life when I was at my lowest. You may have thought about leaving, but you didn't. That's what makes you different. That's what makes you not like him at all. But I ruined Holly's life, I sniffled. You said Deja would never work in New York again. They're totally fucked. They're getting married. It wasn't my finest moment, he admitted. I was hurt. I like Deja, and I like Holly. I felt rather personally betrayed, and I lashed out. But I have no intention to pursue any kind of retribution. Great. So Holly hates me for no reason, I looked up at him. Well, almost no reason. I still ruined her life. Deja lost her job because she endangered it. Not you. He brushed a tear from my cheek with his thumb. If you had come home and you hadn't told me, how would you feel right now? I shrugged. I would feel normal. Keeping important stuff from the people I love is pretty much normal for me. And when it all came to light, when your guilt was too much to bear and you told me, how would you feel then? I would feel pretty much exactly like I do now. Damn, I hated when his logic and reason gave me a reason not to hate myself. But worse, because I kept it from you for so long. You were put in a situation where you were damned no matter what. And that isn't fair. But as I'm sure you're already aware, life is very rarely fair. He stepped back. Let me go get you a cold cloth for your face. Otherwise you'll complain all night about your puffy eyes. His gentle teasing made me laugh, despite the sadness I still felt. As he left the room, I dropped onto the end of the bed. I was worn out and achy. There was a marked difference between a good cry, the kind you cry to relieve emotional pressure, and this kind of cry. This kind just condensed the pressure, made it heavier and sharper in my chest and behind my forehead, and worst of all, made room for more. Neil came back and dropped a cool washcloth into my hands. I pressed it gratefully to my hot eyes. Thank you. I hesitate to suggest it, because I fear it might bring on a wave of fresh tears, he began. But I know that when you're upset, you turn to Holly, and the comfort of those horrible low-brow comedies you two inexplicably enjoy. A laugh burbled up my throat. He went on. I know I make a poor substitute, but if you would allow me to interview for the position. Yes, I will watch stupid movies with you, I agreed, and for a moment I felt some of my sadness lift, not too far off the ground, though. Hey, in the interest of honesty, I am still really bothered that you told Deja she wasn't going to work in New York again. I know what that feels like. It doesn't feel good. He winced. Yes, I know. I won't actively try to block future employment. I'll give her a decent enough reference, something about her position not fitting into the restructure, vague enough that I don't have to lie, nor condemn her. Good. I reached for his hand and squeezed it. Good. A silent moment passed between us, him studying my face with an expression I couldn't quite discern. Then he said, 
I didn't realize the loss of your job still affects you so much. Why didn't you tell me? I guess until I saw it happen to someone else, there was really nothing left to say. He looked properly ashamed. I thought since you had your book deal. It's a memoir. If I had been a creative writing major, maybe I could be happy just writing memoir after memoir, but let's face it, the only reason anyone is interested in my life is because I'm with you. I'd accepted that from the moment the manuscript had gone to auction. This wasn't how I imagined my career. I wanted to work in fashion. I invested so much of my time. Baby, I took a dog to a yoga class for pets. Also, someday, I would have a good job at a top magazine. I worked so hard, and it's all gone. And I can't help but see the parallels between my situation and Deja's. The only difference is, Deja doesn't have a billionaire to come home to. She's a model. And Holly is one of the hardest-working models I know. But that's not a lot of money. You know that. You've seen poor Terrace's fashion budget. I have. He took a deep breath and braced his hands on his knees. I had no idea how much this bothered you. I am deeply sorry. Well, it's not entirely your fault. I did screw up, and I screwed things up with Gabriella Winters. That alone should guarantee that my job prospects in the industry will be few. I managed a tremulous smile. But I did right, turning her down. I don't want anyone to own me. And I didn't want to lose you. He had an epiphany. I could see it on his face. Slowly he raised his hand, one index finger pointed at the middle distance. Wait right here. Where are you going? I asked. But the only response I got was, wait there. When he returned, he held a checkbook and a fountain pen. Sitting beside me on the end of the bed, he uncapped the pen and started writing. When I launched Auto Watch in 1989, I did it with a loan of 250,000 pounds. My father was the sole investor. Now I can't be an investor, it would be a conflict of interest, but I can write you a check. My eyes widened, and I slowly dragged the cool cloth from my forehead, from my personal account. He finished his signature with a flourish and tore the check free. That's not an investment. It's not a loan. I'm giving you the capital to start up, but I have no other connection to it. I took the crisp slip of paper from him. Half a million dollars. It's a modest budget, but if I could do it with 250000 you can get by. Do what? I had no idea what was going on. For a split second, I wondered if he'd just written me a check to get out of an argument. What are you talking about? You said you abandoned your career. That's not true. You were fired, and things were in the air for you. But that doesn't mean you've left your passion behind you entirely. He nodded at the note in my hand. If you can't get a job at a magazine, then get a magazine. You mean... He blinked slowly the hint of a smile curling the edges of his mouth. I mean, start your own magazine. For a weird moment, I saw myself doing just that, sitting behind a big desk, making people get my coffee, and generally terrorizing the masses. But then I remembered something crucial. I have no idea how to start a magazine. Oh, really? That's a shame. He bluffed smoothly. If only there were someone you could go to for advice. Oh, so you're going to do the same thing you fired me and Deja for? You're going to supply information to a rival company? I pushed the check back at him. He wouldn't take it. I said I would give you advice. I'm not going to talk to you about poor Taris business. If you need me to give you advice, I'm here for you. But I'm not going to damage my own interests doing so. Neil said nothing as I laid the check between us. Then his gaze flicked up to my face and he said, The choice is up to you. But if you are unable to have your dream job at Porteris, please consider building a new dream for yourself. I will be there for you every step of the way, if you want me there. I won't walk away from you, Sophie. 
I've waited too damn long to be with you, and we've gone through too much together. I looked at the dollar signs and zeros lying on the bed. This isn't your way of buying me out of my sadness? No, Sophie, it isn't. It's me telling you that it's all right to use our money for a fresh start. If I take it, I'm just doing what Holly accused me of doing. I remembered the way I'd bought a fucking hundred thousand dollar purse right in front of her, like it was nothing. I was so ashamed. I hadn't even told Neil about it yet. I ripped up the check. He grinned at me. I had a feeling you would do that. Well, one of these days I'm going to surprise you. I'm not sure how yet, but I will. He put an arm around me and hugged me close. Of that, darling. I have no doubt. Two nights later, Neil came home from the office and started shouting for me from the front door. I'd been in the library, filling out an interview for a blog. I'd naively assumed interviews were conducted over the phone. About my upcoming book. I shot to my feet. Neil rarely yelled if we weren't in the middle of a heated argument, and I didn't remember starting one today. Had something bad happened? I was absolutely sure I couldn't take any more stress this week. I dashed into the foyer, and he dropped his black leather messenger bag to catch me up in his arms and spin me around. Whoa! I giggled, dizzy, and put my hands on his shoulders to slightly disentangle myself. What's gotten into you? They accepted the offer. It's ours! It took me a moment but the wide grin on his face and the gleam of joy in his eyes clued me in. The house? Five million less than the asking price, and we can take possession at closing. He leaned down for a kiss, and I obliged him, but his words stopped me. Wait, possession at closing? When will that be? I was going to be very quickly plunged into a whirlwind of publicity for my book— it would be masochistic to try and manage a big move at the same time. I have to withdraw from one of my investment accounts to cover the purchase. I don't have that type of money lying about easily accessible. It should take between ten and fourteen days for the transfer to clear, and then we'll sign. It would never stop being a source of wonder to me that Neil routinely talked about moving eight figures from account to account— I was pretty sure my private savings account only held the five dollars required to keep it open. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. I shook my head. Neil, we're getting a house. Oh, yes, we are. We're becoming like a family. His expression softened into the disarming half-smile I loved, and he dipped his head to meet my upturned mouth. I parted my lips under his, my tongue darting out to taste him, as I gripped the front of his coat and rose on my tiptoes to get a better angle. When I was breathless and whimpering, he pulled back. We're all ready, family, Sophie. I wrapped my arms around his neck and brought him down for another kiss. Wait, wait, he laughed, pulling back. I haven't even taken my coat off yet. Well, take it off! I ordered playfully. Something about a guy buying me a $78 million house is an incredible turn-on. I didn't buy it just for you, he reminded me, pulling his gloves off and shrugging out of his coat. He tossed both on the large round table in the center of the foyer. I expect to live there myself, if that's all right. I sighed, a hand pressed to my chest in mock offense. Well, if you must. Following him into the bedroom, I leaned against the doorframe. You know, Sue isn't here right now. Isn't she? He frowned and tossed his jacket over the sofa in front of the fireplace. Where is she? I don't know. She said she needed the evening off, so I gave it to her. It's not like we can't fend for ourselves. I chewed my lip. In fact, how would you feel if we didn't have a housekeeper once we move? How do you feel about vacuuming 35,000 square feet? He grinned at me and sat on the couch to take off his shoes. Why would I be doing the vacuuming? I shot back. You're the one who's going to be retired. You'll be free to do all the house cleaning for me. 
forgive me, for this will seem unbearably posh. But I've never used a vacuum cleaner in my life. Okay, throwing around huge sums of money, I had gotten somewhat used to that. The fact that he'd met the Queen of Freaking England, and there was a photo of said meeting framed and hanging in the hallway, I could cope. But these small, everyday things he had no acquaintance with still freaked me out. I changed the direction of the conversation. Considering the week I was having, I didn't have the fortitude to overthink something so weird as living to be fifty years old without ever touching a vacuum. I never said we couldn't have a cleaning lady come in a few times a month. I began reasonably. Thirty-five thousand square feet is a lot of house. We're not going to use it all every single day, and like I said, you're going to be retired, and you love to cook. I do love to cook, he conceded. And it will be awful nice to have super loud sex whenever we want. I walk slowly toward him. That was kind of what I was getting at when I told you Sue wasn't here. Emma was in England as of this morning, wrapping things up at Global Defense Fund's London office. We were truly alone, a rare occasion that had to be savored. I straddled his lap and leaned in close. He hadn't taken his tie off yet, so I gripped it and tugged. What do you say? Want to do rude things to each other? Always he said with a slight smile. I only... I didn't know when you'd be in the mood, after what happened. It was true that I was still devastated by my fight with Holly. Six years of friendship didn't magically disappear in two days. I'd spent most of the morning watching Bowfinger and crying. But by afternoon, I'd gotten bored with my sadness. Just because Holly hadn't called me didn't mean she wouldn't. We needed cool-off time. I wasn't about to spend mine constantly moping, though, not when Neil and I had a chance to be a normal couple. Why don't I change, and then I'll start on dinner? We have all night, he reminded me. Besides, the sound of my empty stomach won't make for a very sexy encounter. I worked through my lunch today. I'd seen Neil's working lunches. He usually just sat next to a plate of something until it was too cold and congealed to be eaten, then came home famished. All right, I climbed off his lap. I could do with a shower first anyway. While Neil went about his plan, I set to mine. A quick hot shower lifted me from my funk, both depressive and odor-wise, enough that I wasn't content to just throw on some sweats or pajamas. Working from home had severely enabled style laziness. I blew out my hair, then took a curling iron to it, creating soft romantic waves that fell around my shoulders. When I put on my makeup, I went with a thick, crisp cat's eye in black liquid liner and put on Mac's relentlessly red lipstick. It would match the dress I would wear. I'd recently acquired a truly amazing bright red sheath dress, ruched from hem to very, very low neckline. It was possibly the tightest thing I'd ever purchased, and I hadn't worn it for Neil yet. If he'd noticed it in the closet, he hadn't said anything. I chose a red lace balconette push-up bra and slid the extra thick padding into the pockets in the cups. Then I struggled into the dress, pulled up the zipper and checked myself out in the mirror. I looked like I should have been in a hairband music video in the 90s. It was perfect. I slipped on black patent leather pumps and walked myself and my epic cleavage right on out to the kitchen. Neil's back was turned when I entered. He was frowning at something in the refrigerator, holding the brushed steel door open, and he didn't look at me as he asked, I've put one of Sue's lentil casseroles in the oven, but what would you like as a side? It seems our choices are kale, kale, and more. His words died away as he looked up and took in the sight of me. I did a slow turn. What do you think? I knew what he thought. The dress fit me like a latex glove and created the illusion of gorgeous long legs on my five-foot-four body. And if there had been any doubt in my mind as to his opinion— 
They were entirely removed when he strode toward me and grabbed me, his hands sinking into my hair. He didn't kiss my mouth. Good, because I didn't want him to smudge my lipstick quite yet, but tilted my head to the side to suck at my earlobe and whisper, I think I'm going to rip that dress off you, throw you on the counter, and fuck you until you can't walk tomorrow. A few crude words spoken in his cultured accent was all it took to set the blood in my body pounding south. The ache of my desire was not gradual, but an immediate, intense need. You'd better get a condom first, I reminded him. We'd agreed we wouldn't go unprotected for three months after we'd had sex with another partner. That provided time for a checkup to get a clean bill of sexual health. Oh yes, I'm sorry. You're right. He groaned against my ear. The casserole will burn, won't it? Probably, I stepped back. You're not really going to rip it, are you, sir? Have I ever destroyed anything I didn't replace? I thought of all the panties he'd shredded, the buttons he'd popped, and the underwire he'd twisted. But he was right. He had replaced all of them. If you don't want me to, I won't, he promised with a chuckle. Get a stool and drag it over there, where I can see you. I pulled one of the high back stools from the island. It screeched on the tiles. Neil went back to the refrigerator, barely sparing me a look as I hopped up on my perch. He dropped a bundle of kale on the island, then turned to me, leaning on one hand on the counter. After a moment of consideration, he asked, Are you wearing panties, Sophie? I pressed my lips together and shook my head, swaying one knee just slightly open from the other. Show me, he ordered. With a hand on each knee, I slowly pushed my legs apart. I trailed my fingers up my thighs as I spread them wider, burying myself completely. He nodded his approval and went back to the island. I wasn't sure if I should close my legs or not, so I tried to. Don't do that. Did I say you could close them? No, sir. Forgive me, sir. I purred back at him. He glanced up briefly as he reached for a head of garlic. How do you feel? Exposed, sir. I giggled at the wash of nervousness that always followed his first few commands. It was the giddy moment I realized that the game had started. Good. Get your tits out. A hot flush traveled up my neck. I loved how obscene he became in this role, saying things to me that he would never normally say. I slipped one strap off my shoulder. Then I decided I'd done far too much work getting into the dress to take it off already. I jerked the neckline down and lifted my breasts from the cups of my bra. Touch them. However you like, as long as you don't stop. He slid a cutting board onto the island and began to mince some garlic. At his words, my skin tingled with goose flesh. The blood rushing faster through my veins made the room seem colder, only intensifying the feeling of exposure and vulnerability. The uncertainty of what he had planned, what was going on in his devious mind, made me squirm in my chair. I started by trailing my fingers over the tops of my breasts, then down between them, skating up and around my hard nipples. Neil barely glanced at me. I knew he wasn't so absorbed in cooking that he couldn't spare a look at me pleasuring myself. His mind worked fast, so whatever it was he was carefully planning would be nothing too intense tonight, he said, as if he'd read my thoughts. My hands froze on my body. He looked up, his expression soft and sympathetic. Darling, you're not having the best week. We can still play— but I'd rather we keep it light for your sake. There's no reason to risk subdrop. He had a point. I'd had subdrop twice before. Once because he'd moved too fast at the beginning of our relationship, and the second when we'd played again for the first time after he'd come home from the hospital for good. 
Both times, I'd been experiencing emotional upheaval in other parts of my life, and submission had opened the floodgates and poured all my stress out, washing me away on a days-long depressive episode. He was totally right. Two days after a huge fight with my best friend was not the time to let someone slap me and call me a whore, no matter how turned on it made me to think of it now. You're right, sir. Should I keep doing this? I brush the backs of my fingers over one tight nipple and put a little catch in my breath so he could hear it. He smirked and turned to the stove to reach for one of the copper saucepans hanging against the backsplash. Did I tell you to stop? By the time Neil had braised the kale and garlic in vegetable stock, retrieved the casserole from the oven, and opened a bottle of wine, I was a shivering, aroused mess. He'd made me come like this before, just stroking my breasts and rolling his fingers over my nipples. I'd been tied down and blindfolded, wondering when he'd hurry up and just get to my clit already, when a slow, shuddering orgasm had left me whimpering and writhing against the sheets. I think we'll eat in the dining room tonight, he said cheerfully, as though he hadn't been hearing my heavy breathing, my mules and moans of frustration. Why don't you go out and wait? You'll have time to edge at least once before I have the table set. Yes, sir. I hopped down from my seat. My cunt was slick and hot, my clit aching to be touched, though I knew I would only be more frustrated when I denied myself at the very limit of my pleasure. I needed the contact badly. I pulled my top back up, and though he hadn't asked me to, he didn't object. This was different from our usual routine. Any other night, I would have likely found myself on my knees, getting roughly throat-fucked as a punishment, or spanked so hard I cried. Not that I would have minded. It was a good thing Neil paid more attention to my limits than I did. I sat at the table in my usual place to the right of Neil's chair and spread my legs. Even though we were alone, I couldn't help but worry that someone might walk in. That was probably why he was making me do this. The thrill of the fear of discovery, when it was highly unlikely we would be interrupted, would create greater intensity without needlessly endangering my mental health. Slowly, because I knew my sir wouldn't like it if I rushed, I slid my hand between my legs. The first touch of my fingertips skimming my labia was like an electric shock. I dipped my fingers between my folds and coated them with my wetness. So they glided effortlessly over my swollen clit. Already aroused to desperation, it took two swirls over my sensitive hood before I felt my orgasm tightening my cunt. I had to keep going, right up to the very edge, fighting back the urge to come. I tried to think of anything and everything possible to keep my mind off my inevitable orgasm, but it was all I could concentrate on. I had to hand it to guys. Holding out was harder than I'd ever imagined it could be. When Neil came in with two plates balanced on his arm and silverware in his hands, I was panting, rocking in my chair, afraid to move my hand off my body. I was so close. Don't come he warned, sliding a plate in front of me and across from me. You're so close to your reward. He hadn't set his usual place. Something was up. It took him an unusually long time to return. When he did, he poured the wine into our glasses and set them out with more care than totally necessary. I breathed slowly, trying to ignore the throbbing between my legs, he didn't take the seat across from me, but his usual place at the head of the table. Come here. He patted the tabletop. Oh, fuck yes. The fact that I could stand up and take the two steps to his side without climaxing was a testament to my self-control. His hands bracketed my waist, and he lifted me onto the perfectly smooth, lacquered wood. My skirt was still plastered around my hips, and I gasped, when my bare vulva touched the cool surface. 
Neil gripped the top of my dress with one hand between my breasts. He used the red silk to pull me down and slanted my mouth across his. Now smearing my makeup was the furthest thing from my mind, and I matched him for every passionate slide of lips and tongue. He kissed me until I whimpered in distress, desperate for air then let me come up for oxygen. His mouth a millimeter from mine, he whispered. Would you like to come, Sophie? I almost did, just from his words. Y yes, please, sir. I rubbed my thighs together and wriggled on the table. His big warm hands fell on my bare thighs, coaxing them apart, and he laid me back gently on the wide table. With his hands beneath the small of my back, he lifted my hips and said, Put your feet on me. Good girl. I want to devour this gorgeous cunt. I moaned and twisted in his grasp. There was always a moment for me, right before my body let go, a split second of fear in which I wanted to escape the inevitability of my climax. Neil held me like some ripe, exotic fruit— and bent his head to my mound as my high heels dug into the hard muscles of his thighs. He caught my clitoris in his mouth and sucked as he flicked his tongue over me. That was all it took, and I was writhing, loudly groaning in blissful relief. I arched my back, raised my hips, and before I could realize my error— Neil slipped his arms beneath the bends of my knees and hauled my legs over his shoulders. I had no leverage to get away from his mouth. He didn't let up, pushing me on through torturous post-orgasm sensitivity until it felt good again, until I began to want another orgasm, to need one. I thrashed on the table, but he held my hips firm. His tongue dipped into me, tasting me, fucking me. Then he replaced it with his finger. He tapped and sucked my clit and roughly pumped his fingers against my G-spot, building pressure in me that was too much to fight. I came again, spilling over him, my thighs quaking on either side of his head. He looked up and grabbed the napkin beside his plate to wipe his face. Then he shrugged my limp legs off his shoulders, stood, unzipped his fly, and pulled a condom from his pocket. So that's what had taken so long to get the wine. He'd been taking his pill and getting safe sex supplies. Very sneaky. Not that I was complaining. I wanted him so badly, with such painful emptiness— that the thought of walking to our bedroom seemed like a journey of hundreds of unsatisfied miles. Please, sir, I begged him, though his intentions were clear. Please fuck me. He gripped my waist and roughly slid me farther up the table, to the ominous sound of something fragile clinking. I tried to remember if we'd ever fucked in a position that actively imperiled our dinner before. With one hand, he pinned my wrists together above my head, and with the other, he guided one of my legs around his back. He filled me with a rough thrust that almost knocked the wind out of me. I was so swollen, and he was so hard, that I knew I would feel this in the morning. But I was helpless. My body was no longer under the control of logic, common sense, or reason— and I ground against him, savoring the deep, sore burn as I stretched around his huge cock. You're so wet, he groaned against my ear, and when I rose up to meet his next thrust, I felt moisture on my back. Holy shit, is that for me? Should I go to the doctor? Then I noticed the overturned wine bottle beside us, slowly chugging its contents on the table. I laughed so suddenly and so sharply that Neil startled and released my wrists. Through my hysterical giggling, I flung my pointed hand in the direction of the bottle. I thought it was me. I thought I was having a medical squirting emergency. He took my face in his hands and kissed me through our laughter, until the kissing became more important, and he moved slowly inside me again. I sighed and wrapped my arms around his shoulders, holding him tight to me. 
soft vocalizations purring from my throat with every one of his deep strokes. When he withdrew from me without warning, I mewled in disappointment. He gave my vulva a light slap and growled, On your knees. I flipped over and he boosted me up so that I was on my hands and knees atop the table. In the change of position, my foot struck a dinner plate. The crash was deafening in the otherwise silent room, and the casual destruction set my heart racing. Neil climbed up behind me, slid his hand into my hair and grabbed a fistful, then gently pushed my head to the table. He hauled my hips up and pushed into me slowly, just an inch or two. When I tried to move back, he slapped my ass. You stay still. He rocked back and forth, nearly pulling out of me entirely, then pushing back in that maddening, delicious few inches. I wanted him to fuck me harder, to take him in all the way, but I didn't want him to stop teasing that sensitive opening. He adjusted his angle, and I caught my groan, too used to silencing myself so we wouldn't be overheard. We're all alone tonight, Sophie, he reminded me. Let it go. Then he drove in deep and I shouted, Oh, fuck yes, and slapped my hand against the table. There's my girl, he growled and grasped my hips to pull me faster and harder. Okay, maybe I was slightly exaggerating my screams and moans, but damn it, it felt so good to show my unfettered appreciation for the awesomeness that was fucking my fiancé. Especially in the middle of our dining room, it felt so naughty and exposed. He pushed my dress up farther and licked the spilled wine off my back, as much as his tongue could reach, curving his body over mine. He groaned. You'll have to give me a hand here, Sophie. My pleasure, sir, I agreed breathlessly, and reached down to rub my clit in furious circles. My climax curled my toes, tensed my shoulders, and clenched my thighs before it burst over me in a wave of pleasure so intense it left me boneless in its wake. I collapsed on the table, my cheek pressed to the cold lacquer. Neil still held my hips, and he thrust one last time with a loud, Oh, fuck! before he fell on top of me. The other plate crashed to the floor. I raised my head, and he kissed my cheek, his cock still throbbing inside of me. So, I gasped, wine dripping onto my face from the ends of my must hair. We're ordering pizza then? Chapter 13 My fights with Holly had always been of the big blow-up, short, non-talking spell variety. When March rolled in without a word... I began to feel uneasy. This is a bit more serious than a minor tiff over who should have done the dishes, Neil said patiently as I whined to him over the phone one afternoon. It may take her a while to come round. Have you called her? Emailed her? No, I admitted. I meant to, I really did, but I didn't know what to say. I was also deeply wounded, I'd been keeping a surreptitious eye on her Facebook, since she hadn't thought to unfriend me. Three days before, she'd posted silly candids of her four bridesmaids gathered around her in various styles of dresses. Beneath the post, a mutual acquaintance from NYU had written, Squee! So honored to have been chosen as your maid of honor. I'd thought a bachelor's degree, and she came up with maid, M-A-D-E, of honor? Then I'd cried for hours. When I'd tried to show Neil what had upset me, I found that Holly had finally blocked me. Sure, it was childish internet bullshit, but it still stung. She'd waited until I'd seen that I'd been replaced. I shuffled across the kitchen in my fuzzy slippers. I'd gone to sleep with my hair in a ponytail, and now it hung limp down the back of my ugly teal v-neck t-shirt. I scrubbed my hand over my sore scalp, then stood before the open fridge door, dejected. Darling, one of you has to make the first move toward reconciliation. 
Yes, she said some very hurtful things to you. But if you're planning to have any kind of friendship with her at all, you might need to be the one to reach out. He sounded so sympathetic. I wondered if he was speaking from experience. Neil had a lot of acquaintances, but very few close friends, just Rudy and Valerie, and he'd stopped spending any friend time with the latter due to my jealous girlfriendness. I would work on that. I really would. I guess you're right. I don't know how, though. It's been a month. It seems like the longer I wait, the more it'll be like, what the fuck, now you feel bad? Over the line, I heard a voice in the background say, Mr. Elwood, your four o'clock is here. Neil didn't respond verbally to the pronouncement. Do you think that aspect of the situation will improve the longer you wait? I sighed my annoyance. As usual, you're right. I'm always right, darling. Now I have to go. I have a, you have a four o'clock. Go, be the big boss man while there's still time, I teased him. Neil had moved his retirement date up so that he would be free and clear of Elwood and Stern a few weeks after his 50th birthday. He'd originally planned to retire when we got married, but I was starting to feel like I'd be planning his surprise hundredth birthday party before we ever set a date for the wedding. If that ended up being the case, I hoped the surprise killed him. At least I had a busy month ahead of me to keep my mind off his reluctance to set the date and the loss of my best friend, both of which seemed more permanent every day. My book launch party was coming up. I'd be expected to read a passage in front of everyone. I so wasn't looking forward to that. There was also Neil's party, which Emma was doing the brunt of the work on. The house phone rang. And seeing the number and extension on the caller ID came from Elwood and Stern, I answered with a breathy, Sophie Scaife's House of Sexual Deviance, how may I direct your cock? Excuse me? Valerie. Fuck. Hi, I managed weakly, drawing the word out way too much. I thought you would be Neil. I should hope so. Did she sound amused? I thought she sounded amused, but it was probably wishful thinking on my part. I didn't want her to assume I answered the phone like that all the time, so I tried to explain further. I just got off with him, off the phone. I just got off the phone with him, not— Explaining never made anything better. I took a deep breath. Valerie, what can I do for you? I was looking for Emma. I've been ringing her mobile, and I can't raise her. I thought she might be there. She's out with Michael today, travel agent, honeymoon planning. I wondered if that was embargoed information. Emma had been growing increasingly frustrated with her mother's involvement in planning the wedding, and I didn't want to be the reason Valerie showed up at the travel agency with a beach ball and swim flippers. Oh, that's a shame. I could have given them the number of mine in London. She gets me amazing rates. Right, but I bet she goes, Computer says no, and coughs in your face a lot, right? I snorted to myself. I'd just finished Little Britain in my Netflix binge of sadness. As usual, Sophie, I have no idea what you're talking about, she said with a dismissive sigh. If you could... Tell Emma I called. Oh, and I'm sure I don't need to remind you, but it is Neil's 50th birthday this month. I mentally slapped her. Repeatedly. Instead of saying, Bitch, I know when my fiancé's birthday is, I went with, I'm on top of it. The invites just went out yesterday. Then I should find one in my mailbox today, I'll wager. Like it was just a given that she would be invited. The thing that I hated was, it was a given that she would be invited. She was Neil's friend and the mother of his only child. If I didn't invite her, it would be out of petty jealousy, and it would hurt Neil. It wasn't Valerie's fault that she'd met Neil first and became a part of his life. I hadn't even been born yet. Yup, you're definitely on the list, I assured her. But please, don't mention it to Neil. It's a surprise party. 
Emma and I worked on it. I won't say a word, she promised. Must go. Tell Emma I called. Wait, Valerie? What the hell are you doing? My brain screamed at me, but it was no use. I was already saying, There's this thing next Thursday night. It's a launch party for my book. You're totally invited. Why do you do this to yourself? Oh, right. The book. She sounded as taken aback by my invitation as I was. Well, that's very kind of you, Sophie. I would love to come. That's great. Well, um, see you there, Valerie finished for me. Looking forward to it. Email me the details. Mustache, Sophie. Goodbye. She didn't wait for my goodbye, so I assumed she was sitting by herself, staring at her phone in horror the same way I was staring at mine. So, I wasn't nervous enough. Now I'd invited my fiancé's ex to my first public reading of my debut book. My book about Neil. She was the only human being who knew Neil as well as I did, and that intimidated the hell out of me. I'd wanted her to be there so Neil and Emma could see me making nice, but now all I could do was panic that she would use something in the book as ammunition against me. She'd tried to sabotage us once before, after all. No, I told myself firmly, those days are over. You're being very kind to her here, and maybe it's the first step toward a real reconciliation and a chance, a challenge, at a fresh start. Neil's healthy eating habits post-cancer made sadness eating really difficult. Not that I hadn't gone along with it, but I was starting to gently disentangle myself from his lifestyle. He could be vegan if he wanted, but I didn't have to eat exactly the way he did. We'd been together for long enough. The romance of trying to do everything together was starting to wear off. That was why I'd stashed about four containers of Ben and Jerry's in the back of the freezer. I sat on the floor with some everything but the, and considered how stupid it was that I'd invited Valerie of all people to my launch, but not my best friend. Fight or not, I wanted her to know I was thinking of her and missing her. Sitting in front of the refrigerator, I made a mental list of all the things I could write to her, all the apologies I could make. I practically wrote an entire thesis before I got up and went to my computer. But when I got there, nothing seemed right. I typed and retyped, then deleted it all and wrote simply, Hey, I miss you. If you're still angry with me, I get it. There's going to be this thing for my book at the 310 Gallery on West Broadway in Soho next Thursday. It's at 8. I would love to see you. Hitting send was harder than I'd expected. Waiting for the reply that never came was harder. Being the guest of honor at any party weirds me out immensely. Being the guest of honor at a party where I was under a ton of pressure to prove my saleability to my publisher and my worth to readers was a thousand times more stressful. I would have rather been thrown as a sacrifice into a volcano. When I expressed this sentiment to Neil, he said, I thought they only sacrificed virgins to volcanoes. As a man who was used to being the immediate center of attention in every room he walked into, he didn't understand my plight. I'd only recently been thrust into any sort of public consciousness. I agonized over what I should wear for hours, finally settling on a deep blue DKNY dress with a plunging V neckline, knee-length skirt, and elbow-length sleeves. Bands of fabric crossed over the waist, accentuating my cleavage just a little bit. Looking hot was like a suit of armor for me. I spent a long time getting my hair just right in loose, flowing curls, and I carefully contoured my cheekbones and dusted bronzer over my collarbones. I managed such a sharp cat's eye that I hoped no one cut themselves on it. And I slicked on some YSL lipstick in rose bohème and a touch of clear gloss. 
I wore my engagement ring and the platinum and pink sapphire earrings Neil had given me before our weird breakup spell. They weren't the best accent for the dress, but they were simple, understated, and reminded me of how far we'd come. After all, the book was about our journey together. Darling, you're going to be late to your own appearance, Neil called from the bedroom door. I stood in front of the trifold mirror in the dressing room and took in my outfit, from the gray T-strap pumps to the figure skimming dress and my flawless hair. If I just held on to the self-confidence I had at that moment, I would be invincible. When I stepped into the foyer, Neil already held my coat and purse. A slow, reluctant smile broke through his annoyance at my tardiness. Worth the wait. Thank you. I smirked a little as I slipped my arms into my coat. I turned and raised my cheek for him to kiss, but I didn't do it for you. By the time we reached the gallery, my heart was thumping, and my guts were clenching in a very threatening way. Remember my story of how I shit myself at cross-country practice? I asked, as Tony rounded the car to open my door for me. Neil squeezed my hand. You'll be wonderful, and they'll all love you. You're lying, I said, squeezing back. But thank you for lying. We entered the gallery through a back door, where India met us and ushered me inside. Mr. Elwood, you can either go round front or slip in discreetly ahead of us, she told him sternly. But this is about Sophie. I wouldn't have it any other way. Neil was too polite to make any outward sign of annoyance at India's presumption that he would steal the spotlight from me. He kissed my cheek. I'll see you after. Alone with India, I tried to swallow my fear. Okay? What happens now? What happens now is you'll go out and Andrea Vesecchio, a publicist from m and will introduce you. You'll thank her, thank everyone for coming. You'll read the excerpt you practiced, then it's time to sign books and mingle. Easy as pie, and we'll be out of here by ten. She pressed a copy of my book with the appropriate page marked into my hands. God bless India for making the most nerve-wracking moment of my career sound easy-peasy. The book helped. It was still surreal to see my name on the cover. The art department had come up with the perfect cover image for the book jacket. Nothing too flashy, nothing that screamed, My boyfriend is a billionaire. The title, I'm Just the Girlfriend, in butter yellow on a tangerine background, with a stylized bag of bright green IV fluid in the space between the title and my name, Sophie Scaife, right there on the slip cover. I still couldn't believe this was real, though I had a box of copies at home. We walked down a short hallway, passing a few uniformed waiters bustling between the gallery and the catering truck in the alley. Then we emerged into the bright, white-walled, brick-accented main room of the currently disused gallery. I had to admit, it was a perfect venue for an event like this. When I was Gabriella's assistant, I would have killed to get a space like this for a reception or a fashion week party. When I entered, every eye in the place was fortunately trained on Neil. He moved through the decent-sized crowd, no doubt there were some low-level M&R employees forced to be here on their personal time, and drew every eye, from open stares to sidelong glances meant to be inconspicuous. We made brief eye contact across the room, and his half-smile and subtle wink was a challenge. It was all I needed to regain my confidence. I could have all the doubt in the world, but a tiny bit of competition was enough to get me back in the game. And even though I knew that he was doing it on purpose, I thought, Step up your game, Alwood. You are about to be massively upstaged by your super-hot fiancé. A woman in a red knitted caplet over a brown sheath dress greeted India than me. She reached for my hand, effusing, Sophie Scaife? I'm Andrea Vesecchio, head of publicity for M&R Nonfiction. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks, it's nice to meet you too, I said, because I didn't know what else I was supposed to say. This looks 
really great. We were so lucky to get the space, she said conspiratorially. My brother-in-law owns the gallery. There's going to be a blown glass sculpture exhibit coming in on the weekend. Wow, that sounds like it would be a nightmare in a room full of people like this, I said with a shrug. Andrea laughed too much at that. Well, you know, any crowd is a good crowd. Until she'd said that, I didn't know there was anything wrong with the crowd. So, great, now I had that to worry about. Andrea led me to the single microphone and high black stool positioned in the front of the room. Beside it, a table laden with copies of my books waited for signing. She stood next to me and said in a strong, commanding voice that barely needed the microphone for amplification. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I'm Andrea Vesecchio of m and and we are thrilled to bring you our debut author and this fantastic memoir. It is so unique and such an intimate and utterly addictive read. So please welcome our guest of honor, or author of honor, Ms. Sophie Scaife. The applause stunned me. Whether it was given out of genuine enthusiasm or just politeness, I had no idea. But it was a huge surprise. I stepped up to the mic. From where I stood, I saw Neil, and though I knew Emma and Michael were there, I didn't see them. This was just like peeking through the curtain before the church nativity pageant. Back then, I'd been looking for one face in the audience, one that had never been there, that I only knew from a single photograph. Tonight, I wanted to see a face that was as familiar to me as my own. But she was a no-show. Thank you, I said, and I could feel the heat radiating off my forehead. I haven't done anything yet. There was a ripple of subdued laughter. Laughing. That was a good sign. But then, what if my excerpt was too much of a downer? I raised my eyes and saw Valerie standing in the crowd. She was smiling with actual encouragement. Somehow, it was Valerie and no one else who boosted my confidence. Probably because, like her daughter, she wouldn't lie about her feelings to make me happy. She genuinely wanted to see me do well. I opened the book before I remembered what India had told me. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to Andrea and m and for putting this evening together. I took a slow, deep breath while pretending to consider what was on the page. I knew instantly that I would never like this book, even though I had written it, even though it was my debut. It was too painful. The only way I could read it to a room full of people was by pretending it was fiction. The selection was from the beginning of Chapter 2, the only bright spot I could find when I'd chosen what I would be reading. I looked up, put on my best, Cancer Doesn't Hurt Us Anymore smile, the one Neil and I both used to lie to our loved ones, and began... The biggest challenge for an American in London is not learning to drive on the wrong side of the road or making sense of what a quid is. It is, instead, the indecipherable mystery of the electric tea kettle. Once I got into the rhythm, the reading went surprisingly well. It helped that I pretended I was reading something someone else wrote instead of my own book. By the time I finished, to more polite applause, I dared to feel confident about the evening. Well, as confident as I could feel. Darling, you were wonderful, Neil gushed, one arm around my shoulders. Brilliant. Wasn't she just, though? Valerie agreed smoothly, sipping her champagne. Had Valerie praised me? I couldn't believe it. Sophie! Emma dragged Michael through the crowd of guests, keeping a polite distance from the signing table. We got here late. We could barely get in. Are all these people here for you? All these people are here because they want to see your dad's trophy girlfriend and gossip about her, I corrected. But hopefully they end up liking the book, too. I don't see how they wouldn't, Emma enthused. I mean, I'll heed your warning and not read it. But if it's all like what you read tonight, 
I will read it, Sophie, Michael interrupted with a laugh. Valerie raised her glass to him. You have a stronger stomach than I. Well, that was nice while it lasted. India thankfully pulled me away, just as Neil tried to make a response to smooth over the remark. I don't know whether it was her relief at how well the evening was going, or the wine in her hand that made India seem so unusually relaxed. Her lack of tension was actually kind of unnerving. Sophie, come along. You need to sign these. Excuse me, I said, glad to have an exit. It would be far easier to talk to total strangers than to keep my cool in a high-pressure situation, with Valerie poking me like a bear in a cage. By the time the party was over, I felt like I'd talked to every single person in Manhattan. Some of them had questions I'd been unprepared for. Do I have an allowance? Was my name on the bank account? If we were engaged, why hadn't it been announced publicly? And the most offensive of all, did we actually have sex? I'd merely gaped at the last questioner, and he'd winked conspiratorially and said, We do what we must for the almighty dollar. The idea that anyone thought they could speak to me that way had shocked me into righteous indignation. I couldn't imagine who in their right mind wouldn't want to sleep with Neil, and even if they didn't, it was none of their business to project it onto me. There was nothing I found more tiresome than the insinuation that I was faking our relationship for money. Luckily, India had been standing at my side and heard the exchange, as the smug asshole questioner had walked away, fully satisfied at his dig, she'd leaned down and said in a low voice, Honey, vinegar, something about flies, whatever you Midwesterners like to say. The genuinely nice people far outshone the handful of rude ones. They congratulated me and asked me how Neil was doing now, and told me that I was brave for sticking by him through his experience, even though I didn't think I'd been brave at all. I was touched to see how much people seemed to care when I was a total stranger to them. Some of the M&R employees who'd read the book in its various stages of production commented on how well it had turned out, which was nice to hear. I couldn't be objective from my perspective. While it wasn't as horrible as I thought it was going to be, I was glad when the evening started winding down. We'd better leave before everyone else does and you turn into a pumpkin, India suggested. A sad little pumpkin. Who's the last guest left at our own party? You have such a way with words, India, Neil said tersely. When he'd been temporarily in charge of Port Terrace, he and India had bashed heads more than once. Let's go out the back, she suggested, ignoring his remark. It went very well tonight, Sophie. I felt like it went well. I stood up a little taller. Dare I say, I felt poised. You were very charming, Neil agreed, looping his arm around my waist. But how on earth did you think you were going to be on television when you can't talk to a room full of people? You're right. The TV gig falling through is probably the best thing that could have happened to me. I'd had massive stage fright in a room of a hundred people. I probably would have peed my pants at the thought of talking to five million. As we slipped out the back door, India said conspiratorially, I thought it might interest you to know that I've ended in my notice at Port Terrace. I looked to Neil and he raised his eyebrows. This is the first I'm hearing of it. I don't run Port Terrace anymore. That's all under Valerie's oversight. Which is why I'm telling Sophie now. India was still sore over the Elwood and Stern takeover of the magazine, where she'd made a name for herself. I'm leaving to agent full time. Whoa, whoa, I held up my hands. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with. You're not my only client, don't be absurd. You made a healthy advance, but not enough for me to live on. She looked both ways up and down the alley, as though the police would be waiting to snatch her up, then reached into her purse and pulled out a gold cigarette case. 
I've got two other clients and an offer from a former colleague to join our agency. Congratulations, Neil said smoothly, while my jaw hung open. India Vaughn leaving poor Terrace? She was a legend in the office. She'd been there for years. Then again, Gabriella Winters had been a legend too. Sophie, you look like you've swallowed a bug, India said with a roll of her eyes. What's the problem? Nothing, nothing at all. I laughed and waved my hand. I was just thinking of how weird it is, with you leaving the magazine. It'll take some getting used to, but I'll manage, she said, with the kind of gruff cheerfulness I'd finally come to understand. We'll talk about it later. For now, enjoy your night, debut author. In the car, I snuggled down in the plush seat, torn between never wanting to move and considering actually leaning down to unbuckle my shoes. But I knew if I took them off now, I'd never get them back on my swollen feet to go up to the apartment. When does debut Arthur wear off? Neil asked with a chuckle as the car pulled away from the curb. Why, am I being a debut Authorzilla? Too quickly my brain made a leap in association from Authorzilla to Bridezilla, to the promise Holly had made me vow before our falling out. I'd been charged with not letting her become a Bridezilla. Now we weren't even speaking to each other. I did like the revisions to the kettle scene. Neil leaned his head back and closed his eyes. Thank you for making me sound so gallant about your wanton destruction of my kitchen appliances and the wiring. Tears rose in my eyes, and I blinked them back, grateful that he wasn't looking at me. Unfortunately, he heard them in my voice when I said, Hey, no problem. He opened his eyes and looked down at me. Oh, Sophie, what's wrong? I shook my head. Just emotional, you know, highs and lows, revisiting stuff from the past that reminds me of how hard it was. I shrugged to pass off my non-answer. And, you know, Holly didn't show. I was hoping that in all of the confusion and excitement, you wouldn't notice until you'd had a good night's sleep. He reached out and brushed his thumb over the tear track on my cheek. She's not over your fight, but that doesn't mean she'll never be over it. Good friends can have incredibly painful separations and still heal, says the man who's still besties with his ex. He chuckled. This may come as a shock to you, but Valerie and I haven't always been civil to each other. We worked very hard at being friends, for Emma's sake, but after we separated, it was understandably difficult. It took time to become genuinely close, to really consider each other friends again. If Holly did come into your life again, do you think you would be fully recovered from the hurtful things she said? No, I don't suppose I would. I didn't want to talk about it any more. Why didn't things work out with Valerie? Ah, the patented Sophie Scaife deflection technique, he said with a wistful smile. Fine, because you're tired, and because I'm impressed that you haven't asked before now, I'll allow it. He stretched his long legs out and got comfortable before continuing. I cheated on her. Of all the things I was expecting to hear— that they had simply grown apart, that they weren't compatible, that they were just too young. That one possibility hadn't entered my mind. I had never in my life considered Neil capable of something so reprehensible. What? Why? There isn't a good reason. The fact that he sounded actually remorseful helped keep visions of future heartache from prancing through my head. Our relationship was never perfect— I'd slept with her brother, after all. When we started dating, I never intended it to be anything permanent. When we decided to keep Emma, I thought she would be enough to make me stay. I thought I would grow to love Valerie, to really love her, and I did, but not in a way that either of us wanted. There was a woman at my father's office who was very attractive, and when I was in Reykjavik on business— 
I slept with her. I pursued, I initiated, and it was the most selfish and immature thing I've ever done. He watched me, wary. I'm sorry I didn't tell you before, but I'm still terribly ashamed of my conduct, and I can't bear to have you think badly of me, which is possibly the third most selfish and immature thing about me. What was the second? As if cheating weren't bad enough, I had a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. Telling Valerie. He looked out the window, a muscle ticking near his jaw. Or not telling her soon enough. I felt so guilty about stepping out, but I didn't tell Valerie until a few weeks before she had Emma. By that time, three whole months had gone, and my guilt had eaten away at me. So I told her, and I shouldn't have. Ever? That didn't seem right, just not telling someone that you cheated on them. What were you going to do instead? Stay with her and keep it from her? I should have let her go and never told her. The end result would have been the same. We would have separated. But it would have spared her some pain. He turned back to me, his brow furrowed, his green eyes intense. I should have been honest with her from the moment I knew that our relationship wouldn't work out. This was pretty heavy, after the night I'd had. I think I would have been happier if we'd kept talking about Holly. At any rate, I'm glad you now know. I wanted to tell you before we set a date for the wedding, to give you time to... consider. I almost got whiplash. I was so physically taken aback. Are you kidding me? Well, I've heard it said that once a man cheats, he's predisposed to cheat a second time. I don't ever want to hurt you like that, and I cannot imagine a circumstance under which I would. But you deserve to know. Because your guilt was eating you up? I paused. You think I should have kept my involvement with Deja's firing a secret? He considered his words carefully. I think you had to. The difference between you and I is that when I told Valerie about my transgression, I didn't beg her for a second chance. I told her and I ended it. You didn't tell Holly the truth because you wanted to destroy your friendship. You wanted to tell her in an effort to save it, and I think that is one of the many ways in which you are a much better person than I am. I studied his face, the face I was more in love with now than I had ever dreamed possible just a year ago. All of the good about him and all the bad. I loved him because he loved all of me as well. That was what love was. Since I loved Holly and I knew she loved me, I couldn't believe we'd never be able to reconcile our own bad and good parts. I refused to believe our friendship was over. Chapter 14 What time was the reservation? Eight, I called to Neil from the bathroom. I grinned at myself in the mirror as I rolled a tube of dark berry lipstick over my bottom lip. Somehow, miraculously... Emma and I had managed to keep her father's surprise party a total secret. Tonight he was expecting a quiet dinner with me and Rudy, followed by a proper 50th birthday celebration after we moved into the new house in two weeks. A combination retirement and birthday party, he described it. I didn't think I would make it to 50, so I want to do it right. He had absolutely no idea how right tonight was going to be. I checked myself in the mirror and straightened the skirt of my very snug silver sequin sheath dress. I checked the double-sided tape hiding my bra straps beneath the thin shoulders of the dress, which were barely wider, and pushed up my cleavage. If we were just going out to dinner, I might have worn something a bit more conservative, but tonight was a party, and I was damn well going to dress like it. I don't see why Emma couldn't come. Christ, you look bloody fantastic, Neil said as he stepped into the bathroom. He checked his hair in the mirror, sparing another sidelong glance at me. If this is my birthday present, I'd like to unwrap it now. And I'd like to eat. I'm starving. I leaned over the counter and pretended to fix a lipstick smudge that wasn't there. 
I really just wanted him to get a good look at my tits in the mirror. As much as I'd love a private evening with you, I don't see what Emma was doing that was so much more important than her father's fiftieth birthday. He grumped for the billionth time that day. At least Rudy got the night off. I ran my tongue over my teeth in case I'd gotten any lipstick on them. Shame about Valerie, though. Oh, yes. I can see you're quite torn up about her absence. The corner of his mouth twitched. It was so cute, the way he thought he knew what was going on. Valerie would be there, as would two hundred of his closest friends and family members. He was going to be so surprised. As we'd planned, Emma called just as we were leaving. But unlike what we'd planned, she called me. I fumbled for my phone in my handbag and frowned at the screen. It's Emma. When I answered, she huffed. Tell my father that he turned off his phone again. I covered the mic. Your phone is turned off. Oh, right. He reached into the pocket of his gray-tinged taupe trousers. He'd paired them with a simple eggshell white shirt with French cuff, and he carried the jacket over his shoulder. He laid it carefully over his arm as he diverted his attention to his phone. Do you want to talk to him? I asked cheerfully, delighting that Emma and I were partners in our little ruse. Oh my gosh, I was totally making a memory with Emma, with my stepdaughter. That was a little weird, but a little awesome at the same time. Yes, put him on. I gave my phone to Neil so that he was out of hands entirely. Trying to juggle his jacket in both phones, I pretended not to notice his dilemma, adjusting the belt of my short white trench coat and staring up at the opening elevator doors. Emma were just stepping out. He paused, and I heard the highs and lows of Emma's voice as a tinny rhythm from his phone's speaker. That's kind of loud, I mouthed at him, indicating my ear. Chemo may have damaged his hearing, but it wasn't smart to ruin what was left. He shot me a look of disapproval. I'm sorry, Emma, what was that? Then after a pause, why doesn't he have any money? Another pause. We're supposed to meet Rudy for... Oh, bloody hell. Yes, we'll be there. But I'm very pleased to know that you preferred to go out clubbing with Michael rather than spend your father's 50th birthday with him. Emma's gentle wheedling tone the one I'd heard her use with her father on several notable occasions relating to her wedding expenses, simpered through the phone. Neil was powerless to resist. Fine, fine. We'll be there in... He checked his watch. Probably forty minutes. Damn. No, I know it's not your fault. We're on the way. Is everything all right? I feigned concern as he hung up the call. Only horrible Michael stealing my daughter away to an overpriced club on the night of my birthday, and then not being able to pay for it when he does. Neil waved Tony off and opened the door for me. He motioned to me to slide over rather than walking around the back of the car. Then he hit the intercom, informed Tony of our change of plans, and Neil settled back in his seat like a man trying to get comfortable in an iron maiden. Honestly... Drinks and dancing on a Monday night. What kind of husband is he going to make? I seem to remember someone in this car fucking his secretary until she couldn't walk on a Tuesday night, then sending her home with no panties and expecting her to show up for work on Wednesday morning. I tap my lips with one straightened index finger. I wonder what kind of husband he'll make. Neil gave me a look that warned, I might not find out. It was all I could do to keep from giggling madly. I have to call Rudy, he said, handing my phone back. When he reached for his, I shook my head. No, I'll just text him. I've already got the message half typed. Neil's knee bounced in agitation for the entire ride. By the time we pulled up outside of One Oak, he was so tense that his shoulders probably felt like phone books. He pushed the intercom. Tony... Would you mind terribly taking this credit card inside to my daughter and her idiot fiancé? Shit, that was going to make my job harder. It was up to me to get him into the building. I chewed my lip, trying to pick the perfect reason we should go in. 
I wouldn't have a second shot without sounding suspicious. Hey, I've never been here, and you're the only chance I've got of getting in. What do you say we have one drink? Just long enough for me to say I've been there. He let out an annoyed, resigned sigh. One drink. Lest the night mimic those insane movies where people hop all over the city from party to party, getting into zany mishaps. That's the spirit, grumpy man, I laughed, as Tony knocked on the window. Neil rolled it down just a hair. I'm sorry, Tony, we've changed our plans. Sophie wants to go in. Can you circle the block a few times? We won't be long. Certainly, sir, he replied and when I looked over my shoulder at him, he winked. Hey, you can't keep secrets from the domestic staff. They find out everything eventually. There's no line, Neil said, looking uncertainly up and down the street. That's very odd, isn't it? The doorman didn't ask for our names, and ushered us in without a glance to his clipboard. Neil looked down at me as we walked down the hallway. Sophie, what's going on? The muffled throb of loud music penetrated the gold script scrawled black walls, and with every step, it was harder to contain my grin. In the warm yellow light, it was difficult to gauge his facial expression. At the end of the hall, we stepped through the curtained entryway and into the club proper. At the sight of two hundred people all turned out for him, Neil froze, and in that moment, all of the guests who'd been standing there, patiently waiting for us to arrive, shouted a gleeful unison, Surprise! The DJ switched the music, and the Beatles' birthday blasted over the speakers. Emma, Michael, Rudy, and Valerie were all amongst the front lines, and they swarmed over him now. Happy birthday, Daddy! Emma shouted, jumping up to put her arms around his shoulders. Are you surprised? I may be in clinical shock, he laughed, squeezing her tight. He looked to Rudy and Valerie. Were you in on this? It was all Sophie and me, Emma gushed. You have no idea how difficult it was to not totally ruin it. I rose on my tiptoes to kiss his cheek. Happy birthday, baby. So when should we expect the midlife crisis? Rudy quipped. Will it be an earring or another expensive car? Both, Valerie laughed. She hugged Neil and I distanced myself from them to avoid feeling like I was trapped in an awkward three-way embrace. Rudy raised a perfect eyebrow in my direction. I just smiled back at him. Even though he was Neil's best friend, he had an antagonistic streak when it came to me. Probably because he was Neil's best friend. He didn't want to see him get hurt. You know, I said, stepping away from Neil's side as he spoke with Valerie and another party guest, whom I didn't recognize. Tonight is Neil's birthday. Do you think you and I could get along just for a few hours? It was hard to stare down someone as handsome as Rudy. He had flawless dark skin and sleepy eyes that still somehow laser-focused on his target. He dressed like a man who'd been born in Louis Vuitton, and no matter how cool he might act toward me, I had to admire the aesthetics he worked so hard to maintain. He pursed his lips and pushed up his thick black-framed glasses with an elegantly pointed middle finger. Oh, very mature, Rudy. Neil's voice surprised me as he slid his arm around my waist. He didn't sound annoyed at us, partially, I think, because he liked being fought over. His hand closed possessively over my hip, and he motioned toward the bar. I have been at my own birthday party for five minutes, and there is not a drink in my hand. We made our way to the bar, Neil stopping to chat with and hug the guests we passed. Others were already on the dance floor, where the DJ was impressively mixing Where Did Our Love Go by the Supremes with a house beat. When I'd told Neil I'd never been inside one oak, I hadn't been lying. Only the coolest people in New York got in. And while I thought I was pretty awesome, I knew I wasn't Beyonce awesome. While Neil laughed and talked with his friends, I scoped out the surroundings. The ceiling was wood, the same as the facade of the building. 
exposed brick peaked between huge black-and-white photos and decadent curtain panels of subtly metallic fabric. The floor was a white-and-black zigzag of tile that I was certain would be dizzying if it weren't broken up by the shoes of the guests walking over it. When we stepped up to the bar, Neil asked me, Now, what kind of depressing, middle-aged man desperately trying to recapture his youth, drink, should I have? Jaegerbaum, I said with a forceful nod. Two of them. The bartender, one of five, served up two Red Bull Jaegerbaums and passed them across the bar. You take the shot glass and drop it in, I began, and he cut me off. This is my fiftieth birthday party, Sophie, not my twentieth. I have done shots before. He lifted both glasses. On the count of three? We counted together, then dropped our shot glasses in and tossed back our drinks. Good Lord, he sputtered, smacking his palm on the bar. That is the worst thing I have ever done to myself. To the bartender he called, Can I get a bottle of Reka? Emma and I made sure you would have the best table in the house. I pointed to the VIP tables in the narrow U-shaped bend at the end of the room. Emma and Michael already sat there with a bottle of something of their own. The sight of that bottle in front of Emma made my spirits fall. If she was drinking, she wasn't pregnant. I'm going over. You can circulate if you want. I grabbed the booze and glasses off the bar. Very good. I'll be there in a moment. Neil kissed my cheek, then took the bottle, unscrewed the top, and took a giant swig off it. When he handed it back to me, he said, What? It's my birthday. Okay, but you won't want a hangover tomorrow. Trust me. He tilted his head, silently demanding an explanation. I grinned at him, because he won't be any good for your birthday present. His open-mouthed paws indicated he knew exactly what kind of present he was getting. But if he thought we were just going to stay in the apartment and get nasty in our bedroom, he was in for the shock of his life. When I walked away, I put a little swing in my hips. I knew he'd be watching. I made my way to the booth and slid in beside Emma and Michael. This is amazing, Emma beamed at me. We did such a good job. I'm so pleased with us. Michael chuckled and kissed the top of her head. And I'm glad to see you decided to invite Michael after all, I laughed, pouring some vodka into a shot glass. I held it up to clink against Michael's. I have to say, ruining Mr. Elwood's birthday was not my intent, but if my presence causes him some unhappiness... Michael threw back his own shot of some kind of pink liqueur in a bottle that looked like it should have held perfume. I gasped and waved my hand at my mouth, then pushed the bottle of Reka to the center of the table. You all help yourselves. I think I'm going to get a glass of wine. I'll go with you. I want to get a Coke. Emma slid out of the booth after me. We were a few feet from the table when she lowered her voice to as much of a conspiratorial tone as could be heard over the music. I really just wanted to get out of there and have a look around without Michael. He talks to everyone. It's impossible to go two feet. They do say we marry men who remind us of our fathers, I said dryly, and Emma pulled an ew face. The party was, without a doubt the best one I'd ever been to. There was music, and people were actually dancing. I'd never thrown a party where people had danced. It helped that the club's sound system was excellent. And celebrities. I hadn't been prepared for that. Emma bopped up to my side just as I caught a flash of ginger hair above the other heads in the crowd. Is that? I almost choked on my own tongue. Is that Prince Harry? Yeah, he's crushing. He's here with the son of one of Dad's lawyers. She rolled her eyes and scanned the crowd. Honestly, he could have at least asked. It isn't as though he doesn't know how to contact me. She spoke those words as though it were totally normal for Harry Mountbatten Windsor to be able to get in touch with her at a moment's notice. Because we'd spent the entire first year of our relationship insulated from the rest of the world, 
I'd had no idea how many influential and famous people Neil counted among his friends. Rudy, of course, I knew from his work in fashion and costume design. But there were artists, singers, actors, socialites, basically the entire society section of any random copy of Vanity Fair one could find. I should have realized that owning a multimedia corporation would put him in contact with people from the entertainment and news industries, but it was a little disconcerting to see people I'd only seen in magazines walking around the party like normal folk. In a social environment, Emma was surprisingly fun. I'd had plenty of enjoyable lunches and family functions with her, but she was always so uptight. I knew she found my silliness immature, and she would probably never be okay with the relationship between her dad and me. But we did get along quite well, most of the time. But tonight, she was like a person I'd never seen before. She even dragged me onto the dance floor and introduced me to some of her friends. The first two hours passed quickly. I alternated between dancing and politely interacting with Neil's guests, most of whom I didn't know. There might have also been a bit of royalty stalking, now that I knew there was royalty to stalk. When Neil caught sight of me, he would wave me over or catch my hand, introduce me to this important person or that, and I would nod politely and try to appear more intelligent than I was intoxicated. I was standing at his side playing the part of the obedient trophy girlfriend when I noticed the rocks glass in his hand was empty. Want me to get you another drink? I offered. It wasn't that I wanted to get away from him, but I didn't find long conversations about Formula One as exciting as the awesome party going on around us. He handed me his glass and dropped a kiss on my forehead with a knowing smile. Go on. Go out and find Prince Charming Party Crasher. I made my way to the bar and slid the empty glass to a bartender with incredibly douchey facial hair. Two fingers of Glenlivet with a splash of water, I said, looking away so as to not encourage dude bro eye contact. Unfortunately, I ended up making unwanted eye contact with Valerie, who'd just accepted a glass of white wine from another bartender. When our gazes met, I was trapped. We were too close in proximity for me to play it off with a wave. Valerie saw it, too. She took the few steps toward me and said under her breath, Be aware that many of the people at this party know that Neil and I have history. And those people are probably watching us right now, hoping to view something unseemly. Awesome. I'm a little bit of an exhibitionist anyway. I took the scotch from the bartender. Can you get me another? Valerie lifted her glass. To the busybodies. I clinked the glass that had been intended for Neil against hers and nodded. This really is a lovely party, Sophie. You and Emma did very well. She took a sip from her glass. Congratulations on the house, by the way. I shrugged. I didn't build it, but I'm so glad to be getting out of the city. I come from a small town, and after six years, it's starting to grate on me. I can sympathize, Valerie said with one of her sexy, throaty laughs. I don't come from a small town, but New York is unlike anywhere else in the world. It can be quite overwhelming. Then why are you moving here? A jealous little voice snarked in my head. I translated it to, At least you always have the office in London, if you ever want to escape. Well, I couldn't walk away from Porteris, you know, she said, glancing down as the bartender slid the second glass to me. It's been something of a dream of mine to run a fashion magazine. Has it? That surprised me. Somehow I'd always painted the acquisition of Porteris in shades of dollar amounts. Oh, yes, she said, brightening up for the first time in any conversation I'd ever had with her. I wanted to go to school for fashion design, but my father rather strongly objected. It was easier to take business classes than endure his scorn. That makes me feel kind of bad for you, 
I blurted, before I realized how insulting that might sound. No offense intended. None taken, she assured me. I knew that Elwood and Stern buying Porteris put you in something of a strange situation. I hope my mentioning it doesn't bother you. No, but literally ninety-five percent of everything else you say does. I smiled, closed-lipped, and shook my head. It's all in the past, Valerie. If you guys hadn't bought the magazine, I would have never seen Neil again. That's very true. Her expression was unreadable as she took another sip from her glass. She looked back to me as though she'd just remembered something. Do excuse me. I'm getting a wave. I looked in the direction she was pointing, to a pair of German businessmen I'd met earlier in the evening. Valerie navigated the crowded floor and I watched her go, still somewhat stunned at the revelation she'd made. I had something in common with Valerie. It was a miracle. I caught up with Emma on the dance floor, and she motioned me toward the VIP booth. Neil was sitting with a couple I'd never seen before. They were reacting to what must have been a very funny joke we'd just missed, when Neil looked up and his smile got wider at the sight of me. Ah, Sophie, excellent. Ian, Jenna, this is my fiancé, Sophie. Ian, a man about Neil's age, held out his hand for a friendly shake. Ian Pratchett, and this is my wife, Jenna. Jenna was a lovely, slightly plump redhead, with a cloud of gorgeous orange corkscrew curls. She reached across her husband to shake my hand. She might have been in her forties, but her skin was so flawless it was difficult to tell. Neil had said only incredible things about you, Sophie. Ian went on, and he winked at me. Okay, so maybe Ian hadn't aged as well as Neil had, and maybe he had kind of a sharp-looking nose and a narrow face, but that wink? Damn, his Scottish accent didn't hurt either. Sophie, Jenna is a buyer for Bonnie's. Neil gestured to her with a shot glass, which Ian was quick to snatch and fill up. Jenna rolled her eyes. They went to school together, can you tell? And apparently they still think they can drink like they're nineteen, I said dryly, sliding in beside Neil. Oh, it's just a bit of fun, Ian scolded playfully. He poured out some vodka for himself, then held it up and clinked it against Neil's. Slauncher. Where's Michael? Emma asked. Emma, dear, you look lovely as ever, Ian said in lieu of an answer. Neil raised his chin and gave him a warning. Ian? Daddy, I think you lost your moral high ground in the middle-aged men flirting with younger women game. Emma rolled her eyes. I'm going off to find Michael. I see time hasn't mellowed her any. Ian fiddled with a straw on the table, and I recognized it as the frustrated motion of a smoker indoors. Neil's arm slid around my waist, and I scooted a little closer to him, asking, Are you having a good time? Fuck me. I'm having the time of my life. He was so drunk and so adorable. Oh, but there's someone I wanted you to meet before they leave. Ian, Jenna, will you excuse us a moment? Of course, Ian said, slightly raising his hand in polite dismissal. Sophie, it was a pleasure meeting you. Nice to meet you two as well. I slid from the booth, my feet aching in my two tall heels. When we were a few steps from the table, I asked, Who is it I'm going to meet? Neil's arm snaked around my back, and his hand closed over my hip. No one. It was all an excuse to get you alone. He steered me toward the men's room, and I stopped on my heels. Whoa there, cowboy! You wouldn't deny a man on his birthday, would you? He asked, close to my ear. There wasn't a day I could deny him, and now we were both drunk. And when was I going to get to have sex at this particular club again? When was I ever going to be in this club again? He left me beside the men's room door, then went inside. A guy in his twenties, I thought I'd seen him on SNL, walked out and said, Excuse me. 
Then Neil opened the door and ushered me in. There was a bathroom attendant, a slim young man in all black, stationed near the bank of sinks, and Neil reached for his wallet. He tossed a stack of hundred-dollar bills on the counter and gave the man a meaningful look. Without missing the beat, the man scooped up the bills, said, And a happy birthday to you, Mr. Elwood, and whistled a little tune on his way out, hitting the door lock behind him. I backed up slowly, bracing my hands on the edge of the counter. Do you have any idea how intimidating it is, knowing that my boyfriend can basically get whatever he wants? He stepped up close, looming over me, and slipped a finger under my chin to lift my face. Do you know how terrifying it is for me, knowing that you're the only thing in the world that I want? I was used to intensity from him, but that took my breath away. I didn't know what to say, but I wouldn't have had time before he kissed me. His hands splayed against my back, drawing me closer. His mouth tasted like alcohol, but so did mine, so I didn't care. I grabbed the lapels of his jacket and pulled him closer. Or maybe I pulled myself closer, climbing my way up his body with an urgency so sudden. It frightened me. I was a different person with Neil, far different from the person I'd been before he'd come back into my life. I'd never bought the idea that a person had a better half. Neil had called me his other half when he'd proposed, as though without me he lacked some vital component. It was a sweet notion, but I found a much simpler explanation as to why people shape you and change you. People are darkened rooms, and each person they choose to include in their lives is a beam of light, uncovering some new, previously hidden part of them. If I'd never met Neil... I would have been the same Sophie I always was. Others would have uncovered the bits of me that Neil's presence had illuminated, but that's what made our love seem so magical when I considered it. We didn't need each other to be whole. We were already whole, and we chose to love each other to be more. There was no other man on earth I wanted, so I understood what he meant by terrifying. A moment ago, I'd been questioning the wisdom of having sex in a public restroom during a party where our absence would most likely be noticed. The next, I was clawing at his jacket, pushing it off his shoulders, hanging on to his shirt so tight I was sure my nails would go through it. His open mouth slid down my jaw to my throat in a careless wet path. He pushed me back and lifted me onto the counter my hands groping for his fly between us. He reached for the little basket the bathroom attendant had left behind and rummaged through it one-handed for a condom. The whole thing spilled onto the floor with a clatter, mouthwash and cologne rolling over the black tiles. Get your legs open, he growled, forcing my knees wide apart. I heard his zipper, felt him fumbling with the condom between us. Then he pushed aside my panties, slicked the tip of his cock over my slit, and plunged deep. Oh! I had to hold onto his shoulders to keep from falling back on the sink. I wrapped one leg around his waist, the other he caught beneath the knee, and lifted to perch my heel on the counter. It contorted my body, exposed me, made me utterly vulnerable to him. My cunt gripped him, waves of muscle contractions rolling up and down his length as my body tried to decide whether I should lock him in or push him out. His hand cupped the back of my skull, fingers threading through my hair, and he tugged my head back, forcing me to meet his gaze. The party is wonderful, but there is really no place on earth that I would rather be than right. He slid his hand between us, his middle and ring fingers bracketing his cock, digging into my labia stretched around him. His knuckles brushed over my clit. I gasped, and he swallowed it up with a kiss, whispering, Here, against my mouth. He moved his hand to rub my clit with the tips of his fingers, and I came hard, lifting my hips with what little constrained motion I could manage. He clamped his free hand over my mouth to cover my wail of relief. 
I don't suppose it could have been heard over the music outside, but better safe than sorry. He grinned down at me, grinding deeper, and when the last blissful tremor had passed, he gently withdrew. Aren't you? I panted, dropping my leg and balancing myself with my hands on the counter. He rolled the condom off and wadded it up in some paper towel before he dropped it into the trash hole in the counter. I fear I am far too drunk for that. It's a miracle I got hard. Well, I certainly had a religious experience. I hopped down and turned to check my makeup. My lipstick was smudged, and I corrected the situation by wiping it off entirely. I wasn't going to fool anybody. I looked thoroughly fucked. Neil stepped up behind me, kneading my breast through my dress as he met my gaze in the mirror. Thank you, darling. This really is a fantastic birthday. I went out ahead of Neil. He wanted to stay behind to pick up the toiletries he'd spilled, trying to keep the I-just-had-sex swagger out of my walk. I'd just stepped into the hall when a very confused-looking man stopped in his tracks and looked from the men's room to the ladies, as though he were trying to solve a differential equation in his head. Excuse me. I dipped my head as I passed him and tucked some hair behind my ear. When he went inside, he'd get it. The automatic blinds on the windows were set on a timer, to roll gently up every weekday morning at eight o'clock. Fuck those stupid blinds. I rolled out of bed, still in my silver sequin dress. There was something sticky in my hair. It was probably puke. It might not have been my own. Crawling on my hands and knees, like a vampire trying to avoid the rays of sunlight, I scrambled for the universal remote on the couch in front of the fireplace. I clicked the button for the shades and groaned in relief as the room was plunged into blackout darkness once more. I sat up, my mouth feeling like someone had shoved a wad of cotton into it, probably because they'd mistaken me for a corpse and had started embalming me and staggered toward the bathroom. I turned on the light, then slapped the switch immediately off again. In the dark, I leaned over the sink, turned the tap on, I never realized how loud running water was before, and filled my mouth. Swallowing seemed dicey, but I powered through it. It was only when I got back to the bed that I noticed Neil wasn't in it. I grabbed my sunglasses from my purse, and slid them on before I ventured into the rest of the house. Halfway through the dining room, I heard Neil singing. Singing? He was a quarter century older than I was. He should have at least been mildly dead after last night. I pushed open the door, and there he was, standing over the stove, cooking breakfast and whistling. He was even dressed, in jeans and a hunter green sweater that brought out the gorgeous color of his eyes. If I hadn't had one foot in a vodka-soaked grave, I would have appreciated it more. Instead, I leaned against the door jamb and gave him a resentful glare over the top of my glasses. Sleeping beauty awakes, he said with a chuckle, scraping something out of a pan and onto a plate, the buttery smell, as well as the noise, made me want to hurl up everything in my stomach, though I had a suspicion there was nothing in there to hurl. You know, if you were one of the dwarves, you'd probably be drunky, he went on cheerfully. Do you want mushrooms in yours? I held up one finger. First, there weren't any dwarves in Sleeping Beauty. Second, if you mention food again, I'm preemptively divorcing you. Third, what the hell? How are you even upright? B-12 shot. Dr. Williams was here this morning. I tried to wake you to no avail. Do you want me to ring her? Have her come back. He clicked off the burner, wisely taking my food warning to heart. I shook my head, and I swear I felt my brain smack off the sides of my skull. No, I refuse. I will bounce back from this sans vitamin cures and prove that I'm still young. His lips tilted. 
I don't think you're ever going to get away with complaining about your age. At least, not to me. I shambled like a zombie to the breakfast nook and sat in my usual place. Coffee, I beg of you. I plugged my ears while he got a cup and saucer down and slid them across the table to me. He stood over the sink to eat his breakfast. Last night was... Well, it was utterly amazing. Thank you so much, darling. I gave him a weak thumbs up. It was cool getting to meet some of your friends. Did you ever track down the only ginger man you'd ever leave me for? He asked around a mouthful of omelet. I'm here, aren't I? I quipped, raising my mug to my lips. Humor, that's a good sign. The hangover won't kill you then. Not yet, but I do have to be in shape for tonight. I pushed my sunglasses down and batted my bloodshot, makeup-smeared eyes at him. Your birthday present, sir. Ah, I look forward to it. He paused. Though I dare say, I will look more forward to it once you've showered and brushed your teeth. In sickness and in health, I reminded him. Did you really have a good time? I really did. He grinned at me. I must admit, I shamelessly enjoyed showing off my young girlfriend. Perhaps that's a symptom of turning fifty. Well, I liked meeting your friends, so we're even. I rolled my head on my shoulders, and the cracking of my spine was both too loud and a huge relief. How did you like Ian and Jenna? He asked, with that tone of casual disinterest he could never pull off. How do you like Jenna? I asked with a raised eyebrow. Lovely woman, very charming. He sipped his own coffee and avoided direct eye contact. You wanna fuck her, I sing-songed. That I do. He slid his plate onto the island countertop. But they come as a bit of a package deal. Swingers? My eyebrows shot up. My, my, but aren't we becoming suburbanites? I'd hardly call a 35,000-square-foot house in the Hamptons suburban. But yes, I mention it because they indicated that they would be open to... examining the possibility. I scoffed. I only talked to them for, like, three minutes, tops. And in that three minutes, you couldn't take your eyes off of Ian's hands. Damn, he knew me too well. Okay. He was rocking that forbidden best friend's dad kind of vibe. Oh, please, no, Neil said with an uncomfortable laugh. He hated, hated, that I believed my attraction to older men was rooted in some perverse, father-related area of my psyche, and I loved, loved to torment him with that. What I'm saying is, I'd have dinner with them, get to know them, feel out the situation. But I wasn't entirely cool with the idea of Neil having sex with another woman. It was completely hypocritical of me. I'd been fine having sex with a mirror in front of Neil, and I'd been fine with Neil having sex with a mirror when I wasn't there. Something about another woman was more threatening, and I was surprised at how much. Maybe I didn't understand Neil's bisexuality as much as I'd thought I had. Or maybe it was internalized misogyny talking. There was definitely an element of, it's okay for me but not for you, jealousy that I wasn't proud of. The only way to deal with it was by being totally upfront. Look, if anything ever did happen, I would want to be there. I wouldn't be cool with going off to separate rooms or whatever. And that's not just insecurity talking. I'm also kind of nervous of the idea of being with another partner alone. Neil nodded. I don't blame you there. I don't think I would have been comfortable if you'd spent the evening with Amir in London. I was a bit surprised that you were. Can I confess something? Something pretty embarrassing? I waited for the subtle shift of the creases around his eyes that indicated I should by all means continue. I may not have been viewing Amir as a threat because he's a guy. I'm sure that's probably insulting. Not insulting. He set his cup down and leaned on the counter. Sophie, may I explain something to you? Please do. First, you have no romantic rival. He walked slowly around the island to the seat opposite mine. 
Second, my attraction toward men isn't limited to sexual attraction. That isn't how it works for me. I've been in love with men. I've had relationships with them. It isn't a kink for me. It's just how I'm wired. But you have nothing to fear regardless. I'm in love with you, and I don't foresee that changing. I'm sorry. I resisted the temptation to blame my ignorance on my hangover. Being a straight girl, I'm prone to total ignorance here. Not total ignorance. You just learn something, he reminded me. And I'm pleased that you talk to me about this, rather than making wild assumptions. I take it the wild assumptions, I let my question die away. Not all of my partners have been comfortable with my bisexuality. He shrugged. I've been with women who declared me straight by virtue of our relationship, and I've been with men who insisted I was truly gay. It's quite frustrating, I suppose would be the word for it. I'm sorry that I did the same thing. I reached over and took his hand. He looked down, grimaced in distaste, and said as calmly as he could, Sophie, you have dried vomit on your wrist. Well, so much for our tender moment. Chapter 15 Once I'd convinced Neil that I was dying of my hangover, it required shockingly little acting on my part. I had time to sneak off and make the proper preparations. I wanted to be showered, powdered, shaved, and made up by the time we were ready to leave, and I wanted to be in the right mindset. So I got out my collar. It was really more like a neck-sized platinum and diamond anniversary ring than an actual BDSM collar, and about as useful for collar play as it was for holding a serving of potato salad. Functional or not, just seeing it put me into submissive mode. I propped it up beside the bathtub while I washed my hair and shaved my legs, and yeah, maybe did a little pre-date warm-up. I couldn't help it. The anticipation was killing me. I knew Neil was going to love tonight. I felt a little guilty about how much I was going to love it too, since it was supposed to be his present. I had selected my dress carefully. While I hadn't found anything that matched the dress I'd taken from the Porteris closet on that night over a year ago, I had found one that was just as short as the original dress, the dress he'd bought for me in Paris the layers upon layers of delicate black chiffon, held down by the weight of exquisite beading along the skirt's petal hem. Two barely there straps held up the deeply cut bodice. I'd hesitated ever wearing it again, because the first time I had, it had nearly been ruined when Neil had fucked me against a wall. It seemed like there could be a high probability of the same situation developing tonight. I went light on eye makeup, a marker of a really good play session, at least to me, was that I cried at least once, though I appreciated the aesthetics of runny mascara as much as the next submissive. It wasn't fun to get a bunch in your eyes. I used a pale cream shadow sparingly over my lids and under the brow bone as a highlight with a sleek wing of black eyeliner. I used one coat of waterproof mascara on my curled eyelashes, blinked a few times to make sure it wasn't going anywhere, and dabbed on some neutral gloss. You know, you still haven't told me where we're going, Neil said as he emerged from the shower. Usually when I got dressed up, he complimented me effusively. Tonight, his anxiety over yet another surprise made him blind to my hotness. I'll give you a hint. I said, swinging my hair to one side as I fastened my earring. I'm a terrible girlfriend, and I don't support your dietary choices. We're going for sushi. I hadn't had sushi in ages, and Emma had confided that the restaurant I was taking him to had been one of his favorites before I'd met him. When Neil had been sick, avoiding sushi and sashimi hadn't just been about not eating animal products— we hadn't even consumed raw vegetables. They'd been so great a threat to his immune system. I'll be a very bad boyfriend then, and let you tempt me. He gave me a sidelong glance as he reached for his toothbrush. You look lovely. 
Lovely? I pouted and squished my boobs together. I was going for, so sexy Neil comes before we get to the restaurant. You're very close, I'll give you that. He winked at me, and I skittered out of the bathroom to retrieve my collar from where I'd stashed it. I stuffed it in my purse and slipped on the highest, sexiest black heels I owned. We headed down to the car at eight. Neil looked fantastic in a black suit, white shirt, and skinny black tie. I checked us both out as we passed the gilded mirrors in the lobby. We looked so damn good together. I was beginning to doubt we actually would make it to the restaurant without tearing the clothes off each other. Where exactly are we going? I can't stand the suspense anymore. He held my door for me and leaned on it to peer into the car after me. I ticked my answer off on my fingers. I told you, we're going out for sushi. Then we're going to do something lavish and romantic. Then we're going to do something absolutely filthy. So, just like any other date then, he asked with a smirk, and I just smiled back because I knew what was coming. I'd made us reservations, well, myself posing as Mr. Elwood's assistant made the reservation, because Sophie Scaife wasn't going to get a table. At Masa, a Japanese fusion restaurant famed for, among other things, being one of the most expensive restaurants in New York City. The place had been the stuff of urban legend at Porteris. Gabriella Winters had once had dinner there with Angelina Jolie, and I'd been desperate to ask her what the food was like, and hell, what it even looked like inside. Now I was going to an after-hours dinner in a private room. I was totally psyched. When we pulled up outside of the Time Warner Center, all Neil said was, Oh, I rather like this place. Well, that wasn't the reaction I'd been going for, but how did one impress a billionaire? My slight disappointment lifted when we actually entered the restaurant. We had one of twenty-six tables, set in a private alcove with a bamboo shade. The calm yellow light lifted my mood and heightened my appetite. By the time the first course came around, Masa offered a prefix menu only. It took everything in me not to scarf down the ginkgo nuts and baby shrimp heads served. I suspect I should not get drunk tonight, he asked, as the waiter poured out thimble-sized glasses of hot sake. I opened my purse and flashed in my collar, just enough that he would see what was inside. But I don't think you should get drunk anyway, I said quietly, because the restaurant had strange acoustics and was nearly silent, so my voice seemed extra loud. Not after what you put your liver through last night. The food was incredible. I'd eaten at probably 70% of all the sushi restaurants in New York, but they would never taste the same again. I wondered if we would come back regularly, then realized that such a thought was the extravagant raving of a newly rich person. Once a month. Tops. Otherwise, it would just be decadence. Because Neil has an uncanny knack for reading my thoughts, he reminded me, don't become too attached to this place. We're not going to get out as often after we move. I know. I'm going to miss it. After the waiter returned with the second course, Neil asked softly with a hint of uncertainty, But you still want to move. Oh, I don't know, I teased to reassure him. I could imagine that buying a $78 million house might give anyone a need for reassurance. Do I want to wake up every day with my amazingly hot husband and have morning sex in front of a gorgeous ocean view? Yes, well, I was just making sure. You haven't talked about the move much, except to say that you'll miss living in the city. And at Christmas, when you said you didn't want to make any big changes. That was before I saw the infinity pool, I corrected him. And when I hoped I would be working in the city. Now it just seems restrictive. If I want to go outside for fresh air, I have to share that fresh air with eight million other people. I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, there will be things I can't get in Sagaponic, but they're not that far away. And this isn't as big a risk as I took moving from Calumet to New York. It isn't as big a risk as you took when you planned to run away to Tokyo, he interjected. 
I was never going to live that bit of teenage foolishness down. Touché. But what I'm saying is, I'm not afraid to take this risk. I'm not afraid to do it, because I know that if I'm miserable and unhappy, you'll bend over backwards to fix things, just like I would for you. I rather like the idea of you bending over backwards, he said with a chuckle. Are there classes you can take to learn how? I am sure there are. I lifted my teensy cup of sake and raised it as if in toast. But I guarantee they don't teach them in Sagaponic. About halfway through the meal, I started worrying that we would stuff ourselves too much and not be able to move when we got to the hotel. Then I noticed Neil was only eating about half of what was being served, and I remembered his pills. It wasn't that I didn't objectively understand that it wasn't his fault he needed a little extra help in the getting it up department. He'd nearly died a few months ago. Dr. Grant had warned us about the sexual side effects of chemotherapy, and even without all that, Neil was fifty. It wasn't like he was the only fifty-year-old man in the history of the world who took ED medication. But it weirdly stung my pride that I wasn't just... enough. I shook that feeling away. It had nothing to do with me. Obviously, Neil wanted me. I saw it in his eyes every time he looked at me. It was just plain stupid to blame myself for a problem I hadn't caused, or feel resentful because he was willing to take medication in order to fuck me. Actually, looking at it in that light, it more than proved that he wanted me. He was a pretty great fiancé. When they brought us a small, elegantly arranged dish of thin white sashimi, I almost dug right in until I heard the word fugu in the explanation of what he'd set before us. Fugu? The blood drained from my face. Can't that kill you? I suppose it could, Neil said, lifting a slice with his chopsticks. So could riding in a car, flying in a plane. Bobby Darren died from having his teeth cleaned. You realize how dated that reference is, right? The waiter looked a bit annoyed at my doubt. Chef Masa is one of the most highly regarded Itamai in the world. I can't argue with that, I said with a little laugh, hoping to smooth over my faux pas. I didn't even think about the fact that I was calling the chef's skill into question, especially when he'd agreed to serve us after normal restaurant hours. I've loved everything so far. Yes, it's all been utterly fantastic, Neil added. And tell Takayama I give my regards. I'm not ignoring him. Now the waiter smiled graciously. You're having a romantic evening. He understands. For anyone else, though. Neil laughed. I promise I won't abuse the privilege. When the waiter left, I cocked my head and folded my arms over my chest. Is there anyone in this city that you don't know? He considered. Jay-Z and Beyonce. Damn. I eyed the piece of death fish still dangling from Neil's chopsticks. Are you really going to risk it? Not this piece. This one is for you. His raised eyebrows and close-mouthed smirk issued his challenge, but he had to really grind it in. Unless you're scared. I leaned over the table and opened my mouth so he could carefully place the nearly transparent slice of blowfish on my tongue. Trying not to think too much on it, I chewed and swallowed and smirked right back at him. I knew you'd do it, he said, smiling to himself as he took another piece. Since I hadn't stopped breathing yet, I supposed I would survive, and I took another slice. You knew you could make me. The warm light in the room cast a gleam in his green eyes as he looked up from the plate between us. Every now and again, I would see him exactly as I saw him at the beginning of our relationship, when I'd been so smitten with his good looks and charm that my ribs would ache. He was no less handsome or charming now, but time together had made me take that for granted, until moments like this, and when they happened, I stole my breath away. His lips curved in a barely perceptible smile. I can't make you do anything, Sophie. After dinner, 
Neil made one last attempt to wrestle his surprise out of me. As he got into the car, he asked, Shouldn't you tell Tony where we're going? He knows where to take us. It was a wonderfully smug feeling, being the one surprising him again. You know, my life has been filled with such uncertainty as of late, he joked, but I knew he hated the lack of control. He'd enjoyed his party, but I could tell it irrationally bugged him to not be captaining the ship, so to speak. It's going to be worth it, I promised, leaning over to kiss his cheek. The ride was mostly quiet, with Neil staring out the windows, trying to guess where we were headed. He spared the occasional glance at my purse, as though he could see the collar inside. I practically bounced in my seat. I was so happy that he hadn't figured it out. We pulled up to the curb, and it slowly dawned on him. Sophie, you didn't. Neil took in the front of the building with wide eyes as he stepped from the car. The wow suite, I said, answering the question he hadn't explicitly asked. I thought it would be a good birthday present. I slipped my arm through his and led him inside. I already had the key in my handbag, so we headed straight for the elevators and rode up. It amazed me how easily just being in the building brought up those old feelings of giddy anticipation. I remembered every moment of our first encounter there, with vivid detail, right down to the shape of his hands on my body. But we'd been different people then, something that hadn't struck me as particularly important before we'd opened the door and stepped across the threshold. The W prided itself on its customer service, in which seemingly nothing was off the table or impossible, if you gave the staff enough time and the money with which to execute your plan. I'd taken full advantage, though I wasn't sure I could ever look the concierge in the eye again, now that the staff had laid out my selection of sex toys in the upstairs bedroom. I almost didn't recognize the suite. The warm glow that lit it now differed so much from the lights of the city illuminating the room all of those other nights. But nothing had changed, from the acrylic panel art on the light, smoky-hued walls to the enormous windows that reached all the way up to the second-floor loft. While Neil gazed around the room in shock, I stepped over to connect my phone to the built-in sound system. I brought up the playlist I'd prepared, hit play, and TV on the radio's Will Do slithered through the air. He remembered the song. I could tell from the way his quiet surprise faded into a darker, more focused mix of emotions that slowly transformed his features into an expression of pure lust and heady memory. The last time he'd heard this song in this room, it had been the first night of our illicit no-strings affair. He'd walk through the door to find me, legs spread, fingering myself as I waited for him to arrive for passionate, entirely platonic friends with benefits, sex. We'd really fucked up that arrangement. I took slow steps toward him, sliding one strap of my dress off my shoulder. Do you know what the best part of tonight is going to be, sir? As I stepped into his arms, his hand slipped beneath the other strap, and he slowly rolled it to my elbow, then up again. What will the best part be, Sophie? You get to do whatever you want. He jerked the strap down. I always get whatever I want, he said in a disapproving tone. Don't I? Yes, sir. Anything. Any time. I grinned. He slowly leaned down. With the lightest, softest pressure... He brushed his lips across mine. Then we need to discuss our boundaries. He whispered against my mouth. All right. I took him by the hand and led him to the sofa. Let's talk. What better place than where we first had one of these discussions? He asked with a wistful note. Can I tell you how stunned and touched I am by all this? You can tell me anything. It's your night. I swung my bare legs over his lap. His gaze drifted down my thighs to where the short skirt had bunched up to reveal just a tiny triangle of my panties. 
I don't know if I'll be able to concentrate if you keep on sitting like that. He leaned his elbow on the back of the couch and rested his tilted head against his hand. Let's start with what's off the menu. I considered. I wanted to say nothing, but there were definitely things I didn't like. No flogger directly on my clit. The paddle is fine for pussy spanking, but that flogger fucking hurts. A small, amused smile canted his lips. Noted. Don't be too hard on the hair. I just had it highlighted, and I'm prone to breakage. You can pull just... You know, don't drag me around by it. I considered a moment more. When you slap my face, don't hit the same side all the time. Sometimes you do that, and it not only feels weirdly lopsided, but it starts to really hurt. If it leaves a mark, that's awkward to explain. Done, he nodded, and filed away for the future. That's it for the don'ts. What do you expect from me tonight? That was an important question to ask. I needed to know what level he was looking for. Are we being playful, or are we just doing light stuff? Oh, no, he said, a mischievous squint to his eyes as he slowly shook his head. No, Sophie, I want total submission. I shivered, and it had nothing to do with the temperature of the room. Total as in... Total as in... You do not move unless I tell you to. You do not speak unless I ask you to. He walked his fingers slowly down my thigh. You do not come unless I allow you to. But someone needs to remember the physical limitations of the third one, I reminded him, reaching down to pluck his hand from my thigh. You can't put a freaking Hitachi on my clit and expect me to not come. No mental trick could stop that. Darling, if I use the Hitachi on you, believe me, I'm not going to ask you to stop coming. He dropped his hand to my knee. Just so we are clear, I'd like to go fairly hard tonight. I want to do things to you that I'd only dreamed about when we were here before. That's fine with me. You haven't been hard on me in a long time. I thought you were wimping out on me. I tried to be playful, but heart and stomach both fluttered. It still caught me by surprise how much he wanted me, how much he'd wanted me since the very first time we'd been together, even though we'd spent six years apart. His hand snapped up and caught my jaw, and he leaned forward to kiss me, an act of tenderness incongruent with his rough hold. Then he released me and promised, Never. I carefully wiped at my lower lip line, in case my lip gloss was smudged, then remembered how futile an effort it was. It was going to get plenty smudged up tonight, anyway. Do you want to go over everything point by point? He asked. I wouldn't do anything that conflicts with your established hard limits. No, I can always use my words and signals, and you're good about checking in. I trust you. He gazed at me, speechless, an indecipherable mix of emotions crossing his face. When he spoke, he was hoarse, as though he didn't trust his own voice. That's a gift in itself. There are toys and things upstairs. I gestured with my head to the loft. Shall we go up, or... The song had ended, and a new one had begun, Cola, by Lana Del Rey. The sexy, insistent beat echoed the pulsing tension between us. When he spoke, it was with my sir's voice, the dark tone that always took over when he slipped into the role. Dominance and submission was quite a bit like acting out a character, except the character was a secret version of oneself. I sometimes wondered if, in my case, the secret version wasn't closest to my true identity. Are you ready? He leaned back on the couch, one elbow resting on a throw pillow, the other arm stretched along the top of the back cushions. Oh yes, sir. He looked so fucking sexy sitting there in his jacket and tie, the dim light picking up the silver threads in his hair, one long leg out in front of him. His total ease was a facade. He was calculating. My nipples hardened, and my suddenly very interested clit throbbed. 
Stand up. I did. Take your dress off. Top down slowly, one strap at a time. I slipped one strap off, then the other, holding his gaze as I did. Eyes down. I looked instead at his legs, at the crease in his trousers. I pulled my other arm free and rolled the top down over my strapless black bra. Come here. I was only a step from him. He could have reached for me if he'd wanted to. He waited until I came to him, until he didn't have to do more than raise his hand to grip the front of my bra and jerk it down, hard. He sat up straight and closed his mouth over one nipple, and without thinking I raised my hands to his hair. He released me and gave me a little shove backward. I didn't give you permission to touch me. He scolded. I'm sorry, sir. That will be your very last warning, Sophie. He motioned for me to step back. Get the rest of your fucking clothes off. I unfastened my bra and tossed it aside, remembering how we'd scattered our clothes everywhere the first night I'd been here. He'd been so overwhelming to me then, even without being my dom. It was the aura of power around him, a feeling that had been a bit intimidating when we'd first gotten together. Now, after all we'd been through together, he was just Neil, except when he took control of me completely, until I no longer felt desire or fear, merely pleasure and peace at his command. Then he was my sir. I rolled my dress down the rest of the way, and he stopped me when I pushed my thumbs into the waistband of my silky black thong. Leave that, he said, in a ragged whisper of breath. Go get your collar. I retrieved the platinum band from my purse and brought it to him, presented reverently on my upraised palms. Get on your knees, he ordered, pointing to a spot on the floor in front of the sofa. He sat there, legs spread, so that I was forced to kneel between his feet. I kept my eyes cast downward. If we were going for full submission, this is what he would expect of me. Pick up your hair. His voice was a deceptive caress, so gentle and loving that all I wanted was to please him, though I knew how deliciously cruel he would be later. I gathered the hair at my nape with both hands and held it up as he positioned the collar around my neck. The cold touch of the platinum against my skin, the familiar weight pulled answering pulses from my groin. I was instantly excited, instantly ready for him. It was shamelessly Pavlovian. I was conditioned. Look at me, he ordered in his low, serious voice. I raised my head, and when our gazes met, he snapped the clasp closed. My breath skittered between my lips, and I forced my eyes open despite my longing to close them, to moan in anticipatory ecstasy. He stroked my cheek with the pad of his thumb, then traced the tip along my bottom lip. At the slightest pressure, I opened my mouth and sucked his thumb in, down to the knuckle. He pulled his hand back. I didn't give you permission. I'm sorry, sir. I really was sorry. It wasn't a coy play-along. This was a deeper level, and I wanted my every action to reflect mindfulness of that. I wanted to please him. The consequences would be harsher tonight, though I wanted desperately to know what my punishment would be, if any. I kept studiously still. I didn't even let myself breathe too heavily. He got up and walked away, leaving me there, not bothering to tell me to stay because he knew I would. On our first night together here, he began, wandering idly around the sitting area. I had no idea what to expect when I walked through that door. I thought maybe some sexy lingerie or that I would find you naked in my bed. Another part of me feared you wouldn't be here. And yet, I stepped through that door and found this gorgeous, incredibly sexy woman with her legs spread, fingering her beautiful cunt. The named part clenched at the picture his words painted in my mind. 
There are very few things in life that surprise me, he continued, and only the direction of his voice gave me a clue as to where he was. But you, you surprise me every day. Thank you, sir, I whispered, and I closed my eyes. I wondered what he played at. He was making me anticipate my punishment, that much was clear. But I couldn't tell if he planned to punish me or torment me with the possibility. Shall I surprise you tonight, Sophie? he asked, his voice full of dark, unspoken promises. I, I would like that, sir. I'm going upstairs to investigate what you brought for me. You will stay there and stay still until I return. I heard him take a few of the stairs up to the loft before calling to me. You know, I'd like you to count your breaths while you wait. I couldn't imagine why, but I did as he asked. At ten breaths, I noticed my inhalations had become deeper. At twenty, my mind went with them deeper still. At thirty, I was no longer kneeling on the carpet, but far from myself. Though my body was tense with anticipation, my mind was perfectly still. I was waiting. That was my only task. And by the time I reached fifty breaths, then a hundred, I was nearly euphoric at the thought of my next command. My chest hitched, my fingers flexed and clenched rhythmically beside my thighs. Between my legs, a hot, heavy desire bloomed and flourished. I needed him, his stern, commanding voice, his orders that I followed unquestioningly. We had come so far from the night we'd shared in this room, not just as a couple, but as a dom and sub. Our deepened intimacy in those roles bled into every corner of our relationship. I wasn't sure we would have the same relationship without this aspect that came so naturally to both of us. He kept me waiting because he could and that high of total control thrilled him as much as complete surrender thrilled me. I'm impressed, he said, as he came slowly down the stairs. I heard the crack of the leather flogger against the palm of his hand. I preferred a flogger with thicker tails. It was a heavier strike, a different kind of pain from thinner leather or rubber spaghetti. My skin tingled at the thought of the agony to come. I loved it. I hated it. I couldn't live without it if I tried. Get on your hands and knees, he ordered. Get your ass in the air. I slid into position and knew from the cool, damp fabric against my vulva that my black thong was already wet. Not two feet from where I knelt, Neil had stood before me, six years after our first incredible night together and inhaled the scent of me off a scrap of black lace. What did you do to earn this punishment? He asked, slipping the handle of the flogger through one leg of my panties to pull them up tight between my labia. I shouldn't have sucked on your thumb without your permission, sir. My voice quivered. I sounded so different to my own ears like this— I wasn't used to my voice free from heavy sarcasm without restrained professionalism holding me in check. Do you know what I'm going to do now? He asked. You're going to whip me, sir. Five strokes. You count them. The decision to brace myself or not brace myself was taken from me when the first strike across my buttocks landed without further warning. I gasped a one in shock. This was much harder than I was used to. I supposed that was what Neil had meant when he'd said he would surprise me. I closed my eyes and gritted my teeth against the pain that would come. The tails of the flogger caught me right under the curve of my buttocks. I couldn't help the shout that preceded, two, and I was relieved we were only doing five. I wouldn't be sitting down much for the next few days. The next lash landed on the backs of my thighs, with less force in order to avoid the tails wrapping around my leg. The fourth and fifth came in crossed slaps over the already stinging welts left behind from the first, and by the time I uttered, Five! The word was sandwiched between a sob and a gasp. He tossed the flogger aside and sat on the couch. 
Get up here, across my lap. Seven years ago, in a not terribly impressive hotel room, I'd lain across his lap as he'd spanked me. It had been at my request. It had been the dirtiest thing I could think of at the time. I was so glad we'd found each other again, and we'd explored so many other dirty things. He caught me before I could kneel on the couch beside him. He held me with his hands on my thighs, keeping me motionless, and gazed up at me. Beneath the sadistic mirth, there was true tenderness. We both knew what we needed from each other, and that we were willing to fulfill those needs out of love and desire. Over you go, he said finally, pulling me down and neatly upending me, so that my torso was supported on his lap. My hair brushing the floor on one side, my legs suspended behind me, ankles up and crossed. He'd tied me like this before, and my body had remembered the posture ever since. His palm skinned over my backside, and the gentle touch was still enough to set my welted skin stinging like the worst sunburn I'd ever had. He slipped his fingers up and down my slit, seemingly by mistake, as he rubbed my ass. But the touch was far from accidental. My panties were soaked. He plucked at the fabric. You liked that, didn't you? He asked, increasing the pressure of his fingertips over my clit. Y yes I stuttered out, my body caught between aching pleasure and just plain aching. Why did you like it? I could have said, because I'm a dirty slut, but those words only turned me on if he said them. Besides, they weren't the answer he was looking for. Because it pleased you, sir. He leaned down and kissed one of the burning stripes the flogger had left on my behind. Good girl. His hand ventured down again to cut me, rubbing in firm circles, teasing with pleasure that felt sharper in contrast to the fading pain. Slipping under the strip of fabric, his fingertips circled over my labia parting my folds and slicking my wetness all over. He sank two digits in, drawing a long moan from me. Then his palm fell in a loud smack on my burning ass. There was a difference between a punishment spanking and a reward spanking. I might not have believed that once upon a time, but now I could tell. When he'd flogged me, he'd done it to punish me, for a violation of the behavior he expected from me tonight— now he was rewarding me for everything I had done correctly. It just so happened that my ideas of fun and punishment were pretty fucking close. Another slap brought a hiss to my lips. His fingers were still buried inside of me, and I clenched on them. It was a struggle to keep myself still, though I wanted to reach out for pleasure. There was a difference between surrendering one's will and surrendering to pleasure. It was easy to do the latter. At the moment, I was doing the former, stopping myself from giving in to my urge to wriggle and maximize contact, talking myself out of taking too much at the buffet. My shoulders shook with the tension of keeping still. Neil noticed, took his fingers away, and pulled me up to sit across his lap. Have a care. You're going to hurt yourself. I rolled my neck from side to side, Sorry, sir. I wasn't thinking. You were thinking. He patted my knees, and I moved to stand, but he simply turned me to straddle his legs, my back against his chest. With a little nudge to sit me up, his hands closed on my shoulders, kneading my muscles with firm pressure that made me moan in an entirely different context. You were thinking about when the next slap would come, he continued while his strong hands made jelly of me. You were thinking about when you might come. I wished he hadn't mentioned that, because I had no idea when that would be. What should you be thinking of? He asked, his thumbs moving up the back of my neck on either side of my spine. I should be thinking of how to please you, sir. He caught my earlobe between his teeth, releasing it to murmur. I love how you say that, without hesitation, without resistance or uncertainty. Look at me. I leaned to my right and turned my head, and his hand closed over my throat. It was crazy, 
I made eye contact with Neil all the time, yet somehow being allowed to do so while we were actively playing, when his hand was clasped around my neck, made it somehow more meaningful. You should be thinking of nothing. He brushed my hair back, curving his fingers around my ear. He looked into my eyes, then he kissed me with urgency, that snatched the breath from my lungs, leaving that weird, semi-painful love ache beneath my ribs. Face forward, he ordered, as he pulled back, and I did as he told me. One of his hands slid between my breasts, to the top of my thong and under. I glanced down and nearly came right then. The sight of Neil's hand in my panties was one of the most erotic things I'd ever seen, and was on the top ten of things I love to look at, probably somewhere between baby ducks and the words, Yoji Yamamoto's new collection. Obviously, it helped that the image was associated with some supremely pleasurable physical sensations. His other arm wrapped around my ribcage, holding me captive, as his fingers sought out my clit. My body bowed. It wasn't an instinct I could resist. I'd been so keyed up for this all day long, and I lost myself in his touch. You can writhe all you'd like, but you aren't going anywhere, he warned, his breath hot against my ear. You're mine, Sophie. Tonight I will use you. I will punish you. I will hurt you any way I please. Why is that? I wetted my lips. My breath shuddered from my lungs. It was hard to concentrate under the onslaught of his titillating words and his wicked touch, because my voice broke on a gasp as he slipped one finger up and down my clitoris. His arm tighter around my ribs and his hand stilled in my panties. Say it because I'm yours, sir. His fingers moved in a final slow circle. He pulled his hand away and I stifled my whimper of protest. Sir would not like it if I asked for more than he wanted to give me. Open your mouth, he ordered, and when I did, he forced his fingers past my parted lips. Taste yourself. I sucked his fingers clean, this was one of his favorite things to do, and I'd gotten used to the musky, slightly salty flavor. Did you ever do this before? he asked, gently pushing his fingers in and out of my mouth in a maddening tease, giving me exactly what I wanted on the wrong part of my body. I nodded. When? He dragged his fingers slowly from my mouth, over my chin and down my throat. When I've masturbated, sir? Every once in a while, I like to taste myself. My face got hot at the admission. He could pull secrets from me on a whim. Do you think of me while you're touching yourself? He trailed the backs of his fingers across the skin between my breasts. I do, sir. Goose flesh stood out all over my body. Every time? Every time, sir. He pinched one nipple, hard. Tell the truth now. I gasped in pain. Not every time, sir. I'm sorry, sir. He rubbed his fingertips in soothing circles over the flesh he'd just tormented. Who do you think of? Without hesitation, told him. I think of Amir, and I think of other men. Tell me. About Amir, sir? My breath quickened as Neil's hands cupped my breasts, and he drew his fingers slowly back and forth over the sensitive lower curve. If you'd like to start there. He dipped his head to nibble my shoulder, and a chill raced up my spine. It was difficult to concentrate, but that might have been in my favor. My words rolled out free from self-conscious structure. Lately, I've been imagining what he did to you when you two were together about how it would have felt for you, about what it must have looked like, pretending I'm in the room watching. Spread your legs wider. I was already straddling his lap, but I opened wider, my hips canting forward, giving him better access to my body. Go on, he said, one hand cupping my vulva, kneading me through my wet panties. 
I think about what it would be like to be with many men at once, their hands all over my body, hands on my breasts, fingers in my pussy, in my ass, being used for their pleasure and taking pleasure in it. His cock pressed against my ass through his trousers. I didn't grind against it. I hadn't been invited. Is that something you'd like to make a reality? He asked, his deep voice rumbling through his chest so that I felt it on my back. The scent of his cologne overrode my senses. No, sir, it's just a fantasy. I only want you. I don't have to want you. He gripped my mound roughly. I already have you. Yes, sir. My entire being was focused on him. Nothing existed beyond my hunger to please him. If I could please him, he would please me, and make sure his pleasure was returned tenfold. His hand moved too quickly for me to anticipate the smack that landed on my vulva, and I yelped, I love every sound that I make you make. He closed his hand over my throat, pressing on those little points beneath my jaw, but not my trachea. That was far too risky. He enjoyed causing me pain, tormenting me with pleasure, but he would never actually harm me. He slapped me between my legs again, twice in quick succession, and my thighs quivered. I could only whimper. He released me and pushed me to the floor, not roughly, just as though I were a toy he was finished playing with for the moment, and my body throbbed with longing for contact. He knew exactly how to wind me up, to make me want him more. Go upstairs and wait for me. I started to get to my feet. He pressed me back to the carpet with one exquisite Italian leather short wing blucher. Not like that. I want to see you crawl. I rose on my hands and knees, my back dipped, my hair falling over my shoulders. I knew what he saw, my tight, round ass in the air, my black thong accentuating the curve. He wanted to see me crawl, so I did, slinking in long-legged stretches across the carpet to the bottom of the stairs. Navigating those was a bit trickier. Luckily, I heard him stand and go to the phone so he didn't see my awkwardness. At the top, I could have gotten to my feet and gone into the bedroom, but he just said, upstairs, and he'd said nothing about getting up. The volume of the music over the in-room sound system grew louder. I didn't know who he was talking to on the phone downstairs, but I suspected it would have something to do with the noise level he was expecting. When he came up the stairs, he'd shed his jacket and pulled off his tie. Without a word, he bent down and looped the black silk across my face, pulling it up hard between my lips and teeth to secure it behind my head. My signal when gagged was to hold up my hand and open and close my fingers three times, and all the action would stop, so I was never nervous at having my mouth obstructed. The drooling it would cause would be utterly humiliating. I couldn't wait. He grabbed my hair and wound it around his fist, then with a little, hmm, as he reconfigured his plan according to the limits I'd set, he released it and leaned down to haul me over his shoulder. Mph! The startled exclamation was garbled by the gag. I have been working out, after all, he admonished, more like the Neil who was my fiancé than the Neil who was my dom. He deposited me on the bed and, snapping his fingers, ordered, Lie there and don't move. At the end of the bed, I'd left two coils of black jute rope and a pair of bandage scissors. Occasionally, he liked to tie me up, and it seemed tonight I'd been wise to be prepared. He hovered his hands over the rope, then moved to the wand massager. What I'm going to do to you tonight, he began, moving to plug the cord into the wall, I'm going to need you as wet and as open as possible. He returned to the bed, to the three dildos I'd left there. I'd brought a curved glass one with nubs along its length, a velvety soft white, ambiguously shaped one, and the main event, a large purple monster even bigger than Neil's cock. He picked up the ladder and waited in his hand, my breath hitched. 
He set it back down. I want you to kneel on the bed, with your knees shoulder-width apart. He'd brought the flogger upstairs with him, and he tossed that and the black leather-covered paddle onto the bed. Arms behind you. There was a specific way he liked to tie my arms, that didn't put as much stress on my elbows and shoulders as some ties did. My bent arms folded across my lower back, my hands grasping near their opposite elbow. He climbed onto the bed behind me and quickly braided a single cuff around my forearms, looping across my wrists loosely so as not to cut off circulation and to leave my hands free. How does that feel, Sophie? I rolled my head and both of my shoulders one at a time, nice and loose, only the slightest twinge of a reminder that there would be tension and aching later. I tried to tell him. Perfect, sir, around the gag, and a torrent of drool rolled from my lower lip. He smiled to himself and went to the end of the bed. And you can still signal me. Snap once to answer. I snapped my fingers. When I was bound and gagged, three snaps were my safe word. Good. He reached for the wand and the paddle and stood at my side, idly running his thumb over the black switch on the vibrator. Do you know who I just called? I shook my head, my gaze fixed on the bulbous head of the wand. It looked innocent enough, but with the flip of a switch it became one of the most powerful implements of torture in his arsenal. I called the concierge. I told them it was likely there would be a fair bit of noise from our room, if he caught my drift, and that we would be more than willing to pay the hotel bill for anyone who might be inconvenienced. He ran the paddle up and down the fronts of my thighs, so I can make you scream as loudly as I like. I whimpered, and the paddle smacked just beneath my crotch. I breathed deeply through my nose. Would you like that, Sophie? I nodded. Another smack, just below the last one. I redirected my muffled shout through my nose, my nostrils flaring with labored breaths. It doesn't matter what you like, does it? I shook my head, squeezing my eyes shut, bracing for another blow, one that never came. Instead, he brought the cold plastic ball of the wand between my legs. He dropped the paddle and shoved two fingers past the gag, coating them with my saliva, pushing them far back so that I sputtered and drooled. He used those wet fingers to part my labia around the head of the vibrator, nestling it snug against my clit. I wanted to shift my hips to rub against it. I wanted the pleasure that would come the moment the strong, deep vibrations roared to life. But I knew that pleasure would come at a price. There would either be too much or not enough. He picked up the paddle again and rubbed my ass with it, my body tensed, and he flipped the switch. There were two settings on the wand, a high frantic frequency that numbed and stung at the same time, and a lower, deeper hum that drove me wild. He used the latter now, and I whined through my gag as muscles tightened past the point of pain on the way to my climax. My ascending cries peaked with a high-pitched groan as the shock of my orgasm hit me. In the moment, I should have wanted to buck away from the unrelenting vibration. He smacked my ass hard with the paddle and pulled the vibe away, clicking it off. The conflicting sensations sent chills skating over my skin. He hit me again over the same burning swath, and I muffled a curse against the gag. He dropped the vibe and gripped my chin. I said you could scream, not swear. If you can't keep your filthy mouth under control, you'll be choking on my cock instead of that gag. The imagery turned my knees to liquid, and I swayed. His arm was at my back in a flash, supporting me, and he reached down for the vibrator again. He pushed it against my swollen, satisfied clit and said, We'll go again. In three, two, one. He clicked the switch and I jolted, pumping my hips, either to get away or to get closer, I wasn't sure. I didn't care if he punished me for moving. I wanted him to. I wanted more. 
I wanted him to push me to the very edge. My end goal suddenly became using my safe word. I wanted to go so far I had to stop, though Neil often warned me that getting close was better than going past what I could endure. But just the thought of the extreme, the thought of indulging my truly masochistic side, was enough to bring me to another, stronger release. He followed it with three smacks of the paddle in quick succession, until I cried out. He pulled the vibe away and gave me time to come down, time that was almost worse, because the next orgasm would build from the ground up, not merely blend with the last one. My already taxed muscles were drawn up tight again. I would be impossibly sore in the morning. This time, when he counted down and turned the vibrator on, he rolled the head in small circles, varying the sensation so that any numbness from the vibration wouldn't help me. This time, I did scream, and kept on screaming as the paddle struck the backs of my thighs. He didn't pull the wand away this time, keeping me teetering on the brink of too much pain and way too much pleasure, until it all became pain twisting and writhing around my every nerve ending. I couldn't hold myself up any more. I fell against him, and he dropped both the paddle and the vibrator to catch me. He swiftly untied the gag and pushed my sweaty hair back from my face. Droplets of perspiration ran down my neck. Below my collar, over my chest. He gripped the wet locks of my nape and tilted my head back. What do we say? Thank you, sir, I panted, my throat hoarse. My eyes slid closed as I savored the boneless peace of my ebbing high. Come back to me a moment, he said gently, stroking a finger down my cheek. Check in. Where are we? Green, sir. I didn't want to stop. I never wanted to stop feeling the way I did in that moment. I wouldn't have cared if we stayed like this all week. He sat me down on the crisp white duvet and worked at the knots binding my wrists. When I was untied, he helped me straighten my arms and rub the soreness from my shoulders. How is that? Sir took such good care of me. Much better, sir. Thank you, sir. He skimmed his hands up and down my arms, then urged me to lie back. He slipped one of the pillows from the head of the bed under my hips. Spread your legs. There you are. I shivered as his hand glided down over my stomach, between my legs. He petted my labia, his fingertips straying between. One finger slipped inside me and I clenched on it, mewling in mingled relief and frustration. I needed more than just his finger. I wanted to be filled up. Oh, he said soft and low. You want more. He withdrew and reached for the medium-sized dildo. He brought it between my legs and swiped the surface of the soft silicone up and down my slit, coating it. I'd brought lube, but I wasn't sure it was going to be necessary. I was dripping, my pussy making obscene squelching noises as my muscles grasped on emptiness. My breathing became labored, stuttering through my lips, almost a sob, but never quite reaching that pitch. Slowly, he pushed the head of the dildo inside of me, inserting and withdrawing just an inch or two, raking the ridge of the head over my G-spot. It was almost irritating, in that my body had already been satisfied to the point of overstimulation, but it was such a relief to be penetrated. He pushed deeper, twisting his wrist as he drew the length out in a slow, measured pace. I wriggled a little. I couldn't help it. You may move if you'd like. Thank you, sir, I panted, lifting my hips in a roll that brought a groan of relief from my lips and a trance-like state to my mind. He reached with his other hand to my throat, pressing on the two points beneath my chin that made me light-headed. I enjoyed the possessiveness, the simulated risk, and he got off on the proof of my unwavering trust in him. My head swam, intensifying the sensations in my cunt. Then, 
It became too much. Sharpening my hazy thoughts, I managed... Okay, yellow on the choking. Neil pulled his hand away immediately. The rest is all right, though. Yeah, the rest is fine. I smiled gratefully at him and closed my eyes as he kept up the now deep strokes with the dildo. It didn't take long to return to that peaceful, carefree place of my total submission. My nerves were stronger than my weakened body, sending pulses to every centimeter of my skin, turning every sensation into pleasure. He pulled the shaft free from my pussy once, twice, again and again, always withdrawing completely, then plunging back in. With my eyes squeezed shut against the building pressure, I didn't see him replace the dildo with the much larger one, and when it stretched me, my eyes flew open and my body jolted. We'd used this one many times. He even had a video of me using it on myself. But every time the size was stunning. Neil was well endowed, but this thing was massive. My libido was reckless and greedy, without a limit in sight. This was where the edges could get blurry, and why our trust was so important. We each had our own limits, and he knew where mine were. There was no chance of him forgetting, nor willfully forgetting, where the lines were drawn. Pain, however, was a line drawn far, far down the field, so when he rammed the huge rubber cock forward, burying it so deep in my body that I felt an uncomfortable pinch against my battered cervix, I moaned in far more pleasure than pain. The flogger he'd laid at the end of the bed was easy to access, and he picked it up now in his free hand, still plunging the dildo mercilessly into me. As I sweated and strained and braced myself against the fullness in my pelvis, I didn't have time to anticipate the swipe of the flogger. Neil snapped the underside of one breast with just the tips of the tails, and I screamed at what felt like a rain of needles on my skin. I arched my back, caught between acute and dull pain. No matter what he commanded, I couldn't have stopped myself from responding. This was beyond the pleasure of obedience. This was an obscene hunger for degradation. Are you my whore, Sophie? Another snap of the flogger, this time on my other breast. I shouted my, yes, sir, on a sob, and gritted my teeth against the next that worked up my throat. Who do you belong to? To you, sir, only to you. He gave me another bite of the flogger, and another, maybe five or six, and I lost count as they bled into each other in quick succession. Every inch of my body sang, every pore of my skin burned. I spread my legs wider, took the dildo in deeper, and gripped the duvet in my fists. My mind whipped to my Catholic upbringing, the stories of the martyrs possessed of holy ecstasy, and I finally understood those contorted blissful faces of the flayed and scourged in all those paintings. Because when you're taking the pain out of free will and love, the pain becomes love. I don't know how long I drifted after the last snap of the flogger, it seemed like a long time, and all the while he kept up the long strokes of the dildo, in pace with the mindless movements of my body. When I started to come back to myself, he eased the dildo from me. Open your eyes. I did, and met his gaze just as he knelt beside me, the tie that had once gagged me wrapped around his hand. He used it to swipe away my tears then brushed the silk over the inflamed skin of my breasts. He uncoiled the tie from his fist and dropped it onto my quivering stomach. How are you feeling? Sore, sir, I panted. Thirsty. He leaned down and kissed my forehead. Stay here. Yes, sir. I closed my eyes again and slowed my breathing. In the break from sensation... I felt my stamina recovering a bit. I hoped he wasn't finished with me for the night. 
When he returned with the water glass, he sat on the edge of the bed and patted his lap. He was certainly not finished. I sat up and braced myself to avoid a head rush. Then I obediently moved to his lap. He brushed my sweaty hair back from my shoulders and rested the glass on my bottom lip, tipping a swallow of water into my mouth. There. Do you need a break? That depends on what you have planned, sir. No, no, sir, right now. This is your partner, Neil, asking if you need a break. He smiled his half smile and offered me another drink, which I gulped down gratefully. Oh, then I guess that depends on what you have planned, Neil. He passed the glass into my hands and carefully, so that I didn't tumble onto the bed, lifted me from his lap and set me beside him. Then, with deliberate slowness, he unbuttoned his shirt cuff and rolled the sleeve back. He flexed his fingers, those long, elegant fingers, and I needed another gulp of water. He raised his eyebrows at me. What do you think? I think. I licked my lips, taking in the hypnotic motion of his hand as he cracked his knuckles. I think I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Lie back. Put a pillow beneath your hips. It helps. He reached for the bottle of lube and sat on the edge of the bed facing me. You've done this before? I asked, a sudden stab of nerves both startling and thrilling me. This was so... obscene, so incredibly vulgar that I had never even let myself look at porn of the act. We were so going to level up in the kink department tonight. I have... He put a few drops of lube on his fingertips. The width of my hand has been a problem before, so don't feel as though you've failed if you can't take it all. We'll stop if it doesn't feel good, and go back to what does. That made me even more nervous. Men's hands were such a turn-on for me, Neil's especially, with the fat veins and wiry brown hairs across the back. He got frequent manicures, a vanity I'd once teased him about, until he'd pointed out that he'd never once snagged me with a splintered nail while fingering me. But still, we were talking about a whole fist going into a tight spot. He was right. It probably was better that we didn't include it in a scene, the very first time we tried it, and just related to each other as Neil and Sophie. With his lubricated fingertips, he massaged my labia and perineum, and placed his index fingers inside to gently stretch me. I was already wet and wanting from what he'd done to me before, but multiple orgasms had swollen the pillowy tissues of my cunt. When he slipped his index and middle fingers inside me to the knuckle, I worried it would be an impossible fit. Relax and breathe. He reassured me gently. Do you want to stop? No, I'm just a little afraid, I said with a tremulous smile. This was like jumping into a cold pool. I wanted to go swimming, but the initial submersion frightened me. I trust you. Let's keep going. For a long while he rubbed his fingers in me, hooking them to knead the floor of my cunt, twisting his wrist to soothe the top and sides. I took deep breaths and willed myself to relax. It wouldn't work if I were tense. He pumped more lube onto his hand, although I could feel my own fluids leaking around him, and slowly, with a cupped palm, slid three fingers inside me. The three digits together still weren't nearly as thick as his penis, but the difference in shape produced an almost fuller sensation. The knuckle of his middle finger rasped over my G-spot, and I moaned, rocking my hips a little, wishing he would push deeper. Tell me when you're ready for more, he said softly, his other hand stroking the insides of my thighs. You're guiding this now. I reached down to touch my clit, and the pinprick feeling in that oversensitive bundle of nerves made me hiss in discomfort. Neil's hand stopped moving immediately. No, it's not that. Keep going, I assured him, 
and the desperation in my voice must have convinced him, because he resumed his gentle ministrations. A hot flush broke over my skin, shivers skating down my arms and legs. I was gripped by the unique thrill of sexual exploration. At my urging, he picked up a little speed, steadily twisting and withdrawing, emboldened by this new territory we were exploring. I couldn't wait for me. Wetting my lips, I said on a shaky breath, Okay, you can add another. This time, he withdrew his hand completely to apply more lube, all the way down to the back of his hand. He turned his wrist and inserted all four of his fingers, corkscrewing them gently to open me. My cunt stretched wide around them, and an animal moan passed over my lips. It felt so impossibly good, so incredibly large. His thumb stroked over my clit, and I moved my own hand aside to make room. He withdrew, curling his fingers just a bit, then pushed slowly back in, creating a wave of stimulation that made my body undulate in a similar fashion. You can go a little faster, I panted. He obliged. Is this all right? All right. It felt fucking fantastic. Any reservations I'd had dissipated at the feeling of those four fingers gliding over every ripple and ridge of my cunt, making me clench. I worked my clit in furious circles, arching my hips up. That proved a bit unpleasant, a bit too much pressure on my pelvis, and I dropped down again as he softly admonished. Careful now. It feels so fucking good, I moaned, my free hand gripping the duvet. Don't stop. Not unless my hand breaks, he said with a chuckle. He pumped and curled his fingers, coaxing wet sounds from my pussy. I couldn't shake the voracious appetite that had gripped me. I feared it would never be sated. Please just do it, I gasped. Everything? he clarified, rolling his thumb against me. Yes, please, I nodded, and my sweaty hair plastered to the back of my head. He withdrew his hand and pumped more lube over it, so much that it ran down his arm when it mingled with my own natural lubricant. Slowly, carefully, he slipped his cupped hand into my cunt, his thumb folded against his palm. The addition of his thumb created a startlingly different shape and size, at least, more so than I had expected. All of the lube made even the widest part of his hand slide in easily, and my breath whooshed out of me on a startled gasp. Are you okay? he asked, concern rippling across his brow. I can stop. No, don't. I reached down to feel for his hand, and found only his wrist. The tendons flexed at the entrance of my cunt. Oh, my God. My voice quavered. Oh, my God. It's really in there. It is. He took his free hand and covered my own. Tell me how deep is too deep. He'd done the same thing the first time we'd had sex, when I was totally inexperienced and facing down the biggest cock that had ever been in me. He'd wrapped my fingers around his cock and coached me, telling me to control the depth and find what was right. To this day, he was the largest man I'd been with. He was also the most considerate man I'd been with. I held his wrist and slowly pumped his hand inside me pulling until the widest part of his hand threatened to slip out, then pushed back in a little. Not all the way, just like that much, okay? Okay. He smiled down at me. Can you reach the vibrator? My hand groped across the bed for it, and he continued. I'm going to keep doing exactly what I'm doing now, unless you tell me to change the pace or ask me to go deeper. When you orgasm, that's when I'll take my hand out. It's easier to do it then. I pressed the head of the wand against my clit and flicked the switch. 
It didn't take long to get right on the edge, but I fought it and pulled the vibrator back to resist. I wanted more of this intense pressure, more of the sucking pull of his hand inside me. I just plain wanted more. Faster, I begged, and he picked up the speed of his thrusting hand, wriggling his fingers as he did so. I put the vibrator on my clit again, and this time there was no stopping. Every muscle in my body went rigid to the point of pain, and a high, thin scream twisted from my throat. I twisted, too, jerking the duvet down, the fabric audibly shredding beneath my nails. My orgasm went on and on, but I didn't let up, shouting mindlessly, whipping my head to the side, biting the arm arched against the bed. My climax was a wild, uncontrollable force that left me helpless in the eye of its storm. I thought I was going to die. I was certain I'd never been so alive. Before I could come down, while my cunt still clutched at the impossible hugeness of his hand in me, he gently slid out. My body shook with violent tremors, my calves cramped, my bones and muscles had liquefied from pure pleasure. He wiped his hand on the duvet. We were going to have to reimburse the hotel for that, anyway, and carefully laid one hand on my hip. Is that too much? Not at all, I rasped. Do you need water? I nodded, though how I moved my neck I had no clue. He helped me to sit up and cradled my limp body against his chest, as he handed me the glass from before. I gulped it down, then collapsed again while he went to get more. When he returned, I sat up and winced at the soreness between my legs. Hey, instead of intercourse, could I, like, suck you off? I hate to wimp out on your birthday. Good Lord, Sophie, I'm not going to ask to fuck you off to that. This is the first time you've ever been fisted, I understand if you need time off. He unbuttoned his shirt, slipped it from his shoulders, and towed off his shoes. He unbuckled his belt and slipped off his pants, then pulled back the covers beside me and tucked me under. Seriously, I propped myself on my elbow. I'm not going to be emotionally well if we can't do at least something for you. I need that reciprocation. I can't stand it when you don't get off. All right, he agreed after a moment. Shall I get myself started? I stretched out beside him, luxuriating in the feeling of sweaty skin and overused muscle against soft sheets. I walked my fingers down the narrow line of hair on his stomach. Mm hmm. I love to watch you jerk off. I snapped the waistband of his boxers. Get rid of these. He lifted his hips and slid the black silk down his legs. His cock was semi-hard, and he stroked himself slowly as I threw my leg over his. I pressed my body close and kissed as much of his chest as I could reach, then down, trailing the ends of my hair over his skin. I loved that, all of it, I purred against his ear, I love it when you control me, when you punish me and hurt me. I love losing control over myself, losing myself. A deep sigh rumbled from him. He was hard now, his foreskin rolling over the tight pink head of his cock with every pump of his hand. I slid down his body, sucking and licking at his stomach. I rose to my knees to straddle his thigh. My wet, sore vulva plastered to his skin, and he groaned at the touch of it. Covering his hand with my own, I leaned down and hovered my mouth over the head of his cock. I didn't close my lips, or suck, or even flick my tongue out. I just let a thin line of drool run from my mouth directly onto his tip, until he squirmed his hips on the bed. I made him wait as long as I could stand before I closed my lips over him and took in as much of him as I could. Bent over wasn't the ideal position for giving head, but I worked him with a hand that replaced his own, never speeding up, 
just a slow, lazy suck and swirl of my tongue as I glided my hand up and down his length, when his hips began to pump in time to my motion and then sped as though desperately reaching for more. I slipped the point of my tongue between his foreskin and glands and swept over the super-sensitive spot on the bottom of the head. His hands fell to my head, and he held on, thrusting deep enough to gag me. His body strained beneath me, and he made a noise that could have been either pleasure or pain as he erupted, filling my mouth and throat. I coughed, and cum ran out over his cock in my hand, and I used it as I milked the last drops from him before giving a tiny chaste peck to the head. He hissed and laughed at that, and scrubbed his hands over his face. Oh, Sophie, this was a fantastic birthday present. Thank you. I pulled the covers over both of us, taking a moment of sadistic delight in the way he gingerly tried to avoid contact between the sheets and his penis. Did you enjoy yourself? Anything you would have changed? It was his usual check-in, and I loved it every time. It felt nice to be valued, rather than abandoned with a quick cuddle before the snores started. My past partners had been terrible for that. I considered his question. Nothing you did, but something does bother me. Hmm? he asked, situating me more comfortably against his shoulder. His fingers skated down my spine and back in long, slow sweeps, I don't like that you were able to just call up the front desk and be all, hey, there's going to be a woman screaming, ignore it, and they were totally cool with it. I frowned. Saying it out loud made it even more troubling. When you say it that way, I suppose it is a bit. Yeah. I didn't want to think about it any more, but the idea seized my brain. When I think about what someone could do, not you— but some other guy, some sicko posing as a dom. My chest felt as though it would cave in, and my throat closed. I tried to gasp for air, and tears leaked from my eyes. Before I knew what was happening, I was in a full-blown anxiety attack. Neil sat up and pulled me close as fast as he could, his face pressed to the top of my head as he rocked me. It's all right. It's all right, he whispered. I've got you. This was by far the worst subdrop I'd ever experienced. The thought of someone exploiting me as I was helpless nauseated me and paralyzed me with fear. There was no danger of that happening, and I tried to reassure myself with what little logic I still had left in me. Neil would never hurt me that way, and I would never do this with anyone but Neil. But just the thought of someone being hurt or abused a young woman, trusting of her partner as I was, and having that trust shattered through brutality, crushed me from the inside, until all I could do was sob hysterically. I'm here, darling. Breathe through this. There was a helplessness in his voice that I knew he was trying to control. If he gave in to it, he couldn't help me. Just breathe. This will pass. I'm not afraid of you. I would never think you'd do anything to me. I just... I thought of what happens to other women. I hiccuped, and the feeling in my chest grew worse. I cried harder, but I had to tell him I had to get it out. It was the only thing you've ever said to me, ever. It was the only thing that was truly scary. Oh, Sophie, I never meant to frighten you. His anguish soothed me as selfish as it seemed. I never thought. It's okay. It didn't bother me at the time, and I wasn't scared of you. Just saying it made things a bit more bearable. I sat up and pushed my hair back from my forehead, taking slow, deep breaths before I went on. You thought you were reassuring me that no one would overhear or complain. You couldn't have known how it would sound. No, I should have. If I'd only thought. I pressed my palm to his cheek. My nose was stuffy from my hysterical crying. You couldn't have known. Even with your experience in the past, you're a man. 
You don't think of those things because they're not at the front of your mind, the way they are for women. He folded me close again and swayed with me until my breathing slowed and I was calm again. Sorry I subdropped and ruined your birthday. I tried to make a joke of it, but it sounded pathetic and self-pitying the moment I said it. You didn't ruin my birthday, Sophie. There was such tender conviction in his words, I nearly started to cry again. In fact, I think you were wrong. Your submission wasn't the best part of this evening. What was? He took my face in his hands and tilted it up for the sweetest, softest kiss. When he drew back, his gaze searched my face, soaking in every detail. Because tonight, unlike the other nights we spent here, tonight you're staying with me. Looking back, I couldn't understand how I'd ever had the will to leave him. Chapter 16 I wish all my moves had gone like this. I watched, enraptured, as a very broad-shouldered gentleman loaded the last neatly packed box into the back of the moving truck. Beside me, Neil was scrolling through texts. It was late April and the sun was shining, but it was a chilly day. I'm glad we waited until it was a bit warmer to do this, he grumbled. What happened to, I grew up in Iceland, I'm a Viking. I can walk through the snow barefoot, I teased. Just because I can tolerate the cold doesn't mean I like standing out in it, he frowned at the back of the truck. Surely this can't be everything. I checked and double-checked, everything that isn't furniture. My heart squeezed a little bit. We had no immediate plans to sell the apartment. Neil reasoned that it might come in useful if we ever needed to stay in the city overnight. I wondered if his reluctance to part with it was rooted in the same sentimentality I felt toward the place. It was our home. The place where we'd exchanged our first I love you's, where we'd made some difficult decisions that had shaped our relationship and made us stronger. It hurt more to leave than I'd expected it would. As if reading my mind, he peered up at the bright April sky and said, You know, while I love this place, and we've made some very good memories here, it's never really been our home, has it? I'm looking forward to settling into the new house, making it ours. I supposed I had a different idea of making a house my own. Something about the whole fully furnished aspect made it seem like there were fewer options available in the customization department. Though I knew Neil wouldn't bat an eye if I demanded we refurnish and renovate the entire place, that wasn't my style. It seemed too wasteful, too indulgent, too... Ma'am, this was almost left behind. One of the movers said behind me, and when I turned, I saw to my horror that he held the orange Hermes box. What's that? Could it be a one hundred thousand dollar purse my fiancé has been hiding from me for months? Neil asked, a hint of humor in his voice. He put his hand on my shoulder and leaned close to my ear. I do read our card statements, Sophie. My face burned with shame, both at being found out and at the openly contemptuous look that had come over the mover's face when Neil had uttered the dollar amount. I didn't blame the guy. It was probably an involuntary reaction. I took the box and turned toward the waiting car. We had to get the Maybach out to Sagaponic anyway, where Tony would be moving into the staff quarters. The mover rolled down the truck door and slapped it as he headed toward the passenger seat. When Neil got in beside me, I avoided eye contact. I just held the stupid, incriminating box in my lap. Shall I put that in the trunk with the rest of the valuables? He asked, and I burst into tears. I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I was in the store and that weird neighbor put me on the spot, and the salespeople were so snotty and it was like I was living in that scene in that old movie. Dear God, tell me you aren't referring to Pretty Woman as that old movie, he said, 
seemingly more concerned with that aspect of the whole fiasco than with my transgression. I couldn't stop my shame from rolling out in a wave of incrimination. I didn't really want the bag, but I did, and it's so pretty, and my mom is still living in a trailer, and I'm about to move into this enormous house, and I bought a hundred thousand dollar purse, Neil. A fucking purse! I don't even know who I am anymore. Sophie, I don't care about the purse. He reached for my hand. Truly, I don't care. I raised my head and met his gaze through watery eyes. But you've been so stressed out lately about money. I've been stressed because my only daughter is getting married, he admitted patiently. And yes, it is costing me a small fortune but we're in no danger of becoming impoverished. My companies are doing well, I pay tax, and I have a very diverse portfolio. Unless something truly catastrophic happens to the world infrastructure, we'll always have more money than we can spend. And your book is doing so well, it isn't as though you couldn't afford that bag on your own. He had a point there. I'm just the girlfriend, had earned out its advance in a month, and when Indy had given me a projected royalty figure, I'd almost passed out. Still, it seemed so wasteful, especially when I considered the long hours my mother worked just to keep her head above water. We'd spent my entire childhood one paycheck away from disaster at all times. I'm just... I'm really ashamed, I shrugged. I can't get used to all of this. Coming from the way I lived, the way my family still lives, it feels wrong. Neil sat silently for a moment, before suggesting with all the gentleness of a man handling a live grenade. Do you think, perhaps, you might simply be reacting to the stress of this move? You've never owned property before, and this isn't exactly a starter home— it's perfectly natural that you would be nervous. It's not that it's... I waved my hand. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm stressed. I can't even finish a complete sentence. Can I at least see the bag? Neil asked with a crooked smile. It must be awfully special. I lifted the top off the box. Inside, nestled in crisp, carefully folded tissue paper, a drawstring linen bag with the Hermes logo held the purse itself. I was almost afraid to look at it. I hadn't seen it since it had been boxed up. Neil took an audible breath at the sight of the pale alligator leather. Oh, that is... Well, I can see why it would cost so much. Of course he would. The man knew leather owing to his ridiculous shoe fetish. He reached out with two fingers, I swear his hand trembled, and stroked the glossy alligator as though he were petting a baby duck. Oh, Sophie, this is exquisite. Really? He shook his head. If you don't want it, I'll carry it. I would not give a single fuck to borrow one of your phrases. Why was it that he could always say just the right thing to turn my mood around? You're really not mad? I'll admit I was a bit upset when I got the statement and saw that you'd spent so much without mentioning it to me. But you'd never been comfortable buying even a pack of gum without some kind of tearful admission after the fact. I thought perhaps it was a particularly expensive form of personal growth. I couldn't help my tearful laugh. I am really sorry, though. I don't mind if you spend our money. Just tell me about large purchases. I may have more money than God, but I do need to keep my books balanced. The ride out to the new house was long and gave me a good idea of how hellish a commute by car would be. I couldn't imagine a two-hour drive into the city every day, but Neil seemed positively invigorated by the idea. You know, I have the Ferrari out of storage, he said, almost bouncing in his seat. This drive would be nothing at all in the Ferrari. No, I knew what nothing at all meant. It meant he was having visions of blasting down the highway at insane speeds. He frowned at me. Sophie, I'm retired. 
I have to make my own fun. Your own fun should never include supercars and speeding tickets. Then we have vastly different ideas about what constitutes fun, he grumbled. Since we'd flown in to see the property before, I'd never gotten a look at the driveway and front gate. And there really was a gate, a towering black wrought iron gate set into an intimidating twelve-foot-high native stone wall. We stopped at the security box while Tony entered the code and the gates swung inward. We drove through and they closed behind us. On the other side of the wall was a guardhouse with a uniformed security guard sitting inside. Is that totally necessary? I asked, looking out the back window. On a property this size, with the house as isolated as it is, I really feel more comfortable with some security. Neil rolled down his window. The scent of the ocean. I can't believe I might have retired in Somerset and missed this. I can't believe we have security guards. I was a little uneasy, and I wasn't letting it go yet. I mean, do I have to do anything special if I want to leave? What if I want to be spontaneous? They're security guards, not jailers, he said patiently. You can come and go as you like. I know you aren't used to it, but you must remember that your life is vastly different now. One of the adjustments you have to make, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, is remembering that with money comes a certain amount of caution. I guess I can see where you're coming from. You buy a $78 million house, you don't want anyone fucking with it. There is that, but more importantly, I wouldn't want anyone fucking with us. Your name will be in society sections when we publicly announce our engagement, and when we're married. And there are people out there who aren't stable. He looked back to me and his expression softened, so I must have looked completely terrified. Darling, I didn't mean to frighten you. Nothing has ever happened to me or to Emma. Elizabeth didn't have any troubles. But when Emma was young, there were some letters, some... Well, there were threats. Against Emma? I could only imagine how that had made him feel. He loved Emma more than any other human being on the planet. He nodded. I'm a bit more cautious now, but not excessively so, I wouldn't think. Nah, probably not. I hadn't given much thought to the fact that some of the realities of my new life were a bit more severe than merely having to cope with spending money. Besides, we'll never see them up near the house, unless there's an emergency. There are only four of them on each shift he reassured me. The driveway was lined with tall red pines, the ground beneath them recently churned up. My jaw dropped. You didn't. He looked smug at his little surprise. I told you we were doing some renovations. I thought you might like something to remind you of home. The same trees surrounded the trailer where I'd grown up. The fact that he'd noticed, remembered, and had full-grown trees transplanted onto our property, astounded me. You know, you're really something else. I grinned at him, and he grabbed my hand and dropped a kiss on my knuckles. My legs were grateful for the stretch when we pulled up at the front door and climbed out of the car. We won't be needing anything else today, Tony. Thank you, Neil told the driver. Take some time to get settled in. Tony would be living in the apartment above the portico share, but those rooms hadn't come furnished. Tony's U-Haul was parked near the service entrance. I hoped he had someone to help him move the stuff in. I wasn't above lifting furniture. Wait, Neil stopped me at the door. I'm supposed to carry you over the threshold. I think that's just when somebody is married, I reminded him. But I stood still anyway, waiting for him to scoop me off my feet. Instead, he leaned down and hefted me over his shoulder like a sack of onions. Hey! I laughed, all the blood rushing to my head. I'm entering our new home for the first time upside down. I'm carrying you over the threshold, was all he said in his defense. And when we stepped into the foyer, he set me on my feet and kissed me. Welcome home. When we'd been to the house before we'd bought it, it had been someone else's house. It was ours now, and it still felt like someone else's, 
someone else's furniture, someone else's art on the walls. I felt like I shouldn't touch anything. Neil stood behind me and ran his hand down my arm, over the sleeve of my coat. What do you suppose we should do now? I knew what he was getting at, and he probably expected me to say, do it in every room of this enormous mansion. But I had other plans. I'm going to run around and touch everything. His eyebrows lifted. Well, I wasn't expecting that answer, but here we are. I jumped up and down and clapped my hands, before tearing off like a five-year-old. I ran into the master bedroom and rolled around on the new mattress in the huge four-poster bed. I clomped my way up the stairs in the tower room and ran out onto the circular deck that surrounded it, not caring a second about the cool wind off the sea. In the dining room, I shrugged my coat off and ran around the table, tapping my fingers on each of the fourteen chairs, before I headed off to every single guest bedroom and bathroom. Upstairs, I found the hardwood bridge that led from an upper sitting area to the loft above the den, and I was standing there, admiring the view of the sea out the two-story windows, when I realized I wasn't entirely sure how to get back to the foyer or the bedroom, or a bathroom, and that would become an issue shortly. Hey, I shouted, and it echoed off the glass. Hey, Neil? No answer. How did I figure I was going to shout across 35,000 square feet? Luckily, there was an intercom on the wall. Out of all the complicated buttons, I picked the one labeled house and said tentatively, Hello? It took a moment, but Neil answered with his own uncertain, Hello? Um, I am totally lost, I giggled into the speaker. Christ, so am I. Where are you? In that loft thing I was going to use as an office. I looked around. There would actually be room for two desks. I wondered if we could share the space without driving each other crazy and destroying our relationship. Although, it would be pretty inconvenient to keep my office in a room I can't actually find again. I'm in the basement, in the cinema, but I'm sure I can make it out with some trial and error. Me too. Meet me in the bedroom. There's something I'd like to show you. I snorted. I've seen it, baby. It's very impressive. Cheeky. Get your cute little ass down there. I let go of the button and squealed like a girl, then heard laughter in another part of the house. Oh, shit. We'd been broadcasting our conversation into every room. I hope the movers were entertained. Neil was waiting for me in the bedroom, standing with his hands on his hips, looking out at the ocean. Twenty minutes tops, and we were already in love with the place. Okay, what is it that you want to show me? I leaned on the door and got my smirk ready. He kissed the top of my head and nudged me into a walk, his arm around my shoulders. You haven't seen the very best part of the house yet, Sophie. He led me to the door of the master bath. My breath caught, my heartbeat sped. I'd forgotten all about Neil's promise to me. He pushed the door open with one hand, allowing me to enter before him. The bathroom is beyond awesome. There was an electric sauna, which had really impressed Viking Neil, and a shower tucked away behind a curved wall, tiled in sand-colored stone that matched the airy neutral design of the room. The roof sloped up into a point truncated by the biggest skylight I'd ever seen, and there, standing in the place of what was once a two-person jacuzzi tub, was my perfect, simple, elegant bathtub like a steampunk glass slipper. It was a vision in porcelain and copper, from the peak of its curved back to the gentle slope of its sides, right down to the knobby claw feet. Neil had even installed new plumbing to accommodate the antique setup, and he'd included a European-style shower head on a long hose. Gotta love a man who understood a woman's need for easy, accessible water pressure. I gasped a little. Oh of delight, and whipped my shirt over my head. Neil barked a startled laugh. What are you doing? I am getting in this bathtub. I kicked my boots off and shimmied my jeans down my thighs. 
You don't want to wait and help with the unpack? Nope. I cut him off and bent down to catch my panties from around my ankle. Would you like to run some water at least? He stepped over to the tub and flipped up the taps. And bubbles, I said wistfully. Next time. Neil went to the wall of cubbies on the back of one of the shower walls. A slender bottle was already there. He took it down, turned it in his hand as if reading the label. I had a feeling bubbles would be required. Ah! I unhooked my bra and tossed it aside. Trees were not the only things I planted. He kissed the top of my head as I took the bottle from his hands. I'll go and supervise the movers. Okay, don't do everything. I promise, once I've been in here an hour, hour and a half, I'll help. I leaned against him and tilted my face up for a proper kiss. He obliged me and headed for the door. Hit the lock so no sexy mover accidentally comes in here and seduces me, I called after him. Alone with my bathtub, I sank to my knees and trailed my hand through the water. Oh, baby, I've missed you so, so much. When the warm, bubbly water enveloped me, I swear it was as close to a religious experience as I'd ever had. I leaned my head back on the rim and sighed happily. Though it was still strange knowing I was going to live in a seaside palace, wherever I had my bathtub, that was home. By the time the house was mostly unpacked and the movers had left, Neil and I were exhausted. We'd made up our new bed with the sheets from the apartment that I had refused to wash. I was hoping the familiar scent would put me at ease, much like a dog being boarded. We lit the natural stone fireplace in the den and collapsed on the couch that was newly ours. It feels totally bizarre. This is someone else's furniture. I ran my toes over Neil's big bare foot and relished the feeling of his arm around my back, his chest beneath my cheek, even though his sweater was kind of scratchy. There was no place else I would have rather been. Trust me, it's ours. We certainly paid enough for it. That was weird. Another time Neil might have said, I paid enough for it and the change jarred me into a realization. One of the reasons I had been feeling so strange about spending our money was that while he insisted over and over that it really was our money, he only ever talked about paying for stuff himself. I sat up a little. You know, I think this is the first time you've ever said that we paid for something. He sighed. I know. I'm sorry. I'm trying to break that habit. I leaned up and kissed his cheek. You're doing fine. It doesn't help that I'm constantly saying, don't call it our money, and you really did pay for it, and I love it. Yes, like a terrier, I become easily confused at conflicting commands, but I'm very glad you like the house. I sat up, remembering. Hey, do you know what I read on FetLife this morning? Oh, I'm glad you were on FetLife this morning. Rather than helping me with the move, he grumbled. Help with what? I rolled my eyes at him. All you did was stand around and glower at them. What did you read on FetLife that was so fascinating? This thing about jelly sex toys. They're apparently gross and unsafe. I scrunched up my nose. I'm going to really miss that big purple one. Well, I'm sure we can find safer toys. He kissed the side of my head and snorted. Now... Whether or not we'll find a wealth of sex shops in the Hamptons, I giggled. Life is going to be so different out here, isn't it? A slower pace, most definitely. He pulled me a little closer. I didn't mind the idea. After the year we just had, I'm ready for slow, like stationary, not moving at all. We sat in silence, me all snuggled up at his side, him idly stroking my hair against my back. Then he said, it doesn't seem real yet. I keep thinking we'll go home, but we are home. My stomach grumbled, loudly. Neil groaned. We're home, in a house that has no food. Groceries will be delivered tomorrow, but I didn't think of tonight. Ugh, I really do not want to get cleaned up for a restaurant, I moaned. I miss New York already. There is plenty of food in New York. 
I'm sure they have food here as well. I just forgot to buy any. He eased me up and sat at the edge of the couch, his elbows braced on his knees, hands limp between them. Your caveman failed at the hunt. My caveman? I stood and faced him with my hands on my hips. I don't want to starve to death. Let's go to the grocery store. Do you know where a grocery store is? He asked, as though I were going to tell him where to find the golden fleece. That's what cell phones and Google Maps are for. I slid my phone from my pocket. There may not be a sex shop on every corner, but I am confident that there is at least one grocery store. But I feel kind of bad asking Tony to drive us. And we don't have to. Neil was warming to the idea of grocery shopping, and it took me a second to figure out why. Oh, no. No, no. We are not going out for food in a Ferrari. I shook my head firmly. We're not? He sounded amused. Are you planning to walk? He had me there. We bundled up and headed out to the enormous garage he'd had constructed on the grounds. It was really more like an airplane hangar, with dozens of painted lines on the floor. And you need all this space for cars? I said with a laugh, and Neil looked away uncomfortably. My jaw dropped. I know you have a lot, but you don't really have this many. Let's just get in then, shall we? The car shone like a candy apple under the fluorescent lights, and I couldn't help trailing my fingers lovingly over the hood. It was just so sexy I had to. So it's a Ferrari. What kind of a Ferrari? A 2010 458 Italia, he said as we climbed into the tan leather seats. 562 horsepower, 9,000 RPMs. My stomach was dissolving itself for nourishment, and he wanted to talk about horsepower. Forget I asked. All I care about is the lack of space for food. How much are we getting? Enough to fit in your lap and on the floor between your legs, he winked at me. Come on, Sophie. I want to take you for a drive in a very fast, very cool car. It will make me feel young. Make me feel unhungry. Then I'll worry about making you feel young. I buckled my seatbelt, wondering if we wouldn't be safer in harnesses or Hannibal Lecter-style restraints. Then again, thinking of cannibalism was probably not a good idea when I was so hungry. I can't believe I'm letting you do this. For the most part, Neil drove responsibly, and I had to admit, there was something sexy about a man downshifting to go around curves. He bemoaned the fact that there wasn't room to open it up properly. But after he'd hit a straightaway and gunned it to demonstrate the quick pickup to 90 miles per hour, I was glad he didn't get the opportunity to go any faster. We found a supermarket about 30 minutes from our house, one my mother would have referred to as fancy, due to Neil's insistence on taking a ridiculous sports car. We really could only bring home what would have fit in my lap. He looked around a bit sheepishly as we walked through the doors. Listen, you're much better at this than I am. It had never occurred to me that Neil had probably had someone who shopped for him his entire life. You've been to a grocery store before, right? Yes, before, he said, a bit uncomfortably. Not in the past twenty-five years that I can recall. You haven't been in a supermarket since before Emma was born? This was serious. How did you even get food? Delivery services, he said, as astonished as though I'd started talking out of my ears. You fill out a list, or my housekeeper does. I suppose since we don't have a housekeeper anymore, we'll have to fill it out ourselves. He seemed overwhelmed by even that most basic task. Okay, how about you do the wine, I suggested. Just follow the signs. He gave me an irritated glance and muttered, I do know how a shop works, Sophie. I just don't do my own shopping. We headed home with the bare essentials, a bottle of red wine, a head of broccoli, a jar of pasta sauce, and some spaghetti noodles, a big loaf of crusty bread with coffee, and a carton of soy milk for the morning. I can't believe you remembered bubble bath for me, but not food. 
I laughed as we pulled up to the front door. I remembered what was important. I'm sorry if naked, wet, and soapy Sophie is higher on my list of priorities than well-fed Sophie. Jerk. I passed the bag from the floor off to him and grabbed the handles of the one in my lap. We're going to have to get a sensible family car, you know, in case we need things like food or toilet paper. Oh, no. His eyes went wide, and for a moment I panicked, until I remembered that I'd used the bathroom twice already, and there had been plenty of paper. He grinned at me, and I tried to kick him in the butt as he punched the security code in to unlock the kitchen door. The kitchen was lovely and spacious, with beautiful reclaimed hardwood floors, evenly sanded and varnished to a glassy shine. A hexagonal breakfast nook, with a lovely round table for six, had high, symmetrical arched picture windows that matched the larger ones that looked out over the gorgeously manicured lawn to the east. The warm beige walls positively glowed with sunlight during the day, and inset lighting burnished them at night. Large squares of copper ceiling nestled between the dark wood beams overhead. The center island was topped with one giant oval slab of black, brown, and white marble, with a long rectangular inset bar sink, appropriate for filling with ice and lodging beer bottles in. You can take the girl out of the UP, but you can't take the UP out of the girl. I set the paper bag on the island and unpacked the contents with demented speed. I'd been sorely tempted to rip into the baguette on the drive. I did so now, taking a huge bite from the very top with a moan of lusty relief. Hey! Neil laughed, smacking my hand. I giggled around my mouthful of bread and dropped the loaf on the counter, covering my full mouth with one hand I managed. I wa ungi! You'll be thirsty in a moment, and I don't have the wine open. Damn. I had to admit he had a point, as I swallowed a very dry mouthful of crusty bread. We ended up eating cross-legged on the floor, out of exhaustion, and because there weren't any stools or chairs in the kitchen. They were one of the few furnishings the previous owners had retained. Considering the huge collection of stickly they'd left behind, it seemed like a weird detail. Maybe they had some family significance, Neil suggested, taking my empty plate and stacking it atop his on the floor beside him. I had the most horrible ottoman, probably the ugliest piece of furniture I've ever owned, or seen, for that matter, and I kept it for years because Emma was sitting on it when she lost her first tooth. He paused and got that sentimental look he always had when he talked about Emma's childhood, she was chewing on the end of a pencil, and one of her bottom front teeth just popped right out. I reached for the wine bottle and drank from it. We hadn't bothered with glasses. What happened to it? The tooth? No, the ottoman, I laughed. Obviously, I don't think you kept the... He looked away, and I looked away. The more left unsaid about that, the better. We sat in silence as I imagined one day opening some random drawer and finding an envelope full of human teeth. Hey, Neil? Hmm? I reached for his hand and squeezed it. We're making a memory right now. He tilted his head, his beautiful green eyes flickering over my every feature. Under such intense scrutiny, I always quavered. What are you looking at? I'm committing every detail I can. If we're making a memory, I don't want to forget a single thing. My stomach fluttered. First night in my first house, with my fiancé. I leaned my head on his shoulder, and he put an arm around me. I don't think I'll forget either. Chapter 17 Settling into the new house was a welcome distraction from my BFF troubles at first, but by mid-April the newness had worn off, and I was in serious panic mode at not having heard from Holly. When the first week of May rolled around, I was a barely-eating insomniac with an incredibly worried boyfriend. It wasn't an ideal situation, 
and we were both definitely feeling the stress. It didn't help that the second Saturday of the month was Emma's wedding. Neil had been doing a great job of filling both the fiancé and best friend roles since we'd moved out of the city, but now he was tied up in knots of his own over losing his only child to a handsome, well-off young attorney. I think we'll spend a few days in the apartment, Neil said, as he checked and rechecked his schedule of wedding events. I've got a final fitting with my tailor on Thursday before, and the rehearsal dinner's on Friday night. Sunday will be exhausted, so we might as well stay until Monday. Ugh, I hate having to pack. It's going to feel like I'm taking a vacation to my own house. And secretly... I didn't want to go back to the apartment while we were still in the honeymoon period with our new place. The past month had been lots of fun, though Neil hadn't quite let go of his company yet. He made the commute to the Elwood and Stern offices a couple times a week, either via helicopter or one of his ridiculous cars, the entire collection of which had arrived one at a time from his various storage facilities around the world. I suppose I should have anticipated he'd have some pricey cars, since one of Elwood and Stern's flagship publications was Auto Watch. But our freaking garage looked like an episode of that weird British motoring show he was always watching. But our days had been spent mostly together, lazing around reading, watching TV, cooking for ourselves, cleaning up after ourselves, just being a real couple without the interruptions of adult children, exes, or housekeepers. A team of cleaning staff came in once a week and unobtrusively tidied up, but we hardly ever saw them while they were there. It was amazing how easily you could just not see anyone in such a huge house. Neil and I had taken full advantage of our isolation. More than one dinner had been postponed for a hasty fuck up against the refrigerator. And another memorable occasion had seen me lying across Neil's lap in one of his Oxford shirts and nothing else, masturbating myself to orgasm over and over, while he calmly read the morning paper and gave the occasional bored-sounding instruction. His feigned disinterest had only ramped up my desire, and we'd ended up fucking on the wide Art Deco rug on the floor— it was a heady return to the weekends we'd spent together at the beginning of our relationship, and I didn't want to leave it behind. But obligation called us into the city, so we left for Manhattan in the Maybach, the only car we owned that had trunk space. Tony drove us, probably glad to finally earn his keep and feel secure in his job. We'd barely ventured out of the house at all, and his services hadn't been needed for a while. When I'd asked Tony how he filled his time, he replied, Knitting, and left it at that. He made me an Afghan. The apartment looked, more or less, exactly as it had when we'd left, though everything that remained was in the B-Squad, our sheets, our dishes, whatever furnishings we hadn't taken with us. In the kitchen, there were squares on the wall that hadn't faded, where pictures of Emma had previously hung. The place was weirdly empty without being empty. Home, sweet home? Neil asked, resigned, as we unpacked our clothes in the bedroom. The closet looks so... bare. Want to see the dress I'm wearing to the wedding? I asked, to cheer him up. Emma helped me pick it out. I unzipped the garment bag and pulled out the just slightly longer than cocktail length, black taffeta with a deep cut, wide lapeled neckline. A sash of matching black taffeta wrapped the waist and tied in a bow at one hip. Ta-da! He sat in the wing chair and dropped his head to his hands. I can't do this. Well, you don't have to wear it, I joked. When he didn't look up, I felt terrible for making light of his anxiety. Clearly, this was not about the dress. I have a feeling you're saying that you can't do your daughter's wedding. It's not the wedding. He looked up and drew his palms down his face. It's the marriage. I can't watch Emma do this to her life. It took all the willpower I had in me to keep my tone gentle, but this horrible Michael shtick 
was getting tired. What are you talking about? She loves Michael, and he treats her like she's a priceless gem or something. You couldn't have asked for a more perfect son-in-law. It isn't Michael. Then what is it? I'd been prepared for him to have a total meltdown this week. I wished it could have come slightly earlier, but at least he wasn't losing his mind two minutes before the ceremony. I just don't think it's a good idea for Emma to get married, he insisted. Can we please leave it there? No, we can't. Your daughter is getting married on Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not. I threw my hands up. Sometimes I think you see Emma as six years old or something. Is there even one good reason for her to not marry Michael? I told you. This isn't about Michael. Then why are you acting like this? Because twenty-five is too young to get married, that's why. He snapped. I stared in horror. He looked away. I didn't mean... Oh, fuck me. Yes, I did. Shut up. I leaned back against the full-length mirror and put my head in my hands. Is that why you've been so reluctant to talk about setting a date or anything to do with our wedding? He didn't answer. You know what? I took a deep breath through my nose. My head was spinning, and I was about two seconds from a sobbing, screaming meltdown. But the week was too damn busy. Your daughter is getting married. Let's just get through this weekend. And then? What? He asked a tremor of hopelessness in his voice. I straightened and pushed my hair back from my forehead. I don't know, Neil. Then what? You don't want to marry me? Fine. But I don't know what's going on in your head, and it sounds like it could go either way. You can get an emergency appointment with Ashley for Monday or something, but I can't do this right now. I don't want us to come to any sort of final decision that will hurt Emma, especially not when this could all be the stress of the wedding. He went pale, and for an Englishman, that's a pretty big feat. You don't think I meant. I don't know what you meant, but I don't want to know until after this weekend. I couldn't sit there and do this. I turned toward the door and on some mean, self-pitying impulse said, I'll try not to get in too many of the pictures. Damn it, Sophie! He stormed after me, out of the bedroom and into the foyer, but I didn't stop. I felt like breaking dishes, so I veered off my course away from the kitchen, down the hall past the bedrooms to the storage room. Where are you going? Neil demanded. I'm getting sheets for the guest room. Why? You fucking know why. I slammed the linen closet open and jerked out a neatly folded set of sheets. I don't want to have this fight right now. We're under a lot of stress, and we're going to hurt each other's feelings. You just dropped a bomb on me, and I don't even want to look at you. This isn't... He took a deep breath and lowered his voice. I meant to address this with you, just not at this time. But this isn't as much about you as it is about Emma. I chose my words carelessly. If you'd like to see Ashley on Monday, that would be fine. But don't let's ruin our weekend with all of this. You just told me you think we shouldn't get married. My throat closed up a little saying it. His shoulders sagged. I love you, Sophie. Of course I want to be with you. But there are things we need to... I shouldn't have brought it up now. I'm sorry. This is an extraordinarily stressful time and I spoke without thinking. Please. I hugged the bundle of linens to my chest. Please what? I don't know. His expression was so sad and helpless. Just please. Where is this coming from? I was afraid to put down the sheets, because then I might fall into his arms and take reassurance from his physical presence, rather than addressing the issue at hand. I know this isn't just about Emma's wedding. What's happening here? He rubbed a hand over his forehead. Pre-wedding jitters, I suppose. Pre-pre-wedding jitters? Look, I'm tired and stressed. I'm going to go eat a pint of ice cream and go to bed. I couldn't believe how hurt I was over this. I'm going to chalk all of this up to heightened emotions on both of our parts, and we'll talk about it again when we're sane. 
I think that's a good idea. He came forward tentatively as though rejection were a viper coiled between us, and he didn't know if it would strike. When he got close enough, I tilted my face up to him, and when he kissed me, I felt the tension behind it. I love you. If you need to sleep in the guest bedroom, I won't be angry. I wouldn't really care if you were. I know. I didn't say it to reassure you. I was reassuring myself. He went away then, and I turned to the closet. Neil and I had fought before. It was an inevitability of being with the same person every day. But it had never felt so final. Even when he'd broken up with me in the hospital, when I'd just been fired and he'd been sick with cancer he'd never told me about. Even when I'd told him I was pregnant. Or when I'd found out he'd put me in his will against my wishes. This felt anticlimactic and stagnant. This felt like a real problem. Emma's wedding rehearsal was nothing short of torture. The bridesmaids didn't pay attention. The groomsmen and the groom were either severely hungover or still drunk from the bachelor party the night before. Since I wasn't absolutely necessary to the proceedings, I entertained myself walking around the outdoor terrace and snapping a few pictures with my phone in case they found the whole evening memorable in hindsight. By the time we left for the rehearsal dinner, Emma and Michael both seemed utterly defeated. That bad, huh? I asked Neil, as our car pulled away. No, not that bad. I've been to worse. He leaned his elbow on the door and ran his knuckles back and forth over his bottom lip. Everything will be fine. They're both quite anxious, is all. Yikes. No, that's a good thing, he assured me. Elizabeth and I weren't nervous at all at our rehearsal. We were confident, and everything went smoothly right down to the last detail. Never a single doubt in my mind. And look at what happened to the marriage. That's a good point. I leaned my head back and closed my eyes. I really wished we'd be sleeping in our own bed tonight. Our fight from the day before still hung between us, like the final drop of an overturned cup that might spill out or might not. And I had very little indication of the outcome. It seemed like if we were back at the house, we'd be able to return to the contented bliss of the last few weeks. I tried to make a joke. Well, it's a good thing you're having so many reservations about our wedding. Oh, I'm making a list, he assured me and though our words mimicked the companionable banter we were used to, it all rang hollow. I couldn't understand why a simple piece of paper worried him so much. Buying a multi-million dollar house and putting my name on the title? No big commitment. Standing up in front of our family and friends and admitting we loved each other and wanted to spend our lives together? Unthinkable. The fact that he thought I was too young, that the age gap I'd thought we'd overcome had resurfaced just when it seemed our relationship was in the clear, made no sense to me. It had come from out of the blue. The fact that we couldn't fight about it at the moment, no matter how angry I was, I was more concerned about Emma's big day going smoothly, only made everything worse. I tried to read into his every word and gesture, like I could predict the outcome of whatever argument we'd end up having. I didn't think Neil would actually break up with me, and I was pretty sure I wasn't hurt or betrayed enough to dump him. I didn't need to be married. I'd never planned to. It really was an outmoded institution, one that had more to do, in my mind, with tax filing statuses than anything else— but I worried that if we called off our engagement, that would be the beginning of a long, torturous slide to the end. What was strange about the whole thing was that until he'd proposed to me, I would have been perfectly happy to keep going along the way we had been. But his doubt now seemed like a rejection, or yet another case of him thinking he knew what was best for me and not including me in decisions about our life. The restaurant Emma and Michael had chosen was not the place I would have expected a billionaire's daughter to have her wedding rehearsal dinner. 
but it was the place where they'd had their first date. The walls of exposed brick and the hanging light fixtures of opaque amber glass marked it out as a trendy but relatively inexpensive place, the kind I would have gathered at with co-workers. When the drinks were served and the toasts underway, Michael stood up and thanked everyone for coming. Maybe I should say that when Em and I sat at that table right over there, he pointed to a corner booth, I had no idea that this intelligent, beautiful woman would one day be my wife. But I knew, I knew that she was the one. There was a round of awes from the table. Even Neil looked moved by the sentiment. He might also have just been tired. We'd been out to JFK early that morning to greet his family, his brothers and their wives, his sister and his mother, Rose, when their private jet had arrived, and we'd spent most of the day with them. It had been lovely to spend time with them and get to know them better, but it had also been exhausting, especially since we'd been maintaining this whole we're not mad at each other facade. Michael stopped, choked up with emotion. He laughed and rubbed at an eyebrow with his thumbnail. Okay, I'm going to stop being sentimental before she kills me, but I just want to say thank you, Ms. Stern and Mr. Elwood, for raising the coolest woman on the planet. When she walks down that aisle tomorrow, I think I'll have to pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. When she walks down the aisle, Rose leaned over to ask Neil in what she considered a whisper, aren't you walking her down the aisle? No, mother, Neil whispered back, hushing her. For all the excitement of the evening and the romantic toast, Emma's eyes were hollows, her smile frozen. Michael was still beaming from ear to ear. I won't go on longer, but I just want to say, Emma, you have made me so happy, and I know we're going to continue to be happy as we build our new life together. Cheers. Cheers. Neil raised his glass along with everyone, and I saw the tightness in his jaw. This was so hard for him, and I was powerless, because things were so strained between us that I didn't know what comfort I could offer him without overstepping some line. As the waitstaff served the salads, Rose spoke up. What's this? What's this nonsense? Neil, you're not really going to let her do that, are you? A father has to give his daughter away. A hint of a smile crossed Neil's lips. I don't see how it's my choice, mother. It's Emma's wedding, not mine. Elizabeth, your father walked you down the aisle, didn't he? Did you tell Emma? Rose called to me, pointing a stern finger across Neil's body. Nana, that's Sophie. Remember? The divorce? Emma leaned across the table to remind Rose in a low, gentle tone. Oh, yes, yes. Rose waved her hand and laughed. Do forgive me, Sophie. Forgiven. There was no way I could hold a slip of the tongue against a woman who'd had a very serious stroke only a year and a half ago. It hadn't worn down her tenacity any. Now, now, I'm serious, little bird. Doesn't it upset you that you won't be giving Emma away? Neil wiped his mouth on his napkin, chuckling. Mother, how can I give her away? She's never really belonged to me. She's been her own person since the day she was born. I looked at Emma. Normally, this kind of praise from her father would have pleased her immensely. But she just gave a tight smile to everyone and looked down at her plate. I think it's wonderful. It was Pamela, Valerie's best friend since college and one of Emma's godmothers, who'd made the remark in gentle support. Pamela was exactly what I'd imagined a friend of Valerie's to be. Beautiful, slender, smartly dressed, with a voice like it had been soaked in whiskey and dried with cigarettes. Her ginger hair was pulled up in a perfect twist, frozen with industrial strength hairspray. The elegant way she carried herself made her black ribbed turtleneck seem more fancy than casual. She had a wonderfully posh accent, not unlike Neil's. She went on, You know, 
I've always thought the idea of giving away the bride was a bit absurd. Who owns her, then? Michael? Good luck to you. We laughed at that, even Emma. Sophie, are you going to have someone give you away? Valerie asked, fixing me with an expectant look. Neil's family went silent. Oh, fuck. He hadn't told them. What's this? Rose piped up. Neil, are you getting married again? Yeah, Neil, are you? My face got hot. Tonight isn't about us, Neil covered smoothly. It's about Emma and Michael. But Rose was tenacious. Of course it's about Emma and Michael. But right now I'm asking you. Are you and Sophie getting married? Sophie and I are engaged. Still not an answer to my question, but I would rather choke on something sharp than admit we were having troubles in front of Valerie. Neil accepted the congratulations of his brothers and their wives cooed over my ring, and all the while I wanted to sink to the floor and never have to make eye contact with any of them again. It was a relief when my phone rang. I have to take this, I lied. It was my mother and I didn't have the strength to talk to her right now. But she'd provided me an out, bless her. The reception in here is awful, Michael called after me. I raised my phone as if in another toast. I will try the street. When I exited the dining room, I made a sharp left and headed for the bathroom. I needed to sit and carefully dab at my eyeliner and practice my ecstatic 25-year-old fiancé of a billionaire face. It was going to take a lot of work in the mental state I was in. The bathroom was brick-tiled, the walls cream stucco. Maybe it was supposed to make patrons feel like they were whizzing in Tuscany. The bathroom stalls were standard, though, and there wasn't an attendant— so I didn't feel bad about slipping into one of the cubicles, barring the door, and leaning against the wall for as tearless a cry as I could manage. I remembered the conversation Holly and I'd had after we'd shared news of our engagements. That seemed a lifetime ago. Time passed oddly without my best friend. And I'd sacrificed her for what? A man I loved but who possibly was done with me? I pulled up the browser on my phone and, with shaking thumbs, entered Signs Not Getting Married into the search bar. There, three links down, was the article I'd forced myself to not look at that day. Without really knowing what my expectation was, I found myself relieved when the first items had to do with unfaithfulness, substance abuse, and differing religions. Neil had never, to my knowledge, cheated on me. Our fairly open relationship should have meant he never had to go behind my back in the first place. We both kind of abused substances, like when we drank or smoked the occasional J. But it didn't seem like a problem to us. And it had certainly never caused problems between us. As for religion, maybe his Protestant upbringing against my Catholic one would have been an issue if either of us hadn't been atheists. But there we were. The rest of entries in the list were things like, you fight constantly and he tries to control you. While Neil was awfully bossy in the bedroom, he wasn't consistently so outside of it. If anything, his lack of input was more frustrating than any need for control he might have had. Sometimes I just wanted him to be the proverbial coin flip when it came down to my life decisions, and he was maddeningly neutral until pressed. Other times couldn't resist micromanaging our lives, but he never told me what to wear or eat. Although he did have an annoying habit of trying to decide what was best for me when he thought he was ruining my life, I saw nothing on the list that would make me hesitate to marry him. But there must have been something about me that had changed his mind. The bathroom door opened, and I hurried to turn off my phone, like I'd been caught committing a crime. Pamela's voice drifted into the echoey room. I can't believe he has the nerve to bring her, she said, and there was a laugh. A laugh I recognized. Valerie. I know. It's so pathetic, she said with a resigned sigh. But that's Neil for you. 
The man's arrogance knows no bounds. It's Emma I feel badly for, poor dove, Pamela replied just as I quietly as possible, put one foot then the other on the toilet seat to hide my feet below the gap in the stall. Imagine how awful that must be for her, to have her father's practically teenage mistress at her wedding. I know, I know, Valerie sounded like she was consoling Emma, despite the fact that she wasn't there. She handles it well, but she's so uncomfortable with them. Apparently they go at it like rabbits. Emma was afraid to move from room to room when she was still living with them. I peeked over the top of the door and caught a quick glimpse of Valerie applying lipstick in the mirror. This was just like a teen movie, and I was the lovable nerd hiding in the bathroom stall while the popular girls bitched about me. Well, apparently not too lovable, listening to them. He's making a fool of himself, Pamela went on. Why do men always do this in middle age? This is Neil we're talking about. He started going through his midlife crisis the moment Emma was born. Valerie snarked. I'm sure this one will be the same as last time. Her biological clock will start making unreasonable demands. He'll panic, and she'll be gone. My anger boiled up inside me like some horrible, hot, nasty thing. I wanted to storm out and punch her. And I was pretty sure that the only thing holding me back was that Emma wouldn't want her mother to have a black eye in the wedding photos. If she's anything like the last one, the wedding alone will be an expensive lesson to learn, Pamela mused. Oh, no, I don't think the wedding is going to happen. Pride dripped from Valerie's voice. I've been gently steering him in the wise direction. She's so young, you two must have so much in common to overcome that. It's amazing you can keep up with her that type of thing. You can't tell them anything directly, can you? Pamela clucked her tongue as though they were talking about a naughty child and not a grown man. No, you really can't, especially Neil. He just doesn't listen. I tried to warn him about the last one, and look where that ended up. Hopefully this one doesn't take him for as much alimony. Pamela snorted. I'm going to the alley for a cigarette. Are you coming? No, I'll be along in a minute. I should get back out there. I just need the toilet. When I heard Pamela leave, I stomped down from the toilet seat and flung open the stall door. For a second, I worried Valerie might have a heart attack, and not in a metaphorical sense. Her eyes flew open, her face went pale. I swear if she hadn't been wearing coral lipstick, her lips would have been blue, and her body jolted. Maybe it was because she was shocked at being caught. Maybe it was just the loud noise of the door banging on its hinges and ricocheting back into the latch, which was admittedly alarming. But she took a step back, so I knew I did not look happy. When I spoke... It sounded like some inhuman being had inhabited me. Having been raised extremely Catholic, I did worry for a moment that I might have been possessed. But I think the only thing truly controlling me was my incredible willpower. To not knock her down and jam my Stuart Weitzman pump down her throat. Let me be clear. There are two reasons, two reasons... I am not resorting to physical violence right now, and those are that Emma wouldn't want your hair to be all ripped out in the wedding pictures, and I don't think you're worth a night in jail. How dare! she tried, but I was on a roll. I am not finished speaking! I nearly shouted, but I didn't want anyone to overhear. I wanted to have this moment uninterrupted, because I didn't want anything misconstrued. I didn't want Valerie to think she had an inch of wiggle room or a drop of sympathy from anyone for the shit she'd been pulling. I lowered my voice to a deadly whisper, and the ice in my tone matched the ice in my veins. I am tolerating you right now for Emma's sake, and for Neil's, 
Christ's sake. But I don't have to tolerate being spoken of in that way. I let it go when I heard you trying to get Neil to dump me the very first time you met me. But this is getting fucking ridiculous. Valerie's neck seemed to take a step back, while her head stayed perfectly in place. I'm allowed to express myself freely to my friends. If you don't like it, perhaps you should break your nasty eavesdropping habit. You aren't allowed to sabotage my relationship with Neil. Say what you want about me, but that's where it ends. I clenched my hands to fists at my side. If I ever hear you talking about Neil like that, like he's an infant you have to raise, if I ever hear you suggest you have even a hint of say over our lives again, I will cut off your access to him faster than you give me one of your stupid fake apologies. She laughed haughtily, but it was so obviously forced as to highlight her sudden fear. Neil and I have a daughter together, Sophie. He couldn't cut me out of his life, even if he wanted to. Your daughter isn't five, Valerie. He doesn't ever have to be in the same place with you ever again. Except for work. Shit, I decided to bluff. He's retired now. He could ship you off to the London office in some kind of restructure. She didn't have anything to say to that. So I added, how do you think he's going to react when he finds out that after a year... You're still trying to break us up? Because I have this crazy feeling that you know exactly what he would think. And you also know what he would do if I asked him to. She did. I saw it in the watery gleam along her lower lashes. Good. She deserved to cry. She deserved to feel like shit, if that was how she was going to treat Neil and me. Toe the fucking line, Valerie. Step one centimeter out of bounds, and after the wedding, I'll tell Neil that you think you're pulling the strings. You know control freak Neil would just love that, don't you? Valerie went so still I thought she might have stopped breathing. Cross me again. I dare you. You piss me off and I ask him to cut off all contact with you. Indefinitely. In the stunned flicker of her eyelashes and the slowly bleeding edge of her eyeliner, as a tear escaped, I saw that she'd been confronted with her worst fear, that Neil really would choose me over her, and that there was nothing she could do to stop him from turning his back on her, if he wanted to. I stormed out of the bathroom. My hands were still shaking. I was kind of worried that Valerie might come at me dynasty style and cause a big public scene, but she was too smart for that. I was angrier than I think I'd ever been at anyone before. Valerie didn't have to like me, but why did she feel the need for petty, vicious gossip about me? If she was such good friends with Neil, why couldn't she be happy that he'd found someone who loved him and who loved her daughter? Why did it have to be such a played-out competition, the ex versus the new woman? There were times I genuinely respected and admired Valerie. Then I felt betrayed when she ruined it all in a single asshole moment. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to be jealous of her or threatened by her. I didn't want to have an annual falling out with her and I really did want her out of Neil's life. He counted her as a friend, but she treated him like garbage. Why did he let her? Because they had a child together? Emma was grown, and Neil couldn't reasonably expect that we'd still be having joint Christmases when Emma was thirty. All I could figure was that he still felt so guilty over breaking her heart twenty-five years ago. He couldn't bring himself to build normal boundaries. But I couldn't live like this. I couldn't be around someone so toxic, someone who continually targeted me for passive-aggressive attacks, who made me the subject of malicious gossip at every chance she got, and who was perfectly comfortable slandering someone who was supposed to be her friend in order to do it. I couldn't feel any sympathy for her. I just couldn't. 
Neil's sudden waffling on our engagement had 100% to do with her. I was sure of it. Not because I thought Neil was easily manipulated, but because I knew Valerie had the advantage of time to hone her manipulations. I also knew that Neil was at least somewhat aware of them. Emma had told me that her mother had outed Neil to his ex-wife, though Emma didn't know the truth about her father's bisexuality. Valerie's meddling had made Neil furious. There was precedence set for bad Valerie slash Neil's girlfriend behavior, so I had no doubt he would believe me. I just didn't want to be that person, though. I didn't want to ask my boyfriend, hopefully still my boyfriend if the damage hadn't already been done, to cut someone out of his life for my convenience. But there was no way I would face the rest of my life knowing I would be fighting with Valerie every step of the way. I swiped at my lower eyelids with my thumb, hoping the fact that I'd been crying wouldn't show. I wasn't about to go back to the bathroom while Valerie was still in there. I lifted my chin, set my shoulders back, and went to fake happy for the rest of the night. Walking into the dining room, I caught Emma in a moment when she thought no one was watching. Her eyes were downcast, and she pushed her salad around her plate with the enthusiasm people reserved for root canals and paying taxes. I wasn't the only one faking happy tonight. After the torture of dinner and speeches, and watching as Emma painfully tried to maintain her smile, despite whatever was eating at her, and hopefully it wasn't really, as Valerie had claimed, discomfort at my presence. I was glad when all the guests had left, and the only thing remaining was to make our escape. Where's Emma? Michael asked, frowning as he scanned the banquet room. She was just here a moment ago. Probably off to the ladies, Pamela said airily. Well, Valerie, shall we? Are we going as well? Neil asked, sliding his arm around my waist. I wish I could have felt as confident in his touch as I might have before our fight. But I leaned into him, because Valerie would no doubt be watching for any chink in my armor to exploit. Michael's phone rang, and he checked the screen. It's my mom and dad. They must have forgotten something. I'm going to take this. If you see Emma, I'll wander off and find her, Neil offered. Valerie and Pamela both gave him a warm good night and promises to see us all in the morning. When he left, they shot me cold looks and said nothing more before leaving. So, I guessed Valerie had found a moment to fill her fellow mean girl in on what had taken place in the bathroom. I waited in the small foyer, casting the occasional look to the hostess, who walked around checking on various things she had already checked on a dozen times and impatiently waiting for us to leave. It seemed unlikely that Emma had gotten so lost in the narrow hallway that Neil hadn't found her yet. Ansi under the increasingly hostile glances from the hostess, I went off to find them. In the hall that led to the bathroom was a small empty coat room. From inside I heard Neil's voice and... Emma? Crying? I stood with my back against the dark-paneled wall and listened to Emma's sobs, muffled in her father's jacket. I don't know what I'm doing, she sniffled. Daddy, I don't know what to do. My heart broke for her. She had last-minute jitters. That was totally normal, wasn't it? Seemed to be, in all the movies. Emma, you love... Neil muted horrible from his sentence. Michael, from the first moment you brought him home, I could see that. Is love a good enough reason to marry somebody? You loved Mom. You loved Elizabeth. Look how those ended up, she reminded herself, in the guise of arguing with him. There was so much pain in Neil's voice when he spoke again. I wanted to burst into the room and hug him. I didn't, of course. This was Emma's moment with her father, but it was difficult to hear Neil work through this moment with his daughter, as difficult as it was to know that Emma was unhappy on the eve of her wedding. You are not me, Emma. No matter how alike we are, 
I've made stupid mistakes in my past. You're much smarter than I am. You don't like him, she protested. But you do. He made a noise of helpless frustration. My sweet girl, do you really believe you could cancel this wedding right now and walk away from him forever? I don't want to walk away, she protested through audible tears. I just don't want anything to change. Neil didn't answer right away. I imagined the two of them standing, staring miserably at each other until he said, I understand that. Too well. You don't want to get married to Sophie, she asked, and my heart lurched. I almost turned and ran. I didn't want to hear his answer, unless it was going to be the one I wanted to hear. And if it weren't, well, I wouldn't know, unless I heard it. I want to marry her, more than I wanted to marry Elizabeth, to be perfectly frank. I don't feel like there's an expiration date on our relationship. I don't feel pressured, he said, and the knot in my chest that had cinched up tight a moment before, untangled a little. But that doesn't mean I'm sure that everything is going to be all right once we are married, and I'm afraid, Emma. I'm as nervous as you are that something will change, that we won't be the same people we were before we were married. But I'm not willing to lose her now, because I'm afraid that I might lose her later. Emma's breath was a shuddering sob. Do you want me to marry Michael? Oh, Neil, please, please answer this one correctly, I prayed. I do. I want you to marry Michael. Surprisingly, he didn't sound pained or resigned at all, but earnest. He even went on. He's very smart. He has a successful career ahead of him, but most importantly, he treats you well. And he loves you. I can see that every time he looks at you. Daddy, Emma's voice was nearly a whisper. I can't. She was going to tell him, and it was going to destroy him. We can't. I've been seeing everyone, specialists. They all say I can't have a baby. A rustle of fabric told me that he'd swept her up in a hug. If it hadn't, the sound of his voice muffled by her hair would have. Oh, my sweet girl, I am so, so sorry. I can't do this to him. Emma was sobbing hard now. I can't take that away from him. He wants children so badly. I can't condemn him to... Neil shushed her tenderly as she cried, and I knew he was probably giving her the best dad hug in the history of dad hugs. Does Michael know? He knows, Emma said through a stuffed nose. We've been trying for a while. We knew there were going to be difficulties, but now the fertility doctor thinks that even with IVF. So you get a surrogate, or you adopt. There's no reason the two of you can't have children. He sounded almost relieved at finding it a fixable problem. You've talked to him about this, haven't you? About your fears regarding getting married. He says I'm being stupid. You are. I love you with all my heart, Emma. But there are times when you couldn't see your way out of a telescope. He managed a grim laugh. You've been with Sophie too long. You've picked up her talent for insane metaphor. Emma said, in usual dry humor. Michael knows you'll be unable to have children. I think it's wonderful that you two are responsible enough to find out before going ahead with the wedding. But you know now, and you both still want to get married. I think that gives you your answer. I'd heard too much, so I slipped quietly from the hall, walking on the balls of my feet so my heels wouldn't make noise. I went out to the curb and climbed into the back seat of the Maybach to wait. Emma emerged from the restaurant first, her arm through Michael's. She was all smiles now, as though she'd never doubted. Neil came out after them and stopped Emma for one last hug. It went on for a long time, and when he let her go, he watched her walk away. Tomorrow was going to be so hard for him. Everything okay? I asked when Neil got into the car. 
Tony shut the door behind him, and Neil took a moment to get settled in and buckled his seatbelt before he answered with a vague, Everything is fine. Emma just has a touch of nerves. He didn't tell me everything. He didn't betray Emma's confidence, not even to me. I admired that so much, and I could never tell him. I leaned my head on his shoulder and hoped my contented heart could send some sort of telepathic message to him. What were you and Valerie talking about in the bathroom? Pamela said she thought you might have been arguing, he asked absently, as we pulled off, past Michael and Emma in their car. My stomach turned. I don't know where she got that impression. It was something or other about the wedding. It wasn't a lie. I didn't know how Pamela had overheard us from the alley, and we had been talking about the wedding, just not the one Neil assumed we were talking about. She'll still be planning the bloody thing a week from now. He made the statement with genuine affection, and I felt the most horrific stab of hatred toward her. But I couldn't say anything to Neil, not when he was so stressed out. My anger at Valerie was an infection killing off any shred of niceness in me. I had to let off some of it, or I would fester until I burst like a gangrenous leg. But there was no one I could talk to. Holly had been my only close friend, after I'd lost so many work friends when I'd been blacklisted at Porteris. Valerie was Emma's mom, so even after the wedding I wouldn't mention it to her. I couldn't say anything to anyone. It was a terrible, lonely feeling. I was thinking. He began tentatively, picking imaginary lint from the knee of his trousers. When Michael said what he did about Emma— that he knew from the moment he saw her. I wanted to brace myself, to believe that what he would say next would be, I didn't feel that way about you. But he wouldn't, because I knew it wasn't true. I had to talk myself into my first marriage. I thought I was going to break Elizabeth's heart the way I broke Valerie's. And I did. I may not have been technically unfaithful to her, not physically, anyway but I was in love with another woman the entire time I was married to her. It wasn't that I didn't love Elizabeth, I did. He paused. But I loved you more. He'd met me once, for a few brief hours, and loved me for six unrequited years, and that scared me as much as it touched me. Neil, you have to understand something— Every day I worry that I'm not living up to the expectations of the man who spent six years building me up in his mind. It must be an awful pressure. He reached for my hand and squeezed it. But you don't meet my expectations. You exceed them. Every day I fall more in love with the Sophie who found me again, not the Sophie from that airport seven years ago. I had to ask now. I couldn't hold it back any longer. So why are you being so weird about getting married? When you proposed to me, I thought, no one is ever going to love me as much as this man does. And then in one conversation, I couldn't be certain of that anymore. I swallowed, warning myself off asking, desperately not wanting to bring Valerie's machinations into this. Has someone said something? Expressed disapproval or, of course they have. Sophie, I'm a fifty-year-old billionaire marrying a twenty-five-year-old. Everyone has expressed concerns. A slight smile touched his lips. But it's not them. It's this fear. That perhaps I want you too much. I didn't know what to say to that. Do you remember why I was in LAX? He asked, after a pause. Yeah, you had some interview with a Japanese car company guy, and you couldn't rent a crew for your jet in time to make the meeting. I racked my brain for some detail I had possibly missed. During the layover, I got a crew. I didn't take the flight that was delayed. I could have left at any time after three o'clock that afternoon, but I took a risk and rescheduled the interview. His laugh was hoarse and hollow. I chose... A funny, strange woman I met in an airport over an interview that ended up establishing Autowatch as a hard-hitting example of auto-journalism on a scale I'd never hoped it would achieve. I knew how important it was. And even back then, 
I picked you. My chest hurt. His declaration was at once touching and terrifying. He'd known me for only a few hours then. He'd been able to choose staying with me in that hotel room over his magazine. And Auto Watch was as much his baby as Emma was. But he hadn't been able to stay with me when he thought it meant my future was at stake. Are you? I frowned. How would I put this? Neil, this thing with the wedding. Are you running out of the hotel room again? He looked away. I think so. Perhaps I'm always going to be caught between wanting you and trusting myself to want you within reason. So stop second-guessing yourself, I put my hand on his knee, and stop worrying about what you think is best for me. I'm the girl who was going to run away to Tokyo without any money and without speaking a word of Japanese. Do you think I don't know my own mind? Okay, I don't always make the best decisions, but this isn't one of those times. I love you. You have cold feet, fine. If you don't want to set a date yet, that's fine. I just want to be with you, if it means never getting married. I want to marry you, he interrupted. I want the white picket fence life, sans the 2.5, of course, but it terrifies me. I've never done this right. I was so sure of things when I proposed to you. I'm sure of buying a house and settling down with you. It isn't like when I married Elizabeth. Can I ask you something? Certainly. Why did you marry Elizabeth? I thought I already knew the answer, but I wasn't sure he did. He blew out a long breath. I suppose I married her because... I thought she was as good a chance as any at happiness. I was never going to see you again. I didn't even know how to contact you. I couldn't very well track you down like some demented stalker, could I? So I settled for a woman I did love, just not as much as I loved you. And you want to marry me because you want to marry me, and that's all? It seemed so simple now that we'd talked about it. I wished we had before. It sounds like there's a pretty big difference. There are no ulterior motives behind it, no settling. You propose to me because you love me. You finally have the woman you want and you're afraid of her? That doesn't sound right. He glanced at the window again, then back at me. There are times when I am deeply shamed that although you're half my age, you have twice the emotional maturity that I do. Ooh, be careful, Elwood. That's something I can use against you in future arguments. The knot of uncertainty in my chest eased even more. It hadn't untied completely, but at least it was a loose loop that could be shaken out. I took his hand and lifted it to my lips to kiss his knuckles. He chuckled. I suspect that was something you already knew. It was. I tried to hide my smile, but I was so relieved to get all of this out in the open. I think Emma's cold feet are catching. I think you might be right. I'm sure it's no secret that I'm not enthusiastic at the prospect of losing my daughter to Michael. Hey, you said Michael, not horrible Michael. You're making progress. I congratulated him. Yes, thank you, Sophie. Truly, I am making great strides. His tone was dry as unbuttered toast. As I was saying, I can't help but wonder if my sudden reluctance doesn't have to do with the fact that everything is changing, moving from the city, retiring, turning fifty. It's a bit of an upheaval. Well, it's all different for me, too. Remember at Christmas how we said no big changes? I shrugged. We're not very good at following rules, either of us. He chuckled, but it was a wary sort of sound. I want to go to my future stepdaughter's wedding tomorrow, with my future husband, I continued. I want to stand there and think, what lovely flower arrangements, let's do that for hours. I want to be Neil Elwood's fiancé. I wouldn't have said yes if I didn't want that. He squeezed our interlaced fingers and said with a shaky breath, I want that too. I reached for him. He reached for me. And we held each other as though we'd crossed a physical distance instead of an emotional one.
some of the old guard around to warn the new people in your life just what a fucking tragedy you are. Just hearing the easy banter between the two caused a phantom pain in my heart. It reminded me that a part was missing. A part I felt acutely, even though it wasn't there anymore. It must have showed on my face. A slow song had somewhat cleared the dance floor, and Neil said, Well, Ian, I think I'll have another dance with my fiancé. Unless the two of you would rather. No, no. I need to take advantage of the open bar you're paying for. Ian got to his feet. If I don't see you before I go, give me a call sometime. We'd love to get together and catch up. As we went back onto the floor, I nudged Neil with my arm. You didn't have to stop talking to your friend, you know. I wasn't going to die from lack of attention. Believe it or not, darling, I am not blind to your emotions. He wrapped an arm around my waist and drew me close as Miley Cyrus's Adore played. The super slow song meant the night was coming to an end, I feared. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be thinking about all that tonight. I should just be enjoying myself. I rested my head against his shoulder. There's no shame in getting comfort when you need it. You're thinking about Holly and her wedding, aren't you? I lifted my head to meet his gaze and flexed my fingers where they were entwined with his. I hadn't been thinking of that. It was May now, and we hadn't spoken since February. I wasn't going to get an invitation. I obviously was no longer the maid of honor. That chicken had flown the coop the moment I'd snitched on Deja. But to not even be there. I blinked back tears and got myself under control quickly. Not along those lines, but yeah. I suppose that will be coming up soon. I can't believe we're not going to be at each other's weddings. When I see what you're going through, I can't help but imagine what it would be like for me if I were to lose Rudy or Ian. After a cautious pause, he added, or Valerie, for that matter. I know you believe I've been a control freak since I emerged from my mother's womb, graphic, but... He tried for a stern, don't-interrupt-me look and failed as it slid into a smile. The truth is that without the support of my friends, when I was starting my career and getting on my feet, I would have been utterly lost. I never wanted that for you, and I wish things had been handled differently. I wish your bitch ex hadn't fired my best friend's girlfriend and ruined my whole life. I took a breath my chin tucking slightly to my chest, carefully censoring my reaction. What happened, happened. I've got you, and I've got Emma now. I never thought we'd get along, but I think she's come to like me a little. She put me in the wedding pictures. May I share a secret with you that must be held in strictest confidence? His eyes glittered, green, like light through a dark forest. She absolutely adores you. That made me feel weirdly bashful. I knew 